I, 19, female, live in a small town in South Carolina. We only have a moderately large population because of the Air Force Base. I've lived here my whole life in the same house. It was built in 1971. My father bought it with his ex-wife and my mom, his current wife, moved in 2001. I was born in 2002. I'll start at the beginning, but I will mention that I do have a rather fucked up memory, so I may be forgetting things. For as long as I've been alive, there have been footsteps in the attic. I always try to rationalize it, just thinking that this is an old house. It's bound to make noise. But a couple of months ago, I heard bells jingling in the attic, like our Christmas decorations. It was above the bathroom, and the footsteps are usually above my room, which is right next door. I told my dad about it, and he went to check for animals. He didn't find any. Couldn't even find a place where they could have gotten in. He told me I was hearing things and probably needed to go to bed. So I did. Then I started hearing what I can only describe as footsteps coming from inside the walls. My mom heard it too. So did our cats. At one point, it was behind our coffee maker and we were both standing there, scared that it was a mouse or something. Our cat, Katniss, was desperately trying to find it, but couldn't. My mom told my dad this time. An exterminator came out, but couldn't find anything. The noise continued. Then I heard noises coming from the faucet in the bathtub. It sounded like someone was trying to force it out of its place. I told my dad again, thinking there was a problem with the pipes. He found nothing. The footsteps and wall noises are continuous, but seem to get louder at night. I don't know if it's just because the house is quiet at night, so it sounds louder. I should mention that our attic is very short and hot. It's not possible for a grown person to stand upright. So no, we don't have someone living up there. And like I said, my dad checked and found nothing. Then it started messing with our dogs. We have three dogs. In order of age, we have Amber, Bunchy, and Zoe. We previously had Lil Bit, who was older than all of them, but I'll get into what's happened to her later. Whatever it is, loves to annoy Zoe. She's the most skittish. She's terrified of our cats and will literally move off of the couch if one of the cats gets near her. They've never attacked her. She's just a scaredy cat. Zoe will often wake up and snap at something on her back, specifically when she's laying in the big dog bed we have in the living room. She'll snap at it, lay back down, snap at it again, and decides it's not worth it and gets up and moves. This doesn't happen to either of our other dogs or our cats when they lay there. Only Zoe. There's something that could be touching her and it's not fleas because she only does it when it's in bed. The thing scared the fuck out of our oldest dog, Amber, twice. Amber and Zoe are the most needy, terrified of loud noises like thunder and fireworks, and Amber trials after my mom 24 seven. I never saw this, but apparently something scared Amber to the point where she tried to sit behind my mom on the couch, and she's a big dog, a golden retriever mix. She's only done this with thunder and fireworks. None of our other dogs did this, just her. And she did it twice. No knocking on the door that she was laying in front of, which even if there was, she wouldn't be scared. She'd start barking her head off. The last thing it does to our dogs is the hardest to talk about. Boonchi is a beagle mix and is quite large. We call her Bounce because when she was a puppy, it always looked like she was jumping instead of running. Lil Bit is a Chihuahua, Pug, Boston Terrier mix. Her name is obviously because she was quite small. My mom liked to say she was a little bit of a dog. She was extremely sweet and motherly to our cat Katniss. 
We found her under our house when she was two days old. And Lil Bits helped with the things like making sure she didn't fall and helping her to go to the bathroom. Bouncer's very neutral. Doesn't scare easily and doesn't really like to play. However, she has killed cats that have managed to get into our backyard. And unfortunately, those cats were strays we fed and came to love. Bounce and Lil Bits started fighting, like trying to kill each other. The first time was the night before my first day of school. I can't remember what year it was, but it was within the last four years. I remember I had a coconut hair mask on, and I had just gotten out of the shower, so I wasn't dressed yet. Just in a towel, and all of a sudden, I heard snarling and barking, and my mom screaming her head off. I go in there, and we have to physically pry them off of each other. Lil Bit was injured, but not bad enough to go to the vet, so we just separated them, and they eventually got over it. But they still ended up fighting several more times. I've gotten injured before trying to stop them, although I know they didn't mean to hurt me. I remember one time my dad just straight up picked a little bit up and Bounce was attached to her throat and was also in the air. Eventually, they stopped though, until a couple of months ago. This was at 3 a.m. I remember very vividly because I was trying to sleep, but was on my phone and my mom called me out of my room and I was like, what could you possibly want? It's 3 a.m. And as far as you're concerned, I'm asleep right now. Her yell was urgent though, so I didn't even bother putting on my shorts. I just ran into the kitchen. She screamed that they were fighting again and she needed help. I ran out there with a flashlight, not even bothering to put on shoes or pants, and had to pry them apart by myself because my mom didn't even move from the back porch. At one point, I even hit Bounce in the back with the flashlight because she just wouldn't stop and I couldn't separate them. I was screaming for my mom and I'm surprised I didn't wake the neighbors with how much I was screaming. It's so fucking terrifying seeing two animals you love dearly trying to kill each other. Anyways, I eventually got them apart and held a little bit back. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, earlier in the day, Bunchi had come inside with blood on her, but we didn't know where it came from. My mom called Bunchi up to the porch and let her in the house, and Lil Bit was just standing there. And when I tell you I've never seen her look like that, it looked like she had just reverted to, God, I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like all the personality and sweetness just drained from her. And I was reminded that she's an animal. She looked so terrifying. I was a sobbing mess and was literally hyperventilating. I just sat there at the kitchen table with a washcloth, just sobbing and cleaning the blood and dirt off of me. My mom woke up my dad and he had the audacity to be inconvenienced. I don't have the best parents, but that's another story. My mom decided that this was the last straw and one of them needed to go. So we ended up taking Lil Bit up to the SPCA. But don't worry, we know she was adopted and is fine now. But it came out of nowhere. I have a video from when Katniss was a kitten and she was literally giving Bouncy kisses on her face. I have no fucking clue what happened with them. This is so long, I'm sorry. But now I have to get into the actual, like, hardcore shit, if you will. The first experience I remember was actually with a friend. I think I was in middle school, so this would be around four to seven years ago. So I was friends with this girl, Kaylee. She lived down the street, and she would often come over to my house after school, and would sometimes stay for dinner before walking back home. That day was one of them. We had been in my bedroom that I shared with my older sister, Tori. Not sure where she was, but she wasn't in the room. My grandparents had this bench filled with toys that they needed to get rid of because we were older and no longer used it. So we were allowed to pick some stuff out and brought those things along with the bench home. One of the things I picked out 
was a Scooby-Doo stuffed animal. Apparently, it was called the Friday Night Scooby Stuffed Animal. A flashlight was attached to his hand, and whenever you turned it on, there would be a ghost shadow on the light, and he would say something like, cover my eyes, too scary, in his iconic Scooby voice. I can't remember all the phrases he said, but there were only a set number of them. I had it turned off with no batteries, because it was purely just decoration. It had been sitting on the floor in front of my sister's bed, which is on the other side of the room from the door. Me and Kaylee were called for dinner, so I let her walk out of the room first before turning off the lights. And I shit you not, this thing goes, turn back on the lights, too scary, at the exact same time. Me and Kaylee run out of the room. I don't even shut the door. And we're screaming about how it just talked. My parents don't believe me, of course. So we ate, Kaylee went home, and I ripped the wires out of that thing and threw it away. Before anyone asks, no, my grandparents' house is not haunted. I went over there pretty much every weekend and never experienced anything. So nothing was attached to the bench or the stuffed animal. Also, none of the toys my sister brought back ever did anything. Just my Scooby-Doo toy. Okay, so I have like two more stories, so bear with me. So my sister moved out when I was 11. I'm 19 now, so I have our room to myself. It's weirdly shaped. Basically, it's a box, but they didn't finish one wall, so there's a little bump out area. For the longest, my bed was in that little nook. We had bunk beds that were in that nook. Then we had custom built beds by my dad, they were like lofted beds and mine was in the corner. Now, I have a proper bed that's too big for it, so now I have a desk there with all my makeup. The bedroom door is like next to the wall that the desk is on, if that makes sense. So the door is like across from my desk, through my closet. I'm explaining this horribly. My point is that I can't see my bedroom door from my desk even if I was facing the center of the room. So I was sitting there doing my makeup when I saw this black figure out of the corner of my eye. I immediately jump, thinking that my mom had snuck into my room without me noticing, but my door is squeaky as fuck. I almost always hear it. So I turn around, lean around the corner and the door is closed. No one's in my room. I'm looking around like, okay, so what the fuck did I see? As I'm looking around, I see a black hand coming from my wall on the floor, directly in front of the door. I had a piece of paper on the floor, so I figured that it just blew up, and I just saw the shadow. So I go back to doing my makeup. I take some pictures, take it off, and sit back down on my bed, which is across from my desk in the corner of my room. Then I notice the paper is too far away from where I saw the hand. It is possible that the paper moved in the time I was at my desk, but that doesn't explain what I saw standing in the middle of my room. Now for the latest thing. So I have a weird sleeping schedule right now. I'm unemployed, not going to school. I graduated in 2020. I woke up yesterday around maybe like 2 a.m. Anyways, so my dad left for work at 4 a.m., like always, and my mom went to bed around 3 a.m., so I have the whole house to myself. I got up and heated some leftovers. I got something out of one of the cabinets, but left it open because I knew I had to put the thing back, so what's the point? Mind you, our house is old. Like, 50 years old. Everything squeaks, even the cabinets. So I'm standing at the microwave, Ironically, it's right next to the coffee machine. And I turn around to put it back. And the fucking cabinet is shut. Now I know I have a bad memory, but I wouldn't have shut it. I don't shut cabinets unless they're low to the ground where my cat can get in there. So how did it close? I should have heard it. It's a squeaky door. I literally have to open it a certain way when my mom is asleep 
because I don't want it to be too loud. So I just ignore it and go to my room. While I'm eating, my mom screams for me and sounds absolutely terrified. I thought she got mad at me because I accidentally woke her, so I just yelled, what? Pause real quick because something just happened while I was writing this. I heard noises and my mom yelling, so I just left my room and my mom said something in the bathroom scared our younger cat, Ivy, and she came running out of the bathroom. So that's great. I hate that bathroom. Shit always happens in there. Anyways, back to this morning. She yells for me, and I just yell back, what? She doesn't respond, so I'm like, oh great, she's pissed. So I open my door, and I just see my mom sitting up in her bed, sobbing, and I'm like, what the fuck? She says she heard a female voice, and it sounded like it was at the foot of her bed. So I'm like, great, someone broke into our house. So I go into her room and shut the door, leaving it a crack open. I grab her phone and ask her if we should call the police, but she says no. So I decide to check the house. I knew I had let the dogs out earlier, but was certain I locked the doors after letting them back in. I turned on the flashlights on her phone and walked around, checking the front and back door, and they were both locked. I didn't bother checking the windows, because our house is pretty impossible to break in, so I knew no one was in our house. She's still sobbing when I get back to her room. She said it was feminine, but it didn't sound like words, just mumbling. Two syllables. All of my family members have two syllable word names, so it might have been a name. I asked her about sleep paralysis, and she said that she could move, but the voice sounded so clear. I told her about the cabinet, because I remembered it, and it happened literally less than an hour before she woke up. And she didn't even say anything about it. She didn't go back to bed until my dad got home around 2pm. Bounce and Zoe were laying on the floor in front of her bed and didn't react to anything. Amber was laying next to my mom and was literally trying to sleep while I was in there talking to my mom. Katniss and Ivy were laying on the couch in the living room and none of them reacted. I don't know if she saw anything. There may have been something there, but my mom is pretty blind without her glasses. She has bifocals and it was dark. But this is really starting to freak me out. My cats will just sit and stare at a corner of the living room that just so happens to connect to my mom's room. I thought for the longest that it was the old man next door. The shadow person that I saw didn't feel feminine, but it also didn't feel threatening. I've woken up with bruises in random spots, and while I do move around a lot in my sleep, my mom would hear it if I hit a wall. I have no fucking clue what to do. This, along with a lot of stuff that happened with Kaylee in the forest that surrounds our neighborhood, is really getting to me. I don't even wholly believe in this, but what else could it be? How do you imagine a sound? We're not even close to being religious. I'm not really looking for tips, but I just need to share this with someone who will believe me. When I told my parents about the shadow person, they straight up laughed at me, so I can't even imagine what my dad will say to my mom. I saw her sobbing, she looked so scared. She called me because she thought someone might be in our house, and that's how sure she is that she heard it. I'm honestly so sick of this house. I just want to leave it, and this town. While I was getting ready for bed, I heard a male voice yelling my name from my backyard while I was in the bathroom. I just ignored it. Didn't even bother to check if someone was really there. This was around 9 p.m. On October 2nd at 11.30 p.m., I smelled my great-grandma's perfume in my bathroom three times while I was in there. It wasn't three separate occasions. I never left the bathroom. 
I know what she smells like. I have three of her brooches that she left me after she died, and I can't wear them because they smell like her. She has a distinctive smell, and nothing in our house except for her things smell like it, much less our bathroom. We do have an air freshener in there that's on a timer, but the scent in it was rose and is wildly different from how Nanny smells. I left the bathroom crying because it felt so real and it was like she was in the room with me. And the weird thing is that after she died, I kept thinking about what if she's haunting us. She died like three years ago and I had no reason to think that, but I couldn't get it out of my head. On October 11th, I smelled it again and I kind of yelled at her. I was saying how of all the rooms in the house to haunt, why would you pick the bathroom? Now we weren't very close, so why are you haunting me instead of my mom? And I apologized immediately after because I felt like I was a bit rude. I haven't smelled it since, so I'm hoping it's over. On October 14th at 7 a.m., I was playing in the kitchen with my cat, Ivy, while sitting on the floor in front of the dining room table. We have an umbrella open in the front of the litter box to prevent our dogs from going in there, and the umbrella moved. I don't know what made it move, but it wasn't my cat's. On October 15th at 6.40 a.m., I was leaning up against a counter in the kitchen so that Katniss could rub up against my back. She had turned around and was walking toward me, and she jerked her head around like someone grabbed her tail and jumped down and ran under the dining room table. I've been having a hard time sleeping ever since my mom heard the voice. I keep randomly waking up and falling asleep. This has happened several days in a row. I'm a heavy sleeper. I've slept through a hurricane and the only thing that woke me up was the power going out because of how hot my room got. I have no idea what's causing me to wake up. I'm not under any stress and I'm usually exhausted by the time I get into bed. Any ideas? For everyone suggesting carbon monoxide poisoning, the only thing I can think of that could be leaking is our oven. It's older than me and shares a wall with my bed, but if it is leaking, my mom should be more affected. She's the one that cooks and spends the longest in the kitchen. She's not having any trouble with her memory. Our cats also love the kitchen and like to lay in the window across from the stove. They haven't been acting strange. As for suggestions to set up cameras, we have a small camera that my dad bought a while ago, but we don't have a computer to actually check the footage. I was going to try to record myself sleeping with my phone on an app, but it picks up the AC in my room. Sorry, but I live in the south. I'm not sleeping without it until it gets colder. Thanks for all your concern and tips though. My dad is quite abusive to me physically. He was abused when he was a kid. He has complete control over the finances, so I'm unable to get a job and so is my mom. We're trying to figure out a way to get away from him, but I don't know if we ever will. Anyways, some of you wanted to hear more, so this is mostly about the woods and some small stuff that's happened in the house. So, for context, my house is a one-story brick house that's on a huge hill. Our driveway isn't level, and the emergency brake has to be on all the time in my mom's car. The back of the house, aka my room, the bathroom, the office, and part of my parents' room, is around three stories high. My parents' room is at the corner of the house, so one window is very low to the front yard, while the other one is really high. This is why I said it's really hard to break into my house. Not only that, but because my mom doesn't work, She's home 24 seven. We also have a street light on the corner of our yard near their room. I feel very safe from outside threats. One night, me and my sister were watching a VHS movie in my parents' room. They have a giant box TV in there, so we often watch movies. I was sitting on my mom's side of the bed near the tall window 
while Tori was sitting on the other side, near the low window. I want to emphasize how fucking tall that window was. I heard a metal on metal noise, and that's one of the sounds I can't stand. So I turned to look for the source, and I noticed that the screen in the tall window had been cut. A perfect horizontal cut was now in it. I screamed, and we ran out of there. My parents went to check outside and found nothing. No footprints in the dirt, no ladders had been moved, no weird cars on the streets. Absolutely nothing. I found out recently that they never replaced the screen because Katniss had been sitting on the windowsill and I went to pet her and noticed it. I flipped out on my mom and she said it was pointless to fix it. Weird little noises always happen in the bathroom. We used to have this little muted pink colored plastic trash can in there before we remodeled. Didn't matter what time you took a shower, around five minutes in, you would hear something tap on it. It was a very hollow noise. I don't know how to describe it, but I knew it was the trash can. I tried to rationalize it, thinking that maybe the heat caused the plastic to warp, making the noise, but it even happened to my dad who takes pretty cold showers. It happened to my friends too when they stayed the night. I always had to warn them about it. Anyways, this is the one experience that my sister can remember. So she had been taking a shower and we all heard this loud ass noise. My mom goes and checks on her and Tori literally fell into the wall. Like the wall was caved in. We just assumed she had slipped and moved on. But later that night, she told me something pushed her. The hole isn't there anymore. It had been for years, but it was fixed when we remodeled. There was a plastic bag literally duct taped to it to prevent the wires in the wall from getting wet. The wall she fell into was connected to the office wall. I don't know if the thing knew that and wanted to fuck with the power or maybe even electrocute Tori, but it was creepy. I'd like you all to remember that it is not possible for my family to move. The last thing that often happened in the bathroom were the shadows. So the tub is right behind the door. So when you open the door, it's right up against the shower curtain, but there's like a small wall directly behind the door. So it goes a bit of wall and then the rest is the curtain for the shower. And then you reach the other wall if that makes sense. So when you're in the shower, you're facing with your back to the door essentially. When someone walks into the bathroom while you're in the shower, you can see the shadow of the door opening, someone walking in and then the door closing. But the problem is that sometimes when I'm taking a shower, I can see the shadow of the door opening and someone walks in. I peek from behind the curtain, but the door is always shut and nothing is in there. I would say it's my imagination, but I've heard my mom calling for me, asking why I'm in the bathroom, so I know it happens to other people. This is kind of connected to the bathroom. So the bathroom doorway is parallel to the living room doorway. There's a hallway in between where my room, my parents' room and the office are. There's a painting that my great grandpa did that's in front of the doorway that's framed so there's glass protecting it. Because there's a window right in front of the bathroom door in the bathroom, you can see your reflection in the glass. Sometimes I see a figure that's taller than me in it. I know it's not me because my head only reaches a certain point in the painting, but the shadow reaches a bit higher. For anyone who might ask, no, the thing isn't Opa. He's been dead for a long time, longer than I've been alive. The only one in the house that knew him was my mom and Opa loved him. From what I hear, he was a really sweet man who loved his family. His wife, Nanny, never remarried and never moved houses until she died a few years ago. And I smell her perfume sometimes. Okay, now for the woods. I'm not even gonna try to explain where this takes place in the neighborhood because this is already quite long. Me and my friend Destiny have been walking around selling those world's finest chocolate bars. First of all, this creepy woman wanted us to come into her house. 
So that was just weird on its own. We had been walking and noticed this like marker in the ground. Like it was a piece of wood with this orange fluorescent plastic tied to it. So of course we had to check it out. It marked this little trail. We walked down it a bit and started hearing running water like a stream. This ties into another experience, so keep this in mind. We would also hear like voices, like kind of singing, but we could tell they were working to cut trees, not cutting trees down, but you could tell they were cutting wood. At first, I thought there may be like a factory or something nearby, just because of all the noise. So when I got home, I googled the area and there's literally nothing in that area. No water, no factories, just houses. Years later, I actually fell down that trail while on my bike and sprained my thumb and got a minor concussion. So that's fun. We had been looking for that trail again, but somebody got rid of the marker. I guess it's plausible that workers were maybe like clearing the area, but I don't know. So three more experiences. Two happened with my friend Kaylee both around the same time. So we had been in a tent in her backyard. Something was fucking with us and was poking at the roof of the tent. Her parents weren't doing it. We freaked out and went inside. Next one happened across the street of her house. Her house was in a little roundabout, if you will. There was a straight road and on either side were loops of road where houses were located. Hers was on the wrong side of the road so if you were driving to my house from her house, her loop would be on the right side. My house was also on the right side of the street, so the woods connected from behind her house around the back of the loop to the back of my house. Basically, I could jump my back fence and walk to her backyard if I wanted to. My dog Amber loves to jump the fence and would always bring back bones. Nice, right? Anyways, can't remember why, but we decided to walk into the woods across from her house. We noticed this little boy who was like maybe five. He was white and had blonde hair, nothing too memorable. He starts leading us through the woods and for some dumbass reason, we decided to follow. We noticed several trees with red string tied around them, like someone was trying to mark the way. We saw some creepy graffiti so I can't remember what it said. There was an abandoned car where the roof was smashed down. We eventually found this river. Very shallow and slow moving. Suddenly, we realized how thirsty we were, so we stopped at this stream and drank a little, but the boy got his feet stuck. So we decided to walk the rest of the way to my house to get help. By the way, not once did the kid speak. Like he straight up never opened his mouth. When he got stuck, he just like admitted defeats and just stared off into space. So anyways, me and Kaylee are walking and we end up at this drop down. The ground just kind of stopped and dropped down like maybe 12 feet. There was a tree that was kind of like a bridge down. So we slowly started climbing it, but we heard yelling from behind us. Her dad, Jason, had found us and was yelling at us wondering why we had been gone for so long. We hadn't spoken to each other this whole time and it was kind of like we were in a trance. We both told him about the kid and how we were trying to get help for him and he said he didn't see anyone. So we walked back to her house and it felt like it maybe took five minutes to leave the woods. We never saw the stream, the car, the graffiti, not even the strings. Turns out we had been gone for around five hours. Last one, was with Destiny again. Years before Kaylee moved here, her house is past Kaylee's and is on a massive hill. You walk down the hill and there's two ways you can go. Either left to a dead end roundabout where her house is or right where you can turn left eventually and end up where the weird trail is. The woods near my house connect to her backyard as well. So growing up, me and Destiny were best friends. Might as well be sisters. We loved playing outside, especially in the woods. So this random tidbit happened just near the woods. 
There's this weird plant that looks like a feather duster, but has long, thin leaves. We loved breaking off the fluffy bits and playing with them. So we were picking which ones we wanted, and I was pushed backwards by something. I reached out and grabbed the leaves to stop myself from falling on the road. And apparently those leaves are hella sharp. I sliced up my hands. Several times we had been playing basketball in her driveway, and because it was a slight hill, if the ball rolled away, it could roll all the way into the woods across the street. We've had the ball thrown back to us with quite a bit of force from the woods, with no one there. At one point, we found this tree that was absolutely loved to climb behind her house, but there was one drawback. Sometimes in the distant mountains, you could see a little white house with smoke coming from the chimney. Doesn't matter what time of year it is, if you see it, there will be smoke. It would randomly appear and disappear, but the vibes it gave off were so unnerving. It felt like hundreds of eyes were on you and made you feel so anxious. Anytime we saw it, we just went straight back inside. This story takes place when I spent six months living in a trailer on a farm, trying to save cash on rent prices. The farm is located in a very small rural village and was a very peaceful place to live. I never felt there was anything odd or paranormal on the farm, but on a few occasions in the summer, I walked home after an evening shift and once it got dark, the country lanes leading to the farm became a little less welcoming and I would feel on edge. One of these situations where if you didn't give in to fear and look behind you, you'd be fine. But once you caved in and looked back, that was it for the rest of the walk. So just setting the scene, that the area itself was eerie once it got dark. It would have been mid-February and we had recently had snow, so it was pretty cold. I'd fallen asleep with my fan heater left on, so I woke up around 1am sweating profusely with a mouth like the Sahara Desert. I jumped out of bed and opened the top half of the door to the trailer. I was greeted by the nicest icy cold air and felt instant relief. The sky was black, but being in an area of zero light pollution, the stars shone brightly and the moon was almost full so I could see across the fields for quite a distance. I was taking in this moment of peace and cooling when I heard a noise in the distance. It sounded like it came from behind the farmhouse and up towards the lane leading to the church, which also had several houses along it. The first noise sounded like a man briefly shouting. Bearing in mind I'd been asleep for a few hours and just woken up mid-sleep, so I wasn't on full alert. This didn't really bother me. I then heard the sound again, but it sounded like a higher pitched shout. This time it sounded more like a moan or wail. The sound begins to repeat every five to 10 seconds. The deeper moan followed by a higher moan. My mind begins running calculations of what this sound could be based on where it's coming from. And the only logical thing I could think I said it was an old couple having sex with the window open. The village is mostly old people, so I didn't think it could be young people. And these sounds were not the ecstatic wails you would expect a young person to make out of pleasure. It dawns on me that no old couple is going to be banging the night away with the windows open, or be up the lane against the tree in this weather at this time of night. This focuses my hearing more as the noises begin to sound like they're getting closer. It was at this point, my brain finally decided, yes, that sounds like two zombies taking it turns to scream that classy zombie noise in different tones. And it's without a doubt getting closer. There were two reasons I believe this was paranormal. Firstly, the feeling I got when I realized this sound was getting closer and I couldn't identify it was exactly the same feeling as when I saw the three Victorian looking ladies instant fuck this fear. I slammed the door shut, jumped back into bed and held the pillow over my ears as I could still hear it. I was 30 years old at this point. 
The second reason I believe this is paranormal is due to reading an article in the local paper around four years after this happened about ghosts in the local area and came across this piece. In another of Margaret's tales, she talks of a path from the village which skirted a pond and often flooded in bad weather, forcing walkers to take a different route along Hodman's path. In order to put an end to the diversions, the decision was taken to deepen the pond. And during the excavation, it said that a skeleton was found in the mud, a millstone chained around its neck. The workmen began to recollect old stories told to them by their grannies of a wicked felon who, for his sins, was condemned to be buried at the four relit of four crossways, but for respect to his family, was after all deposited in the pond, where he had eaten undisturbed ever since. The rector of agreed that the skeleton should be freed from his millstone, a punishment mentioned in the New Testament, and reburied close to the wall on the north side of the churchyard, just across the field. It was, it turned out, a rash decision. Margaret continues, This wicked felon, relieved of his spiritual clog, rose at once from his dry and uncomfortable churchyard quarters, and nightly, with a horrid clanking of ghostly chains, rambles the unconsecrated space of glebe between the church and Laker's Lane. It is said that the ghost can be heard at night, clanking the chains it once wore. Now, I didn't hear chains, but the location given here, name changed, is exactly where I heard the noises coming from, which was the lane leading up to the old church. I don't live there, near there anymore, but when I randomly came across that article, my heart skipped a beat. Next story. I was around 13 years old and my parents were looking to move house. They loved old properties with character. This was great as we always lived in nice houses, which were unique, but they often came with a worry for me that they were haunted. The houses we lived in at the time for six months renting was an old vicarage, which was literally two foot from the local church. The living room windows on one side looked out over the graveyard. Ironically, I never had any paranormal occurrences in that house. We were moving from that house to a new one. One house we looked at was called something like the Bishop's Summer House. It was an old property that during the 17th to 1800s was used by a local bishop. This house was weird as fuck as soon as you walked in. I think either I'm paranoid or I can pick up on weird vibes due to the fact my parents never seem to notice any of the weirdness at any of these properties. Maybe just me as a kid worrying about if we were moving into a haunted house. We walked in and instantly I didn't like this place. The old boy showing us around was quite eccentric, which wasn't an issue, but it just added to the vibe. The place still had bells attached to the strings, which ran from each room to the maid's quarters so that service could be called from any room of the house. The place was generally weird, but we walked in the dining room at the back of the house and I swear to God, the temperature dropped a significant amount. You could almost see your breath. The lights were off and wouldn't work, which didn't help. I felt so vulnerable as a kid in that room, I just wanted to leave. He showed us around the rest of the house and we came across his bed, ridden wife, who was sat up in bed telling us how she was going nowhere and also talking general babble. Thankfully, we didn't move into that house. About a year after we had viewed this place, I was out with a friend and his mum and we were driving somewhere. They began telling me about a weird house they had gone to see recently, which was close by and began describing how eerie the place felt and how that they were there for about five minutes before they left. They both agreed that the place felt weird. They were talking about it because we were about to drive past and lo and behold, it was the Bishop's summer house. So glad I never lived in that place. A story sort of tied to the 400 plus year old house. My mum had recently had my little brother and she had gone from full-time workaholic to home mum. So she had gotten to fitness and well-being to keep herself entertained in the little free time she got. One of the things she decides to take up 
was Reiki sessions. I know very little about it, so excuse my ignorance of the subject. The story goes that she, that she was in the living room having the session when the Reiki guy said he had a strange comment to make if my mum wouldn't mind. He said, I'm seeing the image of a man dressed as a Quaker in the corner of the room. Is that significant to you at all? Now, I don't know if there's a history of Quakers in that area, so I can't say if the guy was seeing a spirit of a ghost of a local person. For people that don't know, I believe that Quakers are a Christian subsect that believe the light of God is in all of us individually, not as a dogmatic experience. My mum was freaked out because at a kid until the age of around five, she says she used to have an imaginary friend, whose name I know but will not share, that was a Quaker man that used to play with her, etc. Make of that what you will. It doesn't freak me out, but it makes me positively freaked, if that makes any sense. An unexplainable feeling that isn't a negative one. Next, we go to a local smoke spot I used to visit in my early 20s. This place was rural and a drive away from main roads. We went to a small parking area next to some train tracks. You could either stay at the parking area and be surrounded by fields behind and forest to the front and sides, with the train tracks going through the forest. Or if you crossed the tracks, you could follow a trail through the woods to the local river. One summer evening, myself and a friend made the trip to the river and enjoyed a lovely smoke in serene nature. We had a great time, so we were in a good mood heading back. It wasn't dark yet, about 9pm, but it doesn't get dark until 10.30ish around here in summer. We were walking back down the trail, and it was like we were in full conversation until we walked past a certain tree, at which point we sort of just died off talking to each other and began walking in silence. Although this trail passes through woods, it was by no means a scary trail. We had walked this way many times during the day and never thought anything of it. I sometimes feel places are eerie during the day, which is why it shocked me how much we were crapping our pants walking along this trail. We managed to hold it down until the car came into view. But at that point, it was like the subconscious mind kicked in and went into run motherfucker mode for both of us. I almost dropped my keys, fumbling them in my hands, trying to open the car doors. We got into the car and away without incident, but both still talk about how the atmosphere changed so dramatically. But neither one of us wanted to say that we were shitting it until we both ran like lost lambs. This just sets the scene for the weird story that took place here. Another time I had finished work at midnight and went to meet a friend for a smoke at the parking area near the train tracks. Unfortunately, I arrived first, so before I had even parked up, I knew that my mind was going to be focused on what lay just the other side of the tracks I was parked next to. I reluctantly parked up and began to roll the joint. It was summer, so even at night it wasn't super cold. I had my driver's side window open, the opposite side of the tracks. My engine wasn't running, so it was just me skinning up in darkness, listening to crickets chirp. I thought I heard something, so I looked up. The view I should have had was across a small field and then woods straight ahead on both sides. It was of course dark, so anything beyond 30 feet from me was black. Out of nowhere, the following appeared. One by one, a blinding flash of light took place at the edge of the woods, about 15 lights starting from left to right. As one finished lighting up, the next in line would ignite, and then the next one, and then the next one. Each flash came with a noise, which I can't really describe, sadly. It became fast. I'd say the first one flashed, then there was a second delay, then the other 14 or so all flashed within about two seconds. My brain enters warp speed and decides lampers. Lampers are dudes that ride around farmland and trucks, sometimes legally, with big spotlights on top. They're generally looking for hare, rabbit and other game to hunt at night, and they use the big lamps to catch the creature's eyes in the darkness. Seems logical, 
until I then realized that there's no way 15 lampers are parked side by side in a small field, not wide enough to fit those trucks pointing their lamps at me. Brain was out of options at that point, so I fired the ignition and drifted my BMW 5 Series out of the car park at speed, with the lights off I might add. I didn't want to be sending communication to whatever the fuck was in that forest. Met my friend driving the other way up the road. He asks what's happening and I explain. He looks at me like I've already had too much to smoke. We decide to head up there, him leading the way so I turn around, follow. We get to the parking area and he has his lights pointing across their field. And there was nothing there. So even if someone had equipment required to pull that as a stunt, they wouldn't have been able to get away in the three minutes between me leaving and returning. Also, the fact there is nowhere to access that point by a vehicle or anywhere close by to park and walk equipment there leads me to think something weird as fuck happened. The house I lived in was a thatched roof house in the UK. It was the oldest house in the town, at over 400 years old. There was a cemented up hole in the cellar, which was originally a tunnel to the local church, which was used for something to do with priests escaping during a line of persecution. Excuse my lack of history knowledge here, probably Protestant versus Catholic clash of some sort. General eerie vibe when we were alone in the house. Not negative, but definitely bizarre. Once, my parents went on holiday and I watched the pets. Being 15, I had lots of friends over to begin with, all just drinking and getting high. But once the hype died down and I was at home alone, I didn't go upstairs for over a week. I slept on the couch next to the dog's bed in the hope he would be an early alarm of any poor activity. There used to be a pamphlet in the local church with information about the town that had a paragraph about the history of the house. Sadly, I don't remember much about that, other than at one point the building was something to do with a dairy. And at another point early in its history, there was a fire which burnt a large section of the building. The first weird story happened the first day we moved in. Being a teenager in the early 2000s, my focus was making sure the TV and entertainment setup was sorted out, so I put all the DVDs and VHS tapes in a cupboard behind the TV as my first self-appointed task. This cupboard was empty when I put the various DVD boxes etc in there. The next day, I'm in the living room unpacking stuff. My mum asked me what the hell was in the cupboard, not knowing what she meant. I walked over and saw something on the floor in the cupboard. I picked it up and it's an extremely rusted and perished rabbit trap. If you don't know what that looks like, it's like a bear trap with the jaws that snap shut but smaller. My mum seemed kind of weirded out but brushed it off. I know that cupboard was empty when I put all that stuff in there and my dad had been taking the big stuff upstairs, not bits to the living room and he had no idea where it had come from. I have no explanation whatsoever for how that could just appear. Bear this in mind for the other events though. The next one is funny, but paranormal nonetheless. We had stone tiled floor in the living room. My little bro was about six months old, maybe one year, barely crawling. So we had a big rug he used to roll out for him. Over the week, this would pick up dog hair from my dog, who would molt like hell. So we had to hoover this rug like fuck just to keep on top of it. One day, mum had asked me to make sure I hoover the rug before I went out with my friends. It was my only task and I forgot to do it. I got home that evening and said hi to mum, who enthusiastically thanked me for the fantastic job I'd done hoovering the rug for her. I instantly shat myself thinking, oh fuck. She's so pissed she's in sarcastic mode. I start apologizing for not doing it and she just looks puzzled and asks me what I'm talking about. The rug's perfect. I go into the living room and see this rug looking like it's been cleaned with a fine tooth comb to remove all dog hair. 
I tell her I didn't do it, and that I'm sorry, that I have no idea how the rug is clean. I'm absolutely stunned, but grateful nonetheless at this point. My dad hadn't been home and certainly wouldn't have stopped in a randomly hoover a rug. So again, a very bizarre incident. What happened? Did a ghost use the fucking vacuum? Did whatever it was just vaporize the dog hair somehow? The mind baffles. It seems such an irrelevant story, but the fact I know it happened still gets me. The next one is again bizarre, but it was the first one that scared me because it was so specific. My parents were out and I had to walk the dog that day. I decided to leave by the back door, but not lock it. It's a good place to live. Still, being a paranoid stoner, I decided I needed to hide the door keys. The bunch of keys also had the master key for my parents' car, which thanks to Alfa Romeo at the time, would cost more than a thousand pounds to replace if lost. So I decided to hide these keys well. I found a cloth bag used for holding coins and change in and put them in there. I then hid the bag behind some books on a bookshelf. I took the dog out, got home, forgot about it, and went to play Vice City. Mum and Dad get home that evening and ask where the car keys are. I tell them in the bag behind the books on the shelf. They can't find them. I cockily think I've hidden these keys so well that my parents can't find them, so I go swanning downstairs thinking I'm the Mac Daddy. I then go get the bag off of the shelf, only to find there are no keys in there. My heart just fucking sinks. Instantly, I'm convinced someone has watched me through a window somehow and come inside and stolen the keys. There's no other thing that can have happened. My parents assume I'm too stoned and have forgotten and misplaced them and get angry that I've lost the expensive car key and insist that I search the house. But my heart is still sinking because I know there's no point in looking under the cushions or on the sofa or behind the drawers because I put those keys in that bag. I half-heartedly look around the house, feeling upset, not knowing what to do. Also thinking some thief can take our car or break into the house at any time, and it's my fault. After about 30 minutes of my parents swearing, my dad shouts from upstairs that he's found them, in the back pocket of a pair of jeans underneath their bed in the bedroom. My parents look freaked, but brush it off. I'm super freaked at this shit, with zero fucking idea of how this happens. I was super relieved to have not lost the keys, but that made me realize that whatever that thing or those things doing this were, they were able to interact with physical objects in strange ways. I don't know how to describe it better than that. Apart from that, several times I heard conversations at night below my bedroom, but the room was an empty spare room. My bedroom door bust open at night on a few occasions, shocking me awake. This literally scared the fucking shit out of me. A strange coincidence was being at a party one night, age 16, and getting talking to some friends of friends. We're sharing ghost stories. I shared mine and then these two brothers had stories about this house they'd lived in, which had paranormal activity. It sounded worse than my house. The conversation carried on and it turned out that they lived in the same fucking house I was living in, about four years prior to my parents buying it. Things never got as bad as the brothers described, but I'll never forget that moment we realized we were talking about the same place. When I lived at this property, it was the first and only time I think I saw a ghost, but strangely enough, it wasn't in the property. I had taken the dog for a walk on the usual route, which took a path through some local woods. The path was one of those raised wooden walkways which weaved through forest and mildly boggy terrain. This was a path I had walked many times before and sometimes felt a bit off key, but put it down to paranoia. This particular day, it was around 6 p.m. in the summer, so it was still light. My dog stopped at the very start of the trail to take a shit, so I'm stood waiting and looking around at the woods. I look down the trail and something catches my eye. At first, it looks like branches moving in the wind and I'm squinting, trying to make out what it is. And I'm sure it's branches moving, so I look away. When I look back up the trail, it looks like the branches are closer, 
So I'm moving around a bit, trying to get a closer look. The dog's still having a shit. I take a step forward and into focus. I see three women wearing those old style bell bottom dresses, side by side with their arms linked, moving at pace towards me. It's hard to describe. They were whitish, translucent, but still detailed enough for me to see that they were women in old clothes from a distance of probably 100 to 150 meters away, and they were moving fast. I'd always wanted to see a ghost, but the instant my brain realized what it was seeing, any previous idea on what I thought I wanted soon dissipated into the fumes of dog shit I was inhaling. I bolted, dragging the dog who was still having a shit. This all happened in about 10 seconds, and I ran until I got to the main road. I got home, and my mum said I looked pale and asked me if I was okay. She believed me, but looked more freaked out than me once I told her, so she didn't mention it again. I could see it play out in my head, and I always remember how scary it was, thinking you were actually seeing something that shatters what you know about life. A weird story I have from a friend of mine involves his mum's house. It's probably a 40 year old house, but the local area is all old Saxon land. Lots of marking stones around the place. His front yard had a tree that was very old and rumored to have been used for hanging at some point. He had lots of incidents of items moving or disappearing, hearing voices, hearing footsteps, etc. I wasn't there for this event, but my friend and three other friends were at this place and I arrived about five minutes afterwards to find them all looking shell-shocked in deep discussion, moving around the room. They were all sat watching TV when the wire on the telephone started to lift up in front of them and then begin to twist around and float in the air. One of them notices first and then asks if he's going crazy and asks if anyone else sees it. And then the others notice. It does this for 10 seconds or so before dropping to the floor. The discussion I walked into was them opening doors and windows, trying to recreate a gust of air to mimic the move movements the phone wire made, but they couldn't. It was weird to walk into a room and see four people you know and trust having that conversation because I knew they weren't lying. It's something that still gets brought up in conversation every few years. Another house I lived in had an odd vibe. There was all old suitcases of clothes and old tat from residents in the attic from who knows when. But I remember there was a bus pass or passport of an older guy lying around. I'm 99% certain he's a ghost that stole a 10 bag of weed off of me here. It's easy to stereotypically say that I was probably high and lost it. But that time in my life, I knew exactly where every 0.01 grams of bud I owned was. I went to bed with this bag on the table at the foot of my bed. And when I woke up, it was gone. I rooted around and tore the place apart and didn't find it. The day I moved out of that house, I thought I'm finally gonna find that bud. I didn't. I remember standing in my empty bedroom and saying something like, that wasn't yours. I hope you enjoyed it. I went downstairs with the last bits and then went returning to the top floor to empty the spare room. Next door to my room, all I could smell was intense old beer smell. There was no beer spilled up there, so I took that as a sign of some old guy's ghost who liked to drink, who probably thought they'd try the herbal remedies for a change. A friend stayed the night in that spare room and woke in the middle of the night to see an old guy in full golfing clothes stood staring at him. He jumped up screaming, turned on the light and was gone. Those are my ghostly paranormal experiences. Like I said, not the scariest stories, but still weird as fuck. My dad lives in the Scottish Highlands, has done for the last 20 plus years. And I drive the 14 hour round trip to visit as often as possible maybe two or three times a year. I've always loved this journey, especially if I'm by myself, as there's around two to three hours of motorway, highway, followed by back roads through the mountains, through forests and around locks where I can put music on and pretty much just switch off. For the most part, there's little to no phone signal, 
So I generally download a couple of playlists before I go, pop my phone in its holder and blindly follow the sat nav until it loses signal. I've been doing this journey for years, so really I have no requirement for the sat nav, but I love to try and beat the ETA. It can also be quite handy when it has signal to let me know if there are any accidents or diversions ahead. Anyhow, on this particular journey, I was coming home. I'd set off at nightfall as there's less traffic on the overnight journeys and less chance to get stuck behind holiday makers, especially caravans. I fucking hate caravans. I was traveling south in January and the weather was something else. My car showed an outside temperature of minus 12 degrees Celsius, 10 Fahrenheit, and the snow barely stopped. It hadn't stopped since I arrived at my dad's house four days earlier. My wipers were on full speed, but still the snow kept piling up on my windscreen, meaning I had to drive around half my usual speed. Every now and then, there'd be a short break in the snowfall and everything just looked magical. It was like driving through a Christmas card. Looking down into the valleys, everything covered in a thick white blanket and lit up by the dim glow of the overhead moon, making it possible to still make out the river weaving its way through the cracks in the deepest crevices, reflecting what little white light there was. On these roads, there's nothing in terms of lighting and what's worse, there can quite often be a large drop on either side of the road. Couple this with three to four feet of fresh snowfall and an inability to see any of the road and you've got the potential of a lot of accidents. In order to combat this, there's eight foot high sticks at the sides of the road with a reflective tape at the top, red on one side and white on the other. Drive between these and you should be okay. So I was driving and driving. The snow just hadn't given up and I was focusing on the red and white reflective tape to keep on the road. Up ahead, I saw the dim tail lights of another car. A welcome sight as it was the first I'd seen in over an hour. Everyone else must have known that it was a bad idea to be out in this. Instead of focusing on the reflective sticks, I was now focusing on the tail lights of the car ahead. I couldn't quite work out what make or model was. A lightish, white or light grey SUV of some sort. Holiday makers. I thought this because I could make out their roof box and bike rack. They too must have ignored the warnings to not drive tonight. When I sped up to try and make some ground between us, it seemed to speed up too. If I slowed down, they slowed down too. The space between us remained a constant. I decided that my headlights must have been annoying them in the rear view mirror so kept the distance as it was, blindly following their lights while being mindful to try and keep my tires in the most shallow bits of snow on the road, avoiding the occasional snow mound. A bit of time lapsed, I have no idea how much, as I'd now switched off entirely, listening to my mix of 90s old school dance, the howl of the wind and splat of snow on my windscreen and in between wiper washers, watching the red lights ahead of me, glowing in the dark like the eyes of a demonic beast, intent on keeping its distance. I noticed the car ahead start to take a turn off the road and felt a sudden sense of sadness and loneliness. I was losing my travel buddy, the only other sign of human life I'd had seen for the last few hours. I then realized that, having been so intent on following the car in front, I had no idea where I was, which wasn't an issue. I essentially just had to stay on the same road for three hours until I reached a fork in the road, turn right and then onto the main road and see a little roundabout. Bizarrely though, my sat nav now just displayed lost GPS signal and had me as a dot on a white background. Convenient, as everything was covered in snow. It never did this, it had usually downloaded enough of the route to at least keep the map on screen. It was then I got an overwhelming urge to follow the car ahead. I knew I shouldn't. I literally had no turnings I needed to make off the road and I really didn't recognize the road that they were taking. And the more I think of it, I've never noticed a turn off that goes down the side of a mountain like this did, but maybe I just never looked. I decided to follow it. Of course I did. If I ever think that I shouldn't do something because it could end up in regret, 
I'll probably do it. Although, as I neared the turning, I started to doubt myself and thought I should stay on my road, but no matter how much I wanted to keep the wheels going straight, my hands and body wouldn't allow it. I turned off. I didn't recognize this new road. I didn't recognize my old road when I was on that either. So it really made no difference. Everything was white. Everything was dark. Lots of trees and the reflective sticks. If anything, it looked exactly the same, like I hadn't turned off at all. 10 to 15 minutes later, the car ahead started pulling away from me. Only slowly, but faster than I wanted to drive in these conditions, so I let it. It couldn't really get away anyway, as there was nowhere to go up this road, so I figured I'd see it again shortly. Another 10 minutes or so passed of driving alone, and then, in the distance, I spotted lights again, and this time I was catching up quickly. The lights were flashing in the dark distance, amber, nothing, amber, nothing. Great. My travel buddy has got their hazard lights on and they've stopped. I decided I'd have to pull over and see what was wrong. As I pulled up behind my buddy, a white Audi, possibly a Q3 or Q5, I'm not sure. I noticed the amount of snow on their car, surely far too much for them to have just stopped. And there's no tire tracks for me to pull into, but it was 100% the same car I'd been following. I came to a stop just as a woman in a big blue coat ran to my window waving her arms. I'm not the most empathetic of people, but it didn't take much to read the relief on her face and see that she'd been crying. She'd had to pull over because she had a puncture and then explained she'd been waiting there, unable to call anyone as there's no signal and thought she'd have to wait until morning before she could leave. She's had her ignition on while she listened to music and tried to keep the DVD player running for her little one. Pressing the heated seat button each time, it turned itself off until it wouldn't come back on. The battery had died. I thought she was being a bit traumatic. It was literally only a few minutes since she'd pulled away from me. She can't have been here long. Over four and a half hours. That's how long she said they'd been there. Over four and a half hours sat in her car with her 18 month child in minus 12 temperatures with no phone signal, food or drink, and no way to heat the inside of the car up. So this wasn't the car in front of me for the last two hours, but it looked exactly the same, even down to the dark gray roof box and bike rack. Coincidence, a big one, but that's all I can logically think. I suddenly felt angry, angry that the car in front of me hadn't stopped to help. Maybe they thought I would. That's a bit presumptuous of them. I asked her if she'd tried to flag them down. A look of confusion or concern spread across her face, but she told me there hadn't been a single car go past while she'd been there. But I've been, I stopped myself from going any further, from explaining that I had been following a car that didn't exist for over two hours. She was scared enough from being sat there in the dark for the last few hours. I jumped out and looked in her car, assisted by the light from my headlights. I saw her little one was fast asleep. I asked her if she wanted some coffee from my flask. She said yes. I knelt down in the snow. She'd already tried removing the nuts and had left the wrench on the floor next to the wheel. It was covered in a layer of snow and freezing cold. I jacked up the car removed the tire and replaced it with the pitiful space saver from the boot. I lit a smoke and pulled my car next to hers, connected the batteries and instructed her to start up her car. Once it came back to life, we stood and spoke, asked her where she was going. Sterling, she replied. Brilliant, I'll follow behind you. Again, I thought, that's on my route. She thanked me for helping her, for talking to her and for calming her down. She thanked me for the coffee and gave me a quick hug. Quick enough to be meaningful, short enough to not be overly awkward from a stranger. She got in her car and set off. I got in my car. I sat for a moment staring at the all too familiar taillights of the white greyish SUV with a roof box and bike rack. I lit up a smoke and set off. I sped up. I caught her up. I slowed down. She pulled away. 
her speed remained a constant. I kept wondering how she hadn't seen the other car. The other car was exactly the same as her car. I kept wondering how I know, knew where we were, but yet we hadn't turned off or turned on to any other roads. As we neared the civilization of the A roads, I started to become more aware of the tracks left by my new travel buddy, the tracks in the snow left by their tires, the tracks in the snow that I'm 99% sure certain weren't there when I was following her or the other her. Before I stopped and offered her coffee, the snow eased as we entered a town called Kilmahog. We reached a junction and she turned right, I turned right. We were now driving in sleet, wet snow that leaves a dirty gray and brown slush on the ground. Wet snow that makes seeing much harder than normal, dry snow. As we approached the roundabout, she indicated left for the first turning. I indicated right for the last and pulled up alongside her. She looked, waved goodbye and left. Someone, or rather something, took me away that night, diverted from my normal route, made me feel as though I had no other option but to follow that car, guided me into a stranded woman and her child in freezing conditions with no food, water or heating. I'm still unsure how to explain it. I've not really thought about it too much. I don't like not being able to understand things or give them a logical explanation. It makes me feel uneasy. I certainly never thought too much about the paranormal. I've always presumed if the paranormal was real, it would present itself to me if it needed to. I'd live in a blissful ignorance, but now I don't want to. And me, that's worse than knowing. Half of my childhood home, the half my bedroom was in, was built in the 1800s and was originally a farmhouse. The house itself is on the very top of a steep hill and the woods around it, which I often explored as a kid, had the original stone fences from the farmhouse, which in the broken bits, I often found obsidian rock known for spiritual protection, which isn't necessarily important to this story, but an interesting fact considering what I experienced as a kid there. The first paranormal events I remember happened when I was about six. My sister and I still shared the same room. This room, which I'll just call the purple room as it was originally, although painted over a very deep dark purple. One night, my sister woke up me yelling. At first I was confused and tired until I heard what she was yelling about. Coming from the window was the sound of wet hands squeaking in an aggressive way or pattern. It wasn't raining and the room was on the second floor away from the trees. It was too high for anyone to climb and make such a noise. So both petrified, we ran to tell our parents and have them check. But the noise stopped as soon as my dad came to check. So we went back to bed and not even five minutes later, it started again. And so we ran and had our dad check. And just as previously, it was silent, nothing. This cycle happened one more time before we just slept downstairs. But whatever it was, was very strategic about its actions and who it wanted to present to. The second paranormal event happened shortly after my sister moved her bed to the room beside mine. In other words, it happened as soon as it was only me in the purple room. I was around seven or eight, I think, and was crying whilst putting away my laundry. I can't quite recall the reason I was crying, but I remember it being something petty. Perhaps it was because I had to do laundry. Regardless, I suddenly stopped for no apparent reason, as I remember still feeling upset. But I stared blankly around the room. You know that blank stare you'd make as a kid trying not to cry while being scolded? It was that kind of blank stare. Anyways, I then looked up and saw a hooded old man. He was maybe five foot six, but only visible from the shoulders up. He was like a hologram in a way, 
see-through, but extremely clear. And a white, slight, pale, bluish color. I don't know if he emitted light, as it was broad daylight when this happened, but he was extremely detailed, and I could still remember the pores on his large nose and sagging cheeks. He had thin lips with deep smile lines, I think they're called, and his eyes weren't visible, but his eye bags were. His eyes themselves were covered by the hood he was wearing, and the hood itself was rounded and sat flat over his head, and wasn't pointed or anything. He then just disappeared after a minute. I wasn't scared, but he just had a sour old man vibe, and once he disappeared, I just finished my laundry calmly and went back downstairs. After this sighting, I had named him Newman. Not sure where the name came from, but it felt specifically with an uppercase for whatever reason. After that, I started talking to him and them. I don't know where them came from, but yeah. Outloads about my day and random things. I found outside. He and them never talked back, but I could tell it was appreciated when I did. And the days I didn't, I felt someone waiting. I would apologize and say I'd talk to you tomorrow. Around this age, maybe eight or nine, my friend and I started using a spirit board at recess. This is what I think started the Shadow Man sightings. The spirit I knew wasn't Newman. Newman had a comforting feeling in his sternness. The spirit was just fear inducing. It would lay under my bed in a way where its head would be visible from the shoulders up. And although it was just a black mass, you could distinguish its limbs and head and stuff. Anyways, it would stay in that position at night until I would spot it, and then it would rush underneath my bed in reverse. By that I mean its feet would rush to the head of the bed, so its shoulders and up were also under the bed, if that makes sense. But when it did this, it would make rushing moving noises on the stuff underneath my bed. Garbage bags that stored stuffed animals that I rotated on my bed, and a hard plastic bin with winter blankets and clothes. It was a very distinct and disturbing sound and whoosh. This shadow man slash figure would also knock on the walls a lot. I have a video of these knocks on my old iPod somewhere, but these knocks had the same fear inducing vibes and were not Newman either. This never went away, but the fear became manageable and the experiences lessened the less scared I was. It was during that same period when I saw a Newman for a second time. I was up late on my iPod and felt a presence to my right, which I feel like I should add that to my right was a wall, my bed was pushed against. Anyways, so I looked to my right and there was a single eye, an old man's left eye, piercing back at me in an annoyed and frustrated expression, and was the same hologram hyper-realistic experience of the sighting I had of him before. It made me jolt, but I didn't feel threatened by it. Like before, just felt like I was being lectured, but it disappeared as quick as it came. After that, I turned my phone off and went to bed. I did tell my parents the next day, but I was ignored. These next two incidents happened when I was 12 to 13, and they happened outside of the purple room, and are the only two that have happened in the house outside of the room although they both both still on the side that was built in the 1800s, which is strange. Anyways, the first incident, I was upstairs and home alone. I was in the purple room and heard papers being shuffled downstairs. Confused as I was home alone, I paused my music to get a better listen. But after I paused the music, the shuffling of the papers got louder and became aggressive. As if someone was throwing paper after paper in a fit trying to look for something frantically or just annoyed at something. I then walked out of my room over to the top of the stairs to look down to see if I could see anything. The noises still continued and I could now tell that the noise was coming from the right side of the staircase, which to the right is a home office area at the end of a hallway, and right beside the front door, which is important to the next story. Anyways, I still didn't see anything, but could still hear it, so I took a step down the stairs and it immediately stopped, as if, as if it knew I was there. 
So then I ran back to my room and jammed the door shut till someone came home. But no one had broken in upon checking, so it was dismissed by my parents. The second incident, I was downstairs in the kitchen when I heard loud, aggressive knocks on the front door. The one beside the home office where I heard the papers. My sister was supposed to be dropped off by a friend that day, so I went over to the front door, figuring she was annoyed. I locked it and opened it and looked around on the screen porch, but she wasn't there. So I checked the door on the screen porch that leads to the outside, and it was locked, so I knew it wasn't her or a person, as it was a brick house and the porch was half brick, so no one could get into it without you hearing it or noticing a cut screen panel. So, freaked out, and aware that it's not good to open a door for a spirit and let them into your home, especially not one that's knocking angrily. I went back to the front door that leads inside and said, you're not allowed in, leave. Then I shut and locked the door again. I then returned to the kitchen and immediately the door handle started violently shaking up and down. And the door was shaking as if someone was trying to push it. I went back and shouted, get out. Kind of hopelessly, not going to lie. But after that, it only continued for under a minute, post. And then it stopped abruptly. For whatever reason, I felt like the paper shuffling of the door were related as I got the same aggressive and frantic slash annoyed feeling from them. The last two incidents that happened before I moved were both involving Newman. I was 15 or 16 and I hadn't had any contact with Newman in a while. I wasn't sure if he was still there or if it was just the more sinister spirits now. So home alone one day, I told him out loud I doubted his presence, but would still like to hear from him. I asked him that if he was still here, to move my desk chair. I told him he had 30 minutes and that I would go downstairs and would come up after 30 minutes. And so I did. And when I came back upstairs, the chair was in the center of my room. Me thinking I might have misplaced the chair in the center instead of the desk, then asked him to move it again back to my desk to confirm it was him. And again, I gave him 30 minutes. And when I came back upstairs, it was back at the desk where I'd asked him to move it. Seeing it move the second time made me go as pale as a ghost. The chair, although small and with wheels, was an old chair, so it was pretty heavy at the base. I was never able to lift it more than two feet. After that, I just said thank you and that I received the sign, but it was still just shaken. The last incident was the same sighting of his left eye, but this time to the right side of my bed. I would up higher than my eye level and looking down. Not like it was before staring eye to eye. This time it also didn't make me jump, but I can't remember what I was doing before I just remember seeing him. Then him disappearing, then me turning off the light and going to bed. Thankfully, I've since moved out of the spooky apartment where a few of my experiences took place. However, on my final day of moving, our special roommate decided to give me one last fright. I had returned to grab the last boxes, lock up the doors and pass the keys off to the landlord. I was alone in the apartment with my sister, waiting for me in the car outside. I had been making trips up and down bringing the last of our stuff and finally, there was just one box upstairs, in the back bedroom. I went into the room to grab the box and somehow this box had been unpacked and refolded. The part that freaked me out though is that the box contained statuettes of various Greek and Roman deities. These statuettes were pulled from the box, individually unwrapped and placed facing backwards along the wall on the floor where the table that had held them used to sit. Why backwards? That part seemed really strange to me. I could understand not wanting us to take them with us, perhaps so laying them out makes sense, sort of, but why backwards? Anyway, the door had been locked and I helped my girlfriend pack that box. I distinctly remember taping it shut and pushing it against the wall near the door. 
even if my landlord had randomly decided to check our progress on the move or something and came in the house, why would he unpack our stuff? I asked the downstairs neighbour on our way if he'd heard anything upstairs overnight or while we were gone and he said it had been the quietest it had been all year. Before the move, I was working at a country club. My work usually had me downstairs alone in the basement's prep kitchen. On my first day, one of the senior employees gave me a quick tour of the place, which was massive and easy to get lost in. The employee, we'll call her G, was very hesitant to take me to the basement's prep kitchen. She even asked another senior employee if he'd show me to the basement's kitchen instead. But he was busy, so she got stuck with it. So we make our way down the stairs around some corners and we wind up in a small kitchen. The kitchen is surrounded by a well-lit, well-used storage or dishwashing area, a dim and barely used dining hall, and a big set of double doors that lead to the sub-basement storage. Like I said, the place was way too big. The layout is kind of important though, so to be brief and accurate, if you are standing in front of the oven, there's a prep table to your left on the other side of which there is a well-lit dish slash storage. To your right is another prep table against a wall. On the other side of the wall is the entrance to the dim dining hall and the double doors to the sub-basements. So while working the prep station, you can see the dish and storage area, but not the dining hall or sub-basement door, as they were around the corner. So to get to the dining hall, you'd have to cross in front of the sub-basement door. Now during my little tour, G had told me that she doesn't like going down there at all, and that she absolutely refuses to go in the dining hall alone, or the sub-basement at all. We joked a little about how spooky it was down there, but then her tone got really serious and she said, no, but seriously, stay away from the doors and ignore everything you hear from down there. Straight out of a horror movie, but okay. My first day on the job, I'm not asking dumb questions about spooky sub-basements. So I work my first shift without incident, as well the next two weeks without any problems. But on the first day of my third week, I went down to the basement prep to start working. It was three in the afternoon and I was pretty excited about that day as we had an event going on and it'd be my first time working in action station. So I wasn't thinking about spooky basement doors or anything, just happily slicing ham for the day and thinking about the night to come. Over the hum of the slicer, I thought I heard one of my coworkers walk behind me I even thought I saw a flicker of movement on my right. I thought it was weird that they were headed that way. I hadn't seen anybody go into the sub-basements or dining hall yet, but I figured they were probably grabbing something for the event. So I just kept slicing. That's when I heard a loud thump, like someone had taken a rubber dodgeball and threw it against the door. It made me jump and I wasn't sure where it came from, so I turned off the slicer and listened closely. I didn't hear it again, so I went back to switch on the slicer, but right as I touched it, there was another thump. For sure that time, I knew it came from around the corner, by the sub-basement and the dining hall. In my mind, it was obvious that someone had gotten stuck in the basement or dining hall and needed me to open the door for them. So I pulled off my gloves and went around the corner to check which door they needed open. I tried the dining hall door first and poked my head in when there wasn't anyone waiting on the other side. It was dim in there, but the room was empty except for the few tables pushed against the walls. So I closed the door and moved over the sub-basement doors, which had a small window set above each doorknob kind of like the doors they have in classrooms and such. But when I tried the door, it was locked. I thought it was weird to keep the door locked, but then I remembered what G had said and got a little spooked. I started to walk away from the door when I heard that same thump only twice as loud against the doors behind me. 
I wanted to keep walking, but my brain told me to turn around and look. The doors were still shut, and I couldn't see anything through the window from where I stood. I was very freaked out at that point, and decided to take an early break to have a smoke. While out on break, I talked to another co-worker of mine, whom we will call Jay. Jay had been employed at the club for over 10 years, so I asked him about the sub-basements, and once again, the tone changed, and he just sort of looked down away and said, just don't go down there, Mr. W. A fun little quirk of his is calling everyone Mr. and Mrs. I've been here 10 years, and I've only gone down there once. Now hearing Jay talk like that was weird. He was a large tattooed ex-bouncer. Not the kind to be scared of a bear, much less a spooky dark basement. So I finished my smoke and begrudgingly went back down to finish my prep, extra motivated to get done quickly. I came down the stairs and as I was rounding the corner to head down to the hall, I seen someone clear as day down at the other end walk around the corner headed to the basement and dining hall. They looked to be wearing all black clothes and a black cap, which is the kitchen staff uniform, so I thought for sure that was one of my co-workers looking for me or something. So I called out to them, hey, I'm over here, what you need? There was no response. So I thought maybe they didn't hear me. So I kept going past my station and rounded the corner to find no one standing there. I poked my head in the dining hall again and of course found no one. Now I was legitimately terrified and started to freak out a bit. So I started to head back to my station when once again I heard the thump against the doors. This time it occurred to me that it must be my chef messing with me. He was a notorious prankster and there's always a bit of hazing when it comes to new kitchen crew. He must get everybody with this gag. Jay had to be in on it and G must have been another victim. That was my thought process when I turned around and walked to the doors and put my face up to the glass and cupped my hands around it to block out the glare. I couldn't see anything through the black at all, not even the first few stairs, which I thought was weird. Shouldn't at least a little light make it through the window from the hallway lights? I mustered up my bravest voice and said, very funny, Chef B, but I seen you that time. I waited for a response, but no one said anything. I started to get a weird feeling, like I was standing next to a huge electrical charge or something. It was like I was getting tickled by TV static. That's the only way I can describe it. I pulled my face away from the window and glanced behind me to make sure no one was trying to sneak up on me. But when I put my face back to the glass, my heart dropped. I could see the stairs now, which means that as I was peeking through the glass, Someone or something was standing right on the other side, blocking out the light from the hallway and giving the illusion that I was looking into darkness. The only problem with that is whatever or whoever it was would have to be large to block the whole window in its entirety. With that realization, I practically sprinted through the basement and back up the stairs to the main kitchen where I found the entire kitchen crew happily at work, even Chef B. I told Jay about what had happened and G must have overheard me because she just quietly said, I told you to ignore anything you hear down there. The first story is the most unsettling for me. On our days off right after high school, my cousin and I would routinely drive my parents' golf cart around the neighborhood and into the back of the large neighborhood because it was abandoned and completely overgrown. We knew all the abandoned construction trails through the forest and where they met back up to the roads that were completely unbothered by any suburban houses. It was broad daylight, probably around 2 or 3 p.m., and we had parked the golf carts coming off of a trail and toward the concrete roads into the back part of the neighborhood. 
The grass on the unused lots was covered in weeds and grass that was probably five or six feet tall off the ground. We unleash the pipe, take a few hits, all is peaceful. The birds are singing, the air is clear. He takes another hit and passes it to me. I start to light the bowl, and before I take a hit, I hear my cousin say my name twice, very seriously. I panic and think the cops have just pulled up or something. I look at him and he's staring straight ahead, shocked, and just says in a low voice, what the fuck is that, cuz? I look up and down the road and I see it. It's a little man peering out from the grass on the left side of the road, about 20 feet away. It looks like he's a naked humanoid completely covered in mud and crouched down as low as a person can go while still being mobile. It's not human, but it's human shaped. With both of us staring at this creature, he backs up slightly and then, still disturbs me to remember this, Rody runs faster than humanly possible across the concrete road and into the grass on the other side. It was like a human moving as fast as an insect does when it panics. Imagine crouching down as far as you can go without falling over and then sprinting. This thing appeared to do just that. No words needed. I disengage the parking brake and gas it. We drive all the way to the front of the neighborhood to the community center area, probably a mile away, and decide we should just go home. Lots of frustrated, what the fuck was that? Followed because there was no rational explanation at all. We still talk about that story all the time. Funnily enough, about a year ago, my parents moved to a bigger house about 100 feet from where this happened. Once the neighborhood started building back there again. The second story must have been about six or seven years ago, maybe a year or two after the first one. Very general timeline, but you get the idea. I was hanging out with a friend and his girlfriend, as well as his weed dealer, which was a guy I'd known for a long time also. I'd stopped smoking weed by then, but everyone was good company and I'd have a few beers while they did their thing. After a while, it became apparent that we would have to give the dealer a ride back and we decided that we'd all go together and just take my car, so we did. It must have been nine or 10 in the evening. The dealer's house is a straight shot down a main road for about 15 minutes. We get onto the main road through the city and everything's completely normal for a while. We're almost to the neighborhood and suddenly, police lights. Oh fuck. We pull over into a well-lit gas station right in the middle and the whole routine unfolds. The officer accused me of pulling out in front of somebody trying to make a right turn, despite us having all green lights and riding in the middle of a three lane road. His reason for pulling us over was soon incomprehensible but he ended up recognizing the guy in the front seat, the dealer, who fortunately didn't have anything on him. So cuts are waiting around and three more cop cars and the drug sniffing dog. Of course, the dog hits off on nothing and we get the whole kit and caboodle of stepping out while they search the car. Here's where the fun starts because they begin pulling out a lot of my occult stuff, like an athami and wooden chest full of sigils and candles and some other mobile all-purpose stuff. <laughs> what are you guys, some kind of devil worshippers? I roll my eyes. I open the trunk for them. Nothing in there but a black robe and a Ouija board that I've used for years. Of course, they take both out and wave it around and make fun of it all some more. The encounter ends without any great dramatization because they expectedly found nothing. I loathed that they had tossed around all my tools but I'm a pretty level-headed practitioner. We drive the dealer to his house and part ways and head back to my friend's house to mess around and have a few beers. I head home at around two or three and go to bed. Let me forewarn you that I've never had sleep paralysis or apnea. I don't dream particularly all that often or spectacularly and I can't recall a single instance of experiencing a hallucination in my life. So when I see things, I know there's more to it. I don't wake up, I'm still asleep. I feel like my spirit is brought to the surface of a deep water. I open my eyes and sit up, but I can't see. There's a really weird noise, 
a rhythmic whooshing that's bringing me to full wakefulness. My vision slowly expands outward from the center with a blue tinge, very unusual. I immediately become aware of the fact that I'm not alone and I look into the room that expands out from the foot of my bed. It glows blue because of the moonlight coming in from the windows at the opposite end. A few feet out from the foot of the bed is a high top round table with two high top stools on either side. I can hardly see it though because there's a perfectly silhouetted goat man looking being, perhaps seven feet tall and very wide, sitting on the high top stool closest to me and facing my direction. He has moose like horns and it's the source of the whooshing as he is breathing very heavily, just like a runner after a hard run. I can't see his features, but he's obviously looking right at me and I'm looking at him. I blink. I'm experiencing sleep paralysis, I think. I blink more. I become very afraid and there was really a seven foot tall goat man sitting in my bedroom. Is this just not a usual predicament that I have to face? I probably stare for about 10 seconds before I get hit with a sort of communicated feeling that the being had just come from doing something very awful to some people, one person in particular, and then rushed here to alert me of it. The breathing slows a little after another 10 seconds and the being moves to get off the stool, the table behind him shifting and creaking as it does so. As soon as he hits the ground, he just fades out. I'm baffled, I'm afraid, but I'm relieved. I get up and turn the lights on, walk around the house and everything is effectively normal. I sit and think about the whole thing and the police incident didn't even connect in my head for probably five or 10 minutes. I go out for a smoke to observe the lake out back and the sky because the moon is bright and beautiful. It might have been a full moon, but I can't really remember. I calm down and go back to bed, having been relieved by connection of events that I made. I don't remember what time this happened because I never looked, but it seemed like the middle of the night. I never had any further happenings in the vein of this experience or seeing anything in the night. And I've never seen the being again. The last story wasn't super long after the Guardian of the Ouija board, probably less than a year. I worked at a movie theater during this whole period and I had taken to jogging at like 2 or 3 a.m. after work. Perfectly serene, safe, and there was never anybody awake or driving around. The house was on a small triangle-shaped configuration of roads situated around a lake with only one road going through the forest to get back to the main neighborhood. The road was out on the other side of the lake from where I was. Anyways, I come out from the garage and start walking down the road and shortly come up to the first right turn. The orange of the street lamps keeps the roads pretty decently lit, but the orange lamps cast a spooky feeling. As I round the corner on the sidewalk, I see another jogger down the way on the other side of the road. I think about how odd it is to see another jogger at this time of night. So I slow down and kind of stare. It occurs very quickly that this is not another jogger because most joggers are not eight foot tall ghostly shadow beings taking six foot steps. Due to the confusion, I don't even feel anything as I watch this tall, lanky shadow being run all the way down the road, right in front of me and in between two houses and into the woods. He made absolutely no sound at all. As he passed right in front of me down the middle of the road, I saw that where his hands and feet should be, there was nothing but a fade to mist. Otherwise, he was just a three-dimensional absence of light. After seeing that and taking a moment to process, I decided that if an interdimensional shadow being was running at full sprint away from something, I probably should too. So I turned around and noped out of there and back to my garage to sit in existential terror. After about 30 minutes, I decided that I was going to conquer my fear and run around the triangle like I intended to before having a paranormal incident. I succeeded, terrified, and luckily nothing happened on that attempt.
In 2014, my brother sadly lost his battle with depression. It was very difficult for our whole family. There was a lot of anger towards one girl because she did something pretty horrible that ended up basically pushing him to do it. Also, my mom was a Christian and was very worried about where my brother would end up because she was always taught in school that if you committed suicide, you didn't go to heaven. My mom would also love butterflies a lot. Since she was a kid, she believed that people who pass away come back in the form of butterflies when they want to visit you. My dad believed in the paranormal, but still always will try to deny experiences when he encounters them. I have two more brothers, one of which was in high school, who we'll call T, and another who was older. Here's some of my experiences. About a week ago, after my brother passed away, we began having problems with our lights and electrics in the house. Kind of cliche, I know. Of course, my dad chalked it up to be our electrical box, yada yada. But I, along with my immediate family, would always see this as a sign from my brother that he was with us. We would usually go, hi brother, we miss you. We know you're there. And the flickering would subside. This will come up again later. After about two weeks, my mother and father's anger towards that girl had grown extensively. However, she had a child with my brother. One night, my mom had a very vivid dream and her explanation of it was as follows. My mom, dad and brother sat at our dining room table. She said it was so real that she could hear him breathing. My brother proceeded to tell my parents to forgive the girl, that it wasn't her fault and that they need to see the baby still. After this, my parents did what he said and mostly forgave her. About three months after he passed away, my family, mom, dad, brother, grandparents, were sitting in my grandparents' driveway. As we all talked, a butterfly, I believe it was yellow, but I'm not positive on that fact, flew around us and landed on my grandma's finger. She laughed and waited for it to fly away, but it didn't. It stayed there. For a couple of minutes, we continued talking as it sat with my grandma. Then she asked, can I pet you? And it did a little flick of the wings, which my grandma took as a yes. She gently touched the body of the butterfly. A couple of minutes after, she stopped petting it. It flew around us and flew away. Whether it was my brother or just a lonely butterfly, that was a very crazy experience. One afternoon, my dad and T cleaned out our garage. I think my dad used cleaning as a way to think and escape. We have long metal shelves in our garage that are used for storage. They completely took everything off of them, wiped them down and organized the items that they put back. The next morning, it was maybe 6 a.m., my mom and dad stood in the garage smoking a cigarette. Yes, sadly they still do, before my mom left for work. My mom looked at one of the shelves as she was telling my dad how nice the garage looked. And there was a small yellow metal butterfly hair clip, kind of like what you'd see in a little girl's hair. Now my mom knew instantly that there was no way it could be mine because one, she only bought plastic clips for my hair and two, I stopped using the clips probably three or four years prior as I was a little tomboy. She took this as a sign from my brother and clipped it on his rosary that she kept in her car. Later that day at work, my mom was stopped by someone in the hallway. It was a nurse that was called in to do a specific thing at the facility, only when it needs to be done, meaning she's there maybe once a month. She didn't know my mom, she didn't know my brother. The lady stopped and asked my mom, did you recently use your son? My mom said yes, and the lady said, he was really tall, wasn't he? My brother was 6'2 or 6'3. My mom said he was pretty tall. The lady said, he has tattoos, some on his face too. My mom said yes. Then the lady proceeded to say, he says he left you a gift this morning, 
Something to do with a butterfly because he knows you like them. He also wants me to tell you that the things that you keep noticing and asking if it's him, it is. He's telling you he's there with you and he knows you're worried, but he's in a good place. He's okay. My mom obviously burst into tears, but the lady had to leave to tend to her patient. My mom never got her name. She's never been able to find her since. But this gave us a lot of hope. A couple of years ago, I was playing a Ouija board with my friends. And when we asked who the person was that we were talking to, it spelled out my brother's name. Obviously, everyone looked at me instantly, but I didn't let myself get excited. I asked what his oldest son name was, and it spelled out the first four letters of his name and stopped. Then I asked what my mom's name was, and it spelled it wrong, which I recently heard was something that happens if a spirit is pretending to be someone else. It will know things, but not fully, something like that. But all of my friends playing would have known both answers. So if any of them were pushing it, the answers would have been correct. But we all swore on our lives we weren't moving it. Something crazy that my sister-in-law experienced about a month after my brother died. My brother T became very close with a girl after my brother passed away. They started dating after a week or so. She would experience the closet doors opening which we all saw as my brother messing with her because he lived to do stuff like that when he was alive. Also one time, she was looking for her keys all over the house because she had to drive home. She figured it was T hiding the keys so she had to stay a little longer, but he swears he didn't touch them. He was helping her look. I went to the freezer, probably for food, I'm a fat ass, and found her keys sitting in the freezer on a shelf. We were all super confused and still are. But the craziest thing that happened to her was a month after my brother died. My parents were looking all over for his social security card or wallet or driver's license. That part I'm not sure about as they don't tell me back then because I was only 11. My parents couldn't find them anywhere and they were getting frantic. T and his girlfriend went to my brother who passed away's old room to look for a movie to watch. He freaking loved movies and owned tons. His door opened into the laundry room. T stepped into the laundry room to put his clothes in the dryer and left his girlfriend in the room. To this day, they both swear up and down on their lives that this happened. The door to his room shuts with the girlfriend inside. She thought it was T messing with her, so she tried to open the door and it wouldn't budge. She yelled at Tease to stop being a dick and to let go of the door. He said he wasn't doing anything. He began to try to push the door open and couldn't. She says that something in her head told her to open one of the drawers. She opened it and inside were the items that my parents had been looking for. She told him she found it and to let her leave and the door opened up. She's still scared to talk about this. Lastly, my boyfriend and I have been together for a year now. And since we started dating, I've always wondered if my brother would have liked him because my brother has always been very protective over me and always joked about how he would greet my boyfriend first when he picked me up for a date, blah, blah. My boyfriend started wondering this also. About two months into our relationship, I took him to my brother's stone. He was cremated, but there is a stone for his memorial at a garden in my city. I introduced him to my brother and he was very sweet about it. A couple of months later, my boyfriend had a dream with my brother vividly in it, telling him that he likes him. Crazy. Small things still happen from time to time. My brother will visit me in a dream. The lights will flicker rapidly and once we acknowledge him, they stop. The most common thing that happens starting the week that he died was my entire family seeing the time 12.34, non-stop. I'll wake up and look at the clock and it will be that time. My parents, cousins, aunts, uncles, grandparents, everyone has experienced it and still does to this day. I even got a tattoo of it on my arm. I miss my br brother a lot, but 
but I always feels like he's here with me, watching me grow up, like he always said he would. I was talking to an old friend about maybe going on an impromptu ghost hunt this month. And during the conversation, we reminisced about some of the creepy stuff we had experienced over the years. And we remembered a particular event that stuck with us and is one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced. The story begins with my friend, who we'll call T, and myself searching a hidden attic-like space in his house for a supposed stash of money allegedly left there by a previous tenant. Truth be told, I think that was just a story his mom told us to get us off the Xbox for a while. It was the heyday of Halo, and she was probably just sick of us sitting in front of his TV. But whether or not the story she told us was true, we wound up in this small and low-ceilinged attic space, which could only be accessed by a tiny door hidden in the wooden panels in the wall. We'd known about the door for a while, but had never bothered to go in, mostly because the door seemed like it had been sealed somehow, and we couldn't be bothered with actually using our brains and finding something to pry it open. But the prospect of finding free money in a dusty old room was too much. So we called a few friends to come help search the place. And after a few pries from a putty knife and flathead screwdriver, we cracked the door open and began to explore. At first, it didn't seem like much was in there. Some old clothes and papers scattered about and a desk in the corner. But through the gloom and dust, we could see something against the far wall which turned out to be a very old cot of some kind. It was either busted in half or was meant to be folded in half. But either way, it was folded over on itself and we could see something covered in cloth and sandwiched between the two halves. Of course, we wouldn't be good treasure hunters if we didn't look at the covered thing. So we started making our way over to the folded cot. I take a few steps forward and my foot goes right through the floor, like it's made of wet paper. Luckily though, T was right behind me and had very quick reflexes. His hand shot out and grabbed the back of my shirt to keep me from falling forward and probably all the way through the floor. We took a second to laugh at the situation and realized we should stick to the sides of the room as the sensor was probably the weakest and most likely to collapse under our weight. So we tiptoe all the way around the wall of the room until we get to the cot where we start unfolding it to get at the covered thing. This is where things get strange. As soon as we touched the cot, the room got very cold, which was odd because in an attic in mid-July. At the time, we thought nothing of it. We were certain we'd found the stash and were moments away from being rich. So we unfolded the cot, which took all of our combined strength from how rusted and decrepit the thing was. Honestly, I was surprised that it didn't just crumble to dust at the first touch. Finally, we got it unfolded and found that it was in fact a decently sized wall mirror that had been wrapped in a sheet or thin blanket. As soon as we uncovered the mirror, the tiny door we had came in slowly swung shut. Again, we didn't think anything about it. It must have been a gust of air or something. We were a little disheartened by the lack of money, but T's mom had sent us in there with her camera to take pictures of anything interesting, so she could see what was in there since she wouldn't be going in herself. So we snap a couple of pictures in the mirror, the carts and the random debris lying around. Now, here is the, it is important to note that the mirror's reflective surface was absolutely caked with dust. You could barely tell that it was a mirror, the dust was so thick. Yet the base of the mirror, which looked and felt like it was made of some sort of ceramic, was practically pristine. When I say the base, I mean the part of the mirror in which the reflective surface was set, not the actual bottom of the mirror. I found that to be very odd, as the whole mirror had been covered by the sheet. So why would any of it be dusty at all, let alone just a specific part like that? 
So we snap pictures and are just about to call it quits when we hear the dogs barking downstairs, which meant someone was at the door. So we carefully make our way along the walls and out of the room to head downstairs. It turned out to be our friend, whom we'll call B, who'd come to help us search for the supposed stash. After we told her about the attic room, she wanted to see for herself, so naturally we took her up and showed her to the tiny door. Before we even set foot into the room, we told her about the crappy floor and to only walk along the walls. Of course, she either didn't take us seriously or she just didn't understand what he, she had said because she takes a couple of steps forward and almost falls all the way through the floor, practically right through the small hole I'd created earlier. So she's sitting there with her upper body still in the attic with us and her legs dangling down through the ceiling of the kitchen. It was at this moment that I heard one of the most hilarious sentences I've ever heard. Through the now large hole in the floor, we could hear T's mom on the phone with someone when she said in a very flat, nonchalant tone, I have to go now. There are children falling through my ceiling. So we get B out of the floor and we have a good laugh about the situation once we were sure she was okay. And we all agreed that it was probably best to just leave the room alone before we cause any more damage. We get out and all the way downstairs when T pipes up that he'd forgotten the camera and flashlight in there when we were getting B out of the hole. So I agreed to go back in with him to grab them. We thought it wouldn't take but a second as he remembered setting them both down on the floor, close to the hole when we were helping B get out. But when we got in there, we were a little confused. We couldn't see the camera or flashlights anywhere. We looked all over the floor, thinking maybe we'd kick them around on our way out or when we were helping B, but they weren't there. We were about to go check if he'd maybe set them outside the door or something when we were shutting it behind us when T stopped dead in his tracks and whispered my name. I looked over and I knew in an instant what had made him stop. The mirror was covered up with the sheet again only this time, the outline of the camera and flashlight could be seen under the cover. We stood there and stared at it for a minute or two before T got brave and started making his way along the wall to get over to the cot. I followed on very shaky legs and watched as he pulled the cover off the mirror to reveal that his camera and flashlight were indeed hidden under the sheet, along with the words, help me scrawled in the dust beside them. It was like something else of a horror movie. The nope factor must have been too much for T because he snatched up his stuff and made a beeline for the door with me closed behind. We slammed the door shut behind us and never went back in. T's mom thought we were making the whole thing up until we went back and looked through the camera. We had pictures of the cot and mirror both before and after messing with them. One of the folded cots with the covered mirror still hidden. One of the open cots with the covered mirror revealed. And one of the uncovered mirror which showed no writing in the dust. But there was one final picture which convinced his mom that we were telling the truth and that she should never open that door again. The last picture was seemingly taken from atop the cot and clearly showed the giant hole where B had fallen through, which meant that after T had put the camera down so we could get B out of the hole, someone else had picked it up from beside the hole after we'd left, carried it and a flashlight over to the mirror and snapped the picture after setting the camera down. That had to have happened very quickly because we were only out of the room for two to three minutes at the most, as T had realized he'd forgotten his camera almost as soon as we'd gotten downstairs. The only ones there were T, his mom, myself, and B. His dad and older brother were at work, and even if they'd come home, they would have had to pass us on the stairs to get up to that attic. There's just no way I can logically explain the writing on the mirror. And to this day, 
I still think about what was in the attic with us. This story takes place when I was eight years old, in Fort Myers, Florida, in a neighborhood called Heritage Farms. I'm stating the name and place in case anyone knows of the place or happens to live in that neighborhood. You never know. Pretty bad at the time 40 years old, and this took place when I was eight. I still remember the address, and I still remember the phone number. I remember my parents looking at this house before they bought it. I remember me, my father, and the real estate agent being in the back bedroom, which would have been my parents' bedroom when we moved in. My mom decided to break away from the group and go into the other bedrooms, which would have been my brother and I's. I remember my mother running at full sprint to meet us in the back bedroom because she was scared. She later on told us that she got such a heavy feeling in those bedrooms that it felt like something was right behind her. She eventually let it go and we eventually purchased the house and we ended up moving in. Things didn't start getting freaky until about a year and a half after we purchased the house. But there was always a heavy, wet blanket feeling in the house and the neighborhood was no better. I was terrified to go out and play. I was always picked on in the neighborhood and the neighborhood was always dark. In that year and a half span from us moving in to us seeing the first thing, my dad lost his job, my parents started having problems and I got worse as far as being scared to death to move in general. There was a certain point in time where you would begin walking and then you'd feel like you'd have to run like there was something in getting ready to get you at any second. My mom told me years and years later when I was an adult that she was washing dishes one day in broad daylight and she saw a big black figure in the corridor that opened up to my room and my brother's room. But nobody knew about that. She kept it to herself. So I guess you can say she was the first one to see anything in that house. But like I said, she didn't let me know until I was an adult. It all started in my bedroom, in my closet. I remember hearing what sounded like cards shuffling and music. I remember telling my mom, I think there are cowboys in my closet because that's the only thing I could relate to. I know now it sounded like a deck of cards being shuffled and an old saloon piano being played. The sounds weren't up in the forefront. They sounded kind of distant. About a week that went on, then I started hearing the whispering. Everything from laughs and chuckles to full on whispering conversations. Oftentimes I would hear, hey you. Needless to say, I was out of that bedroom after about a month. My brother was 17 at the time and all he did was work and went out with his friends. So I slept in his bedroom. I know my first experience was on a Friday night because I used to watch a grouping of shows when I was a kid called TGIF. It had Full House, Family Matters, and a couple of other shows that I can't remember, but I used to watch it every Friday night. 80s babies will know what I'm talking about. I remember all the lights in the house being turned off besides my parents in the back bedroom. My brother's bedroom and my bedroom were separated by a very long hallway, which ended in my parents' bedroom. I remember getting a very creepy, sinking feeling, and I don't know what made me do this but I peered around the door opening and there it was. A big black figure that was as tall as the doorway. It was silent and motionless. I remember pulling the covers over my head and being totally quiet. Then I heard our bathroom door, which led to the patio in the pool area open and close. It was a metal door, so it made noise. When I heard that, I screamed bloody murder my parents came in and got me and I slept with them that night. I told my mom and dad that I saw a big black figure wearing a top hat and trench coat and had a round thing in its hand. I remember being terribly, terribly clingy after that and I always slept with my parents until my dad got sick and tired of it. He said I didn't need anything. It was all my imagination. And I guess, according to my mother, she had told my dad I was telling the truth because she had seen it too, but didn't say anything. I eventually had to start sleeping in my room again, 
but the whispering, the cards and the music never stopped. Some nights I wouldn't have to sleep in my room, but nine times out of 10, I would always choose to sleep in my brother's room, which had a director's chair next to the bed. I remember one night being petrified again for some reason, and I looked over at the director's chair and there was a black figure sitting in the chair and I screamed bloody murder again. And I remember my father having to pick me up out of the bed and walk me to the room. There was one incident where I was at school and my brother was at school. My mom says she was making the bed in her bedroom and she heard the garage door open and close. The doors open and close and she heard, mom, I'm home. She called my brother saying that she was in the back making her bed. Then she heard, mom, I'm home again. She walked through the house and out to the garage and out to the driveway and there was nobody there. She called my brother's high school and she actually talked to him. I remember my mom sitting out on the curb of the house when I was walking home from the bus. That's how scared she was to go back in. The straw that broke the camel's back for my mom happened during the tea time. She was washing dishes in the kitchen and hopefully I can explain this kitchen correctly, the design of it. The kitchen faced the two back bedrooms where I slept. You have an opening leading into the kitchen. Then you had a wall, kind of octagonal and then another opening which led into the kitchen. My mom told me that she would always see clouds. She said they'd look like the little wisps of puffs of smoke. She said she saw this one day, followed by a little man in a suit wearing a top hat. It came out of the bedroom, walked past the first opening in the kitchen and looked at her with a blank stare. Made its way past that opening. I guess around the octagon wall and then she saw nothing. I remember my dad thinking we were crazy and not believing us. So my mother and I ended up taking a trip to Maryland to get away to visit my some family. I remember about our fourth day into the trip, we got a phone call at my aunt's house. It was my father and he was upset. He told my mom to come home when she could because he believes her for now. He said he came home from work one night in the house wasn't totally pitch black, but black enough because he had a couple night lights around the house. He walked in from the garage and put his hand on the kitchen light switch, but something caught his eye before he could turn the light on. He was looking in my brother's bedroom and he said he saw what looked like little stick figures running around the bedroom, which scared him to death. He told us he slept out by the pool the entire night. Then he told us the next night, he was sitting in his recliner watching TV and saw the same black figure in the corridor that leads to my bedroom and my brother's bedroom. He said he shut the TV off and rubbed his eyes. And he said that when he opened his eyes, he saw the way of a silhouette of a face in the television screen. So we finally came home after about a week. The funny thing is, is about this house, all the activity seemed to have taken place in my brother's bedroom and never my bedroom. It never went past the kitchen. I don't know what that means, but it was strange. I remember one night, my dad, my mom and myself watching TV in their bedroom. It was some kind of special on television. And I remember we all got a creepy feeling and we looked over towards the door. My dad, for some reason, had this pink recliner, kind of catty corner towards the door. When we all looked over, we saw a black figure peering over this recliner and it had its two hands so you could just see the two hands in the face. And when we made eye contact with it, it shot towards the other end of the house or just disappeared, but it looked like it ran. After that, we would start hearing knocks on the door all hours of the day. Eventually, my mom and dad had enough and they put the house up for sale. We ended up selling very quickly. And oddly enough, a month later we moved out and they moved in. My mom and I drove by one day and they had the house up for sale. Anyway, at 33 years old, I wrote the current owners of a time a letter and just asked if they have experienced anything. They responded back saying they haven't, but I've heard of people having trouble in the past. I don't know if they said they haven't experienced anything to save their face, but needless to say, the experience has had a profound effect on me to this day.
He had a really different taste of music ever since he was a kid. I mean, we would listen to teen pop, K-pop, classical jazz. There were plenty of music genres to listen to. Instead, he had a thing for orchestral music, opera, and instrumental. I don't know why, but he really loved to listen to those sad and creepy types of music. But he wasn't really into horror movies and supernatural stuff. He just loved it. His family and I sometimes made jokes of his weird taste, but we did all respect him. On his 11th birthday, his father gave him an old tiny music box as a present. It's a circle shaped music box with a thin lid. It's beautifully decorated with some type of decaying yellow metal, bronze maybe? You have to wind the heart shaped metal blade to start the music playing. And if you closed the metal lid at the middle while the music was playing, it would also stop playing midway. The music is also cool and heartbreaking, maybe lasting around two or three minutes after each full wind. His father said that he got this from an antique store run by his friend with a really cheap price. He also added that the music box is said to be supposedly haunted. But we ignored that fact as we were all skeptics who never experienced anything paranormal. So without any doubts, he loved it dearly. He wouldn't stop whining the music box even after thousands and thousands of times. We had to listen to it a million times non-stop. The music kept whining in our minds through the music boxes and playing. He valued that box so much that it occupied on the table beside his bed permanently. The activities began soon after a while of the arrival of this very music box. Though we believed the activities as mere accidents, we later figured out that they were not normal at all after we spoke up about his ex experiences years later. I will talk about two incidences. The first was his kid sister, who was five or six years old. She said she went to his room to find something when he was absent. He was probably out with me to play back then. And she knocked the music box accidentally over the desk and forgot to put it back in its place. Then she entered the living room to keep looking for something. She found it at the top of a shelf that was too tall for her to reach. So she took a chair, stepped over it and tried to reach it. But something collided with the chair, causing her to fall onto the ground. She kept crying and saying something knocked her chair. But we ended up to the conclusion that she was just unbalanced, which caused her to fall. I think she sprained her ankle and wasn't able to walk for a week. Next is me, who spoke badly about the music box. I was only joking though. I think I was at his home to help him with his homework that day. I already finished my job, so I sat on his bed while he was doing his homework. I felt kind of bored, so I picked up the music box, winding the metal blade and listened to the melody. Since I'm not a fan of this type of music, I laughed it off and said like, man, this melody is so boring, it's putting me to sleep. And I yawned, acting like I was sleepy. I said that just for fun, I swear. After that, I suddenly got the odd feeling when you're feeling like you're being stared at. He then finished his homework and asked me to check it. And when I touched the paper, the sharp edge of the paper got me bleeding. Not once, but twice in a mere minute. But we'd skip thinking like, okay, that's possible. So we left it like it was nothing. Here's the main part of the story. One night after my friend was listening to his Kirillan, he fell asleep putting the music box under his pillow. He said at midnight, a naked old woman with a long, long gray hair woke him up saying, boy, get up, you're crushing my head. He was shocked to see the old woman out of all doors and windows closed and wasn't unable to speak a word for like a minute. She smiled at him and whispered, scared to see me? He nodded his trembling head, gaining little of his control back. She said, don't worry dear, I won't hurt you. I just want you to pull out my music box under your pillow. 
He gathered his courage and asked her who she was. As she put the box on the desk as gently as he could, and she answered, Me? I'm just an old hag whom the music box belonged to. Now, the atmosphere was a bit warmer, and since she seemed no harm, they had a decent conversation. But the woman spoke most, and my friend just listened. And then he asked, What can I do to help you? The old lady walked towards the chair slowly, sat on it and said, You seem to love this box, boy. He nodded and said, I love both the box and the music. The lady smiled again and said, I'm happy to hear that, boy. And one question, she continued. Will you protect this as you love it? He said, I will. The lady chuckled and said, you do resemble him. She then stood up and walked towards him, handing over the music box gently to his palms and kissed his forehead with tears in her eyes. You keep it then, boy. Those were her last words. He said after the kiss, he became dizzy and couldn't help but fall asleep gently as the old woman watched him. He had no idea who the woman was and only found himself hazy of what he experienced was true or just an illusion cast by his dreams. He opened it up after years, the holiday family reunion. Then, in the next few days, me, my friend and his father went a bit checking to the antique store, a bit curious, and then to the locals where the music box was said to be originated from. Here, we discovered the past of the music box. I'll brief it to you. Before the Civil War broke out, a young and happy couple were married. One wedding gift was a cute, tiny music box, which is believed to be ours. They would listen to it every night, putting their arms around each other in the garden. They spent a normal and peaceful life before the Civil War started, and that's when the young man decided to join the revolution. The lady became concerned about him, but wasn't able to stop her determined husband. She was left with her parents. The poor lady did not have any children, but a younger sister. Little did she know, that was the last day she got to see him. The war took years, as the lady waited for her lover faithfully, but no word returned to her, even after the war had finally finished. She became so obsessed with the music box, listening and staring at it for days on end. She had less and less appetite, and so reached to a point where she just won't leave the music box alone in her bed. She would never answer to calls, weeping silently alongside her playing music box. So, the parents got used to the sad situation and just let their daughter be. One rainy day, when the mother of the lady knocked her door for dinner, no noise was heard. She became worried, so she screamed for her husband and he kicked the door open only to find the poor lady lying lifeless on her bed, alongside her open, yet now silent, music box. After her death, the box would be heard mysteriously playing, though never to be found playing whenever someone checked it. So, rumours popped out the box was haunted. Years later, the music box was sold to an antique shop, owned by his father's friend. At the arrival of the music box, everything still seemed fine, but after some time, it became very old, so they only kept it in a storeroom, where we kept other old yet little priced sales. Ever since that night, the door of the storeroom would be heard banging at night, and when the owner's family fell asleep, they would hear a melody playing in their dream, and then the screaming of a woman screaming to let her go. The owner's family became so horrified, they decided to throw the music box away. Later that day, my friend's dad found it and asked the owner about its price. The owner just said, take it away. So that's how it ended up at my friend's house, I guess. It always gives me chills whenever we talked about the music box. By the way, the box is still in a good shape, but some certain notes cannot be played anymore. Dear lady, I hope you find your lover in the next life. When we were about 20, 
My friends and I were really big into doing scary trips to haunted roads and things of that nature. This one is about Clinton Road, deemed the most haunted road in America. So scary, they even made a movie about it. This story takes place before the movie was even a thought. So there was a group of our friends. There were three of us that were the closest, and then two more that would tag along here and there. The main three guys, myself and two others, were all huge football players, with the smallest of us standing around 6'4 and 230. So we were never really scared to do any of these things, as we'd look like a pretty intimidating group of guys. I had to work late on a Friday night, so they decided to go visit this road without me. Most of it sounded like the typical hype and adrenaline scared. One thing stuck out. They told me when they were there, they received texts from an unknown number stating, why are you on Clinton Road? And the texts even described what my friends were doing and wearing. They showed me the texts, but I figured they were faking it, trying to make it sound scary, knowing I'd be mad that I missed out. They also explained to me a legend that a child died in the water under the bridge on the road. And if you throw change, the ghost boy would return the change to you, known to us as Ghost Boy Bridge. On top of that, there's a ridiculous bend in the road there called Dead Man's Curve, that even if you're doing a modest 30 miles an hour, you could easily crash and tumble off the cliff. It's said that a ghost truck will chase you throughout the road and try to get you to crash. I called total bullshit. I then convinced them to take me the next day, being that I was off from work. It didn't disappoint. We get there and immediately I see the road is in the middle of the woods, covered with ritual signs all over the road. I knew that this was not a typical road. We came up to the bridge and parked. As soon as we got out of our car, I checked everyone's pockets so that they wouldn't be trying to pull anything slick to try to drop change in the road when I wasn't looking. There were a total of five quarters, one for each of us. We all tossed them in the water over the bridge. About five minutes go by in total silence. I decided to break the silence by saying, told you, bullshit. When we turn to walk back to the car, we get about 10 feet away and cling, cling, cling. The sound of change hitting the road. We go back to the bridge and there are five quarters laying directly in between the two yellow lines in the middle of the road. Thinking it was one of the other four people there messing with me, I came prepared. I then sign one of the quarters with my initials and we all throw them back in the water. About five more minutes go by and again I proclaim, see, bullshit, it was one of you guys messing with us. We then proceeded to walk back to the car, get about 10 feet away again, Cling, 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 the sound of change hitting the ground again. We turn back around and go see what it was. Sure enough, there were five quarters laying in the road, with one of them having my initials in my handwriting. We're all going nuts and decide to run back to the car. After getting back to the car, we decide to keep going to see what else the road has to offer. But keep in mind, we're spooked from the change thing we just experienced. About 10 minutes go by, a few of us had to pee really bad after holding it in for the car ride. So we pulled up to this random castle looking building, no bigger than a small house, but you could tell it was extremely old. We decided to just stop there because there was like a little indent in the road to where a car can pull over. We all get out to go. I go to my immediate left and do my business. After I'm done, I notice my one friend is walking towards the castle, almost in a trance-like state. We yelled his name to come back, but he kept walking. We all ran up and grabbed him and shook him out of it. After questioning why the hell he'd be walking up there alone, he stated that he was following me and that I waved him to come here without saying a thing to him. The problem with that was the fact that the entire group was actually behind him. We had all sorts of signals as a group, so I would never just wave to him to me without saying anything. So I'm 100% convinced that he saw a doppelganger leading him to trouble. The fear level is definitely higher now, so we decide to leave. 
Like I stated earlier, it's an extremely dark road in the woods, so you can't see much. You have to pass Dead Man's Curve twice, once on the way in, once on the way out. We're probably four miles away from the curve when we see headlights behind us. We didn't think much of it as we thought it was just some other kids our age trying to do what we were doing. About a minute goes by after us talking about random stuff trying to ease the mood and we noticed the headlights were directly behind us. The headlights looked super old and you could tell it was a truck because of how high up the lights were off the ground. Thing was, we didn't see a truck, just the lights because it was so dark. Getting more creeped out, we told the driver to speed up and to try to get this crazy driver off of our tail, but he was sticking right on us, going around the bends at high speeds, straight straightaways, everything. We couldn't shake him. The problem with this, we were in a brand new and modified sports and performance car. If someone were to be driving an old truck, or any truck for that matter, there's absolutely no way they would be able to keep up with us for more than 30 seconds. But this thing was on us for what seemed to be miles. Finally, about half a mile away from Dead Man's Curve, it's almost as if the light shut off and we lost it. So I remember. Pulling up right after the curve, and pulling over so that we could find our way back to the main roads. Meanwhile, there's woods on both sides of us. We're all talking very lightly, just in case something crazy were to happen, we could hear it and be aware. Two minutes go by, after getting service to our phones, one of the guys got directions, so we're in the clear. Right before the driver put the car in drive, we hear this deafening screech, which sounded like a woman's scream, literally sounded about 20 feet away from us. So loud, I lost my hearing for a few minutes. When we looked over to where the noise came from, I will never, ever, ever, ever forget what we saw. This is gonna sound crazy, and if it didn't happen to me, I would never believe it. We saw a typical movie scene, white dress, black hair figure standing there, but next to that was a clown hanging upside down from a tree swinging back and forth, smiling at us, moving its head in any direction we moved. The clown was like an old school type of clown from back in the day, like sideshow creeper clown with the big circular neckline. I can't remember much detail about it, except for that damn circle neckline and chilling old school vibe. Now this totally could have been some prank, but to have that prank up, you would have to have both immense patience for someone to come to that exact spot, or balls of steel to be doing that in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, with just two people? Nah. I don't think I've ever been in a car that moved as fast as ours it did after that sitting. We then found the main road and headed back. Going home we did research and found out about the legend of the ghost truck, Dead Man's Curve, etc. It was such a rush, by the time we got home, it was probably 2.30 in the morning, and we'd forgotten already the feeling of how scared we actually were. So we all decided when we got home, let's do it again the next day, which would have been Sunday, to see who really had balls. We all parked at my friend's house so he could drive us, so we all had to drive ourselves home. I lived 15 minutes away. On the way home, I noticed that a rundown church in my town had letters put up on their board. They never used to, so it was strange to see. The board stated, you're going to need Jesus on Sunday. About a minute after passing that church, my radio cut out and started playing Bloody Sunday. Sunday, Bloody Sunday. It's safe to say, I made a call to the group saying we're not going back. It's been about seven years and I refuse to go there ever again. But that night made me believe. Here's some backstory. My great-grandmother was a devil worshipper, abused all of her children for the sake of what she was doing. She was evil, to say the least. She murdered her lover because he said he was leaving her and then killed herself in front of her children. Again, she was evil. Please stay with me as this story gets crazy. I'm adopted. I, now 22 male, 
was adopted at 18 months old. I had severe night terrors growing up because I would have terrible nightmares. I was always afraid of the dark because I felt like something was in it, ready to snatch me up. Night terrors would turn into sleepwalking. Sleepwalking turned into sleep paralysis as I got older. And because of that, I now have bad insomnia. I have panic attacks that keep me up all night because I dread going to sleep. When I was about 16 years old, I had a series of dreams for about a week. I've always been on the fence on whether there's a God or not, but in these dreams, I would see angels. They were beautiful and they would speak to me and tell me everything would be all right. Then at the end of every dream, I would feel a dark force enter my mind. I would wake up, but I wouldn't be able to move or say anything. I felt hands pinning me down. I could only move my eyes. Each night, that same thing would happen lasting about a week. Every night that week, I would see a dark figure rise from the ground at my feet. It would just stare at me until the final night. The final night it swiftly came next to my bedside. Its eyes pierced my soul. It stooped to my level, laughing and said to me, you will never become anything. Laughed again and left. As soon as it left, the forces holding me down released me and I could move. Needless to say, that's when I stopped sleeping at night. Fast forward to 18. I decided to go to bed one night because the next day I had to catch a bus to Oklahoma. I live on the East Coast. For some insight, I'm a very lucid dreamer and because of this, I know when I'm about to have a paranormal experience. I was asleep and around 3 a.m., I started to feel something happening. It's like being submerged in warm water. My body kind of goes numb and I hear a ringing noise. In my dream, I find myself walking down a hallway. At the end of this hallway, there was a cracked door. I open the door to see a room with no ceiling. The sky is a grayish orange color and in the middle of the room, there's a chair. I look around and no one is there with me. The door behind me has disappeared. I sit in the chair. As soon as I do, I'm surrounded by people. People I've never seen. They don't seem to have the intention of hurting me, but they're just staring at me. After a few seconds, they all in unison say, disorganize. As soon as they say that word, their faces start to literally melt off their bodies. Blood and flesh fall to the floor and they all drop dead. I immediately wake up and see that same dark figure standing at the edge of my bed laughing. I'm laying there crying. I try with all my might to yell out the word God. In the Bible, demons shudder at the very name. The figure at the end of my bed screams in agony and yells, God is not here, then yells. And then finally leaves. I'm released. And I just sat there crying until the sun came up and I had to leave. My trip was to meet my biological mother after 18 years. Fast forward to me asking questions and her answering. That's when she tells me about my grandfather and great grandmother. My grandfather had followed in his mom's footsteps for a time, but now has turned to God. Yet he will still call my mom late at night and says, baby, are you ready to learn about the powers you have? To this day, my mom says no. When my grandfather is in a demonic mood, he gets these blues rings around the pupil of his eyes. It's trippy to say the least. About a year ago, I told my mom about all these experiences and she basically said that it's all my great grandmother's fault because my grandfather admitted that his mom, before she took her life, cursed our bloodline and said we will never find happiness which explains why I always feel like I'm being followed and watched, why I have these dreams. But not all of us are given this gift. My grandfather has the gift of communicating with the unseen world. My mom does, as I do, and my younger sister does. It sucks because my grandfather, when asked about this, will deny it. Well, here we are today. I'm married with a six-month-old. 
My wife and I are being tormented by this unseen thing. Just last night, I heard banging on the walls in my son's room. I checked the cam, nothing. I lay back down. I hear some growling next to me, nothing is there. I catch it peeking at me from out of around the corner. I see its movements in reflections, its whispers. My poor son, I'm sure he sees it because he'll start screaming randomly at night. My wife is scared shitless too. I feel its presence. I never sleep at night and during the day when I do sleep, I still feel like it's watching me, like a predator stalks its prey. I want this cycle to end. I'm tired of feeling threatened. I saw it, I finally saw it, or at least what I believe it is. I live in my mom's third story attic. Yes, I'm well aware that I, a married man with a child, shouldn't be living with his mom, but we once lived on our own and we had to move back in because I lost my job due to the pandemic. This is my childhood home, so I've always seen and heard things. Most of the time, menacing whisperings. Well, just the other morning before sunrise, I saw what I believed to be the demon bothering us. My bedroom layout is simple. You walk up the steps to the top and to the left is a bathroom door down a six foot hallway and to the right is the bedroom. No walls divide the bathroom from the bedroom other than a door, of course. It's an open layout. When you turn right to go into the bedroom on the far wall is the bed. And on the wall that is shared with the hallway leading to the bathroom, it's one of those big bookshelves with a large stereo system sitting in it. I apologize, it's a weird setup and hard to explain. I grew up in this house and know every creak and squeak that the floor makes. Right by the stairs, it squeaks when you step on it. So I'll wake up when I hear that because that means someone has reached the top of my steps. Well, this will happen multiple times a night and every time it happens, I wake up. But the other night I saw something, someone, and it made me stop and stare in horror. A few nights ago, I was having a really hard time sleeping and about 4.30, I woke up to the floorboard squeaking. I woke up, saw nothing, went back to sleep. Around 5 a.m. I heard it again. This time I sat up and looked around. But this time, something caught my eye. When I sat up, I saw this big cloaked figure walking past the door to the bathroom in the reflection of that large stereo on the other side of the bedroom. It's dark on my side, but we keep the bathroom light on because, quite frankly, we're afraid of the dark and this created a perfect reflection in the stereo. I stared in horror, hoping, praying that I was just tired or that it's just the ceiling fan or something other than what I knew it to be. I immediately woke my wife up and told her what I saw. She took my son and stayed the last few hours in the spare room on the second floor. I will never forget what I saw. It wasn't a flash. It was someone walking average speed across the light. I don't know anything about this crap. I've been an atheist for most of my life. Never believed in anything paranormal. A few years ago, in 2014, I moved into a new house. From the get-go, weird things started happening. Unexplainable things. Cabinets in the bathroom opening on their own, pictures falling off of the wall, and the dog just barking at nothing. My kids were complaining that their room was scary. Never heard this complaint from them before, and we've moved several times. There was something unsettling about the entire lower level of this home, where my kid's room was. The split foyer stairs, and also the hallway and bathroom on the second floor, this hallway led to my bedroom. The rest of the house was fine. This hallway on the second floor was absolutely frightening, and we were all terrified of it. We kept the door to that hallway shut at all times. I felt crazy in that house. I've moved 13 times in my life. I've never had a problem with any home I've lived in. 
Two years go by and these things just become normal in this house. Then suddenly one day, everything stops. It just went away. No more uneasy things, no more uneasy feelings, no more weird shit happening. We eventually move later on to get my kids in a better school district. We have been in our new house for three years now. Recently, our sunroom has been giving me the same uneasy feeling that our old house gave me. Now the kids are complaining about not wanting to be in or near the sunroom. I haven't mentioned that it has been bothering me also. Can anyone tell me what the hell might be going on? I feel like we're being watched at all the time. I feel insane. I feel like I'm being followed by bad energy from our old house. I know this sounds crazy. Honestly, it would take days to describe the horrors that went on in that house and the impact it wound up having on me emotionally. Let me put a little bit of what happened into perspective for you guys. We purchased this home and had it inspected. It was 10 years old at the time of purchase. It was structurally sound and was built by a reputable builder. My mom worked in construction for 30 years at a bank and we've made a lot of trusted friends over the years. So I had a lot of professional help in choosing a home. Day one, moving day. The previous owner left some pictures on the wall. We promptly removed them and put our own up. We leave to go get some furniture from the old house and come back to the artwork lying on the stairs in the split level foyer. These were heavy pieces of artwork that were screwed into studs in the wall and hung with heavy duty picture wire. The weight of the artwork would make it impossible for them to fall. We tested this when we hung them to make sure they wouldn't fall. The artwork weighed around 30 to 40 pounds. It weighed down the picture wire to the point where there was no way it could jump up an inch off of the hooks it was attached to. Only an earthquake could have possibly caused that. Day two, me and my dad are sitting in the living room, taking a break from moving furniture. When we hear a loud noise and glass breaking, it's in the foyer again. A photo has somehow managed to travel from a table by the front door down to the bottom of the stairs. If it was not securely placed on the table, it would have just fallen to the floor. For it to have reached the bottom of the stairs, it would have had to travel four feet and then have fallen down the stairs. We were the only two people in the house at the time. My dad doesn't get shaken about anything, but he was visibly disturbed by this. Two weeks give or take after the move, my youngest son, who was about six at the time, wakes me up in the middle of the night, crying so hard that he threw up on himself and peed on the floor. He said something was making noise in his room. He shares a room with my eldest son and he didn't hear anything. I've never seen my son scared enough to do that. A few weeks go by, we start regularly hearing weird noises in the attic and promptly call pest control. There's nothing up there and no signs of any critters. Then the cabinets in the hall bathroom start opening, not closing. You can hear them because they creak. I immediately thought we had rats and called the pest control guy back. Nothing there. The creepy hallway door shuts on its own one day while I'm home alone and scares the shit out of me. I get on the phone with the pest control guy again, who now thinks I'm insane. He finds nothing again. This continues for months. Also, my dog, who never barks, decides to just start randomly barking at things in the corner of my son's room every day. We keep their door closed to keep her from going in there. Then she starts barking at the light in the hallway upstairs. We start closing that door too. She's also incredibly proficient at finding critters. If we had rats, she would have found them, no question. A few months in, downstairs in the kids' room is the stuff of nightmares. You can hear footsteps in and around the stairs outside their bedroom, and you just stay uneasy and sick to your stomach spending time down there. 
The kids start asking me to stay with them at night down there. I oblige for a few nights and I experience this for myself. The kids start sleeping upstairs after this. A year in, we joke about our ghost regularly. I try to make light of the situation for the kids' sake. I think I'm going insane at this point. I've had electricians, pest control, had my dad look for every possible thing that could be the culprit, and even asked a few friends in construction what their thoughts were. Nothing points to an answer. I give up. 2016, no change. Weird sounds and smells, footsteps, nausea, a feeling of impending doom and the feeling of being watched are just part of my day now. Depression takes hold and sends me into a dark, dark place. Somewhere I've never been before that causes me to have thoughts I never thought I'd have. I just want to die now. I feel empty and exhausted and I'm just done with it all. This goes on for a lengthy amount of time, along with the noises, weird smells, terrified kids and invisible rats. The kids are still sleeping upstairs most nights. They've just started bringing their toys upstairs and hang out up there. As long as the door to the hallway stays closed, they constantly complain about it. 2017, it's almost spring. It's still a little chilly outside, I remember. I go downstairs because I used my hair dryer and I straighten it together and it caused the breaker to do what it does best, lol. The breaker box is downstairs. I got down there to flip the breaker and then nothing. It was then that I realized that I haven't experienced anything in a couple of weeks at this point, that everything has just stopped. Nothing ever happened again after that. My depression subsided and I get back to my normal self, like it never even happened. We moved in 2019 with no issues. Here's a weird fact though. I found out later on from my old neighbors that the previous couple that lived there had died in the house. What was particularly disturbing was that the lady that lived there broke her neck on the stairs in the foyer and died. That would have been good to know while we were living there. We knew when we purchased the house that there was an old couple that lived there and they knew that they had passed away in the home. We just assumed it was from old age. This is a story that my mother and aunt told me when I was in high school. I'm 21 now and it's never left me. I think about it constantly and ponder over what happened. My grandfather passed close to a year ago in June of 2020. He was 96 when he died and it caused some issues in my family. They don't really pertain to the story, but there are some things about him that I have to share in order to explain the story in the best way. My grandfather, John, was a man who was extremely calloused and old fashioned. He was bitter, abusive and a complete macho man. My mother was raised on never showing emotion or pain due to his abuse and lack of compassion for others. He was also an extreme racist. He had many secrets in my family that are now coming to light after his death. Everything that happened around him was brushed off and forgotten because he had more important things to do, like drinking and having affairs. Just an overall intense and very no-nonsense type of man. He wasn't religious at all and found things like faith and hope stupid. This story takes place in the 70s, most likely early to mid 70s. My mom was born in 1965 and remembers this story clearly. My aunts as well remember this happening, but no one knows exactly what year. One summer day, John decided to take his family on a small outing with the intent to have a picnic in the woods. My mother, her three sisters, and her mother, my grandmother, were all there and very excited about this. Where we're from, my family is more accustomed to the woods and has lived in this area for generations. Going into the woods for a fun family activity was nothing out of the ordinary and seemed to be just another normal day. They made their way down a dirt backwards road 
and stopped once they found a clearing large enough to accommodate them. As all the kids started jumping out the car and messing around as kids do after being stuck together, my grandmother began unloading their food and picnic supplies. John began surveying the area and deciding where to set up. As he was doing that, something in the woods past the clearing caught his eye. Before going to see what was out there, he yelled to the family and said he would be right back. The kids and my grandmother thought not much of this, since they were all used to the woods, and these woods in particular were very familiar to them. They continued unloading and setting up the stuff they brought. One of the girls pointed out something in the clearing that caused a sudden shift from a normal day to something far worse. It was a dirt mound that looked like something was buried underneath it. The mound was about the size of a small person, maybe even child size. It was too big to simply be any animal in these woods. There was nothing but squirrels and raccoons in the area. Scattered amongst the mound were larger river rocks. There was no pattern, but they were definitely placed on the mound intentionally. Also, the dirt seemed to be fresh, as though just buried. It was loose and slightly darker than the area around it. The mood immediately shifted from an average day in the woods to something much darker. My grandmother became concerned and told the girls to stay away from it. She was clearly upset and worried about it, but did her best to ignore it. The girls, all being children, didn't have the same amount of worry and continued playing while just avoiding the mound. They tried to return to their picnic and the girls were already chasing each other in circles again. It was supposed to be a joyous sunny day and my grandmother wanted to keep it that way. Things seemed to return to normal for a beat. The trees around them created a wall of dense foliage, blocking their view from anything inside the forest. One of the girls again took notice of something strange. It was immediately clear what it was. Along one of the long branches of the tree hung a noose. It was tied with rope and hung high above their heads. A lump of dirt can be explained away by nature, but someone had to have placed the noose there. My grandmother stopped dead in her tracks when she saw it. Something was wrong, very wrong. They couldn't just pack up and leave. John was still out in the woods. Even children can recognize a noose as a symbol of death. The children started to become very anxious. Whatever innocence was keeping them from worrying about the mound had completely vanished. My grandmother, the resilient woman she is, soothed her children and told them it was just left by deer hunters. But she knew in her heart they needed to leave. No deer hunter would hang a deer and then bury it. At least no sane deer hunter. It wasn't until they started hearing something in the woods that they started to really panic. My grandmother, as well as all the children, began hearing a rhythmic chanting from deep in the woods. It sounded as though there were a group of people all singing in deep voices to the beat of the drum. It went in a quick bum 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 pattern. Three steady beats followed by a pause and then it would repeat. It sounded far away, but immediately fear began to take hold of each one of them. They each listened and gathered together. As the seconds passed, it began to increase in volume. It was getting not just louder, but closer. What started out at a distant echo soon began to engulf the entire clearing. My grandmother was terrified and wanted so desperately to leave, but John had yet to return. They waited fear ridden as the sound began to fill their chests. It felt like they were at a concert as the deep bass began to vibrate in their chest. It was everywhere and constant, as though the sound was being made by the trees themselves, surrounding the family in every direction. Suddenly, the sound of yelling broke through the constant drone of chanting. John's voice was yelling out at them from the trees. Go, he yelled, get in the car. He came running out of the woods, yelling that they needed to leave. They had never seen terror on this man as they had at this moment. He was a man afraid of nothing, unbothered by the world around him. This was the most emotion any of them had ever seen from him. He saw something in those woods, something that shook his very being to the core. 
My grandmother began throwing everything in the back of the car as the kids got in as well. John and my grandmother picked up their things and as quickly as possible threw it all in the car. They had no care for the things they were packing up due to their fear. Food was all over the trunk and items were broken. After everything was tossed in, they both got in the car and drove away. This is where the main grunt of the story ends. But one fact from this story is what really has caused me to wonder all these years. My grandfather refused to ever speak of what he saw. He never told any of the children or my grandmother. Every time it was brought up, he quickly rebuffed it and angrily told them not to ask again. He never went to the police or told anyone outside of the family. My grandfather is the only person who knows what happened that day. When I first heard the story, I swore to myself I would ask him one day. Now I can't and regret it greatly. By the time I was in high school, he had moved out of state with other family members and I mostly lost contact with them outside of occasional happy birthday calls or letters. The story doesn't have an answer to go with it. When he died, the only thing I was sad about was never knowing what happened that day. We weren't close when I got older and once I learned of all the abuse he caused, I separated myself of him. His death looms over me and this story still haunts me to this day. My mother and aunts just look back on it as a spooky memory from their childhood. Nothing more than a story to spook the little ones at Thanksgiving with. I'm one of the only people in the family who's still curious about what happened. My childhood home was built by my own grand something father and has stayed in our family since forever. My mother claims that her paternal side of the family were always rather sensitive to paranormal stuff, despite trying hard to hide this. While the entire house was iffy and plain uncomfortable to live in, there was a certain room that no one could bear to stay in. It used to be my grandparents, but they couldn't handle it and decided that my aunt would sleep there. My aunt wasn't able to either and ended up sleeping anywhere but her own bedroom. When my own parents took over, I was about four years old. And of course, they gave me the bedroom. Not that I knew any of this until years later. Both my parents went to great lengths in order to convince me and my brother that paranormal stuff was just made up in order to scare kids. Doesn't change the fact that I went from sleeping through the night since I was three months old to barely being able to sleep at all. I would complain about seeing someone scary and dangerous in my room. I still remember the pure terror I felt every single night going to bed. I couldn't sleep unless I was hidden under the comforter while facing the wall, with the CD drowning out the noise with folktales and Christmas carols playing in the background. After a while, my little brother started sleeping in the same room due to his being repainted. I lasted for a couple of days before my mother decided that the two of us should sleep in her room while she slept in mine. My father was away for weeks at a time due to work. She told me later on that she decided to do that because my brother woke up screaming. I'm a really heavy sleeper and didn't notice. And the next day, she saw bruises and what looks like scratches on his back and around his neck. She slept there that one night, but ended up joining us in her room after. She apparently woke up unable to breathe during the night. And when she looked up, she saw someone on top of her before she was being choked by them. She really thought she was gonna die, but managed to throw the thing off before running out of the room. After that night, nobody ever slept in my bedroom again. Me and my brother were clueless, despite us both being terrified of what resided inside my room. Our mom simply pretended that it was nice for me and my brother to share the big bed, while she took over my brother's room. This greatly helped my sleep and general feeling of terror, despite still feeling scared every night in that house. I never felt scared anywhere else. Neighbors and friends would also tell us that they saw someone in the window of my bedroom 
despite none of us being there. None of us were even tall enough to look out of the window. My dad eventually bought me porcelain dolls so they could tell the people who asked that it was probably the dolls set up on the windowsill. I never knew any of this until later on, but it got to the point that people actually started avoiding walking past our house alone because they thought it was haunted. Me and my brother and even random kids from primary school would talk about, mention, and interact with people in my home who weren't there. My mom always played it off, but you can't really do much when a random kid is asking you about the old man sitting in the chair, or when your son asks about the lady who was petting his feet in the morning. Eventually, the house burned down, the second house fire we survived. We rebuilt and my mom had the place exercised at least 10 times by all sorts of different people. From priests to people who claimed to be clear sighted or able to talk to angels and practitioners of the occult. This was done in secret, of course. When we moved back in, it was better for a while. Personally, I repressed all memories and ideas regarding anything paranormal or scary. I convinced myself I was just afraid of the dark as a kid. I lived a couple of years in ignorant bliss. But then it started again. Little things at first. Hearing someone coming through the front door just to walk up the stairs and look around before leaving again when I was home alone. I thought it was a family member ignoring my greeting and was mightily insulted until I found out at dinner that no one had been there. Then I started having trouble sleeping again, but only in my own bedroom. I never had nightmares, but I had trouble calming down enough to fall asleep. I had a big clump in my chest, feeling like something terrible would happen at any minute. My current bedroom is roughly in the same place as the previous one. My toddler brother started talking to people. He had a name for one of them that he would always laugh and smile at. But there was also one which terrified him and would make him start shaking while staring transfixed and cry about mean and scary. I felt my soul leave my body the first time I held him during this. His eyes would follow movements I couldn't see. Then my cousin came to sleep over with my aunt. Only problem was that he couldn't fall asleep because of those scary people chanting my initials over and over and the man who would walk in to stare at him from time to time when he was in bed. Not my bedroom this time. Eventually, I started feeling like someone was walking into my room every night. But I convinced myself that I was just being paranoid due to my recent trouble falling asleep. Sometimes I would hear my youngest brother, at this point a young child, knock on the walls. I often humored him and knocked back. This continued for several weeks until I asked my mom, who slept in the same room as him, why he was awake and knocking on the walls when he should be sleeping. She said that he'd only done that once when she was trying to put him to sleep, but that she'd put a stop to it. My brother confirmed it later when I asked him about it. I spent weeks knocking different tunes and repetitions back and forth with someone through the walls but nobody else even heard it. I immediately quit it, and the wall I'd often seen as a safe space became another thing that frightened me. It didn't take too long after that before I regularly felt someone's breath on my face after having closed my eyes when trying and failing to fall asleep. I couldn't handle this and started staying awake at night to avoid it. I eventually moved out and all the problems disappeared. I didn't lay paranoid in bed, waiting for shit to happen. I didn't feel scared, and I fell asleep easily and peacefully. I still got my room back at my parents' place, and I've recently moved back. I thought I was over whatever the fuck was going on. But the more time I spend in my bedroom here, the more I start feeling like I used to. I can feel the staring and the breathing whenever I spend too long falling asleep at night. The heavy feeling in my chest is back 
and I don't feel fully rested when I wake up, despite sleeping heavily with only good dreams. I don't want to believe in paranormal shit because I find it terrifying, but I can't explain a lot of the shits from my childhood any other way. I honestly feel kind of crazy just thinking about all this stuff, but there are so many other people who have experienced shit around my family home that I just can't ignore it, even though I'd like to. Fun fact, the Rebeats house was hit by lightning that caused a minor earthquake which woke up the entire neighborhood. The house was glowing green, according to eyewitnesses. Okay, so I don't know where to start, but I'll start with a bit about myself first for some basic info. I believe in God. So I already do believe that paranormal things do genuinely exist, since demons could easily try to fuck with things and people of our world. I will say though, that I'm probably one of the most skeptical people in the world towards the paranormal, besides my belief in God. By the way, not sure what flair I should have used, so I just went with what seemed closest, even though I don't know if it was a man. Okay, so I'll guess I'll finally start the story. So at this time, it was late at night, about, I don't know, somewhere between 12 and 2. I was working out in a warehouse, getting some stuff ready for my work coming up in the next few days. I do this kind of thing on the regular. There were wild animals where I was at, so I was a little bit tense since there were foxes, skunks, cougars, and bears in the area. Anyways, so I got done with my work and the lights were on in the building still. And then I opened the door to leave. Oh, I should mention, there are two trees kind of close to the door of the building. By the way, I also have music playing in my earbuds and I'm totally chill right now because I can finally end the night and go to bed. I opened the door to leave and straight in front of me, there are the two trees. They're about 70 feet in a straight line in front of the door and slightly to the right. I look straight out after opening the door and I see what I immediately assumed was a shadow next to the trees. It's similar to my height, but I thought it was just a shadow. My shadow to be specific. It was literally in a humanoid shape. One of the main reasons it spooked me though is because if this was a shadow, why haven't I ever seen it before? I've done this hundreds of times. Why am I just now seeing an eerily dark, super still shadow? So I start getting more nervous as I have these thoughts going through my head. So then I stare at its head and neck in particular, and I tilt my head. It didn't move. It didn't fucking move. I start saying a little prayer, asking God to not have this be my time to go, but also start thinking of any rational explanation of how this is not actually a paranormal thing or being. My thought process. I have had migraines and migraines that mess with my vision before. Maybe it's my vision. Nope, I don't have a headache. And I look to a different section of its body and its image doesn't change with my vision. Maybe I had a weird shape burn into my retina and for some reason I'm seeing it now of all odd times. Nope, I have vision that is about 50% more sensitive to light. And if it was this bad, if a burn, I'd be at least extremely uncomfortable or be crying right now because of my eyes being in pain. Maybe the tree is making a weird shadow. No light is shining on the tree to make a shadow appear there. By the way, I've stood here looking at the shadow for about 50 seconds at this point and have still seen it even after blinking. Anyways, I remember I did more checks to see if it was real or not. I finally thought, fuck, let's just shine a flashlight on it and see if it goes away like a shadow. I shine my focusing flashlight on it, which is focused, so it becomes the brightest it could be. It's still there. It's still goddamn there. It literally looks as if the light is unable to touch it, since it's literally as black and indistinguishable of a figure as it was before. 
I just now know that it's 100% a humanoid body and absolutely not a shadow. I reached the conclusion that it's either me being really fucking paranoid and or having a migraine, some kind of paranormal being, or a guy came to rob the place wearing clothes painted with that paint that absorbs light so we could blend in with the shadows. So I finally do what I think will be a good test. I completely look to my left, body included, shut my eyes for one full second, and then look back to see if the shadow has followed my movements, or it's disappeared and it was just me being crazy. I look back and it's still fucking there. At this point, I started getting really freaked out and started seriously getting nervous and paranoid. I'm staring at it again and it's in the exact same position. I literally thought to myself, is this thing going to finally kill me? It honestly seems as if it's almost trolling me since it literally hasn't moved and we've just had a staring contest for about two minutes at this point. So after staring at it and thinking that, I blinked and it was gone. Then I really was shitting myself, thinking, oh great, so you either got a robber to try to finally hide himself and run away, hmm, I should listen really well to see if I can hear any noise, like any movement outside, if he's running away. Complete silence besides literally crickets. Okay then, so if it's actually a paranormal entity, I've just had a staring contest with it and then joked about it in my head. If it was going to finally make a move and then it did, so did this thing just fucking read my mind? What the fuck? I stood there and thought this and was freaking out for maybe like seven seconds and then thought, well, if it's paranormal, then this is going to do probably jack shit, but this will make me feel better. So I slammed the door shut and then held my leg against the door so it was held shut as tight as I could. So I sat there paranoid and thinking what the fuck for like 20 minutes until I finally decided to leave because, well, because I thought to myself, if God wants me dead in 20 seconds, I'll die in 20 seconds whether I go outside or not. So there's no point in sitting here all night long. So I left and nothing else happened the rest of the night besides me reflecting on what the fuck happened. And if it was a real paranormal entity, demon, angel, or what the fuck else it could be. Here's my most detailed description of what it looked like. From what I could tell, it was as if you took the darkest shadows that exist and made a body out of it. Nothing reflected off of it. Light didn't look like it touched it. You might be thinking, well, did it look 3D or have a highly defined edge between where it's center of its body and body sections defined its edges? And no, it didn't. It's like it had an ever so slight shadow aura around the entirety of its form, where there's a quarter of an inch thick deep shadow that makes its form hard to dis distinguish. Honestly, kind of like real shadows. Before you ask, did it have eyes? It didn't. While researching about what I encountered, some people have noted something similar, but it always had eyes, but mine didn't. So I'm unsure as to how or if those two are connected. If I had to describe it closest to anything, I'd say take an umbral blot from D&D, make it humanoid, then give it a slight shadow aura so it's hard to tell exactly what shape it is. Also, it didn't appear to be wearing clothes, or at least if it was, it was skin tight since nothing on or of its form depicted any kind of cloth, kind of dangling or adding thickness to its body. This is the most stereotypical shit to say after someone just essentially claimed the impossible happened to them and that promises over the internet can be seen as pathetic as paper, but I promise I'm not bullshitting about this. Through therapy and medication and meditation, I've been able to look back on my past without shutting it down from fear. My sister and I had a traumatic upbringing. 
I know abused children survive through escapism and imagination, which was our case. It was helpful when this was explained to me by child specialists and therapists, as some of the experiences felt terrifying. Something happened to me this past year that has inspired me to ask others about a few experiences that I was never able to fully let go of as childhood coping skills. I would love to hear what you think. I'll start with the most tangible. My sister and I had just been dropped off home by the school bus. We ran inside to catch our favorite cartoon, like always. As we start watching, a loud thud hits the window. Then another, followed by a few more, hitting the sliding glass door to the backyard. The sky became dark and we saw they were black birds. All circling our backyard, blocking the sky. I don't know for how long it lasted, but the memory stuck with us. I always thought it was some weird bird migration, or maybe something was in our backyard they were interested in. If there's a simple explanation, that would be great. Now to the figures we saw. This also happened in the same room with the birds. We shared a bedroom and would often sleep with the TV on, being too scared to sleep in the darkness. Just as I was falling asleep, I saw a figure standing right in front of me by my bedside, looking down at my face. The best I can remember, the figure seemed like an older woman. She had no discernible clothes and there was no detail in her body. The whole figure was the same grayish color except for the eyes. They were completely black, like no iris or white parts, just black. I had never felt such confusing fear. I pulled myself under the blankets and couldn't scream. I tried to wake my sister up by nudging her, but she was out. I peeked my head over the blankets and she was still standing there looking down at me. I returned to the blankets and finally wake my sister up. The figure was gone and I ran so, so fast to my mom. She checked the room for me and slept in our bed that night. I've explained this away, thinking it was a different type of dream I had never experienced before or that maybe the TV lights created a figure in my mind. My sister one day ran into the kitchen with wet hair in a towel, terrified. Some background here. My little sister had really bad night terrors. The times where she sat up pointing at nothing in the room, screaming were the worst. My mom and I tried to console her as she explained. After taking a shower, she went to turn the lights on in the bedroom when a robed figure began gliding towards her. She describes not seeing any detail of a body and only seeing the white robe. She explained to me that she knows the difference between night terrors and waking reality. I believe her. Growing up, we had a few scary religious people tell us we had powers and stuff about demons. Part of our abuse was through our family's church. When our mother came to them asking for help with our father, they ignored her and made her to blame while protecting my father. Both sides of our family sided with the church and abandoned us. My sister never brought into religion while I still try to hold on in my younger years. My mother tells me when I was around four years old, I told her something that kept her spiritual even after her church abandoned us. My mom was driving with my little sister and I in the back seat. I calmly told her a glowing man sat and talked with me. He told me everything would be okay. I love this idea, but understand I could have just randomly blurted out something I heard. Who knows, but it's the only memory I, I like out of these. One night, we went to a sleepover with some friends from school. It was the first time staying at one girl's home and meeting her mother. Her mom ended up being the type of religious who believes in demons and locking them up in cages through prayer. 
That says way too much for us. She had us in a prayer circle. We were all holding hands on the floor, my sister to my left, with friends to our left and right, and the mother across from us. As she's praying, we close our eyes. I began to feel pressure on my back, like a hand, but without feeling any physical mass to it. Just the pressure, if that makes sense. I started inching in, scared, and then feel my sister to my left is doing the same. I kept feeling the pressure on my back and started pushing against her to get her closer in, feeling frustrated even. My eyes were squeezed shut until after the prayer was finished. After the mother left for bed, I started saying something to my sister about being angry at her for blocking me from getting in closer when I was scared. She was angry right back at me for doing the same to her. We then realized we may have experienced the same thing. One of the girls was smart enough to separate us and have us tell what happened. I told two girls, she's told the other two girls. Our stories were the same. She had experienced the same thing and was pushing in closer to get away from whatever it was. The strangest part, my sister's eyes were opened. She had stopped closing her eyes in prayer a long time before that night, so it wasn't out of the ordinary. All girls were holding hands, nobody got up, and even if they did and she somehow missed it, we would have heard them. After we put it together, we were all shocked. The mother's daughter looked at us wide-eyed and ran to her mother. Her mother sat us down and told us we had powers. She talked about demons and angels and honestly freaked us out. That night, we didn't sleep at all. We rarely got good sleep growing up from being scared though. The, old, the, the other girls eventually fell asleep. Even though I'm thinking, how did any of them just fall asleep after that? Wasn't this crazy? My mom was so mad when she found out she had been working hard to keep us away from scary things and then that happened. That scared us for a long time and nobody seemed to understand how real it was for us. When I was a baby, my parents brought an old house in an historical society that used to be a toll house way back in the day. It's approximately 315 years old, but I think I'm lowballing that. I had never felt completely safe in that house for the 25 years I lived there. When I was a kid, I thought it was normal to just always feel like you were being watched and to feel something hanging on your back. I wasn't allowed to go over people's houses or have anybody over until I got to around middle school. I remember going to a friend's normal modern house when I was 12 and immediately feeling safe and private. I didn't feel eyes burning into me. It was so strange to feel that, and I remember dreading going home. I didn't fully click that my house was odd though until friends came over and they said my house was creepy. I remember going to the bathroom while they were waiting in my bedroom. My dad was asleep in bed and my mom was in her office working, one floor and several rooms adjacent away. I came back from the bathroom and they had asked me who I was talking to. I said, I wasn't talking at all. I was in the bathroom. And I remember my one friend telling me that she heard two women whispering just outside my door. She thought I was talking to my mom. That moment really chilled me. They were afraid to sleep in my room and ended up staying awake all night. I remember most nights when I would go to bed I would feel like a man was watching me through my window. I slept on the second floor. It felt like there would be somebody standing on the roof watching me, even though I know there physically was nobody there. I begged my mom for years to get curtains, but she refused. She refused to put any curtains up in the house, and I always felt watched from the roof and backyard. I eventually put up blankets to feel safe, but I still felt eyes burning into me. 
We had a decently furnished basement where my brother and I had all our video game stuff. Anytime I brought friends down, they would always ask to go back upstairs instead, but never said why. I grew to love and hate the basements as it was a respite from my mother. But then I would have to deal with the door opening and shutting by itself, as well as feeling hands on my ankles from time to time if I tried to nap. I remember one time asking my brother if he ever experienced that, and he said he would often feel a sensation of a hand by his feet, but ignored it because it was that or deal with my mother. Not getting into that kind of worms, but yes, we preferred being terrified instead of dealing with our mother, lol. It soon became a running joke not to go into the basement unless you wanted to get grabbed. And it became normal to just feel fucking uncomfortable down there at all times. Not many things happened to me physically at that house. Almost always it was feelings of being watched or seeing a figure in my peripheral only to turn and nothing be there. There are a few more things of note that I can think of now. And one is that there were regularly footsteps in my parents' bedroom. But unlike anything else that happened in that house, this was comforting. In the summer, we would sleep on my parents' floor because it saved on AC. I would stay up very late on my Game Boy while my parents slept. But frequently, the sound and feeling of footsteps would go by me on the floor. This was when I was very young and it was just a normal thing. And they made me feel safe. Like whoever was walking around was making sure everything was alright. Even as I got older and would sit in the room directly below, if I heard the footsteps up while my parents were in other rooms, I kind of felt at ease and like whoever was up there wanted me to know they were there. Also, we had quite a large backyard, about an acre of land and it was really pretty, but I would often have terrifying nightmares of it most nights. I would have had bad dreams about people dragging me out there or wild animals attacking me while figures watched. I honestly believe people may have died out there. I stayed out of the backyard as much as possible when I lived there and those dreams plagued me for years. The last thing I can think of off the top of my head was when I was in the senior year of high school. My mom and I were really at odds as I was the only child left in the house. She kept asking me to sleep on the floor in the living room. At this point in my life, she slept on the couch and my dad slept in the bed because he genuinely snores so loud she couldn't take it. I really didn't want to sleep in there with her. The living room has four large windows, two facing outside and two facing the backyard. I hated it. I reluctantly agreed and I remember her leaving the TV on some animal channel when she fell asleep. I was laying on the floor with my phone when suddenly I felt a full hand, palm and fingers lay on the back of my head and very quickly shove my head down into the pillow. I'm getting anxious just typing about it. The only people home were my mom, myself and my dad. I could hear my dad snoring upstairs and my mom was five feet away on the couch. I was utterly terrified and I yelled stop and hid under my pillow in fear. My mom freaked out and had no idea what was going on. I was too afraid to move. She didn't believe me when I told her what had happened. And I remember going back up to my bedroom and praying to whatever God would listen to keep me safe from whatever had done that. I could still feel the phantom sensation of that hand. And I remember basically never going into the living room again after that, unless it was daytime and somebody else was with me. The older I got, the less safe I felt in that house. I eventually isolated myself to my bedroom when I wasn't at school or work. So I couldn't fall asleep until eight or nine in the morning. I just always felt watched. I started buying white and black candles from the local pagan store as they told me white was to promote positive energy and black was to protect my mind. You can imagine after 25 years of weird shit and feeling unsafe, I was willing to try anything to keep me feeling somewhat sane. It helped a lot, but maybe it was just a placebo. Who knows? 
Now I live in an apartment very far away from that house and experience zero paranormal things. I don't feel watched, I don't feel scared. I don't have nightmares and I finally feel safe. I, ha I hate going there to visit my parents. There's a lot to go over. I guess I will go over how the events unfolded to me. It started a kind of strange. As a kid of at least six or seven years old, my parents were looking for the broom in the house as it had gone missing. They were tearing the house apart trying to find this broom and eventually gave up. Weeks later, my mom was vacuuming in our computer room where we had a large shelf in the corner in a way that would not allow for things to pass around the sides. This shelf is also about 200 pounds. Behind the shelf was the missing broom. I of course was blamed and it was a big ordeal. This was only the beginning of the strange occurrences. Soon after that, several things followed. Everything from knocks to brand new light bulbs going out. Some things worth mentioning are the TV remotes flying off the table. Not just falling, but flying at least three feet forward and then falling to the ground. At this time, other miscellaneous items were falling too. Plus a couple of my infant brother's toys would go off at random times during the night. Now my dad grew up in a conservative Christian household, so he was very quick to dismiss the stuff he saw happening. But the more he experienced, the more he started to pay attention. One of the things I vividly remember is sitting in the living room in my play school plastic table eating some apples. I heard my name being called clear as day in a whisper. I quickly ran to the back of the house where my mom was and told her what's happened. My mom was very religious, so we said a prayer. Soon after that incident, we moved houses out of central Texas due to my dad getting a new job. We didn't really think about those occurrences after that, until things started happening again. The first occurrence I can recall is the most chilling one. My dad got home late from work and my brother was asleep in the living room. My dad was talking to my mom when he thought he heard someone talking in the living room. He walked in there and found my brother asleep talking to someone like he was having a bad dream. My dad listened for a little bit and began to hear something else, a young girl's voice. He couldn't make out what she was saying, but my brother kept responding no to it. My dad quickly woke him up and asked him what he was dreaming about and he replied with, a girl. She was asking me to go with her. My brother slept in their bedroom that night. Several other small things happened later, such as things being moved or knocks, but a couple major things happened when I was about 11 or 12. My mother was up late one night while my dad was on a business trip. She slept with our two Dashuns that were very calm. She was studying for her online college and she heard heavy footsteps coming down the hallway. She assumed it was me and my brother. My dog became alert and started growling at the door. Apparently, my mom had never heard a dog growl with such fear before. Her doorknob turned and the door opened with no one on the other side. I remember being woken up to my mom crying, holding me and praying. One day, I witnessed my dog get hit by a car. As I was running back to the house to tell my mom what happened, she heard me screaming that Frida got hit by a car. As soon as she heard that, the brake to the house flipped and we had no power. I'll explain this occurrence at the end. One of the most recent things that happened in 2014, I was getting home from school. It was around dinner time and my mom was cooking a casserole. I was in the kitchen with her getting the table ready. I remember seeing her drop the casserole dish and it's hitting the ground and making no noise. I asked her, did you just drop the casserole? She looked at me puzzled. She said, yeah, I dropped it about an hour ago. I had to remake it. The dish was on the stove and nothing was on the ground. 
I swear I saw that dish hit the ground. So this is what I experienced firsthand. So I wouldn't find out the whole picture until later in my life. My mom has always had issues with stress and anxiety. She started school in 2005 when all of this stuff happened. My dad saw this correlation and did some research. He found that this occurrence is called a poltergeist. He found that sometimes stress can affect people in a way that magnifies supernatural occurrences. I guess in a way, you could say mum was some level of psych psychic ability. Even hearing this as a kid, I was skeptical. Ghosts are one thing, but psychics? I later found out that my mom's side of the family has experienced much, much worse than what I did. My grandpa grew up with 10 siblings in one small two-story house. Most of them stayed in one room and would play there a lot. One day my grandpa was showing his dad a handstand while in his room. It was a bad place to do a handstand because there was a glass mirror right behind him. If he were to fall, he would land on the mirror. Sure enough, he fell, but the door to his room opened and stopped him from hitting the mirror. The scary part is that the door didn't open that way. The door opened through the threshold and stayed. My great grandfather grabbed my grandpa and slammed the door back into place and yelled, that damn door isn't supposed to open that way. There's a lot of things that occurred with that side of my family, but it would take a book to explain. To wrap it up, going back even further in my family lineage. My mom's great, great, great grandmother was hung for being accused of witchcraft. My mother practiced witchcraft in her younger years, and me and my brother have had dreams predicting the future of numerous occasions as children along with my mom. One last thing. In 2017, I was with my wife at her mom's house. While watching TV, we saw a dark figure in the reflection. It started in my wife's mom's room and moved into the hallway. I told my mother-in-law and she'd seen the figure in her dreams. She thinks it had something to do with the guy she was dating at the time, went to a psychic and told her about the situation. She told the psychic about what I saw and without her knowing anything about me, said it ran in my family. I haven't experienced anything since 2017 and my mom is done with school and hasn't experienced anything for a long time. This experience happened three years ago, during the 2018-19 Christmas holidays and the first week of New Year. It was the first holidays without my maternal grandma and the third without our paternal grandma. My parents were struggling in their marriage and their mental health. My little sister was 15 years old and was acting out, going to illegal car races, getting drunk, holding drugs for friends, smoking, getting into fights in school and out of school, just mixing with a bad crowd, including a gang that I had mixed up with five years prior. And they started stalking her because she was my sister. And in general, she was doing terribly in school. Our parents had completed left her be. They wouldn't parent her and only yell at her when they were in the mood to play the parents. She was by herself in her room. I was visiting every second weekend since I was away for college in an attempt to be in the loop. I wouldn't see my sister all the time. She was constantly out or in her room and wouldn't allow anyone to enter. The Christmas holidays came and a week prior, my sister called me crying in the middle of the night, which I was up studying for finals and told me that she had nightmares every night and wanted to do something that would get her out of this funk. I decided to talk to my aunt about allowing us to stay at her house while she was visiting her boyfriend for Christmas, and she agreed. Then, I surprised my sister by visiting earlier than expected, and I had a hard conversation with our parents. I told them that I had noticed that things were tense around here, and I would get my sister to my aunt's house for the week leading up to Christmas, 
and be back for Christmas if the weather allowed, so they can have some alone time to work on what is going on with them. So I took my sister and we returned to my college town where for two days, my sister watched me study and came with me to class while I wrote finals. It was the day of my last exam and I had promised her that we will go Christmas shopping or at least check the prices and items we wanted and make a budget list, then go grocery shopping and make brownies or cookies, depending on which ingredients were cheaper. She was excited beyond words. She wasn't stopping singing and humming Christmas songs all day. It was a sight to see. But at the time, I was in between medications for my osteoarthritis chondropathy and Hashimoto thyroiditis, and I had vitamin D and E deficiency, and I was taking supplements for it. Plus, I was suffering from migraines and headaches for days on end, causing me nosebleeds, dizzy spells, and even fainting. I was praying that day I would be okay and didn't have to go home, but I wasn't. I woke up feeling like death. My head was killing me and my eyesight was blurring in and out of focus. I felt like I couldn't sleep properly. I cried in the bathroom because I was afraid. I did everything my doctors told me, took my pills and supplements, took a painkiller, ate a nice breakfast and drank a glass of orange juice. I ignored the blurring vision all day until I almost fainted at the grocery store. My vision went black for minutes and then I was on my knees with my sister calling my name, worried. She got me some dark chocolate muffins and an orange juice and forced me to eat them as she went to pay for them. I ate a muffin and the juice and I felt better, so I thought I could keep going. We finished our shopping and my sister demanded that we go home and that the rest could wait for tomorrow and we could do online research if we had to. As we got out of the store, I saw a woman begging for money that looked so, so much like our maternal grandma but with blue eyes instead of hazel brown ones. They could be twins if you put them side by side. My sister called out to me, but for some reason I felt compelled to go to her. I gave her the second muffin and a juice box my sister had bought for me. I felt like she needed them more than me. I was so dizzy in that moment, I thought I would collapse, and my nose was cold, plus I had no control over my limbs. I was doing this out of instinct. As I handed her the brownie and the juice, she looked up to me. The look of true shock as she grasped my hands were cold, yet mine were a little bit warmer than hers. I was sweating like crazy, but when she held my hands and I looked at her face with blurry vision, dizziness and the headache was gone. My breath was caught up in my throat as I looked at her shocked. She looked so much like my grandma. She said a shaky thank you as tears ran down her eyes and wished me happy holidays. I mumbled a weak you're welcome and then she let my hands go. Bleariness, headache, dizziness came rushing back and the force made me trip over myself and my sister had to catch me. She asked me why I did that and why I wasn't answering her calling my name. I hadn't listened to anyone calling, and it had only been a couple of seconds, right? No, five minutes had passed. I was holding this woman's hand for five whole minutes, and I was frozen. People were looking at me oddly. I said I didn't know what happened, and we got on the bus. Then my nose started bleeding, and then I took my phone out in order to get it out of the way so I can reach for my tissues. I checked the time. It was 1746 and my sister looked shocked at it and showed me hers, 1803. She said that 1746 was when we came out of the store. She checked it because she thought it felt it buzzing. The time on my phone reminded the same for an hour even though I restarted it twice. I had no signal nor Wi-Fi. As we were on the bus at 18.08, we passed by the same grocery store and I looked at the window searching for the homeless woman. She wasn't there anymore. 
I searched for her twice more after that, so I never saw her again. I think of her from time to time, and I don't know why all of this happened. And if she was a ghost or an angel, my grandma trying to remind me to be kind and giving, like she was. I never told this story to anyone until now. I stay in an area of North Carolina that back in the early 19th century had the biggest sawmill in the United States at the time. The town of Elizabethtown now sits on the grounds of that sawmill. To the north is Bladen Lake State Forest. There's a creek there called Turnbull Creek, named after the Indian chief that laid claim to the land there. My grandfather told me Chief Turnbull struck a deal with the sawmill and allowed them to cut the trees except in one area where many of their ancestors were laid to rest. The story goes that the loggers began cutting and for years, no problem had ever come between the loggers and the tribe. Until the day they cut on the sacred land. A battle broke out and in the end, the tribe was slaughtered, all except the chief. It was said he cursed the land and swore to protect it forever. It was said he changed into a black smoke as dark as coal and in it were two bright red eyes, like fire. A story when told in detail would scare any kid from venturing off into those woods, except me and my then best friend. In my younger years, I loved to explore. So naturally, those woods made a great place to have adventures and discovery. The creek always gave relief from the hot summer days. The cool water fed by springs that were so cold that in the heat it would give you goosebumps. I used to think there was gold in that water for the glittery flakes you would find all over your skin after a dip in the tea-colored waters. You always had to be careful of where you took a swim because cottonmouths, water moccasins and rattlesnakes enjoyed its banks. The forest around it was loaded with wildlife. Deer, black bear, raccoons and squirrels could be seen around on a daily basis. Sometimes if you were lucky, you'd find an arrowhead or a railroad spike from the old logging rail that went down the side of the creek. The old dirt road to the creek was a good hour walk from the neighborhood. I remember one spot on that road was always cold, even in the summer. So cold, in fact, we would run as fast as we could to get through it. Sometimes it felt like the temperature would drop from 99 to 50 degrees right there. Eventually I got curious as to why. Maybe it was another creek that nobody knew about or a pond filled with fish, or maybe something else. Whatever it was, I was gonna find out. One day in June, me and my best friends set out to find out. My grandfather told us not to and told me the story of Chief Turnbull. I wrote it off as an old tale to scare kids and set off for the woods anyway. I never believed ghost stories. This one wasn't gonna scare me. I told my best friend to be prepared for him to try and scare us, and off we went. I remember walking forever through those woods and never finding anything. So we decided to follow the cold air and see where it went. After some time passed, we came up on a thick area in the woods. Thorny vines and thick underbrush were everywhere. The cold air was coming from inside of this thicket. We found that we thought was a deer trail and crawling on our hands and knees, we made our way through. It felt like a hundred feet we crawled before everything cleared. No trees, no bush, just tall grass and mounds of dirt scattered about and the air was freezing cold. The whole clearing was surrounded by the thickest like a ring. The air was misty like a light morning fog. In the middle of the clearing was what looked like smoke from a campfire. It was a dark smoke and in it was what looked like a person standing there. 
All I could see is the outline of a body. But when it turned around, I saw the eyes, bright red like fire. It moved towards us quicker than we could react. When we did react, we moved like lightning had struck us on the feet. I never knew a person could run on all fours, but we did that day, right back through the thickets so fast it seemed like a flash. Behind us, we could hear something stomping through the woods like a charging bear and people whispering in our ears. We made it out the thickets and never stopped running. We ran until the air warmed up and we couldn't breathe enough air in. I think it stopped chasing us long before we stopped because we didn't hear it anymore. But why not be a little safe and make sure? When we made it out of the woods, it was starting to get dark. No words spoken on that walk home, just two kids trying to make sense of what happened in our heads. We walked by his house first, then mine was a block away. I had to walk past my grandfather's house to get home. He was sitting on the front porch when I walked by. He asked me if we found what we were looking for, and I told him yes. He asked if I wanted to show him with a smile, in which I replied, no. The next day, I went back to my grandfather's house. He told me how he did the same thing when he was little, how he saw the clearing and the mounds. He said it chased them out of there too. Then Woods had a many dark secrets and that was just one of them, I remember him saying. My best friend and I drifted apart after that. He never spoke to me about it and I never spoke about it to him. He's now the chief of police in a town close by and I work for an engineering firm building roads and bridges. My stepson came to me not long ago and asked if we could ride that road one night and spotlight deer. I told him, go if you want to, but I wouldn't. Then woods hide a many dark secrets. Some of you don't want to discover. Sometimes I ride by that dirt road. Sometimes I'll look down it. Sometimes I see a smoky figure standing there with glowing red eyes looking back at me. When I do, I know Chief Turnbull is still there and he's still protecting the sacred lands. He won't have to protect them from me though. I'll never go back. This happened to me when I was in middle school. I decided to join a peer church group in the hopes that I would make some friends. Instead of finding friends forever, I had experiences so frightening, I avoid both churches and church groups. Backstory. There was a church in the next town over that had a reputation for being haunted. My best friend told me stories about other people who had seen a squat shadowy creature running around the church and jumping through closed doors. Coincidentally, this was the same church the peer group belonged to. It was a little nerve wracking for me to hear since I was going to be going to that church for a sleepover in three days time. Ultimately, I decided that I would be cautious, armed with this information and still go to the sleepover. This would be one of two terrifying experiences I would have there. Hide and go seek. Saturday comes and I ride out with the other kids that lived in town to this church. We had two chaperones, one young man and one young woman, which would be caring for us while we were there. They both sported casual attire, tennis shoes, jeans and t-shirt. This is important for what follows. After all of us had stowed our sleeping bags and belongings in the main hall, we gathered in a common area with a kitchenette attached by a hallway that led to the main hall of the church. After a little discussion, the chaperones decided to play a game of hide and seek inside the church complex. As I had already chosen my hiding place, I waited until everyone had scrambled off to find places to hide before I went to mine. In this common area, there were a set of two pews sitting against the back wall of the room. One of them had a piece of wide plywood leaning against it. To me, it was a perfect hiding place. I crawled underneath the pew with the plywood leaning against it and lined my back up with the back of the pew to keep from being seen from above. The plywood was wide enough that most of my body was hidden from view. However, 
they could still see the rest of the room and the kitchenette un unimpeded. After about five minutes, the whole church fell silent and then slowly, it got really quiet. I couldn't even hear the running refrigerator in the kitchenette anymore. I was so scared I held my breath, listening to the pregnant silence. Not long after, I saw from my hiding place a pair of shiny black cowboy boots silently walking from the hallway that led to the main church hall. Barely breathing, I watched intently as the boots walked into the middle of the room, stop and turn in the direction I was hiding. The boots walked right up to where I was and whoever or whatever it was grabbed the plywood and leant, leaned it back from the pew. The shadow of a slim head darkened the plywood as whoever it was peered down towards me. Abruptly, the shadow of the head turned back towards the hall, then back down at me, before putting the plywood slowly back in place. Then, the boots turned and walked away, disappeared into the side wall. Shortly after, everyone including the chaperones came back into the common area looking for me. Startling the group, I emerged from my hiding place. I'm here, I said, faking a smile. I couldn't tell them what I saw. I knew in my heart they wouldn't believe me. As the chaperones discussed what to do next, I took the time to look down at their feet. Both of them were only wearing tennis shoes. I spent a sleepless night listening to the hard thump of leathery creak of cowboy boots walking back and forth and between the sleeping children and even right past me as I hid in my sleeping bag. When the light of dawn came pouring in from the stained glass window, I jumped out of my sleeping bag and packed everything up as fast as I could, glad to be gone. Preacher. A few weeks had passed since the night of the black boots. I had decided not to leave the peer church group, figuring I would be safe if I didn't go to any other sleepovers at the church. I was mistaken. One day, I was invited to stay the night at the group leader's house and go the next day with her and her family to the Sunday sermon at the church. Despite some apprehension, I accepted the invite. After a wonderful Saturday night of country fried pork and gravy and a moonlight ride on horseback, Sunday morning arrived. It was time to go to church. Her two kids as well as myself were herded into the main hall and into a row of pews close to the days where the preacher would be delivering his sermon. All three of us kids, still sleeping from the previous night, were quick to fall asleep to the sound of the preacher's almost monotone voice. As soon as the sermon was over and he stepped down to shake hands with the various parishioners, I was suddenly awake. Instinctively, I looked around until my eyes fell on the preacher. Something was wrong with, with him, just plain wrong. I ducked into the crowd, aiming for the back of the church. When I looked back halfway to the other side of the room, I realized that he was following me with each hand he shook, his milky white eyes like that of a corpse staring at me. Finally, I had made it to the back pews by the wall, scrambling underneath one and huddling behind it. I peered carefully over the top of the pew. He was still creeping closer and closer, his wrinkled face now being a wide, triumphant smile. He knew I was trapped. Just as he thought the crowd of parishioners and was heading straight at me, a tall man with short brown hair, wearing blue jeans and a white shirt segmented by blue lines, stands directly in front of where I'm going. Peering from the edge of his blue jeans, I watched as a smile fell from the preacher's lips as he looked his dead eyes with the man. An agonizing moment passed as they regarded each other before they carefully shook hands. With one more glance down at me, the preacher turned to his right, walked away, and back into the crowd. As I breathed a sigh of relief, the man in jeans leaned over and quietly told me, get out of here and never come back. Then he also turned in the same direction and disappeared too into the crowd. I ran outside as fast as I could, breathing hard from fear. I waited as far away as I could from the church for the peer group leader and her family to come out and take me home. The next day, I quit the group. Since that day, I have never set foot in that, nor any other church alone.
Before my best friends and I were separated, one passed away, the other moved away, we used to ride around doing all of the haunted legend places within reasonable driving distance. Sometimes we'd drive a few hours, but most of them weren't scary, other than the adrenaline-filled, hyped-up, did you hear or see that, that would cause us to get spooked. This one was different, way different. We were just out of high school, probably 20 at the most, and we were looking for an actually scary place to visit. A lot of the people we knew knew we were into these kind of things, so we'd always get tips on where to go. There was the original three of us that day, and another friend that wanted to tag along. After a little drive to our destination, about 45 minutes, we stopped at a Wawa to get gas and grab a few snacks. Like I stated earlier, we were all about 20 at the time, so we were all hyped up because we knew spooky time was getting close. We'd always pick on that other friend that tagged along. Nothing harsh, just, ah, you're scared. So I believe it was me that said something along those lines, and that was overheard by a few people. It got the attention of a few people in the Wawa, including these two creepy older guys who seemed like they didn't fit in. Their clothes were all beat up and dirty, and they just didn't seem right for the area. And time it was, probably 8 p.m. on a Saturday night. What's the little one scared of? asked one of the guys. I say little because the three of us are abnormally tall. The shortest between us was 6'4", and he was normal height, probably around 5'9". We replied and explained how we got tipped to go to this road because it's haunted. They replied that it wasn't that scary, and if we wanted a real scare, that we should go to this random road. I forget what it was called exactly, but apparently this random memorial statue for a plane crash in the middle of the woods that had crazy things are supposed to happen to it. We grabbed our stuff and didn't think anything of it. As soon as we left, the group started talking and decided to go with the other road that those guys hyped up. I know, a typical horror movie, what not to do. So we get to the entrance of the road and it already did not disappoint. Woods on both sides, not one damn street light in sight. And I remember there was like a detention center off to the right, in the middle of nowhere. So the spooks already began the second we hit the entrance. We decided to drive down the road and search for the statue. We noticed that there were trees cut down the side of the road and laying parallel to the shoulder of the road. We finally find the statue. About five minutes go by of silence and we decided to enhance the scare factor by shutting the lights off. About a minute goes by, and we see a shadow figure pop out from the statue. We all freaked out as it starts walking towards us, but it was making movements that no human would be normally capable of. It was dark out, but this thing was black. It was darker than the woodsy sky, so we could make out some of it. This thing was huge. Like I said earlier, we were all extremely large compared to the average guy, but this thing would have dwarfed any of us. We decided to peel out of there and continue down the road, figuring it would lead us out of here. Boy, were we wrong. About three minutes go by and we hit a dead end, which in this case was an open spot in the woods with sand everywhere. The cutout was massive, but surrounded by woods. There were different cutouts and ways to go from there. And I'm pretty sure the road continued after this cutout, but we were pretty deep in the woods at this point. So we decided to turn around and obviously leave. After we turned around, we stopped just to take in the eerie feeling. The other three guys were talking about the shadow we saw earlier, while I, ha I happened to catch something out of the corner of my eye. About 40 feet away from me, I see what appears to be a white face, and then another, and another, all surrounding the car. The other guys didn't see them, and I rarely ever get scared but seeing me panic, they knew something was up. My panic caused them to panic. All panicking now. We then floor it far away from the sand turnaround. We get about half a mile down the road, somewhere near the statue, and pull over to gather our composure to get out of there. When we stopped, I swear I heard the typical ghost ooh noise. This was now turning into a movie. 
I wish I was never a part of. So we're all really scared now. After finding the way we came, we started heading back out. Remember those trees I talked about earlier? They were now laying in the middle of the road, blocking us in. As we all see the white faces masks as I saw earlier. Thank God my one friend, the driver, was good at driving and valued safety of his car. We drove on the edge of the woods, what felt like we were defying gravity to speed our way out. The car was literally sideways on the edge of the woods. I mean, I could literally hear a single finger out the window and touch the trees. We all made it home safely that night. After doing research, we found out that the spot was notorious in that area for crazy things happening, such as body dumps and murders. Because of the shadow and the ghost noise we heard, my head, heart and gut tells me that the place is actually haunted. As previously stated, that place is famous for dumping bodies, along with the plane crash 100 years ago. So there's bound to be some spirits there. I think where we were that night was actually haunted. We just happened to be there on a night where there was more things going on. I can't say for certain, but I'm 99% sure we survived one of their setups that night. But what I'm 100% sure, I will never go back again. I got chills just typing this and I never tell this story. There were four of us there, one took our story to the grave and I'm sure the rest of us won't speak about it much either. Whenever we even bring it up in front of people, we always use the code THMTW so that we don't have to actually talk about it. THMTW of course stands for the horror movie that wasn't. I grew up in a house that was built in 1902. I was born in the late 80s, so the house had been remodeled a few times. It was a two-story house with three bedrooms and a tiny bathroom on the second floor. The bathroom was at the top of the stairs and my room was across the hall, kind of at an angle. My sister and my parents had rooms further down a long, narrow hallway. For as long as I can remember, I saw a ghost. I called her Pam. My mom told me I began talking about Pam around the age of five, and in her words, I never stopped. My mom never believed any of this and just brushed it off as my imagination. Pam was pink and transparent, a see-through, totally pink little girl, maybe eight or nine years old. She knew I could see her, I knew she could see me, but she never made a sound, ever, nothing. She walked around only the upstairs and never came down the steps. Honestly, I have no idea where the name Pan came from. Growing up, Pam would sit at the top of the stairs waiting for me to run up to the bathroom after I got home from school. I would walk around her because she was always there, every day. If she wasn't sitting on the step, she would be just sitting on a bed or standing in the rooms or hallway harmless for the most part. However, if I ignored her, she would mess up my bedroom while I was gone doing my paper route. And when I would get back home, my parents would be all sorts of angry over my messy room. But if I said a quick hi, she wouldn't mess with me. She never touched me and I also never physically saw her move anything with my own eyes. But I would get really scared and nauseous every time she would destroy my room behind my back. So I learned very quickly to say hi to her every day. At the age of 15, my mom put me into therapy because I was still bringing up Pam here and there. Pam was still always around. I was used to her and she wasn't doing it, any, anything. So she didn't come up in conversation as often. Therapy helped, but not with Pam. When I was 17, my parents decided to put our house up for sale. I don't know if it was all the people walking through or me packing my stuff up, but something triggered Pam and it got real crazy. About a month before our new house was built and ready to move in, I was asleep in my room. 
My bed was against the wall and I could lie on my side and see right into the bathroom. While asleep, I had a dream about Pam, still transparent, standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She pointed up and for the first time in my life, I heard Pam talk. She said, look, that's my mom. I sat up in bed and from the light fixture saw a dark haired woman hanging lifeless by a rope. Her boots fell off of her foot, hit the floor and I woke up. Holy shit. I couldn't say anything because my family never saw her. They didn't understand. Pam, Pam wasn't in their lives like she was in mine. I didn't really dwell too much on it. It was a dream. Pam was back to sitting on the top step the next day. Life as usual. But two weeks later, I had another dream. It started out exactly like the first one. The bathroom light was on and I could kind of see in while laying down in bed. But this time, I heard weird grunting and splashing. I sat up and saw clear as day the woman that was hanging from the light fixture only she was alive and holding Pam, no longer translucent, under the water in our bathtub. She was drowning Pam in our bathtub. I don't have any idea what made me wake up, but I couldn't contain my emotion. I ran down the hall and jumped into my parents' bed. Yes, at 17 years old. It was just my mom in there. I think my dad fell asleep on the couch or something, but I was hysterical. I told my mom everything through tears and gasps for air. My mom didn't know what to say. Then, in the middle of my sadness, Pam walked into the doorframe of my parents' bedroom. She was transparent again. I quickly laid down really close to my mom and pulled the covers over my head. I just remember saying, oh my God, mom, she's in here. I held my breath and seconds later, I felt cold, small hands on my back, shoving me against my mom. I kept yelling, stop touching me. My mom could only reply with, I'm not touching you. This went on for what felt like forever, but was probably only a matter of seconds. When she stopped, she just stood there at the side of the bed, staring at me. She didn't move. I pulled the covers over my head again and ended up crying myself to sleep while my mom held me. We were both shaking horribly. I moved all of my stuff out the next day and slept on the floor of our unfinished house the next few nights until my bedroom was done. I never went back. Shortly after my family moved out completely, before the next buyers moved in, the entire back of the house and the entire garage went up in flames. The official cause, spontaneous combustion. The first people to buy and sell the house after us lasted 10 months there. They called my parents to tell them that they couldn't keep the window or closet door shut in the room with the black carpeting. My bedroom. I wanted black carpet when I was 15. I saw the house posted a couple of months ago online and the only picture of my room shows the door open a crack. You can see a bit of the black carpet, but there's nothing in the room. The rest of the house is furnished. I've tried so hard to find any information about the girl that's in my old house, but there's almost no information at all. Just basic architecture and lot line documents. A few years ago, my friends and I were playing football at the school's football pitch, like we usually were. We were there for hours, which was nothing out of the ordinary. There were about six of us, and there was another separate group of about seven or eight people. The pitch was divided into thirds. We were taking up a third each, which we didn't talk to or anything, as we didn't know them, and they didn't know us. My friends and I were at the end near the school, and the forest was at the complete opposite end, about 80 or 90 yards away or thereabouts. At one point, one of my mates noticed two people wearing masks standing still at the other end, just staring at us. 
The masks looked similar to the Guy Fawkes mask, but they were somewhat different. They were on the other side of the fence, so we just ignored them, thinking it was someone from the other group playing some kind of joke before joining them. However, they were still just standing there about 15 minutes later. We asked the people from the other group if they knew them or if they knew what was going on, and they said they noticed them as well, but they thought they were from our group, which they definitely weren't. They stood there for five more minutes or so before leaving. So everyone just sort of ignored what just happened and kept playing with their groups. We heard a scream about half an hour later, which sounded like a female scream. The friend who lived across the road called his mum to make sure she's okay and to ask if she's been seen anything. She said that she was alright, that she heard the scream as well and was about to call us to see if we were okay. She knew we were at the football pitch playing football. So we just started playing again. Shortly after we started playing again, we heard and saw a police car and an ambulance speeding on the road outside the school. The road was on the opposite side of the school, but the school had more than one building and you could see the road between two of the buildings. About 10 minutes after the scream and the phone call, there were about five people standing where the two previous people stood and they were just staring at us. A couple of them had masks, the others didn't. Over the next few minutes, there were more and more people joining them, coming from different areas of the woods and or from the fields. Again, some of them had masks, some didn't. I think that in total, there were somewhere around 30 people just standing there staring at us. We obviously got scared and it was clear that the other group playing football was scared too. We eventually all stopped playing and we were just looking at them and they were looking at us. The other group joined us so that we could all be as far away from that group as possible. We had no idea what to do. We didn't know whether we should talk to them or not, if we made the right choice by acknowledging them. We didn't know if there would be more of them coming or if they would come onto the pitch. I forgot to mention, we weren't really supposed to be there as we were in the six week summer holiday so the school was closed and everything was locked up. However, someone managed to unlock one door and was facing the forest. Door which was used if someone kicked a ball over the fence during PE. This meant that we were trapped. We couldn't get out without going through them and we had nowhere to go if they decided to walk towards us. It felt like we all just stood there looking at them and they were looking at us for an eternity. But it was probably only a couple of minutes. We then all huddled up and decided what we should do. And we came to the conclusion that we should call the police. Even if we would have been told off for trespassing or whatever, our safety was way more important. However, we were all too scared to call 999. As it turned out, none of us has ever done it before. One of my friends volunteered to do it, so he got his phone out and had 999 dialed up. He just needed to actually call the number. However, as he was about to do so, we heard the ambulance and the police cars driving the other way, and the people started walking away pretty much straight after the cars passed the school. We decided to wait a little more to make sure they wouldn't be waiting for us somewhere in the forest which we had to walk through for a couple of minutes to get to the main road. Someone from the other group actually called his older brother and his mates to come and check. We waited for maybe an hour or more, after which we decided to get out of there to find the guy's brother, don't know any of their names, and quite a few of his friends waiting for us. They laughed at us at first, but then we told them what happened and they stopped laughing. Now, it could have easily been someone just messing with us, 
but I highly doubt it with that many people taking part. My mates and I still don't know why they were there staring at us and or what their intentions were, which probably adds to the eeriness. But yeah, this is the strangest and scariest thing I've been through in this area where something weird was definitely going on. I'm saying was because I haven't been there in about two or three years, but I wouldn't be surprised if strange stuff is still happening. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night and in the corner of your eye, you see someone standing there? Only to find when you look that way, there's nothing there. Chances are there was. Here, we call them people in the shadows. I was 15 the first time I saw them. In my bedroom, I had this beautiful bay window that took up the whole wall. I had a view of the orchard and just behind it at the edge of the yard was a fence that separated my yard from the state forest. For some reason, I began having issues with it though. At night, I felt like I was being watched and looking out the window, you couldn't see anything but darkness. That feeling got stronger over time, so I began hanging blinds and thick curtains so I felt a little safer. My stepdad decided to put a light outside where I could see at night through the window and I felt a little better. That is, until one night when I saw them. It was a fall evening and the only light you could see that was natural was the full moon overhead. The lights my stepdad put up shined down on the pear trees and I could see the edge of the yard pretty easily from my vantage point in my room. The silhouette of trees and bushes in the woods always seemed a little odd shaped, but tonight they moved. At first, I thought this just isn't real and found myself glued to the window watching. I could count 13 of them moving around. I could feel ice in my veins like they knew I saw them. I watched almost like I wasn't able to move, like my life depended on me not even blinking or they'll get me. They moved back and forth in the woods until one stopped through the fence. Yes, they walked straight through a solid object into my yard. They stood just at the edge of the light looking back at me. They were just a black shadow. No definition of the body except the outline and the void inside of each. I couldn't tell if they were facing me or had their back to me. No eyes, no face, just a shadow standing there like the shadow of yourself on a sunny day, but in the form of a body. I must have realized something because I quickly closed the blinds and pulled the curtains. In a panic, I don't know why I didn't go to my mom and stepdad and tell them. I just got in bed and pulled the covers over my head, wishing to wake up and they would be gone. My heart was beating so hard, I could hear it, but somehow I fell asleep. I woke up some time later and I couldn't move. At the foot of my bed, I could see a figure standing there very short, maybe three or four feet tall. It was holding my feet. To the side of the bed stood a very tall figure, hunched over in a room with an eight feet ceiling. It placed a hand on my chest and spoke in a whisper. To this day, I don't know what it said. Not that I could understand the language it spoke, but also because it spoke in a whisper so low I couldn't hear it. The shorter figure climbed up on my bed and scurried up, crawling to my chest like it was mad. Just as it grabbed me, they disappeared. The next morning, I wake up and my chest was hurting. I told my mom about it and to my astonishment, she wrote it off like I had a nightmare. When I looked in the mirror, you could see a handprint on my chest in a light red outline, a very large outline. This happened just about every full moon until I moved away. After that first time, my chest didn't hurt and there was never any marks on me again. 
I thought maybe if I tried to communicate with them, I could find out what they wanted. But every time I couldn't move, couldn't talk. Come to think of it, I don't think I was even breathing. Maybe it was, was just a bad dream, a nightmare that stopped the day I moved away. Sometime later, both my mom and stepdad had passed away and I had a marriage that fell apart. So I moved back into that house with my kids. My daughter got my old room and after the first night, we put more blinds and curtains up. I hung sage and put salt down by the window and she slept like a baby after that. She asked me why I put the salt and sage out and I told her to keep the shadow people away. She looked at me in horror and started crying. Then she whispered to me, so you see them too? I thought I was having a nightmare. They came out of those woods and I'm sure they are still there, waiting. What they want or what they did to me, I don't know. I wish I did. I wish whatever it is, I could find it and give it to them so they maybe will go away. The pear trees over time died over there. Nothing seems to grow but the grass. The fence is still standing and for some reason, it's rusty and brittle. The fence posts all look burned, even though there's never been a fire. We don't mess around on that side of the yard. All of us kind of feel uneasy about being there, so we let it be as much as possible. I can't say they are trying to do us harm, but I just feel uneasy, like something deep down inside me knows to be scared of them. Them woods have a many a dark secret. This one isn't too dark, but if you ever come to my house, I will let you sleep in my old room. Who knows, one night when the full moon is out, you might meet one of the shadow people. Keep in mind, it might be you they're looking for. Okay, so in November, I tried to off myself. Long story short, I have clinical depression and major gender dysphoria. I was in the hospital for two days and a night. That night has to have been the worst and best of my life. I know, I know, very contradictory. The way that I try to do it can cause hallucinations, but I honestly have no clue if the first two are hallucinations, just general shittiness of hospitals or paranormal. But I'm 100% certain that the last one wasn't a weird dream or a hallucination. So the first thing, I had already been there for at least a few hours and was having to drink charcoal, which is disgusting and gritty by the way. I was laying on the uncomfortable hospital bed, sipping this gross shit and listening to some music or watching a show or something. By this time, I was in one of the few private rooms, so I didn't have to wear a mask or be talked at by a few other patients, as that was making me panic. I have social anxiety. The washroom was connected to my room by a door that was a meteor or two away from my bed on the right. A small table and a counter to the left, along with one of the machines they had me hooked up to. Not the IV though, I can't quite remember where that was. The washroom door was closed, and I wasn't looking at it, because why would I? You also have to understand that this door was the loudest thing, and I'm really sensitive to sounds. So this door creaks open as slow as fucking possible, in the loudest way possible, making me jump and disconnecting one of the pad things attached to me. So I look over, trying to see if it's just a doctor or nurse, but I see this impossibly black hand wrap itself around the door. This wasn't the hand of a human though, and it wasn't black like a skin color. It was black like you've never seen fucking black, and it was fuzzy like toned down TV static. The machine started beeping to let me or a nurse know it was disconnected, and yet again, I jumped. Looking back at the door, I saw the hand slowly slip back and drag the door with it. The second thing, I'm pretty sure this one's a hallucination, as it's the same thing I've seen when I've had sleep paralysis. 
So I was up pretty late. It was probably 1 or 2 a.m. I was listening to music fairly loud on my headphones. Time warp from my The Rocky Horror Picture Show, to be exact. And I noticed that the light in the room was off. So I looked around to see if a nurse or doctor had come in to turn it off. Because they did that before when they thought I was asleep. But no one was there. Except for this motherfucker in the corner. It was a seven foot tall guy with owl wings, a skull for a head, frog legs, and beetle antennae. After a few minutes, it, I like to call him ball sack to make it less scary, started to blur into the wall as he usually does. The other times I've seen him, I was paralyzed, so I think this is just a weird hallucination. And last but not least, I think I met a God. So I'm not a religious person. There may be a higher power, but I don't know, right? But this dream was the weirdest thing. And well, I'm not totally convinced it was a dream as I never remember my dreams. So the dream. I was sitting cross-legged on the floor of the most ancient and beautiful forest you could imagine. I was surrounded by moss that seemed like it was slowly growing onto my feet, connecting me to the ancient soil. In front of me, a path of slightly shorter grass stretched out away from me, in a way that made it seem more like a veil stretching away from a bride than a grass path. I stood up calmly, feeling deep and unconditional love, and started to follow this path. The moss on my feet felt warm on the slightly damp grass, and the trees were letting early morning light dapple in. It probably took me 20 to 30 minutes to get to the end of the path where the largest and most beautiful and silent waterfall stood. Around the mouth of the waterfall and at its base, there were about 12 beautiful statues that looked ancient as the dirt itself. I felt warm and surrounded by undying and unconditional love. I sat at the edge of the water, letting my feet dangle in when I heard a low hum coming from the other side of the water. I ran around to the other side of the water and hugged her. This woman was at least six feet tall with the ears and antlers of a deer. She smiled down at me and hugged me back saying, rest now my child, all will be as it is when you awake. So rest and be at peace. Soon after I realized what I felt right, which I know sounds odd, but I felt comfortable with myself as I was who I was supposed to be. I was biologically male and I was happy. I swam for the first time in a long time. I just sat by or in the water. I felt the moss on my feet and fingers. I felt unconditionally loved. I knew that I was safe. I woke up the next morning as I usually do, just vibing or chilling. I still have all my issues, but I know whatever is out there will love me no matter what my actual family thinks of me. To set the scene, my family are of Hindu Indian background that settled in the UK in the 1960s. Apart from my parents, everyone else was born in the UK. Two things of note are, A, my grand uncle was a Hindu exorcist. B, the Hindu religion, or Santana Dharma to give it its correct name, has an extensive belief structure based around the dark side. Demons, monsters, witchcraft, etc. that is also affected by the local environments and folklore. As a family, we moved to a new house that was previously owned by an elderly lady. The lady was found dead in the home, downstairs, where apparently she was sleeping. The only furniture that we kept was, was a beautiful wardrobe that had a long mirror on its door. It was situated in the master bedroom. Within two years, my father died. Apparently, a heart attack. He did have underlying illnesses. 
Then, within six months, weird things began to happen after my first nephew was born. My mother said she saw my father looking over his first grandchild early one morning. After that, she began to hear voices coming from the master bedroom, calling her name at odd times when no one else was in the house. The family put it down to stress and grief. No more occurrences until my second nephew was born. His birth seemed to trigger a cascade of events. Initially, it was voices that would moan in agony, coming again from the wardrobe area of the bedroom. Then shades, or shadow people, crossing the top of the stairs. My mother and sister-in-law were scared to tears when they heard screams and footsteps pounding all around them, yet no one else was in the house. Then the attention centered on my youngest nephew. He was two when it began. He would sit for hours talking to various presences in various rooms in full front view of the whole family. One evening, everyone was in the living room just talking. The two boys were playing with their respective toys when suddenly the youngest stopped and shouted loudly, no, 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 stay away, stay away, stay away. My brother had to hold him tight to stop him from having a fit. From then on, one adult would always be with him. Finally, one night my sister-in-law woke to hear her name being called. She looked to the wardrobe and found people on the other side, looking into the room. Most of them were of Indian heritage. She thought she was dreaming, went back to sleep, but awoke an hour later. Again, the people were still there, but this time she saw one pushing its way through the mirror into the bedroom. This is when her screams woke everyone. Cue the whole house lit up and the family staying at a cousin's place that night. Next day, we brought in a Hindu priest who went around. He came back down, looking very unsettled. He told us that the old woman who owned the house was living downstairs because of the mirror. The mirror was the focal point of all the issues. It was acting like a portal and our family history of dealing with the occult, we my granduncle, had attracted all the individuals in our family who had died and not reincarnated due to attachment to this material world. They were angry and hungry. They were looking for peace, so they decided to use this portal to attract the attention of the family to do the final rituals for them, hence all the activity and attacks, etc. We asked what would happen if we just got rid of the wardrobe. His answer, now 30 years old, scares me to this day. It won't matter. They have gained a foothold in our world. The door has been opened. If you don't do the rituals in India, they will possess the youngest and then each one of you in turn. You will all die, but not before you suffer mightily. My brother, sister-in-law, mother and youngest nephew, the most affected, went to a special place in India and did the rituals over a day. The moment the final mantra was spoken, myself and my eldest nephew heard the door of the wardrobe shut forcefully. Then, under the instructions of the priest, we took the wardrobe apart, taking care not to break the mirror and then disposed of it. Today, 30 years later, my youngest nephew is 32 and hates all things spooky. My sister-in-law only uses small vanity mirrors and I sometimes get sudden chills that alert me to never look into any mirrored surfaces within the location I'm in. I did once and scared myself so badly, I didn't leave my house for a week. It seems that the occult sensitivity that made my granduncle an exorcist jumps one generation. And now it's myself and two cousins who display, to varying degrees, sensitivity to the occult. I appreciate your reading in patience so far. I've collected more anecdotes of the South Asian occult experience in the West and India. Maybe I can relate some more here. In the meantime, 
Please be incredibly careful what furniture you keep or old furniture you buy. And if you can, do buy brand new mirrors. I've always been a peculiar and precocious person and that started in childhood. I asked questions about everything and everyone simply because I just wanted to know stuff and understand things. Around six years old, I started having these dreams. It was two years before my grandfather, who was basically my father figure of the time, passed when I had my first encounter. I had this dream that wasn't a dream about someone who had passed in my family. It was my aunt and she appeared to me just to talk to me. She just wanted to hang out with me in my dreams, but I knew it wasn't a dream. It was like she kept coming around to protect me from something as I slept. But since I was a child, she made it seem like she was just visiting because she felt like it. For two years, I didn't really have any other encounters until the summer before I turned eight. I was at my great grandmother's house asleep when I felt my kid dream turn into something too real and insane. I remember waking up in an operating room and I had a tube inside of me. There were these doctors there dressed in green scrubs and surgical masks, speaking a language I've never heard. It didn't sound like any of the languages we have on this planet. Every person in the operating room was blonde with blue eyes and they all were at least six feet tall. They sounded angry and harsh and kept shoving things down the tube in my body. I could feel everything as if I were actually there. I guess I was supposed to be asleep in this situation because one of the doctors saw me awake and started yelling at the others. They put a needle in my arm and it felt like I was floating in a warm tub. After that, I woke up and felt super nauseous, sore, dizzy, and I had a wicked headache. I can remember this as if it happened yesterday and that night I went to bed at 10 p.m and woke up at 3 a.m. after the encounter. I was only seven and a half at the time. Fast forward to that next year, the year my grandfather passed. After these first two encounters, I began having more and more experiences. By this point, it was mostly just dreams that were either eerily lucid or foretelling in some way. The year my grandfather died was the first time I was able to sense something while awake. I was spending time with him one night that year and I always spend the night. The whole day he seemed fine, so I thought I'd spend the night as usual, but he was adamant that I didn't. As soon as he said no, it looked like his face became heavy even though that wasn't how he actually looked for real. It also felt like I was being squeezed to the point of popping. I told him I didn't want to leave, but he insisted. I just knew something was wrong. But I was eight, so of course I had limited vocabulary and couldn't come up with a plan to not leave. The next day, he died from a heart attack. My mother took me with her to go to confirm that my granddad was who he was. So I ended up seeing him post-mortem. He was laying there with his eyes open and glazed. He had the heart attack while watching TV, but the weird part was that as I was looking at him, I heard the TV being on and saw him standing next to the bed, looking at his body. He didn't seem to know that I was watching him, and then he just went away once they zipped him up. After that, my grandfather has come to visit me in dreams to go fishing and talk like we would when I was little, as if to keep up with my life. So this was the beginning of all the craziness that I feel now. Since my grandfather has passed, I've been able to see things, know things, and feel things I probably shouldn't be able to. I've encountered gods and goddesses. I've fought demons attacking me in my sleep. I've been able to visit heaven and hell, see angels, met the devil himself. I've met people in my family that have died before I was even a thought and have talked to them about family history. I don't let the dead pass through me, but they do seek me out to talk or protect me. Those floating orb things that folks speak of have appeared to me before. I've experienced sleep paralysis in the form of spiritual attacks. I can astral project uncontrollably. That shit just happened and the first time it happened, 
withdrawing surgery, but I can't make myself do it. It just happens. I've met angels. They smell like sugar cookies, by the way. I've also met Jesus twice. Gods I've met are Anubis, Dionysus, Adja, Hecate, Artemis, God, and I've been through the layers of heaven and hell. That's the easiest way to put it without giving myself a headache. So I grew thinking I was one thing, or another spiritually speaking, but because I have the ability to witness and act in all these capacities, I don't know what to call myself or how to deal with it. I can instantly know when something is off with a person. I've heard and seen things in pure daylight that I shouldn't even be able to. I'm almost impossible to lie to or keep a secret from. And I dream so lucidly and vividly that I've awakened in serious pain before. For instance, if I'm shot in a dream, I'll have pain for at least two days in the area the dream injury happened. So my question is, how do I control and navigate this shit? One, without something taking me over, and two, without it keeping me from sleeping. I've never really been afraid of this stuff because real life was scarier and because a lot of what I ended up seeing manifests in real life around me or it's telling me what happened behind the curtain. But I'd like to figure out if anyone else who shares this ability can just help me stay sane, safe, and well rested. On February, I hit my head thanks to my mum's impatient behaviour. She brought the door of our family car's trunk on my head while I ducked to check if my laptop bag was in there, not knowing the fact that my sister had grabbed my laptop. So my hurt hand doesn't hold too much weight. I was bleeding from 7pm up to 3am and finally I was seen by a doctor at 5am after waiting in the ER from 8pm. Yes, my parents tried for an hour to give me first aid and then we lost our way to the hospital because dad and mum had panic attacks and my sister was crying because I was speaking two different languages at once. English and Greek. Well, I was speaking Greekish, lol. Anyhow, I was diagnosed with mild TBI and for the second time in my life, I dodged stitches. At this point, I'd like to point out that the doctors didn't pay me much attention because mum had already cleaned the wound and dad bandaged it and I was kept awake and talking. Yes, I had issues with my balance and my head was in so much pain, but yet again, the doctors seemed to not really care for any patients, which brings me so much doubt in my diagnoses because I was just given a piece of paper with the do's and don'ts of what I should feel for the first week. No meds or clean bandages or anything. Mum had to bandage my head again once we walked out of the hospital. And for the following weeks, it was very hard for me to write and talk. My writing patterns had never been the same as before, and neither does my accent in English and Greek. It takes too much time for me to find words and form sentences than before. Multitasking, loud music, low or too bright lights, fast exchanging lights, different color lights, and even the smallest change of lighting and sound brings me headaches and migraines. With time, those things minimized, or at least I accepted them and based my life around them. But another thing is worrying me. I'm blocked. All my life, I used to have precognitive dreams, being able to remember my dreams, seeing dead relatives in my dreams, things that the women in both sides of my family were and are able to do. And so was I, till I hit my head. The day after I hit my head and I was allowed to sleep, it was the last time my grandparents visited me in my dreams. Yet, something else got unblocked. First was my emotions. I was never an emotional kid. I kept my emotions to myself and didn't show much. But now, I can't even pretend or mask them. Which isn't all that bad when it comes to my sister and I's relationship. But it was my weapon against my emotionally abusive parents. Now everything they say cuts like a knife. And I can barely keep myself from crying in front of them. 
I get so angry so quickly that I fear that one day I will rage blackouts again, just like when I was a teenager. Another thing that got unblocked was my empathy. I used to be able to control it, so I won't feel everyone's emotions at once, but now I do. And sometimes it confuses me too, because I tell if they're mine or somebody else's. In contrast to empathy and emotions, I've been experienced way too often the deja vu effect with past dreams I had, and awake precognitions like hearing my best friend Karen say she would do one thing, and I know in seconds that she won't because of how determined her voice sounds or how determined as a person she is, but because something else will block her from doing so. Or how I went to my mum's room because I felt that I was needed, and as I stood by the door, mum called my name, and when I told her I was here, she looked at me, spooked. I felt urges to say things, like my sister went out with her friends today, and I turned and told her to tell her friend Sophia to check the dates on the milk she will buy. And my sister looked at me and said that they weren't going to the supermarket. But the moment Sophia came, she informed my sister that they need to go to the supermarket for milk because her mum is baking a cake. Or how I was sleeping in the car while we were going to my dad's village. And I woke up and told my dad not to take exit B on the streets before his village but exit A, because a tree trunk had fallen down then. My great aunt Lisa told my dad about the event and dad looked at me and I just tried to hide behind the glass of water I was sipping from. Also, the few times I do remember my dreams, it's numbers, random words and music that a few hours later I either end up seeing or hearing about. I dreamed of the number 46 one day and the afternoon of the same day, a car with the numbers 1546 sped down our road towards the maternity hospital, down the road and crashed into a pole while the woman was in labor and the boyfriend was under the influence of alcohol. Thankfully, everyone was okay, not the car. Lastly, I suddenly seemed to be getting past life visions at random while awake. And doing stuff while prior to that, I only had past life dreams. So, when me, my brother Arthur and my mother moved into our new house about a month back, I was very ready to have some ghosts. However, it's usually just me and also my friend Lena. Me and him bond over our weird paranormal experiences. Who has the spooky stuff happening? Back at the condo I used to live in, which is now more of a second home because I still go there a lot to be with my dad. My mom, who literally practices witchcraft, didn't believe me when I said the place had spirits. It's usually pretty directed towards me. It was always me being the one experiencing weird things with the exception of whenever my friends would come over. Arthur and my parents never felt it. So what's really weird about the new house is that the majority of the happenings have been to mom. Now, keep in mind, for reasons I won't go into because it's not relevant, I tend to take everything mom says with a grain of salt. However, it's not just them. It's them and their friends. I have had one thing that I will discuss later, but it's mostly just them and their friends. From what my mom has picked up, there are two spirits, an old lady and her pet. The old lady, thankfully, is a helpful spirit and has helped out mom on numerous occasions. Before we were fully moved in, mom and a friend, this friend is the mother of my two friends, Blake and Shana, were at the house just unpacking and whatnot. Something happened and mom needed a first aid kit, but of course it was packed away somewhere so they were gonna have to go find it. They heard a thud in the garage where all the boxes were, went in and saw the first aid kits on the floor. Keep in mind, it was in a box that was on the ground, facing up, 
So it couldn't have just fallen out. That same day, they both heard the sound of a bell being rung, coming from the garage, went in and saw that the dryer was malfunctioning. Overall, the ghost had just been helpful. Another time, more recently, Mom was with a different friend and the two were chilling in the little pool Mom got. My mom grabbed onto the door to get up and out, but accidentally locked it, meaning they were both locked outside. That door, as well as the front door and side garage door, were all locked, and the only person inside was Arthur, who was asleep. Mom thought all was hopeless, as their friend went around trying the different doors and tapping on Arthur's window, all for no success. However, Mom remembered that there was a ghost and decided, why not? So they went up to the door and said something along the lines of, please let us in. We don't want to be locked out. The friend comes back and suddenly says, wait, I don't know why, but I think we should check the garage again. They went back to the garage and it opened perfectly. One night, my mom was home alone and was tired but hadn't locked the front door, brushed their teeth, taken their pills, etc. She thinks, eh, I'll do it in a few minutes, but begins to drift off to sleep. They hear noise in the living room and jolt awake to see the lights flickering on. They get weirded out and decide to go check it out. The light switch was off, but the light was on. Thinking that it somehow reversed itself, Mom flipped the light switch on. The light stayed on. They switched it back off and only then did it turn off. As for the weird pet spirits, keep in mind we have a grey cat named Archimedes. I'm saying this because it will be important. One night, home alone, Mom was in the garage doing something. It was very late and they were very tired. They see something brush past and immediately assume it's Archimedes. They were about to shoo him out and they realized it wasn't Archimedes. They saw a small gray shadow that quickly vanished. Thinking they were just tired and seeing things, they shrugged it off and went to bed. However, one time when they had some friends over, something similar happened. Mom was in the kitchen when all of a sudden they heard one of their friends say, Hey, Aki, w wait, what? Their friend saw the same thing. Now for my experience. In my closet, there's a circuit board. All was well for several weeks, but one week, all of a sudden, I started hearing an annoying beep coming from my closet area. I eventually realized the only logical explanation was that it was coming from the circuit board, which was screwed shut. It kept happening every five to 10 minutes. And after a few days, it got annoying to the point where I just opened it. I didn't touch anything inside because it's a bunch of confusing wires and I don't want to get electrocuted. The beeping has now been reduced to once every 30 minutes to an hour, sometimes even longer. We plan on getting someone to check it out but I think this helpful spirit may have been increasing how much it beeped to try and tell me something was up. Coweta, Oklahoma, a small, quaint and haunted town. Coweta was Indian territory. I lived in three different houses there in different parts of town as a little girl and experienced hauntings or supernatural encounters everywhere I went. My very first memories are in that town. Some of them still scare me. There's a lot of history and a lot of old buildings and homes in the town. The first house I lived in was right across from some woods. My three siblings and I used to play there. One day, we decided to go in further than we ever had before. I was about four years old. We found an old dilapidated shack. As we got closer to it, the leaves to my left flew up and almost in a straight line, like they would for a sudden gust of wind, but 
there was no wind. It stopped right in front of me. And then there was a very loud and deep man's voice all around us that screamed, get out. Needless to say, we ran like hell. I was the youngest, smallest, and the first one out of there. After this, I would always see an old man at the edge of the woods. He would stay there, like he was guarding them. My mother asked me one day why I was afraid of the woods. I told her because of the bad man. She inquired further. I told her that he was a bad man that didn't want us in the woods anymore. She brushed it off. Life went on. We moved away for a couple of years until my parents divorced. My mother moved us into a small two-bedroom house that was close to our schools. She was sleeping on the fold-out couch and us kids had the two bedrooms. It was also right next to a cemetery. We'd play there, as curious children often do. There was always a man, probably early 30s, who would visit his mother's grave every single day. He was there every time we went, no matter what time it was. He'd pack food and camp out, talking away on this grave all day. We were intrigued. We'd hide behind the gravestones and try to hear what he was saying. I don't remember ever being able to make anything out, but his facial expressions and body movements were so casual, like there was someone sitting in front of him, keeping up the banter. One day, my oldest brother and I managed to get really close. We thought we were slick. All of a sudden, the man stood up, turned around, looked right at us and said, What are you looking at, kid? And then started speaking in a different voice, in a language we sure didn't understand. It sounded like well-thought-out gibberish, if that makes any sense. It's possible he was messing with us, but he was certainly creepy. I stopped going into that area. After a short time, we ended up moving into downtown Coeta. It was literally one street with small buildings neatly aligned on either side. We lived on a side street that was once a cemetery, back when the town was first settled in the 1840s. When they decided to build houses, they moved all of the graves. Well, I found out through my lack of supervision, it was 1990, and constant curiousness that they built houses on top of graves. There were gravestones in the crawl spaces of at least three homes. There was a very old white two-storied house that sat one block from ours. We saw multiple families move in and out only a few months later. The house was empty most of the time. My eldest brother, myself and my cat climbed into the crawl space. My cat was awesome and lived the shit out of me. We attempted to turn a stone over so we could try to read it with our flashlight. As we did, something hissed. It was not a normal animal sound. It was like a hundred voices all hissing at once in different frequencies. The hair all over my body stood up. We freaked out. My brother was out first, my cat second. As I got to the sidewalk, I saw my cat get picked up and thrown. Someone grabbed my hair and pulled me to the ground. I was so scared I started crying. My cat hid in my mom's closet and wouldn't come out until the next day. I ended up having a giant bruise on my right butt cheek. It was hard for me to even walk past that house after that. In this same house with the graves and the crawl space, I would often see an old woman. I wasn't the only one that saw her, but I did more than the others. I mostly saw her at night, but sometimes in the day as well. At night, I would often wake up to her standing by my dresser, which was just in front of the door. She was illuminated by the hall lights my mom would leave on for us. She would just stare and move her mouth, but I couldn't hear her. On three or four occasions, she would put her hand on my crayons that were on the dresser. The next day, they would be moldy and dried up. I have no idea, idea why she'd do that, but she did, and my mom just kept replacing them and still never believed me. Also would have stuff turn on by itself. Footsteps, whispers, doorknobs, rattling, etc. I had a terrifying childhood in Coeta, Oklahoma.
In the town of Bladenborough, just eight miles southwest of Elizabethtown, where I stay, it was said a demon cats from hell used to stalk the woods, killing livestock and making the locals scared. Then suddenly, it disappeared. That's what they say anyway. We know it didn't. To this day, there's been reports of something that looks like an abnormally large mountain lion, with blood red eyes and fur as black as night. Its cries have been compared to that of a woman being torn apart and screaming for her life. Luckily, it only has a taste for goats and cows, or so we think anyway. I will tell you, there has been a few people that have gone missing. Some have been found, and to hear some of the police tell the story, the bodies were torn to shreds. It's not just located in Bladenborough like most think. It goes from Bladen Lake State Forest to the Green Swamp area, which covers three counties and over 1,200 square miles. A friend of mine was hunting one day down in the Green Swamp when it started getting dark. If you hunt in this area, you know you've got to be out of the woods before dark by law. So we climbed down from his tree stand and began the long walk through the swamp and underbrush to where he parked his truck. Now, my friend is a cornbread fed southern boy and has the size to prove it. Standing six feet six inches with a weight of 260 pounds of pure farm muscle, he isn't small by any standards. So he learned not to be scared of anything. He said what happened next made him never want to go in the swamp hunting again. Making his way through the brush, he said he began hearing something walking through the woods toward him. He stopped to listen for it and said it sounded like a large black bear. So he got his gun ready just in case. When he stopped, it stopped. When he walked, it walked. He said it made him nervous because whatever it was knew he was there and wasn't running off. He said he started making noise and even shot his gun into the air. It didn't leave. Instead, it let out a growl he said you could feel as much as hear. All the way through the woods, it stayed just behind him out of sight. When he came out of the woods onto the dirt road, he said his truck was about 50 yards down from him. He decided it was a pretty good chance that whatever it was following him was going to keep following or make a move on him. So he took off running. It took off running too. He said it sounded like a bulldozer was crashing through the woods. And when it broke from the woods, it sounded like a horse running through loose dirt. He could hear the stomps of its feet and the growling in its breath. He didn't have to look back to know it was coming and catching up to him. He shot behind him, hoping it would scare it enough to stop for a moment and give him a chance to make it to the truck. When he did, he said he must have hit it because it screamed and for a moment he thought it was a person. That's when he finally turned around. He said it was jet black, as big as a 600 pound black bear, a tail as long as its body and eyes that were glowing red. He hit it and it was just standing there looking at him as if to say, now you've done it. He bolted to the truck and jumped in. Just as he shut the door, he looked and it was right there. He said it was so close, its breath was fogging the window. By now, he said he was shaking badly and it was everything he could do to get the key in the ignition and start the motor. He drives a Ford F-350 four wheel drive that was raised up so there's a good two feet of clearance under the truck. He said this thing was on all four feet and looking eye to eye with him in his truck. The engine started and he took off like a bat out of hell. He said it chased him as hard as it could until he picked up speed and stopped and watched it drive off. The next day, he and his dad went back with guns and looked around for tracks, blood, or even a dead body. He said there was no blood, even though he knows it was shot. And there was paw prints as big as his hands on the ground everywhere. Then they found a tree that nine feet up had claw marks one inch deep in the wood spaced four inches apart from each other. 
They didn't venture into the woods, nor did they go too far from the truck. Both of them said they felt as though they were being watched and didn't want to stick around to find out what it was. They got back in the truck and that's when they heard it. A scream from the woods off in the distance. He said it was like a woman screaming bloody murder. It lets him know it was there waiting. Yep, there's a many dark secret in them woods. Charlie Daniels even wrote about these woods in one of his songs. If you ever get adventurous and want to try your luck, come on down to Green Swamp. And when the sun goes down, get real quiet. You might hear that scream. I hope when you do, it's off in the distance and not close by. Because if it is, well, it might just be the last sound you hear. Okay, so this is what happened. I started meditating to a binaural beat and I only set my alarm for 25 minutes. The closed eye visuals I was starting to get were fairly intense. I've never before closed my eyes and had visuals this clear through meditation before. And then my alarm goes off, so I quickly turned it off and lay down, continuing to meditate. This is where it starts to get really intense. About an hour into the meditation, it felt like magnets were pulling my head from side to side. And then what felt like invisible cords going through my ears, down my throat, and something felt attached to the back of my head. And then what felt like little spiders running around my ears on both sides of my head. I could e actually feel the center of my brain. It was making a chugging sound and I could genuinely feel it. I started having pretty insane visuals when all of a sudden I started feeling these orgasmic tingles go up my back. Every time I would get a burst of these tingles, I would feel the top half of my astral body start to wiggle from side to side, like I was about to astral project. But my intuition was telling me there was another presence or entity. I didn't have a clue what any of these symptoms were at the time. I just continued meditating when all of a sudden I forgot everything about myself. I said to myself in my head, who am I? And that's when I opened my eyes kinda because I just felt a touch of fear. When I opened my eyes, the only lighting in my room was my speaker light, so it was pretty dark, but I could still see most things. There were two shadows dancing in the corner of my room in a very weird way. They were only small, like hip height shadows, with arms and legs, but they looked like they were 100% there, I swear. I continued to watch them in awe, when I noticed a human-sized black figure leaning out of the cupboard at the end of my bed, looking around my room. This one was not a shadow, it was 3D. After watching these things for a few minutes, I walked to the lounge room where my brother was sleeping on the couch and told him everything I had just experienced, leaving out the parts about me hallucinating because I didn't want him thinking I was mental. As I was explaining what I experienced during the meditation, I was looking outside the glass back door and there was this gremlin looking creature about hip height just staring me right in the eye. And there was no shadow. This was complete 3D. It was just bobbing back and forth. So I approached the door and as I got to it, the creature just faded away in a way I can't explain. As I get outside, there's another shadow the same size, doing the same weird dance type thing that the shadow is doing in my room. The weird thing was that this shadow was dancing in front of the Buddha statue we have outside, enough for me not to be able to recognize the Buddha behind it. Completely mind blowing for me because I had no clue about what was happening. When I returned to my bedroom, I wasn't hallucinating anymore. A few nights before all of that happened, just as I went to bed, I felt something decent size run onto my chest. So out of instinct, I smacked it as hard as I could. And what do you know? It's a wolf spider about 30 meters long from leg to leg. That all happened about two weeks ago. Last night, I went to my mates for a catch up 
and I have a bunch of stuff in her shed from when I moved house and had nowhere else to fit it. I thought I'd just go have a suss at what I still had in there. I opened the door and it's absolutely infested with redback spiders, like big fat ones everywhere. And it was only my stuff in the shed. Probably has nothing to do with this, but there is a chance. Tonight, when I did my meditation after having a bit of a break because of the intense hallucinations I previously experienced, I had the same feelings like spiders were crawling all over me. So I stopped the meditation early just to be safe. Even after I stopped, it felt like there were spiders in my hair, on my legs and arms. I kept checking to make sure none of them were real when bam, I find a spider, I don't know what type, crawling up my leg. I quickly took pictures to make sure it wasn't a hallucination. I know it sounds like utter bullcrap, but I swear none of this is a lie. I'm self-aware and honest as they come. I go outside for a smoke and start rereading a similar post on Reddit that mentions the spider feelings through meditation. When right behind where my phone is pointing, a red pack starts to make its way to the floor from the bottom of a chair. And then a few minutes later, when I was standing near the back door, another small spider comes down from the roof right in front of me. I don't know what type of spider. So I put my hand out for it to land on, and as soon as it touched my hand, it quickly climbed back up its web to the roof. I know it sounds absolutely crazy, and I'm very aware it could just be a massive coincidence, but pretty creepy still, especially the one climbing up my leg after meditation. What do people suggest I do? Any advice would be great. Ever since I was a small child, weird things constantly happen to me, at least a few times every year, to the point where it's a running joke between all of my friends. I'm 23 now and usually brush these things off as just me attracting weird energy. But as of lately, when I don't feel like I'm going crazy as I often do, I've been feeling like I'm on the verge of discovering something about myself. A spiritual awakening of sorts, but I don't know where to go from there. I recently even took a shot in the dark and got a well-reviewed but generic card reading to try to help myself gain some clarity about my situation. And I did get very impressive cards for my spirituality category. But I don't know where to go from here. Or if I even actually believe in card readings, I'm just desperate for any help I can get. Here are a few examples of things that have happened to me from what I can remember. My earliest memory is one of being at a supermarket, sitting in the baby toddler seat of my grandma's shopping cart. She was turned around in the fresh vegetable section, adding veggies to a bag, when I suddenly had a panicked shiver run down my spine, feeling like someone might try to hurt me. I then saw a gruff looking man across the aisles in a leather jacket with a braided ponytail. He immediately walked over to me and very briefly tried to stick his finger in my mouth as he was walking by before my grandma turned back around but having already been heightened to the situation I had kept my mouth firmly closed and turned my face away from him. To this day I believe he might have been trying to drug me. Why? I have no idea, but this is my earliest childhood memory and first experience with a correct gut feeling or premonition. It scared me, and for some reason I felt ashamed, and I never told my grandmother. When I was a young girl, about seven years old, I was laying in my great-grandmother's guest room while my family socialised in the living room. I was supposed to be taking a nap, but was instead just laying in bed, staring up at the ceiling fan as it spun on high. A blade from the ceiling fan suddenly shot off from the fan and hit the wall, leaving a mark in the paint. I got up and looked at the wall and at the blade on the floor and then started off to go tell my family what happened, but was met by them at the bedroom door checking on me because they had heard the loud voice. When I tried to show them where the blade was, it was gone, as was the mark on the wall, and when we turned the fan off, there was no missing blade. When I was about 10, my dad was in the local jail. My dad was in and out of jail my whole childhood and into my teen years. 
and I was asleep in my bed with my mom. I woke up singing the name Sean Apple, Sean Apple, Sean Apple. And my mom asked me why I was saying that and told me to please stop because I was freaking her out. I asked her who it was. My mom said that Sean Apple was one of my dad's crazy friends whom she didn't like. We found out the next day that at the moment I was repeating his name, he had died from banging his head against his jail cell wall. My dad's cell wall was next to his and he had been screaming and screaming for the guard to help, but had been ignored. All the small examples from my daily life, especially lately, are seeing very bright, very brief flashes of light. Hearing sounds of objects moving, but not witnessing them moving. Experiencing phantom smells such as burning, having a premonition about my dog dying when I wasn't aware she was sick. I lived in a different town as I am away at college and very suddenly having vivid and unprovoked, very insignificant flashbacks from my childhood called mind pops according to Google. Three days ago, however, something disturbing happened to me that provoked my search for answers for these unexplainable things that happened to me. I got in my car to go to a job interview and I found a considerably large section of my hair that was cleanly cut with scissors and pasted together with some kind of whitish, greenish paste. I have absolutely no logical answer of how it got there. None. And yes, my car was locked. And no, I'm not a drunk, nor do I think I have a stalker or a prankster friend. Does anyone have any idea what's happening to me? Why do I attract such weird experiences? These are only a few examples. I have so, so many stories like these and feel deeply like I experienced similar things as a child that I can't quite remember. I'm honestly starting to get scared that these situations are going to escalate as there have also been strange instances seemingly not paranormal, such as once driving home from the grocery store. I live in a large city and this particular drive is about five miles behind a car whom I followed all the way from the grocery store parking lot to my college housing, in which the car parked in my parking space. And when I cracked my window and yelled to ask what the fuck they were doing, the woman seemed disoriented, didn't say anything and drove off. That was about two years ago. Unfortunately, at the time we had a security guard, I was able to alert at the situation and began to call to walk me inside at night. First off, I just want to state that this story is 100% true. Whether it was paranormal or not, it was terrifying for me. If I had any way to prove it to you, I would, but my words is all I have. So whether you believe it or not, is up to you. I've since asked my little brother, the person involved, if he remembers, but he was very young at the time. And while he believes the story, he can't remember it happening. So here it goes. This paragraph is going to act as a backstory and shed some light on the event. I've always been huge into the paranormal. I grew up listening to families' ghost stories and watching ghost hunters and ghost adventures. I just loved the feeling of being creeped out. Me and my buddies at school would go into the library and act like we were ghost hunting, but nothing ever happened. And that was just it. Years went by and nothing ever happened. No shadows darting out of my peripherals, no seeing dead people, no moving objects. Hell, I've never even had sleep paralysis. All the things you always hear people experiencing, I just simply never have. I did once see a shadow drift by an opaque glass door when I was at my grandparents' home alone. As so I put that down as reflection of a bird or something, as a window was right behind me. But for years, I called it a ghost because I still convinced myself I was a believer. I just wanted it to be real. Well, I was a believer up until we moved house when I was around the age of 10. It was a slightly larger house, going from a bungalow to a two-story, and was right across the road from the old house. So it would, should have been exciting. However, when my mother told me about the move, I started to tear up. Not because I would miss the old house, but because just a year or so before, Davy, the older man who lived there before us, died of a heart attack in the snooker club bar across the road. 
His wife moved away after it happened. For a young boy who based half his life around the paranormal, I don't want to hear any part of them, but years went by and nothing. Just like I said before, that was until this night. I can't remember what age I was or what age my little brother was, but I do remember he was very young. I was in my early teens, so I want to say I was 14, which would make my brother three. But take that with a grain of salt. Anyway, he wanted to sleep in my room for the night. I agreed, because I'm just that cool. I had a small couch in my room, which he slept on. The couch was at the opposite end of the room from the door, facing the door, if that makes sense. So my brother was lying on his side, looking directly out of the door of my room to the tiny hallway at the top of the stairs, then into his room just across from mine. My room door was open. I was leaning over him and I was tucking him in saying goodnight before the lights went off. And I vividly remember he was looking at something. I would never have noticed this, but it's just because of what happened next that made this forgettable detail so memorable. He says word for word, there's a man. I sort of froze for a second, even though I heard him clear as day. I just had to clarify. What? He gives a more detailed answer, again, word for word. There's a man walking inside our house. Those words are so clear in my memory. It's such an abnormal way to describe someone in your house. You don't say, oh yeah, I saw that dude. He was walking inside my house. It was as if there was something about this man, whether it was the way he was moving, or a partial manifestation, or disfigurement in some way, I don't know. But there's a man walking inside our house was the only way my brother would describe what he saw. And when he did, I remember feeling instant chills. I literally had to just stay in that position for a second. It was so unreal. In a moment, over 10 years of TV shows and stories of encounters, I found myself at the heart of a supernatural experience. And although it didn't happen to me personally, being in the presence of a possible paranormal encounter is scary enough. I then pictured Davy, the man mentioned in the paragraph above, and knew it had to have been him. After a few seconds, I came to my senses, as if my brain just seized for a second and thought, wait, you should probably turn around. When I did, guess what? Nothing. Hallucination? That's my guess. But the attention he was giving to the door when I was tucking him in, it was so genuine. And the abnormal way he described its movements, well, I just don't know. He was very, very young. So maybe that's just how he could word it. I do know one thing. There was never a man in there. For some reasons I don't wish to discuss, I ended up the man of the house over the years. Just in case you thought it might have been my little brother's dad. Because of circumstances, we wanted nothing to do with him. If it was a ghost, I don't know who it was. But maybe it was Davy, checking on his old home. I will call this even. Rip in the matrix. Mental set and setting. We were both sober at the time of the event. Setting was my home with my girl. I'm 23 and she's 21. Nobody else home. Background in me, weed, psychedelics only. Mentally stable, never had an episode or anything weird happen to me. I love psychedelic effects and feeling, but I can very easily identify drug versus reality. Last trip was a year and a half from this happening and never felt lingering effects. I truly believe this happened. Never heard voices, never seen shadow people, etc. Normal Joe. Room layout. Our living room is large. It's an open concept. Connecting it to the kitchen. Imagine an eight foot long, four and a half feet high. Bar like raised counter. On the opposite side, about six inches lower, another counter with a double sink. Behind that is the back counter. 
Same width as the bar left to right, only six inches lower. And behind that's an outside wall. Microwave and cabinets at eye level. To the left, another wall, same wall the TV is on. To the right, a refrigerator. Further right is the dining room out of sight from our sitting location. From the couch, you can see the entire kitchen, the raised bar counter first. Then you can see the top of the sink and the back wall, fridge, etc. We were sitting facing the kitchen's raised countertop, but turned 35-ish degrees left, facing the TV. It's on the left wall in the living room, 15 feet from the center of the kitchen. The event lasted two beats or two seconds, four to eight p.m., months ago now. I heard a tearing sound, identical to a piece of paper tearing. Pfft. It was loud, but not crazy, like five pieces being ripped at once. This caused me to turn and look in the direction that the sound came from. My quick motion made my girlfriend look in the same direction. Just above the sink, one foot suspended above the sink, I see a wavy, heat-like blur or disturbance. It looked like it was 14 to 18 inches tall and four to eight inches wide and had depth, but was so fucking weird looking. I have no clue the depth of it. Clear, but it made the cabinets and microwave behind it unrecognizable due to the distortion. It appeared out of nowhere and the sound clearly came from it. I wish I could describe it better, but it's like seeing new technology. It made no sense to my mind how or what it was. Like an invisibility cloak in a movie, but way, way, way too real. Next, an item fell from this tear. I guess I'll call it. It looks like a sheet of white printer paper, in a helix shape, but half untwisted. It wasn't curled up, but it wasn't flat. It's a shape, like the tear, my mind couldn't recognize at all. It suspended for less than a quarter of a second and began to fall into the kitchen area, just like a piece of paper would fall, semi-floating, but heading toward the lower cabinet behind the sink. By the time the paper fell from view, into the sink or behind the sink, the tear slash heat blur dissipated into clarity again but I was now much more focused on the item moving. In two seconds, it made the tear sound. The peers dropped this white item and it was gone. We looked at each other in complete shock and without saying a word, rushed into the kitchen to see what just fell. Only thing on the counter was a house plant with small green leaves, sink empty, floor empty, in between the counter and fridge empty. Counters completely empty. Nothing. We both looked and looked and found nothing. I broke down because I was so sure that I saw something and heard it. And there now was nothing real I can see as evidence. It left me with an entirely new feeling I've never felt before at all. My hair was standing, adrenaline rush, panic, feeling of utter disappointment, disbelief, horror, and most of all, like I was a pilgrim from 1800, seeing a, nu seeing a nuclear power plant, ununderstandable. Never heard or seen any stories like this. I Google and Google and find nothing. We both saw it and can't understand it. What could this be, please? I'm a 35 year old female. I've always been sensitive to the paranormal and have had had some crazy stuff happen throughout my life, starting with my earliest childhood memories. The older I got, the less the experiences became. The last thing I experienced was last year after my little brother's best friend hung himself in the woods, not far from my house. He came to me a couple of weeks later on two separate occasions as a black, smoke-like mass. 
I could feel it was him. I knew him very well. I could feel all the pain he was in and I knew he just needed someone to understand. The last time he came, the pain was so intense I burst into tears. I know what it's like to want to die, to be in so much pain that anything had to be better than that life and to be so completely hopeless. I felt like that again, only it was his pain I was feeling. I cried for what felt like hours, said I understood and goodbye. He didn't come back after that. Nothing really happens in my current home and I've lived here for years. There's been a couple other little things, but it was always just someone passing through. I live by a cemetery. I'm having extensive hip surgery next week again. Also, my older brother has been missing since Halloween. He's an addict and a violent schizophrenic. I'm not. Doctor keeps a close tabs on me and I tell him everything. I suffer from CPTSD and recently had a major episode and have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia. I lost my job. Needless to say, I'm vulnerable physically, emotionally and spiritually. Five days ago, I had my first encounter. I'm pretty much living in bed since I'm in so much pain. Both bedrooms are upstairs. It sounded like someone was in my boy's room, moving stuff around. I thought it must be my cat, but she was sitting on my dresser. I swear someone peeked around my door, but when I looked straight at it, they pulled their head back so I couldn't see it. I looked away and they peeked around again, just looking at me. So I got up and hobbled on a cane around, but no one was there. I thought maybe someone came through the attic, but the door was still closed and locked from my side. I just closed my door. Earlier that day, I had the feeling I wasn't alone as well. I never get that feeling in this house, so that was weird. I make dream catchers. I have like 10 or so hanging on my ceiling by my bed. I was laying in bed reading the night after the first incident. The dream catchers started moving and clanking together. There was no fan on and no heat blowing through the vents. It was like someone drug their hands across them. My hubby was in the room, but of course he was sleeping. My cat left the room before it happened. I'm not sure if she left because of the presence or not. Two days ago, I was downstairs in the hall, giving the dogs food. The little dog was staring at the end of the hall where the stairs and front door are. She was barking hysterically. I didn't think anything of it. She's 15, half blind and mostly deaf. But then, clear as day, a man said, knock, knock. The dog cried and growled louder and ran behind me. It scared the shit out of me. I never heard anyone go up the stairs and immediately checked to make sure there was no one there and the front door was locked. I made hubby check the whole house. Thankfully, he was on his way home for lunch when it happened. The dog reacted, so I'm not losing my mind, right? We do have carbon monoxide detectors. I thought maybe I was just being paranoid about my brother at first, but I'm not so sure that's all this is. Or maybe because of how vulnerable I am, the spirits thought it'd be fun to mess with me. I don't know. Just worried about my brother and worried about my surgery. I did talk to my doctor about it, he said it could be the PTSD somehow. If anything else happens, I'll sh make sure to update. Sorry for the long read. I hope it was worth it. Would also love to hear your thoughts or advice. Started calling morgues and hospitals again where my brother was last known to be. Lo and behold, he calls me later that day, strung out and asking for money. I declined and he hung up. Those dreams where he was in a snowy place he has lost, so I guess I wasn't too far off. He was two years sober and threw it away. As for the weird things around my house, nothing else has happened. I just sometimes feel alone and scared, but that could definitely be from the PTSD. Anyway, it was good to vent, and at least I know my brother isn't dead yet. The 
This happened over three years ago, but I can't get over it because of how strange it was. I'm not sure if what happened can be classified as an encounter or sleep paralysis, or even a simple dream that involved moderate amounts of sleepwalking. I had had two occurrences of sleep paralysis before this. I was at one of my family homes and was sleep deprived that day, having barely slept around four hours the night before, which was mostly due to, due to some late night porn streaming and masturbating. It was around two in the afternoon and my parents had left for some place until that evening. They had asked me to stay in their bedroom while they were gone, since it contained a lot of valuables belonging to them, so that they could feel more secure. They told me to take a nap in their room itself while I was at it. I slept on the right side of their big bed. A wide window around four feet away from that side wasn't curtained and the sun was shining brightly. This is sort of a rather large farmhouse, which is walled from all sides. So the area outside the window is also a part of the property. I went to sleep and had a dream involving myself visiting an apartment complex that supposedly belonged to one of my mother's younger friends, not in real life. I went there alone or maybe one of my friends had tagged along as we visited this young lady's place. She was rather beautiful and was asking me about how my mother's been and how's everything. After a few pleasantries, we took leave and said bye. While we're on the road, the dream ended. One of the visual images from that dream that I still remember was how lonely the way back was. It was extremely sunny and hot, so everyone was staying inside. And the cement on the road was reflecting the sunlight brightly and there were barely any greens around. There was no other person or vehicle in sight. Her apartment complex from a distance seemed normal and just sunny in general, but uninhabited in the sense that everyone was inside. This is the point where everything gets confusing. I woke up and saw three ugly and demonic looking hags standing next to me, on the right side of the bed that is. They were dark black or bluish in appearance and had terrifyingly large disproportionate teeth, which resembled a wild beast's face more than that of a vampire. They were all angry at me and shouting and wailing or even crying maybe. The one in the middle who was probably their leader addressed me and accused me of killing her son. I was frozen from fear maybe or just because it was a sleep paralysis event after all. The three of them put their clawed hands on my body and started pushing me to the left. When I had rolled for more than 90 degrees, I woke up for real this time in case it was a sleep paralysis event, or I gained control of my body and the apparitions disappeared, in case it was an actual encounter. Either way, I had actually rolled my body to the side and was sweating profusely. Barely able to move because of how scared I still was, I mustered up some courage and reached for my phone to the right on the bedside stool and called my father. I tried to explain what had happened and broke down and started crying. I remember telling him that some witches had visited me. He told me to get a grip of myself and consoled me, telling me since I was the most non-religious in my family, to not let such things affect my reasoning. Once the call had ended, I was still sleepy and my body wanted to sleep again so badly. I forced myself to get up and get out of that room. Fearing that those witches, ghosts, demons might get a hold of my body again. It was around 3.30 or 4 then, indicating that I hadn't slept for long at all. I didn't visit my parents' room for a long time after that had happened, and also generally avoided sleeping in the afternoon, for a year or two at least. I should also mention that I had some guilt of masturbating the night before, since in my culture, it's not viewed as something that's ideal and I had felt that I was wasting my time away looking up for porn like that every night. Another theory that I came up with was that past lives may be real, and I may have somehow killed that demon woman's son in one of my past lives, and that the girl whom I visited in her apartment complex in that dream may have been what that woman looked like when she was human. After her son's death, she may have been looking for vengeance upon me in my current life and that visit to my place through that window 
to terrify me was her form of revenge. Or whatever I just mentioned may have just been a dream, coupled with a sleep paralysis event where my body moved as a reaction to what was happening in my dream or sleep paralysis. Whatever it was, it was pretty disturbing and I'm looking for any answers here. I'll start with two experiences that happened in County Clare, in Ireland. The first time I was there, I was 16 and my family had rented an old white Irish cottage with a thatched roof and green trim around the windows. It was in a little semicircle of similar houses, but this one was different. The windows seemed just a little darker, the paint just a little more chipped than the rest. When you walked in the door, black and white pictures of a family outside the house lined the entrance. We set up inside with my friend and I in one room in a bunk bed, my parents upstairs on the mezzanine and my sister in the room beside me. Now, to say this house was the coldest house I've ever had to stay in is an understatement. The cold clung to us in every room weeping into our bones even when we turned the heating on and lit the fire. We went through three bags of turf in two days and would still be sitting in the living room with our coats on. The first night was uneventful, for me at least. I woke up the next morning to find my sister in the living room playing solitaire. There was no internet to top things off. Her eyes were red rimmed like she hadn't gotten any sleep. When I asked if she was okay, she told me that our dog, who had been sleeping on her bed, stood bolt upright all of a sudden, facing the wardrobe in her room with her hackles raised and started to growl. She got freaked out, so she picked up our dog and ran past the wardrobe out the door. I told her that she could sleep with my friend and I for the next night, and we managed to squeeze two of us on the bottom bunk. Her room had been the coldest in the house, after all. That day, we did the normal tourist thing and nearly collapsed back into bed that night. The next morning, I'm woken up by a flurry of activity. My mom had decided to cut our trip short. And she couldn't stay there anymore. The shower barely worked, she said. My dad had a strange look on his face. And I asked him what was wrong when we were both in the kitchen together as everyone else loaded the car. He asked me if any of us had been up during the night. When I said no, he went very quiet, only continuing when I asked him why. He said that he had woken in the middle of the night to see a dark figure standing in the doorway of his room. It had looked so real that he asked what was wrong, thinking it was one of us but it just stood there. That house was menacing, and I think that it was really trying to get rid of us. A couple of years later, we went back to Claire to visit family, this time staying in a completely different house, thank God. As far as I know, it had belonged to a priest at one point. It seemed like a pretty normal house, especially compared to the previous one, but it took on a new character at night. The front door of the house led straight into the kitchen and the living room was right across from that. But to get to the bedrooms, you had to go down a narrow corridor that had big slabs of dark flagstone on the door. There was no lights hanging in the hall, so my friend and I always had a mad dash down the hall at night to get to our rooms. We felt like children when we slammed the bedroom door behind us, feeling a little more safe and a little out of breath. One night, my sister had gone to bed early as she wasn't feeling well. My friend and I were in the living room playing Nintendo as, once again, the house didn't have internet. The door of the living room was open and I could see down the dark hall. My heart started to race as I sat on the couch and I almost felt as if I was going to have a panic attack. I lurched off the couch and slammed the door closed because I couldn't bear to keep looking down the corridor anymore. 
The next morning, my sister told me that she saw a dark figure standing over her bed at around the same time as this. She's never gotten night terrors or sleep paralysis, and she said that she pulled the covers over her head to hide. She's three years older than me. I was talking to my friend about something while standing in the bedroom in the morning, and suddenly, the tap in the bathroom turned on full blast for about five to ten seconds. I could see the sink, and the actual tap had turned, as if someone was there turning it on and off again. I bolted to the kitchen. My poor dog now howls at night and when he wakes up. She was about seven when we stayed in the house, nine when we stayed in the second. And she had never howled before we took those trips. So basically, this took place three years ago in my old house. At this point in time, I was 13 years old and completely unconvinced about paranormal entities being real. For a little background, this story starts back just after we had moved into our new house. My dad had been offered a new job and it was a great offer, so we'd moved to a new city. It was late in the evening and both my parents weren't at the house. My mom was meeting with some friends and my dad was on the evening shift at work, which meant I was home alone. It was probably just after seven o'clock when my mom left the house, leaving me alone. I didn't really mind though, because I was looking forward to having the house to myself and just having the chance to hang out and watch TV on the big screen in our living room. For a little insight, the living room is on the main floor of my house. I have both a basement and an upstairs. I was just hanging out and watching some Netflix on the TV. I want to say maybe around 7.30ish, maybe a little later. I was just laying out on my couch half asleep, as you do. For some reason, due to me being half asleep, I heard a creak from upstairs. One you would hear when someone's walking on hardwood. Now, I have a dog and a cat, so normally this wouldn't strike me odd. But this was an incredibly new house. It was built the year before we bought it, so it was very new. Everything was super sturdy and fresh, so the floors didn't creak at all. But alas, I just brushed it off like it was my dog or something. This was probably at least half an hour later when I heard this weird click noise. I don't exactly know how to explain it. It was like the sound where you lock a door, but just louder. I couldn't pinpoint where I had heard it from. It sounded like it came from upstairs and downstairs. At this point, I got really paranoid. Not because I thought there was a ghost, but because I, this was a new house and I didn't know it well at all. So I decided to help calm my nerves. I would get on a FaceTime call with my friend. Nothing at all happened after I was on the call with them, which definitely made me feel better. I wasn't expecting both my parents to be home earlier than at least 12, and at this point it was probably 10-ish. I was tired, so I just decided to go upstairs and get ready for bed. I took a quick shower and did all the normal stuff you do to get ready, brushing teeth, washing your face, etc. It only took me like 15 minutes, so I wanted to say it was only around 10.15. You're probably wondering why I keep bringing up the time. You'll figure it out later in this story. At this point, I was in bed, with no light in my room except for the light from my window. I don't know how long I'd been asleep, but I knew my parents were not home due to what happened later. When I woke up very suddenly, for some reason, it felt like how you wake up from a nightmare. You know, like the whole gasp, jolt up head thing. I didn't have a nightmare at all, it was strange. I felt cold, but not the type of physical cold, like the inside cold when you feel your stomach thumps. I kind of just sat up and looked around my room, trying to calm myself down. This is crucial, so you know it wasn't sleeping paralysis or anything of that sort. After glancing around my room a bit, something caught my eye. I looked over to the farthest corner of my room and could almost make out some sort of figure. It was completely horrifying. 
It was almost human, but it wasn't. It was tall, like seriously tall, maybe eight feet. But it didn't have normal body proportions. It was so skinny, but its arms were long enough to reach its knees. This is gonna sound crazy, but the best way to describe it is almost like Slenderman, but shorter. I was so persistent that it wasn't paranormal and maybe it was just something my clothes had made up. I don't know why I did what I did, but I lay down and tried to get back to sleep despite my dripping feeling of dread. But I couldn't sleep at all. I lay there forever. I didn't feel safe, but I just lay there. I don't know how long it passed, but I heard my dad's car pull into the driveway, making me feel safer. Curiosity was killing me, so I pulled my head from under my covers to peek and see if it was still there, and it wasn't. The corner was empty and I felt better now. Nothing much happened after this. I tried telling my parents, but they told me my mind was playing tricks. I swear to God though, I saw that thing and it was real. I thought this would be the best place to share this. Maybe some people will believe me. To paint the picture, I was probably 18 or 19 years old at the time, living in my parents' house. They have a modest home built in 1975 on a quaint suburban street in a somewhat historical small town of America in western New York State. I grew up there. My bedroom where I slept was on the second floor, along with all the other bedrooms of the house. Before going to sleep that night, I made my bed from freshly cleaned and dried sheets from the laundry. I'm somewhat particular, so I make it to point to fold and tuck everything in nicely, like in a hotel. I remember the night as just a routine evening, probably a weeknight, sometime in winter, I think. I went to bed at a sensible hour, 10-ish perhaps. I wasn't ill, nor ate anything out of the ordinary as I recall. Don't believe I watched anything overly concerning or scary on TV that evening. I actually felt generally pretty content that night and was longing for a solid night's rest. I slept in a twin bed. It was against the wall to my left. The head of the bed was against the adjacent wall, where there was a window over my head. The window was shut closed as it was cold out. I had blinds on the window and they were closed. There was a nightstand to the right of my bed with a small lamp and digital clock on it. Outside of that, it was pitch black room and my door was closed. Now for the crazy part, here goes. As I slept in my bed sound asleep, I was jarred awoke by the feeling of my comforter and sheets being tugged off my bed. I was sleeping on my left side facing the wall when this occurred. It started with small rhythmic tugs pulling the blankets away from my body to the right of the bed, away from the wall side. I didn't move my body at all while this was happening and remained completely still. Oddly, at the moment I didn't feel particularly scared so much but more so thought to myself how incredibly strange this was. Honestly, I was just in awe. I immediately thought I must be sleepwalking. Well, obviously not walking, but half asleep, half awake. And was making this whole thing up in my mind. This may sound weird, but I felt the need to check. So I pinched my cheeks with my hands and wiggled my feet, just so I could acknowledge to myself it was indeed not me or my extremities and this tugging was still occurring. I remember noting that I heard no sounds of breathing, moaning or growling, as I had a hunch in the moment that perhaps our family dog somehow got trapped in the room and was trying to wake me up because she had to go out. At this point in time, several seconds had transpired and the tugging was becoming more and more deliberate and stronger. I know for a fact I'm wide awake and it isn't me causing this. The tugging was so violent, I guess you could say, that it is pulling my tucked in sheets from under out the edges of the bed. After about a solid 30 seconds of this, it stopped completely. There I sat in a completely pitch back room in silence on my left side, with a heavy comforter and sheets pulled off my bed and no longer on top of me. I didn't move for like 10 or 15 seconds, 
Then I finally mustered the courage to quickly turn to my right and flip on the lamp. Boom. Nothing. No dog. Door closed. Window closed. I was left uncovered. My blankets and sheets were strewn halfway across the room, with just a corner of the sheets still hanging onto the bed. I checked under my bed for any sign of animal activity. At this point, my mind was going pretty wild with possibilities. Maybe a wild animal got in or something. Empty. I checked outside my room and found my parents asleep with their door closed. I checked the clock. It was around midnight. I sat up in my bed for like an hour, rocking back and forth, contemplating what I had just experienced and what could have caused this. I had no ideas. I wondered if I should have awoken my parents, but I just thought my dad would be rolling his eyes and tell me to go back to bed, lol. Weirdly, I felt kind of excited to have been a part of something like that, and I just remember feeling I experienced something otherworldly, ghostly perhaps. To conclude, it was the single most unusual occurrence of my life. My parents live in the same house as of today. Whereas I remember small oddities growing up there, I never experienced, nor they or my brother, anything like that before then, or since then. I don't believe the house ever had a death in it before, but I could be wrong. The last bit of info I will mention is, the land in which the housing developer was built on was excavated for Native American Iroquois artifacts several times. And from my understanding, it may have been a burial ground at one point, hundreds of years ago. It was nearing Halloween, and they had an old town Alexandria ghost tour. My wife had to work, but she told me to go on the tour if I wanted to, by myself. It was going to be cold that night, but my wife had given me a warm overcoat that came down just behind my knees. Sort of important for later. It went just like you'd expect. The tour guide lady in old timey clothes led the group around, maybe a dozen or so people, to different places in the city and told us stories about X died here in a jewel and people hear or see his ghost at times. You know, that kind of thing. The tour ended at some church that George Washington prayed at or something. I can't remember which church. It was over 20 years ago, but I looked up historic churches before typing this. So it may have been Christ's church in Alexandria. Don't hold me to that though. Anyway, the church was obviously closed, but the grounds weren't. We stopped on that side of the church by a door as the tour guide lady told us some spooky story. She was in front of the door. We all stood on a brick walkway as she spoke, facing her. There was maybe about 10 feet of space from the church to a brick wall, and there were a few grave markers in the grassy area before the brick wall. There was no one to my left. As the lady spoke, I heard a heavy sigh directly behind me. I turned. No one was behind me. Just a few grave markers and a wall. I looked to my right, and there was a guy on the tour, listening intently to the tour lady. I figured it was my imagination, but then a few seconds later I heard it again, and it seemed even louder, like someone was doing it on purpose to get me to look. Again, I looked behind me. Again, nothing. I looked at the guy to my right and asked, did you hear that? He looked at me, a bit annoyed, and said, hear what? I was certain I heard a heavy sigh. This guy was the only person close enough to me to have heard it, and he said he didn't. I know he wasn't the source of the sound. Then the lady finished her story and told us we were free to explore the cemetery behind the church. The crowd dispersed into it. I was wandering by myself when I saw two women by a tombstone. It was one of those tabletop kinds. I don't know if they have a special name or anything. This tombstone was about 10 feet from the wall of the cemetery. People had been putting pieces of Halloween candy on it. So I walked over and asked the women why people put candy on this particular grave. They said they didn't know and walked off before I could ask whose grave it was. 
But I was curious, so I took out my lighter and tried to read the name on the stone. I figured I could look it up later. I couldn't make out the name, as the stone was really worn and my lighter didn't give me a lot of light. Then I heard it, a heavy sigh, followed by breathing, as if someone was trying to catch their breath after exerting themselves. I spun around. No one. No one was even remotely close to me. No one was within at least 30 feet of me. I said out loud, okay, who is doing that? Even as I spoke, I kept thinking, this has got to be my imagination. Another heavy sigh and breathing. This time I know I heard it, right behind me. And of course, no one was even close by. And that's when all of my army training boiled down to the two mile PT run. I took off. I mean, I bolted. No thoughts required. I booked on out of there at top speed and I kept on running until I got a few blocks away to my car and went home. I was unnerved even when I got home. My wife and a friend were watching TV at the time and I told them what happened. They both laughed and maybe only believed that I heard something that sounded like what I thought it was. I said, fine, let's all go and I'll show you the place. They made no secret that they were in the note because you may be right category and chickened out of it. Where does my long overcoat come in? The friend asked, did you really run all the way back to the car nonstop? I told her, you see how long this coat is? I was going so fast it looked like a cape and people thought I must be Batman. Okay, not the greatest joke in the world, but it made my wife and friend laugh. I never did go back to that cemetery. Kinda wish I had. I still want to know why the candy and whose grave it was. Some quick background. My family moved into this house in August of 2015 when I was a senior in high school. The house was built in 2006, so not very old. Since we moved into the house, my room has been the guest suite in the basement, while my parents' bedroom is on the second floor, and the kitchen and living room are on the main floor. When you enter the house through the garage, you pass through the basement and go up the stairs to get to the main floor. I don't recall ever noticing anything off when living there in high school or when I came home from college to visit. However, my sophomore year of college, I went on a civic engagement trip to an old mining town in Appalachia. I returned home with a walking stick that had a face hand whittled into it, which was given to me by a strange man there who did his own woodworking. This probably sounds silly, and I never thought there was anything of significance associated with the walking stick, which I'll lovingly nicknamed Randy after the man who named it, until I started having strange dreams about it. In these dreams, the eyes on the walking stick's face glowed red and it would levitate. From then on, I got what I can only describe as the creeps every time I walked past Randy. That's when I started to notice strange things happening. Keep in mind, at this point, I had moved back home from college. Periodically, when sitting at my vanity doing my makeup, I would catch a blur passing behind me in my reflection. A lot of times when I laid in bed, I had the undeniable feeling that I was being watched. One time, when I was downstairs with my mom and a boyfriend at the time, I could have sworn that my ex came up behind me and rested his head on my shoulder. I even felt and heard the breath on my neck. Then, moments later, he and my mom walked into the room. No one was there the whole time. My best friend spent the night one time and she swears to this day that she woke up in the middle of the night and saw a woman standing in the corner of the room. The first time that my current boyfriend stayed the night at my house, I told him the backstory of Randy and he thought it would be funny to mess with the walking stick. I'm talking hiding it around the room and riding it like a flying broomstick. That night, for the first time in his life, he had horrible sleep paralysis. 
could very well be a coincidence. But the rest assured that I've told him ever since, that that's what happens if you bother Randy. Fast forward to more recently. My boyfriend lives with me in the basement apartment. My dog, who has never been one to get up in the middle of the night, has started waking up in the early hours of the morning and aggressively barking and growling at a corner of the room. It's not the sort of bark that he does when he sees a bug or small animal that he wants. It's more threatened sounding barking and he somewhat cowers while he does it. Extremely unusual behavior, but could be written off if it were the only thing happening. Last week, my boyfriend and I were both at work. My parents were at home in the kitchen on a Zoom call with some friends. I received a text from my mom saying, are you guys home or just dropping by? I had no idea what she was referring to. She said that my boyfriend just came in. I double checked his location on Find My Friends and just as I thought, he was at work. After I told her that there was no chance either of us came home, my dad went downstairs to check out the basements. Nothing was out of place and all the doors and windows were locked. When we got home later that evening, both my parents swore up and down that they had heard my boyfriend's voice at the bottom of the stairs saying hello in the tone that he always does. But they didn't hear the garage open or any doors. They both heard it so clearly that they paused their Zoom call to respond to him. Additionally, two days ago, my dad was in the master bathroom getting ready to go meet my mom, who was not home. He heard, once again clear as day, her voice saying, ready? Just as she would. He's an extreme skeptic, so to hear him claim that this happened with no clear explanation was really shocking. So all that being said, has anyone had any similar experiences to this? Does this sound like a paranormal phenomenon or just a series of coincidences? Regardless, I would love to hear your thoughts and suggestions because I can't shake the bizarre feeling I get in my home. I lived in this house until I was 15, then moved across the country. As the house ended up staying in the family, I've been staying here since I moved back a year ago, after seven years of being away. It wasn't a peaceful home by any means. My mother was severely mentally ill and was very violent, physically and verbally towards us, as well as neglectful. I think she perpetuated really bad energy here. When I was a kid, strange things would happen often. For example, things would go, go missing for months at a time before reappearing in the middle of the floor. The dog would always bark at one specific place in midair between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. Things on shelves downstairs would constantly get moved around or thrown on the floor. Water taps would turn on. Cabinets in the kitchen would open and close. There seemed to be some kind of spirit in a red jacket who would come to the door during the day and evening at seemingly random intervals, knock, wait, and then leave. All of these could be their own story, but few things have left a severe imprint in my memory. There was one experience in particular that comes to mind wherein we, read I in particular, left the house in a very specific condition. As I was midway through a trawl, in particular, the cover for the downstairs futons were brought off the clothesline and left in a basket on top of the dryer in the laundry room, which is quite far from the room in which this takes place. The furniture was in a square L-shaped fall as it usually was. When I put the dog in the kennel, I made sure to only do up to the first lock as he was a very good boy who never tried to get out. I remember this vividly when we got back, I immediately went downstairs, talking with my brother, to let the dog out. He was whimpering and whining loudly as we came down the stairs and in the hall. When we turned into the family room, the dog was crouched to the very back of his kennel, sitting on top of the futon cover and visibly terrified. The kennel locks had been switched. The bottom one was now locked and the top was unlocked. 
The futon mattress was absolutely shredded, as if an animal with teeth had found great joy when ripping it apart. The footstool for the chair was left in a similar fashion. The faux leather upholstery had been ripped off at the corner, and the foam had very clear bite marks in it. I do mean bite marks. In addition to the bite-shaped sh- chunks of foam torn off, there were very distinct tooth imprints torn into the foam. The shape and size of the bite marks was not even close to a dog. It was about as wide as a grown adult's jaw, and the teeth themselves were flat across with no distinct canine. You know, like a human bite mark. It was a human bite mark. The stool had been dragged over towards the futon from in the corner. About a total of three feet. The futon itself, normally perpendicular to the wall, had been dragged by one corner several feet until it was maybe a 30 degree angle from the wall and about two feet back from its normal placements on one end and like five on the other. We opened the kennel and the dog shot upstairs at Mach fucking five speed. We checked all the windows and doors and all had been locked. There was no trace of dirt or debris anywhere to suggest a break-in. There was nothing stolen. The dog wasn't physically hurt as far as we could tell. We've never found a logical explanation for this. This happened as my mother was trying to list the house for sale and later that day we had a house inspection lady come in. Since I've been back, nothing of this caliber has occurred. Electronics will turn on and off still, occasionally. Sometimes I hear someone knocking on the window on the path to the house. Things still go missing and reappear once in a while, but it's not a constant thing. I believe while I was gone, the house had been cleansed by a psychic. I do practice witchcraft, and have put up several protection charms and barriers around the house in the time I've been here, so we haven't heard people laughing outside the windows lately. I can't go down to the basements, where the majority of the more extreme things happen, as it is rented out currently, so I can't say if it's much worse downstairs than it was. I'm wondering if the house or spirits here simply have less bad energy to feed off, or if it's just genuinely less haunted. It was evening, and I went out the back field to watch the sunsets as usual. The view was best there, and the sunsets always looked cool over the trees. I took the 15-ish minute walk on the gravel road that connects all of our land. Through the gates, over the creek, past the pond, and finally into the back field. I watched it set over the trees until I couldn't get a view of it anymore. It was starting to get dark, so I decided to go back home, until I saw something. At the other side of the field, right across from me, I saw what looked like a book staring right at me. And while it's not abnormal to see a deer out there, it's odd that it didn't get spooked by me being out there. Since my mom hunts in those woods, I got my phone out to take a picture of it to show her. But the sun had basically set, so all you can see in the picture is a silhouette. That's when it started getting weird. I looked up from the picture and saw the silhouette change. It got taller, like the deer stood up on its back legs and just stood there, motionless. For way too long. Feeling uneasy, but trying not to get scared, I casually put my phone back in a pocket and started walking home. It was getting quite dark after all, and it's just a wild deer, nothing to be scared of, right? So I turn my back to the deer and begin walking, but something felt wrong. It's like I could feel someone staring at me, or something. I quickly looked over my shoulder, but saw nothing. It was very dark now, so all I would be able to see is shadow anyway. I saw nothing until I saw something. The deer. But it was wrong. So wrong. Just typing this out is making me uneasy. 
it was still standing upright, just like it was before I started walking home. But it was running, straight running towards me. That's when I knew something was wrong. This isn't normal and I better start running. I sprint through the gate and get onto the gravel road, screaming for someone to help me. My bare feet getting torn up by the sharp rocks I'm running over. Fumbling with my phone as I ran, I called my dad, who was thankfully home. Hello? Someone is chasing me! I don't hesitate to tell him, obviously, especially since the deer is gaining. About half the distance away it was when I first saw it running. I can hear my dad on the other end of the phone, slamming the front door open and running outside. But I can't hear or see the thing behind me. It's black dark out now, and all I see is a shadow getting 50, 40, 30 feet away. I tear through the creek bed as I run through it, finally seeing my house lights in the distance. I scream as loud as I've screamed in my entire life, the breath scratching my lungs as I do so. I'm running uphill now, not stopping once this entire time. And I finally see my dad in front of me, running even faster than I am. He jumps the last gate, separating me from my house, and starts yelling, Get away! Get away! Get... When he finally reaches me, instead of stopping at me, he keeps running past me and keeps yelling. I fall to the ground, barely able to catch a breath, tears streaming down my face. After maybe 20 seconds, my dad kneels next to me. Did you see it? I force out of my trembling lungs. I didn't see anything. Apparently, whatever chased me was afraid of my dad because once he was in view, it ran away. He is a pastor, so if this was a demonic spirit, it makes complete sense that it left once my dad got to me. Now, it's been a year since that happened. I'm made fun of by most people because everyone thinks it was just a sickly deer with rabies or something, even my parents. But my great uncle, who's literally an expert on wildlife, says there's no way. He says it was most likely a bear, but a bear hasn't been seen here for 30 plus years. And I don't think bears have antlers. This is something I've been needing to get off my chest for a while, and I'm not sure where else to tell it. A few years back, after my junior year of high school, I was working a summer job, making enough money where I could support myself for a few days if need be. At the time, my parents decided that they wanted to take a trip to the beach for their anniversary, leaving me home by myself for a week, which was fine by me. Well, the time came and they left, leaving me and my dog to fend for ourselves. I should add context, saying it wasn't uncommon to hear footsteps or things moving on their own, as I've lived next to a graveyard all my life, and just took it as that's just how things were. Well, about three days had passed since they had left, and I had just gotten off of work, and the sun had started to set, and by the time I got home, it was pretty much dark. The first thing I noticed when I pulled into the driveway was that I could see the light through the window of my living room, which I thought was odd. But when I walked into my home, I quickly realized every single light in my house had been turned on. Thinking not much of it, I looked through the house and turned them off, only leaving my living room and kitchen light on. That was when I noticed my dog was not laying in his bed. I found him underneath the cabinet in my bathroom, shaking to the point I thought he was sick. But he calmed down and came out after he saw it was me. Like I said before, a little activity in the house was not uncommon, so I just thought it was a strange occurrence and shrugged it off. At this point, it's dark outside and it started pouring down with rain but I had to go and pick up dinner from somewhere. So I went and got Sonic 
And when I was headed back, I had nearly forgot about what had just happened. But sure enough, when I pulled back into the driveway, the lights were on again. But this time, when I stepped foot into the house, I was hit by this overwhelming stench. A smell so foul and pungent, it made my eyes water immediately. That should have been my telltale sign to tuck tail and run as soon as I got there, but I didn't. I sat my food on the counter by the door and went to find my dog who was laying in the corner of the living room, seemingly stressed to the point he had puked on the floor. I quickly got him on his chain and out of the house and got to cleaning up the mess. At this point in time, the smell had only gotten worse and I had this terrible feeling of fear that I couldn't describe. I finished cleaning the mess and realized I should probably turn the lights off. So I started in the bathroom, into my father's room and into my room. Nothing eventful happened during these, but when I got to my mom's room, I could feel something staring at me from behind. But when I looked back, of course, nothing was there. I got out of there without turning the lights off. And when I was walking back up the hallway, I felt it again. But this time when I turned around, I saw it. This awful decayed or burnt looking being was standing right where I had come from, in the middle of the hallway, right outside my mother's room. I froze in fear and just stared directly back at him. His eyes were almost human, but way too sunken back. And I could see the dark charred skin hanging from its face. I have no idea how long it stayed like this, but eventually I tore myself back. And when I looked back over there, the thing was gone and the lights in my mother's room had turned off. I remember just sitting on the floor in tears, just staring at the spots where this thing was. I must have sat there for about 10 minutes before sprinting out of my house, grabbing my dog and staying in my truck the entire night. By the time we went back, the sun had come back up and things were normal. I've never mentioned this to anyone and I probably wouldn't have, but I saw it again yesterday at a quick glance while doing the dishes. It was standing just a few meters from me behind the table, but it was gone as soon as I blinked. You may know the story told in the Charlie Daniels song, Legend of Woolly Swamp. Well, you may be surprised he's from this little town I call home. So you can imagine that these creepy woods around here influenced his music. One is the aforementioned song. He even mentions Carver's Creek in it if you listen. That's an old creek that used to be a popular fishing hole about 12 miles west of Elizabethtown. Woolly Swamp is where the creek feeds into. Now it's been said a many moonshiners called the old swamp home. That's where they made their spirits and some like Lucius Clay was said to have left his spirits right there. Most of those old moonshiners liked to bury their money in mason jars so the law wouldn't get their stash and neither would some of the more desperate people looking to make a quick book. If you listen to the song, it'll tell you the rest. Truth is, that old man still walks that swamp, protecting his still and his money. The old man himself sat down one evening after we had been out hunting and told me the story of where that song came from. Charlie very much loved to hunt and he came down every year to bag him a book or two. This is what he told me. The song came from a story he was told as a child. When he got older, he thought it was told to keep the kids from venturing in the swamp and running up on a moonshiner or maybe a gator. So he got bold and him and a few of his friends went out one night looking. There was an old shack back up in the woods where Lucius lived and they knew where it was. So with some liquor and flashlights, they went to see if the old man would come around. You gotta go where the moon is full, he told me. 
Lucius walked when the full moon was out. That's when he liked to dig up his money. I held on to every word while Charlie spoke. He could tell a story and keep you glued better than any TV could. We went out there, sat around, even built a little fire and broke out a bottle of Jack. Must have been out there for a while, just having a good old time, when we noticed the fire had turned blue and it was getting pretty damn cold. Won't like the fire had gone out. There were flames three feet high off the thing, but it was blue flames, like you'd see burning off a good jar of moonshine. Hell, I could run my hand through the flames and they were cold to the touch. That's when we noticed we had one more fella sitting with us than what we came with. The old man was sitting right there and had a gaze locked on every one of us. He took that bottle of Jack and turned it up and said, so you boys come for my money or my shine. Charlie said the woods got real dark and you could hear screams coming from all around them. The old man said, they came for my money and shine, but the gators got him now. Charlie said he let out a laugh that made your hair turn white and that's all they needed to see. Charlie said they got out of there so fast, he didn't know if they left anyone so they got to the end of the road. He said he looked over and Lucius was sitting beside him in the truck, still laughing. He said Lucius told him to not ever come back down there or next time the gators would have him too, then just vanished. They never went back to Woolly Swamp. In fact, to his last days, Charlie wouldn't hunt around that swamp. Charlie told me Lucius was the damn evil and I'd best not go around there if I didn't want to meet him or those gators. I took his warning to heart and never went in there. I can't say Charlie telling me that story didn't make me curious. Oh, I ventured down that way a few times. On a full moon night, if you go down there and park your car in the right spot, you can hear Lucius in the woods laughing and the screams off in the distance from those who never came back out. If you venture in there, you might run across an old shack and see where there was a campfire. When you do, I hope you go ahead and run out of there pretty quick. Lucius still has his money hidden out there and he aims to keep it. Like I told you, them woods hide a many a dark secret. Charlie didn't believe it and he had to see it for himself. He said it best. There's just some things in this world you just can't explain. I had a haunting nine years ago. I was a single mother with a two-year-old boy and my nine-year-old niece. I'd gotten custody of my niece due to her mother being an addict. We just moved into a nice apartment and I was so excited to be able to give my kids a nice place. It was newly redone. New carpet, new walls, new trim, new everything. It was a weird setup though. When you walked in, my bedroom was on the right, living room on the left and dining room straight ahead. To the left of the dining room was the smaller bedroom, which also had its own full bathroom. I think it was more for roommates than a family. I started having paranormal encounters the same day we moved in. So I always left both bedroom doors open at night so I could see into the kids room past the dining table. From the start, I would wake up at 3.12 a.m. every night. A lot of times my son would too, but would start crying. I would wake up to an old woman in my room. She would always stand in the hall that led to the master bath. She would always try to talk to me but I could never hear her. Then my son would cry and I'd go comfort him and go back to bed. But sleep was hard to come by for me. As time went on, she would bang on the walls where the water heater was, jiggle door handles, knock photos off the wall, wake me up every single night at 3.12 a.m. She got more and more angry that I wasn't doing what she wanted, I guess. So eventually, she started appearing as a black, smoke-like mass. She'd get closer and closer, mumbling something I couldn't make out. My cat would always flee. I could feel her anger. I could feel the tension and frustration thick in the air. 
When she wasn't that black mass, she appeared more tattered and unkempt. Her hair would be a mess when it was once done up nicely. She would look so tired, sunken in eyes, became more and more frightening. The behavior was downright aggressive. The banging became so loud that neighbors could hear it. She'd rattle the doors violently. I thought someone was trying to break in, but no one was ever there. My dreams were cruel torments of me being raped, murdered, having my children kidnapped every night. There weren't many nights that I didn't cry myself to sleep. I was doing my best to raise two kids, one of which wasn't mine, work a full-time job and then come home to so much negative energy. I decided to ask my neighbors about previous tenants as they'd lived there for years. Apparently, a woman took care of her elderly mother. Her mother died in my room. The apartment was totally redone because that woman literally had to wallow in her own feces. The daughter was very neglectful and the pets were also never cleaned up after. I also found out the reason I was able to afford that apartment was because the rent was significantly lower than the other identical units. The manager of the apartments never told me any of this. Shortly after, I woke up again at 3.12 a.m. But instead of the old woman or blackness, I saw my son squatting on a dining room chair. I said, Troy, why are you up? He looked me straight in the eyes, smiled his sweet smile and whispered, Mama. I got up to get him. As I reached for him, he just vanished. My heart sank, I couldn't breathe. I thought something had happened to him. I ran into the kids' room and they were both fine, sleeping away. I cried until I was totally exhausted and finally fell asleep. That's when I decided to break my lease and move. She'd unpack boxes, hide things, turn the bathroom light off when I was in the shower. She was trying desperately to talk to me and I had no idea how to listen. I mourned for her. I could feel her pain, but I also had a family to take care of. I had my stuff packed and moved in under a week. If you have any idea what it's like to be a single parent with two kids and a full-time job, then you know that was an amazing feat. I had a dream after we moved that there was a diary hidden behind my water tank. Why I never thought to look in there when there was she kept banging? I just hope she found peace. My family used to live in a house that was right above a small store. To get to our front door, you had to climb quite a few stairs. On the right side was a huge parking lot, a gym, and a couple small shops and restaurants. On the left was a small dirt parking space and a swamp that went out with a decent amount, and then some more houses. I had my own room at the time, which was straight down the hallway from the kitchen. It was peaceful in the house for a small amount of time, but one night I had woken up for whatever reason that I can't remember and saw a small boy engulfed in flames, just dancing around my bed. He kept telling me to go outside over and over again. Now, the swamp looked like it was sturdy ground by looking at it, but if you put a single foot down, you just fall right in. I don't remember what happened next, but apparently both my parents had woken up to the door opening. They got up, ran to the door and saw me going towards the swamp. Luckily, my father was able to run down the staircase and get me before I went any farther. After some time had passed, after my mom had my second little brother, two more incidents happened. I was up in the attic with my father, just playing with his wrestling stuff. There was a small doorway that led to the small room where he kept his wrestling collection, and there was the rest of the attic, and a small staircase that led down to the kitchen. I had gotten bored of being up in the attic, so I headed over to the stairs to go play with my own things. Before I could take a single step down the stairs, a pair of hands pushed themselves against my back. 
causing me to go flying down the stairs. My mom was in the kitchen and thankfully, she was there to quickly help me. She asked if I tripped and I told her no, that someone had pushed me. She did have a team of ghost hunters come to our house to investigate. When they had gone up to the attic, they had brought me along. They asked, did you push this girl down those stairs? And they had gotten a reply, yes. Sometime after that, when my second brother was a bit older, this incident happened and it almost destroyed our family. My second brother was sleeping in my first brother's room because my dad was still building the bunk bed for him and I, and I was sleeping on the couch. I wasn't in the room at the time, but my mother did tell me what happened. She had gone into my brother's room to say goodnight to both of them. And when she went in there, she found my brother with a weapon in his hand. I can't remember if it was a knife, a meat mallet, a hammer, etc. She asked my first brother why he had the weapon. And without even hesitating, he said, they told me I have to kill my brother tonight. And like any parent would, she panicked and got my second brother out of the room. After a few days, she had the same group of ghost hunters come back to investigate. They, have, they gave her this container full of some weird liquid and told us to spray it on the carpets in my brother's room and have him sleep somewhere else. The morning after doing that, there were blue footprints leading from the door straight to my brother's bed. She did send him to a place to stay for a while and it helped prove that it wasn't really my brother that night. Then there was everything that happened in our last home, along with what was going on in our new house. I did forget to add something else that happened. I was sitting on the couch, just scrolling on my phone and laughing at the hilarious arguments that was going on between my mom and first brother. At some point, I felt pain go through my left forearm as if someone had taken the tip of a knife and dragged it up my arm. I look down and see three scratches appearing in the spot that hurt the most. It was faded enough where you couldn't see it at first glance, but it was still somewhat visible. I was still in high school at the time and my grandmother often came to visit us at home. As usual, she often came to talk to my mother about things in general. I only remember that every Thursday, she was holding with my mom a kind of coffee ceremony, which is very common in our culture. Surprisingly, I never asked myself this question before traveling abroad, but it's true that our coffee ceremonies, not only ours at home, but in our country in general, are very much like a kind of religious ritual. We roast the coffee, we put a lot of incense so that the room is filled with smoke, and often we recite prayers. It's often said that it cleans or purifies the house. That day, I stayed with my grandmother and mother in the room where they were holding the coffee ceremony. I listened to them talk and out of tiredness, I started to doze off. My head resting right next to my grandmother, after a while, my mother and grandmother stopped talking and I felt that something was happening around me. I was wide awake, but I didn't want to show it. I don't know why, but I pretended I was still asleep. After a while, I heard my grandmother speaking, but it wasn't her. It was a very husky and masculine voice. For those who know grandmother, it's very strange. My grandmother or whoever, had taken her place, greeted my mother, and my mother replied with a lot of respect, but above all, a lot of naturalness. At that time, I had problems with my tonsils and my mother was very worried. She asked the spirit if I was going to recover from my tonsil problems, and the spirit told her not to worry, that everything would be fine. It's strange because my mother used to address my grandmother in the plural, as if she was talking to several people. She spent at least 20 minutes asking all sorts of questions, which my grandmother answered. 
The spirits possessing my grandmother finally warned my mother that my grandmother was not doing as they commanded and that this was why she was in poor health. They told my mother that my grandmother must never miss the Thursday coffee ceremony once and other stuff I forget. Well, she would have to pay the consequences. Her health, I guess. After 20 to 30 minutes, my grandmother came to her senses and asked my mother what they said. My mother told her that she had to follow what they told her to do in order to stay healthy. All the while, I was petrified and didn't want to show that I was awake. Back to me now. I was talking to my wife about this last night. I still say I don't believe in these stories in general. Even though it's amazing that stories like skinwalkers are so prevalent in our culture. It was common knowledge that a neighbor turned into a hyena some nights. And many other stories about people you meet every day that send spun nights in the middle of wild animals. Or people living with spirits even with spirits manifesting themselves in front of you, etc. Finally, to conclude, I think what, what happens with the grandmother in question is a possession that we call czar in our country. Basically, some people live with spirits inside them that give them orders in order to appease the spirits. For some spirits, it's to read Quranic or biblical verses every night. For others, it's to do a coffee ceremony every week. The most amazing thing about my wife's story is that it's completely integrated into the culture and that people even seek advice from these spirits who possess people. By the way, the funny thing is that my mother is possessed by this type of spirit as well. For her, she also has to organize a coffee morning, but only once a year when she makes an animal sacrifice, usually sheep or chicken. And she is dressed entirely in red from dawn to dusk. I know it's super weird, but I come from a very traditional country. For us, it's totally normal. I'm not even sharing here the crazy things my mum would do or say about paranormal thing. Don't hesitate to ask me questions. If you want to know more or tell me about what you know about this kind of phenomena, I'm, su I'm super curious about your opinions. My dad grew up next door to the house I live in now. His parents were friends with the original owners of my house, and my dad knew them basically as his aunt and uncle. My parents bought his aunt and uncle's house when I was like six months old. My dad would often go to the house by himself to work on it, because it needed quite a bit of updating. The owners were old and didn't have great taste, lol. Whenever my dad would change something in the house, pull up the carpets, paint the walls, redo the bathroom, etc., he would smell the old owner's cologne. The old owner had passed away in his new home in Florida. Because of this, we assumed that owner chose to reside in his old home, aka our home. Growing up in that house, we always experienced paranormal events. Our cousins and friends would stay over and even they would experience something. A quick rundown of the thing's experiences. One time when my family was out of town, my cousin came to our house to let our dogs outside. She came in through our garage and the door to the house from the garage opens right to the basement stairs. Scary, I know. When my cousin walked into the house, she saw a figure standing at the bottom of the stairs. She sat there they looked at each other for a couple of seconds before she realized that she what she saw and ran out of the house. Our living room has a walkway into the kitchen and to the right of that walkway is the stairs to the top floor. You can see up the stairs from the living room. At least three to four times a week, I see a figure walk down the stairs and into the kitchen. And it's been that way for as long as I can remember. Everyone in my family has seen it, and it's just a normal occurrence now. My brother will be like, yo, did you see him just walk down the stairs? And I'm like, yep. One time in particular, my brother and I were in the living room when we saw the figure go down the stairs. 
Neither of us acknowledged it. But we then heard a full cup of water that my brother had been drinking earlier slide across our textured countertops. When we looked in the kitchen, the cup was 90% of the way off the counter. There's no possible way it could have done that without falling. I still to this day do not know how that happened. But we ran out, our little asses, out of that house and to our older brother's house down the road. Now that I'm older, I'm more interested in figuring out who the ghosts are. I bought a pendulum from New Orleans a couple of years back and used it in my old room. I got a couple of answers. The spirit said it didn't like me. That hasn't changed, lol. The next day, as I was getting ready for school, I saw a figure run from behind me out of my room. It was small, like child-sized. Now, I don't trust small ghosts, so I moved the fuck out of that room into my now grown brother's old room. His room was pretty haunted, but I didn't care. When his girlfriend would stay in that room, my brother slept in the living room, she would wake up in the middle of the night to the closet doors sliding open. My brother and I both experienced seeing a man standing in the corner of the room in the middle of the night. I'd just turn my TV on and go back to sleep. I used my pendulum in that room to try and figure out who was the spirits were. It went like this. Do you like me? No. Do you want to hurt me? No. Was this your house? Yes. Do you get angry when we change things here? Yes. Are you the man that stands in my room while I sleep? No. When I talk about the spirits at my house, they become more active. I've learned that if I ask them nicely to be calm, they won't mess with me. I often do this if I have an important test the next day and need sleep. So, I consider them my pals, lol. I'm moving soon, so I don't know if they'll stay at my house or come with. My mom seems to think that they'll follow me. One. Dear, this is my strangest story. In 2019, my husband and I were driving through a rural part of the Midwest on our way to a family weekend. I've always had a good sense of intuition and I told him to watch out for deer, totally unprompted. It was dark out early because of the winter time and no less than three minutes later, we hit a deer. That part isn't the strange thing though. What was strange is he vividly remembers the deer facing left and I remember it facing right. It was freaking huge and totaled our brand new Ford Focus. In the process, I got dazed. Airbags hit me pretty hard and my flight or fight kicked in. Well, I ran out of the car, not realizing we we're in the middle of the highway. Note, my husband was still in the car and the OnStar thingy was going off or whatever it's called. His phone was connected via Bluetooth and it set off some alert saying we had been in a car wreck. I mentioned this because it was loud and he was totally in shock so there was no way he did the following. Clear as day, I heard his voice, like right next to me or in my head. He said, run towards the trees calmly and I listened. Had I not done that, I would have been struck by an oncoming car that was going at least 50 miles an hour. That voice saved my life. To this day, my husband insists he didn't hear anyone or say that and other cars hadn't stopped to help yet. Also, the deer was nowhere to be found, but I don't know if that's strange or not. Two, nursing home. I worked in a nursing home for a bit, which I absolutely loved. There were lots of spooky things that happened there. A little history without giving too many details for patient privacy. The nursing home was old and was originally run by a church. It even has the original house that would house the preachers and a church attached to it. The layout of my floor was very home-like, with an open kitchen and living room that had a few bedrooms connected. I was drying some dishes and listening to the game show the TV was showing and enjoying my day. Now, for context, the room across from the kitchen area had a lady who always insisted her door was cracked a few inches. 
She was bedbound and couldn't walk due to an injury and being generally frail. There was also a bed alarm. If you don't know what that is, it detects when someone gets up from bed and sets off a very loud alarm and alerts the nurse's station call light system. She was also not a social lady and didn't have a cell phone. So when I noticed a shadow or person walk across her room, I totally freaked out and ran down the hallway. I heard her happily chatting to someone and when I opened the door, she was in bed. It's a small room and there wasn't anywhere to hide, but I checked the bathroom, shower, even under the bed. Finally, I asked who she was talking to and she replied, an old friend. I apologized for bugging her and we went about our day. Later that week, three residents passed away. A story for another day, but the old wives tale that death comes in threes, I swear by it. To this day, I wonder if that was someone like the Grim Reaper. Three, first apartment. This story takes place in my first apartment with my now husband. At the time, we were just dating. This complex was a little old, at least 65 years or so, and was close to downtown. I don't want to reveal this town for privacy reasons, but it's been known to have a lot of paranormal experiences. Or maybe superstitious residents, who knows? One evening, while playing on my phone in bed, not sleepy, I saw my boyfriend walk into the room. When I looked up to say hi, I could see through him. I was actually looking at some sort of apparition, but it was weird because he looked like my boyfriend. He stopped as he realized I could see him, looked at me with surprise, then walked into the stand-up mirror. I never saw him again. I ran out of the room into my husband, who had been playing a video game with his buddies for the past hour. Headphones on, door shut, had no idea what I was talking about. In northern Idaho, deep in the Rocky Mountains, there's a cabin that runs a cattle ranch. Chris's brother knows the owner and invited Chris to spend a weekend up there for some hunting and hiking. The brothers gathered their supplies and a few of their best pals and took off to the mountains. As they were driving up the winding Idaho roads, his brother issued a cryptic warning. Sometimes the cattle escape into the woods and need to be tracked down. The owner of the ranch has seen strange creatures in the forest. I'm not messing around. Everyone laughed and didn't take the warning seriously. Within the hour, they had arrived at the cabin. On the second day in the mountains, Chris decided to go on an afternoon hunt with one of his friends. They drove down a backward into the forest until the road ended a few miles from the cabin. They got out and walked to the nearby creek, then split off with one person going upstream and one person going downstream. After walking for a ways, Chris came to a silty deposit where he noticed a foul odor and a broken pine tree that was green and healthy. The trunk was snapped in the direction of the water. There were four finger indentations in the tree bark, like it had been squeezed and pulled down by a massive hand. Sap bubbled from the compressed bark. On the ground, he discovered numerous huge footprints with five toes stamped into the silt. He followed them and counted 73 beautiful tracks that led to another snapped green pine tree. This tree also had big finger marks on it and was facing in the direction of the water. Tracks danced all around this tree. The smell was now overwhelming. Chris became so spooked that he immediately ran back to the truck. His friend had shot a deer and they quickly drove back to the cabin with it. At the cabin, Chris explained the situation to everyone. That night, half a dozen men from the cabin armed themselves, each with a rifle and a pistol, and returned by truck to the end of the dirt road. They parked the truck facing the creek and then walked on foot to the edge of the water. It was a moonless, starry night, but the horrible smell still lingered. The band of hunters waited, and at one point, 
howled into the night, calling for the creature. Chris thought he could hear something moving in the forest, but the creak was too loud to be sure. He decided to walk alone upstream and into the woods to get a clearer sound. He could hear that there was definitely something big making its way through the pines. He ran back to the hunters and warned them that something was approaching. Moments later, from both up and downstream, they began to hear branches snapping and footsteps thudding. The sounds came from both directions, closing in on the group. The footsteps grew louder and louder until the booming crunch of a log under the surface of the mud spooked them so much that they all ran back to the truck. In less than two minutes, they made it back to the vehicle. The moment they fired up the truck and turned on the headlights, they could see two massive bipedal hairy creatures moving up the creek in the location they had just retreated from. The creature's eyes shined from the truck's headlights. All of the men had clear shots, but all took flight back to the cabin in terror. The stench greeted them upon their return. They feared that with the slain deer outside, the creatures would be drawn to the property. They all slept killed up with their guns that night, but no more signs that the creatures would be found. I told you, little brother, I was not fucking around. He figures he ran into a family of them. There was a wild look in his eyes as he turned to me and said, I know they exist. So I wake up in the middle of the night, but I'm not anywhere. It's just void. And then I feel this something. I can't explain what it was. Trying to tell me something, but couldn't unless I allowed it to. It felt wrong to let whatever that was tell me what it wanted. My instincts told me not to. Then it started manifesting itself in the form of unanimated objects, people, a thought, anything. Kind of like trying to convince me to let it tell me but I never complied. Then from this point on, I was aware of my own body and was conscious, but at the same time, I was somewhere else. I'm sure it wasn't a dream. It didn't feel like one. So in the other place I was, I first woke up in this wooden house, in a bed right in front of a door that was never opened or used in this house. I don't know how I knew this, I just did. The door just led to the outside if opened. But this time, the door was poorly closed and one of the lower corners broken. I immediately told someone it had to be fixed ASAP, feeling extremely worried about this for some reason. Next thing I remember, I'm in some kind of line waiting for some guy who was sitting at a table writing something. I couldn't make out exactly what it was. Sometimes he wrote letters and sometimes musical notes. So I don't know if it was like a song or something alike. While I was waiting, I looked down to my shirt and it had a name sewn on it, Alexis, not my name. And then when I reached the front of the line, I read it again on my shirt and the guy says the name out loud and starts writing this stuff. So close to the table was standing a woman and separate from her, but also close there was a kid. Then all of a sudden I started feeling this dread from the guy at the table, the woman and the kid, there were more people, and started feeling the something I mentioned before, trying to reach in again. I left that place and came into an empty house with four more people that were talking about how tired they also were of that something, trying to tell them whatever it wants to say. After this, I'm only in my real body at last and instantly I remembered the grandmother of a friend, she's alive, and started shaking and crying uncontrollably, without an apparent reason, and wherever I was before had no relation with her that I know of. During this whole process where my real body felt hot and I was sweating, like room temperature, not like a fever, and just when I could regain control of myself with the crying, I was no longer hot, 
and came to the realization that my thoughts were completely mine once again. I later looked up and the temperature that night was 21 degrees. So it wasn't hot at all. The experience would have been fascinating if it wasn't for the fact that the whole time I felt like I was in danger while my consciousness was divided. So I texted my friend right away as it was his grandmother that triggered my crying to see if he could reach her and see if everything was okay and told him everything with detail. When I got to the part of his grandmother, I started crying without control again. And here's what made me be completely sure that this wasn't a dream. He told me where I first woke up, I described the room to him, was exactly as the room he used to sleep in at his grandparents' house in another town since he was a kid. Even the broken bit of the door. And he was going to go visit that very same day. Later that day, he texted me again that when he was just about to leave, a worker from the electricity corporation went to his house, talking about a problem with the wiring in the houses of the vicinity. Then he excuses himself to call someone on his cell phone and greeted the person he called as Alexis. My friend also told me that his mother and grandmother had something whisper to them before, even though what I sensed wasn't something audible or visible. I just perceived it in a way I can't explain. I can't say that I've never seen a ghost, but two experiences tell me I might have been near one. The first one, I was recruiting duty in ugh, New Jersey, army. My wife and I lived on Fort Dix. FYI, it was the early 2000s, and while Fort Dix is not an active duty post anymore, the housing area and facilities are still used for personnel that have to work in the area. Or were, I have no idea of their status now. The thing is, the housing area was supposed to be torn down and new houses built. They had actually torn down a section and were going to build new houses. Then, me and other service members would move from our homes to the new ones, and the houses we left would be torn down and replaced. That didn't happen, because this was shortly after 9-11. All of those houses were the same, as you'd expect on a military post. Same layout, same basic stuff. We lived right next to a guy I worked with. Hell, two other guys I worked with lived on the same streets. We all got along, but... As you can imagine, even though I liked these guys, seeing them 12 plus hours at work and then after work and on days off got old, fast. Then there was a hurricane that passed through. Fort Dix is relatively close to the coast, so there was a lot of rain. And since the army has taken money out of maintaining the housing areas so they could build a fence around the entire post, the roof of our house collapsed. I'll spare you the details. Basically, we had to move. The government was at fault, blah, blah, blah. There were two houses that were available at the time. Yeah, I could have taken the option to move off post, but recruiting duty was brutal. I was at work all of the time, and my wife was already pissed about that. I was never home, and I only had Sundays off, and sometimes not even that. Plus, I knew it would end, so I'm not looking for a lease off post, when all I wanted was to get out of a recruiting in New Jersey anyway. One house that was available was right next to another guy I worked with. No prob, I liked the guy. He was cool, and he wanted out of recruiting duty when his time was up too. The other was a block away. We looked at that one first. An older lady that worked with my wife had told her that she actually lived in that house on post before her husband passed. She had told her that even when they lived there, the house was creepy and had a bad spirit in it. Eh, me? Whatever. Each house was the same. I felt that until we inspected it. My wife isn't someone that gives in to superstition easily, but as soon as we entered the place, it felt off. I don't even know how to describe it. It was like nothing was level. 
everything in our perception was off, like a funhouse. Plus, I seriously had feelings of anger and rage with no provocation when we were in the place. I remember that because it was out of the blue. I was cool when we walked up to the place, but once inside, I instantly hated everyone and I felt like I was two seconds from going berserk. My wife also felt uncomfortable in the place. It made her feel angry for no reason. We both decided, nope. We opted to move into the second choice. It was next door to the other guy. I said I worked with, but what the fuck? Liked this guy and his, at the time, toddler daughter was a sweet kid, so no harm. We never found out why that house made us feel that way. But my wife will not deny that it wasn't us. There was something there. And she is not the person who will believe in ghosts and goblins easily. The lady she worked with wouldn't give details either. And she clearly didn't want to talk about, about it beyond what she had told my wife. I still wonder, what was it? Friday 3rd of January 2020 at 4.36 p.m. I, female 20, was cooking with my sister, female 16. She was boiling the pasta and eggs and I was making chef salad, meaning I was cutting the lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers and the cheeses and salami. When because of time, I asked her to cut one of the cheeses when it happened. I was cutting the salami while my sister was cutting the regatta cheese when I felt a warm hand, the palm of the hand to be exact, slowly pushing me forward towards the table. The palm was at the left side and the place underneath your shoulder, same level with your armpit. The hand slowly removed its palm for me and the place was numb, tingling and warm. And my entire body was instantly frozen. My sister and I didn't see anyone or anything but she saw me how one minute I was joking about how the roles inside our household were reversed and the kids did most of the chores while the adults were playing on their phones or sleeping when I gasped and my body moved forward. Now the first couple of seconds, my brain thought it was our dad trying not to scare me by touching me because behind me is the terrace doors that lead to the room that was supposed to be the balcony. But my grandparents closed it and turned it into the sunroom that then leads to another set of terrace doors that lead to the master bedroom. We turned the sunroom into my dad's den where he has his PC and his stuff for his hobby of building small army vehicles from plastic or wood when we moved in after grandma died. But the fact that our dad could be heard snoring and I felt the hand scared me. My sister didn't freak out as much she got scared seeing me become white like snow from fear. When I explained to her what I felt, she told me that some days she feels the same thing, especially at night. A warm hand on her back before she falls asleep. She told me she thought it was only her tired mind playing tricks. Then I told her that many times I have felt shoves or someone touching while I do chores around the house. One time I was dancing and I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned to see if dad or mum or my aunt or my sister who were in the house were trying to get my attention. But I saw nothing. One time I felt it in my hair like a stroke after I woke up from a nightmare. Two days ago I was bolted awake. Entire body jerked forward I mean because of nightmares that I can't recall. I just knew I was in danger when I felt the hand again stroking my hair. When I turned around, I saw nothing. Just the Christmas tree that I thought I had unplugged. When I looked at my phone, it was 9.45am. So I went and took my 10am pill for my Hashimoto thyroiditis. Then I fell back asleep. It's not the first time, but it was the first time it happened while I was with someone else in the room. I don't know if it's a friendly ghost of my grandparents or any other loved ones we've lost. And we've lost many in the past two decades. My best friend said that it might be muscle spasms, 
but why do they feel like a warm hand? Also, my sister complained a couple months ago that she feels watched in her room at night. And that's why she sleeps with the music on and covers her head. And I told her that it must be grandma, since the room my sister is in was grandma's favorite room. She used to pray in it and listen to the church on the radio when she couldn't attend. The house was built in 1978, and my grandparents sort of ordered it to be the way it is. And in 1983, my grandparents were the first residents. My house, along with the rest of the apartments of the building, were built in 1978 also. The area before it was built in was a river and farms, according to my mum's knowledge. So what are your thoughts? Ghosts or something else? In 2013, I moved with my family to a foreclosed six bedroom home on 14 acres straight up in the middle of nowhere in the Poconos. My father and I noticed very weird things going on the second we moved in, but my mother and sister seemed to not notice these things. Everyone besides me and my dad and the entire family are the oh it was the wind type of people, if you get what I mean. There's some evidence that the entire area of where this house is located is haunted as in ghosts and Native American burial grounds and other things. Now, historically speaking, with actual evidence, people settled here around the old mill area long ago and brutally killed many Iroquois Indians. The area is very spread out over miles of heavily wooded mountains. Two weeks ago, my uncle on my mother's side and his girlfriend came to visit my parents' home. They do this quite often, as my parents always have people over for beer, games, bonfires, etc. I just want to start off by saying my uncle is a non-believer, a Harley rider who to this day, I've never seen him really scared of anything or anyone before this sighting. My uncle and his girlfriend are playing foosball with my parents when they realize it's 12.30 a.m. So they decide to head home. They take all back roads and once they turn onto Running Valley Road, six minutes from the house, my uncle's girlfriend sees two figures. They were pretty far away at this point, but it was two small figures waiting to cross the road. Just to mention, there was nothing out here. No houses, besides one abandoned one that was still two miles up the road. Only thing in the vicinity is a cave. These figures were attempting to cross the road to go into the woods, which was very odd because of the time and location. They're now approaching these figures. Headlights start to shine directly on them. Both my uncle and his girlfriend see two young girls aged around 10, one much bigger than the other, wearing what my uncle best describes as early 1900s church clothing, like dresses to the knee with white cotton shawls or cropped sweaters and flats. Weird, right? What the fuck are two 10 year olds doing at 12.30 in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, wearing church clothing? They also noticed the bigger child had her arms wrapped around the smaller one, like you would do if she was hurt, scared or cold. At this point, my uncle's girlfriend is like, it's children, we need to stop and help. Now at this point, the truck is almost right next to the little girls. Both had their heads held down. So then the bigger of the two starts to pick her head up to look at the passing vehicle. Then both my uncle and his girlfriend notice the girl has no eyes, just black holes as if they were carved straight from her face. Girlfriend says, what the fuck was that? You saw that, right? Oh my God, turn around and go back right now. My uncle, scared shitless, takes the fuck off, flying to get home. Then they get home and get into an argument because she wants to drive back and see what was up. Grabs her own car keys and my uncle basically was like, you're not going back there. We are never going on that road again. He calls my parents in an extreme panic, tells them, and they start bugging because they know 
he would never lie or be that freaked out if it wasn't warranted. So my mom starts to tell me everything. Mind you, my fam knows nothing of black eyed kids, never heard of it before. I send my mom an article to forward to my uncle with some of the very basic info. Young kids, no eyes, dreadful feeling, sometimes outdated clothing, hitchhiking are at your door, looking for help, etc. Hi, I have a problem. Since starting meditation more regularly a few years back, also working with my subconscious, like doing dream work stuff, I've become more and more aware of certain psychic abilities. I believe I have always had these, but I used to think they were just my own thoughts. Now I have come to realize that these thoughts or emotions don't belong to me. It has become more clear through the grounding exercise I do, for example, or the fact that I spend much more time alone, so I have something to compare with. When I'm in the company of others, images sometimes enter, or sounds. It has started happening more and more frequently, to the point I feel I can't hang out with almost anyone anymore. Riding the subway is incredibly stressful, or going shopping. I try to avoid activities like these during rush hours. It was always stressful, but I used to blame it on myself, thinking I just had social anxiety. For example, I was seeing a therapist for about a year. I began having more and more difficulties focusing on myself and my own feelings, because I felt too much pain as I went into the same room as her. I couldn't look her in the eye because then the pain intensified. Also, voices and images telling me things like, I don't have the energy for this, I can't bear this. I asked her about this, like, are you sure you have the energy to work with me? I feel like I'm draining you somehow. And she was just like, no, no, I'm fine. I'm just concentrating on what you're saying. Or, why do you think like that? Trying to make it about me. Then one day, she was on sick leave because she had a stroke. And now, she isn't working anymore. Another example, I had a roommate. She only stayed with me for a month. I couldn't handle, handle longer than that. She had a lot of trauma and nightmares. I slept well before that and rarely have trouble sleeping. But the minute she moved in, I started having extremely vivid nightmares and night terrors about her. She could be sitting on my bed, dressed like a child, crying or something, asking me for help, or attacking me and I would wake up shaking. My mental health started deteriorating quickly, so she had to move out. Every boyfriend I ever had, I could hear their thoughts too. I would always know, for example, what kind of shameful secrets they would be keeping and not telling me, like the one who was addicted to violent porn. And only a week into dating, I just knew this was the case. We hadn't even had sex. And I asked him about violent sexual thoughts, if he was into that stuff. And he just broke down in tears. Or my friends for that matter. I have one friend who I can literally hear telling me or herself, I am so ugly, I am so ugly. Whenever we're in the same room and I can't handle it. It's really stressful. She has very low self-esteem. Whenever I meet someone new, these types of voices keep entering my mind, or images, and I feel I can't have a normal relationship with anyone. They need to be 100% secure and at peace with themselves, and nobody I ever met is like that. The latest one is with my current therapist, who I fear is feeling some kind of attraction or affection towards me. I do not feel this way about him, I'm sure. I can't look him in the eye because weird stuff like flowers and pictures of him running around and acting happy and in love appears. I feel super creeped out and a bit disgusted by this. He's never crossed a boundary, but I fear I can't keep seeing him, or any other therapist for that matter, because they're all humans and imperfect. Please help. So 
So I lived with my mother in a very old ex-Victorian bakery shop type stone house, detached in a very rural hamlet. We lived there for just over two years before moving to the town. It was a beautiful house with a lot of potential. One interesting detail is that it had a basement and a couple of cellar rooms. In my country, it's not common to have a proper cellar, let alone a basement. However, the landlord kept those separately locked up and wouldn't let us use them. The house was definitely haunted. I'm skeptic myself, but can only deny the evidence. Plus, even being skeptical, I still love anything to do with ghosts. Some examples. Odd noises coming from under the house at night. Okay, this could have been rats in the cellar. Myself and a friend witnessed a curtain move, almost like when a cat is behind one. The windows were closed and there were definitely no drafts. Things would sometimes seem to throw themselves off of the kitchen counters, like the kitchen roll which was stood at the back of the worktop suddenly taking a dive. The electrics would trip all the time, although it could be normal for an old house. And one time the lights just clicked off, yet the fuse box hadn't even tripped this time. I went and just flipped the light switch back on. At night, there were definite sounds of movement out on the landing floorboards. There was once an unexplained cold spot over part of the sofa. I could literally put my hand on, uh, in and out of it, and there were no drafts. The wall between mine and my mother's room was wooden. One night I heard her knock. I thought she was messing around, so I knocked back. And then she also knocked back again. I questioned her about it after, and she said she didn't do such thing. I always felt a calm yet sad female presence in the house. When home alone, I never felt alone. One night, I woke suddenly, because I thought my mom had come through my bedroom door. I immediately witnessed a middle-aged, thin brunette lady up at my face, looking at me curiously. When she realized I had awoken, she looked nervous, backed away, and literally faded into nothing. It was like I had spooked her. I'm skeptical about this, though, as it could have been a hypnomorphic hallucination. After experiencing all of these ongoing occurrences for quite some time, we found out from a local friend of the landlord that his wife had died in the house. So it's not even like we knew about the death and noticed these things after. This really amazed us and validated our thoughts about the house. I actually used to lay in bed sometimes and talk out loud to the spirit. I thought, maybe there. I felt she was lonely and sad that her family had moved on. One day, me and my mother managed to sneak into a cellar room and there were lots of really old bottles and jars still filled with things. Not sure what, wine and preserves maybe? But the odd thing was this hole in the ground, like a little well of water about a foot in diameter. I've watched a few paranormal shows and a lot of these haunted properties have wells or holes with them, under them which seem to act as a portal. The issue I'm having now is that I'm being very intensely drawn back to the house. I dream about it all the time. The dreams in always include spirits and are sometimes full-on nightmares, yet other times just spooky. After these dreams, I am always felt feeling desperate to reconnect with the house, like I need to go back there. I even search the real estate sites for it regularly, just to see it again and get any news on the property. My longing for this house is driving me mad. I sometimes feel like jumping in my car and driving the 130 miles away just to go see it. I always get the feeling that something is watching me. This feeling mostly comes up when I'm completely alone and it really scares me. I've been having this feeling for the past few months. I tried to ignore it at first, but the feeling of fear when I'm going to sleep keeps getting worse and worse. I feel like a hand is reaching towards me, trying to drag me somewhere. It makes it hard to sleep because I hate closing my eyes when I feel this. But what makes this even weirder to me? 
I've been seeing weird shadows out of the corner of my eyes. Some look more like animals than humans, and it's been getting more realistic. I have a cat. She's still alive. Once I saw her walking towards my bed where I was sitting at night. She walks under my bed. About 30 seconds later, she walks towards me again from the same spot and then jumps up onto my bed. I just kind of stare confused before shrugging it off and then going back to watching YouTube. About two months later, this feeling continued throughout all of it, though it stayed at the same level. I found out there's a crap ton of ants in my room, so I sleep in the living room. I despise bugs. I find that all of my fear is gone. And whenever I went back into my room to get stuff, I felt like I was being watched. A lot of times when I tried to fall asleep, it felt like something is breathing on my face. Then when I open my eyes, nothing is there. I hate that feeling. So I decided to sleep in the living room again. This time during the day, I felt fear whenever the living room was mentioned. So I didn't want to sleep there, but I decided that my room would be worse. So I slept in the living room again. I stayed up a bit that night watching YouTube. Then I get the sudden feeling that I'm being watched again. I look at the windows, no one is there. There's no windows in my room. I put on some calming music and I lay down. I blink and my phone is plugged in and it's morning. I have no memory of plugging it in. I ask my family members if they did it. They didn't. At this point, I don't want to be in the living room. The ants are gone, but I still had a bad feeling when I went into my room. So I stayed in the living room again. When I'm setting up my air mattress, I walk past the hallway and I see a human looking shadow standing in the darkness. I try to get a better look at it and it's gone. I finish setting everything up. I look out the window and there's the same shadow. It doesn't go away. I get a bit scared, but then I realize that it's outside and the doors and windows are locked and it's probably not even real. So I go back to watching YouTube because it helps me fall asleep. I then felt like I was being watched again. I look around and I see the shadow lunging at me. It surprised me, but I didn't feel that much fear for some reason. I was just surprised. I go back to watching YouTube, then I fall asleep. I wake up at 3 a.m., then I fall back asleep. The next morning I wake up and I get ready for school, only to wake up again in a small village with my friend. Then I wake up again and everyone in my family is mad at me. Then I finally wake up and this time I pinch myself to make sure it's not a dream. I was awake for real. I'm not sure if these dreams or these feelings are connected. The shadows scare me, but I don't know what I can do. Does anyone else get this feeling? What can I do to get rid of it? I've had more than a few unexplainable things happen to me in my life. And this one specifically is a single isolated event or entity that I've never seen before or since. But it is by far the most intriguing for me simply because it's so out of the ordinary compared to what I've been used to over the years. This one takes place when I was in the army, stationed at Yongsan, South Korea, back in 2013-14. I was in my barracks room laying down to get some sleep in the mid-afternoon watching some Futurama and hadn't fallen asleep yet. A temporary roommate I had at the time, who became a good friend later on, had walked in after he got off his own shift and we acknowledged each other, yo what's up dude. He proceeded to his side of the room and flopped on his bed behind the furniture wall barrier we created to give ourselves a little privacy in these small barracks rooms. He turned on his Xbox 360 and that was the last I paid attention to what he was doing. Seconds later, I turned away from my TV onto my back and suddenly I was paralyzed and a dark human figure, 
like a smoky black silhouette with medium length messy hair and no real discernible features as he was almost more of a dark void in the air was hovering over me. His silhouettes could be described as ghastly, but I oddly wasn't afraid. He was almost sort of straddling me, but I just hovering in front of above me, like he was paralyzing me and trying to intimidate me with his presence. This wasn't sexual in any way, and he didn't seem evil nor good. I always thought of him as having a chaotic, neutral vibe. He wanted me to do something for him someday, and I remember I was pissed off at him for wanting it. And I wasn't scared of him at all, at least not in the moment. And the whole situation felt like we had discussed at a time before. And this meeting was him following up on the previous conversation or something like that. But I don't remember encountering anything like him in my life before this single afternoon or since. He never said what it was he wanted from me. I just sort of knew what the task was the second he appeared. And to this day, I haven't the slightest clue what it is he wants me to do. Even seconds after he disappeared, I couldn't remember what he wanted anymore. But I sure as shit knew that it was in that brief moment of him smirking down at me. And I remember staring at that jagged fucking smirk on his face and then back up to the smoky white holes where his eyes were supposed to be, and telling him sternly, almost yelling it, no, I'm not doing that for you. It will never happen. He responded with a quiet but audible and confident chuckle, and he audibly spoke only two words a few seconds later. We'll see. His smirk grew a bit with those two words, and he sort of disappeared dissipated as he floated upwards, and I felt his presence physically release me from being temporarily paralyzed. I never woke up because I never fell asleep. I just got up immediately, walked around the furniture to my roommate, and asked him if he just heard me talking weird. He heard all of it word for word, including the entity's response. But he was behind the furniture barrier so he didn't see anything, and he hadn't yet said anything until I walked around, because it all happened in such a short amount of time. I think I've said it a couple of times already, but I've never encountered this thing before or since, and I still don't want, or don't know, or remember what he wants me to do. So I firmly and downright angrily said no to. It was a cold winter in 2010 when me and my family got the news that my grandpa got very sick. So we decided to book a flight from Belgium to Croatia to see him because his health was in a critical condition. As soon as we arrived, we noticed that he lost a lot of weight and wasn't the same happy and healthy man like he was a year ago when we visited our family in Croatia. We were also told that he had cancer and it had spread throughout his whole body, from his lungs to some part of his bones. At one point, my grandpa couldn't walk anymore and his bones started to hurt a lot. We had to drag him literally under his shoulders so that he could go to the toilet. It was very painful to see my grandpa growing through all this, but now, comes the unexplainable part of the whole story. Something which nobody ever was able to explain to me, nor to my family. It's a two-story house. When entering the house, you can choose to go upstairs where a big living room and two bedrooms are located. Me and my family spend most time upstairs because that's where my grandpa was sleeping. You can also choose to go downstairs there's a small room where we usually drink our coffee all together in the evening. That is a thing what we every evening do. One evening, me and my mom were very tired because we had to help my grandpa with almost everything. We decided to skip the evening coffee downstairs and go to sleep. After a few hours of sleep, I woke up to a very, very loud scream. My mom was screaming my name to wake up. 
I was terrified about what could have happened. I rushed to my mom, who was in the living room upstairs, where my grandpa was sleeping. Once I arrived there, I noticed my grandpa wasn't laying in his bed. Me and my mom panicked, like really, really panicked. Where was he? How in the world was it possible that he had got out of bed on his own? He was unable even to get out of a laying position to sit straight in bed without our help, let alone getting out of bed and moving somewhere else. We searched in every room upstairs for him, but we weren't able to find him. We ran down the stairs and went straight to the room where we every evening drink coffee. And to our surprise, he was sitting there all confused, drinking his coffee. I looked at my mom's face and she was looking with disbelief at him. This couldn't be true what we were seeing. He then said to us, I was waiting the whole evening for you guys to show up and drink our evening coffee. Me and my mom were very shocked when he said that. I couldn't believe what I saw and heard. And to this day, it's very hard to, for me to believe that this really happened. We decided to drag him under his shoulders like we always do, upstairs into his bed. This took us more than 30 minutes because he had so much pain and couldn't walk by himself. I didn't sleep that night because I had so many questions in my head. How was he able to get out of bed by himself? How was he able to go downstairs and make himself a coffee? And how did he know about me and my mom drinking every evening coffee in that room downstairs? We didn't really speak about it and he was sleeping most of the time. My grandpa died the next day and I still miss him to this day. He will always be in my mind, especially this event. I will never forget it and how it could possibly have happened. It all started summer of 2017. Me and my friend had moved into a three bedroom apartment. Everything seemed fine for the first month until I started seeing shadows flicker out of the corner of my eye. It didn't bother me at first until the night terror started. This shadow thing would just be standing over me, tormenting me, morphing and twisting its body into horrific formations. After this, it escalated. It started showing itself in full body apparition to me and my friend. It would stand over my friend's bed till he couldn't stand it anymore. And my friend would come to my room and ask if he could stay in there. Now my friend is a former Marine. Nothing phases this man. One day we were all chilling in the living room and we heard someone banging on the door yelling, where is Chester? Where is my son? I know he's here, I'll call the police. We answered the door and a very worn down and old looking woman with wild eyes was screaming that phrase over and over until our other friends started yelling at her until she left. We then named it Chester. Chester would begin to move things, flicker the lights and shake the room at the most inconvenient and terrifying times, like the shower the final straw for me was the clawing at my door. At night, it would scrape and scrape and scrape until I would scream and run towards the door and nothing would be there until the last time where it towered over me like a behemoth. If I hear a cat scratching at a door, I immediately get sent into a panic attack. And that's why I don't have one, lol. I would leave the apartments but the torments for my friend wouldn't end. He had moved back in with his parents and I was with my grandparents. We lived fairly close. He texted me and asked me to come over. I found him on his porch, wild eyed and holding his gun that I heard the strangest wails all popping from different places in the neighborhood. He motioned me to come inside. I asked him what was that? And he looked at me and said, so you can hear it too. I was like, uh, yeah, that's not something you don't hear. It's really loud. And he said, then why aren't the neighbors reacting? I went quiet. He then said, he won't let me sleep, bro. 
He's always there, always screaming right as I fall asleep. Please stay here and watch over me till I fall asleep. I of course obliged. I had to listen to the whales till sunrise. It would then, in 2020, target my brother after he challenged Chester, mocked him and dismissed him. For months, my brother was barely getting sleep. And when he did, it was only night terrors, paranoid and too scared to be in his apartments at night. Then this year of 2021, it targeted my grandmother. I had moved out and she didn't understand what was going on with this thing towering over her. She called for me, but obviously I wasn't there. She's fine and it hasn't bothered her since. I've gathered more information on Chester from my friend. As it turns out, more happened in the apartment than I know. Apparently, he had a full-blown conversation that lasted like three hours with Chester, which involved multiple hallucinations, including showing him a giant pile of money that he could pick up, touch, and feel, only to disappear in his hands, tormenting him with visions and laughter. In the early 90s, my sister was born healthy, but a year and a half later, she died of unknown causes, SIDS. The medical team managed to resuscitate her once, but when she died again, they determined she may not make it, even if they resuscitated her again, or she would have permanent brain damage. At the brink of divorce, they had me a year later, around the same time this happened, born in the month she died to my mom's dismay. Fast forward to a day before the accident, weird things happened all day. Sounds of glass breaking made my parents jump and run outside, checking all our windows, but there wasn't any broken glass. This repeated itself a couple more times. My brother was just a baby, and he cried hysterically, and whenever he wasn't, he was looking up and babbling at no one. Before bed, There was knocking and my parents checked the front door, but no one was there. I was a young kid at the time, so I was just uncomfortable, but unsure about what was going on. The next morning, my mom could not get my early riser brother up from bed, as we normally went to bed easily too. But he was fussy all night, which was unusual for him. My dad had to take me to a doctor's appointment, and usually we went as a family. Dad told us to stay home and let him sleep. We were on the interstate and we're going to take an exit and I remember a car cutting from the far left. I always sat back seat driver side so I saw it in the window and it hit our car leaving us in a spin while they kept going. We rolled down a steep embankment and hit a tree head on. Dad lost power steering and braking ability So we hit a full-size tree at 75. It fell on top of the car, crushing the passenger side, where my mom and baby brother would have been sitting. I died. I remember it didn't hurt, and I remember being in the rubble pressed into the ground out the back window. It hurt after I was resuscitated in the ambulance with a neck brace. I was resuscitated again at the hospital, and they told my mom in front of me, keep her talking, If she falls asleep, she won't wake up again. Years later, I found out both my dad and I had zero chances of making it out alive. He was almost impaled through the heart by millimeters. I had a touch brain bleed. No doctor was able to believe we survived. If my brother or mom were there, they would have died. My mom told me this happened 10 years ago to the day that my sister died but they didn't resuscitate her a second time like they did me. She felt like fate was trying to keep her from ever having a baby girl. What bothers me most is our baby pictures are identical. Sure, we dress different, but other than that, you couldn't tell us apart. I'm sure I'm not her, but I feel chills now every time I look at those pictures and mortified that my mom disclosed to the day we almost died was the same day she passed away. Mom believes my older sister was looking out for us the day before and helped me survive that day 
because the bleed should have taken my life. Part of me feels guilty that they saved me and tried a second time, but not with her. Even with my injuries and blood loss, they tried, but they didn't try with a healthy baby. Other things have happened in the house before and after this all took place, and to this day, I feel uncomfortable at the family home. So this happened to me when I was a kid, probably around seven or eight years old at school. During a lesson one day, I needed to use the bathroom. The toilets were basically at the other end of the school from where my class was at the time. I always got kind of creeped out when I had to walk through the school corridors during lesson time. Since sound didn't really travel from the classrooms, so you were on your own walking through these dead, silent, echoey corridors. It just freaked me out. After walking past all the classrooms, you had to go through another set of doors to get to the next corridor where the toilets were located. As soon as I went through these doors, I could hear this music. A slow, scratchy guitar that echoed and reverbed with a low beat. It seemed to be coming from my right, which was the door to the main hall where we would have assembly in PE, just opposite the toilet's entrance. Often, you'd walk past and you'd hear a class doing PE, but not this time. I looked to see the door was open and couldn't see anyone in there. The music was kind of freaking me out, so I poked my head around the door to see where it was coming from. I saw one of the distinctive sideways prism-shaped cassette players our school had, often used for music during assemblies and stuff, plugged into the power outlet on the left of the door just playing this music to itself. No sign of anyone around in the hall. I looked up and down the corridor, still no sign of anyone. Unsettled as I was at this point, I really needed to use the bathroom and knew I'd probably get in trouble if I got caught snooping about the school during lesson time. So I went to the bathroom. While I'm in there, I could still faintly hear this music. And just as I'm finishing up, the music starts to fade then disappears. I come out of the bathroom to see the main hall door is still open and there's still no sign of anyone in there. I poke my head around the door again to see nobody there, but the cassette player is now gone. I look up and down the corridor again and there's still no sign of anyone around. Bear in mind, the time between me hearing the music fade and me coming out of the bathroom it's probably about a second or two. Weirded me out big time, especially as an eight year old. I power walked back to class, told a few friends, but I don't think any of them really believed me. Didn't really think much about it until 2013. I was around 20 years old at this point, when I was following the Kakada 3301 phenomenon. Part of the ARG puzzle whatever Kakada 3301 was a piece of music called the Instar Emergence. Now I can't say for sure that this was the song I heard that day since I don't remember the exact tune, but upon hearing it for the first time it instantly reminded me of the music I heard that day and freaked me out all over again. If this isn't the song I heard, it can at least give you an idea of what it sounded like especially the latter half. I still don't really know what to make of this whole thing, but the more I listen to that song, the more I'm convinced that's what I heard that day, but I'll probably never be sure. The song hasn't been identified as existing publicly outside of Kakada, but I somehow doubt a Kakada 3301 member walked into a school with their music on a cassette tape to mess with some random kid in 2001. Anybody have any ideas what might have happened here? This experience has happened to my little sister, female, 16 years old, when she was three years old. I learned of it yesterday after my dad, her and I, sat in the living room of our late maternal great aunt Eugenia's home and we were reminiscing about the old times when most of our grandparents were alive and living in this three apartments building. 
and how fun it was to meet for lunch and breakfast with them, and in general, having them and the cousins from Australia around. Those were the best family summers in mine and my sister's memories, and slowly the conversation shifted into the paranormal sightings our family has gone through, since the women in both sides of the family have some sort of gift. Dad started sharing his ghost sightings when my sister hesitantly shared this. Please note that the time of the events it was late in the afternoon, and I was present, but I was eight years old, and I did notice that my sister was behaving weirdly, but I was too busy eating ice cream. The experience goes like this. She was three years old, and she was too bored to walk on her feet. So she started to crawl and pretend to be a dog, barking at our grandmas. When she met them in the hallway towards the first kitchen. Yes, we have two kitchens and two bathrooms. When my sister grabbed some water and then stole some pie from the fridge and went to the second kitchen to grab a plate. As she was eating, she saw great aunt Eugenia and she was scolded for eating the desserts before dinner. Defeated, my sister returns to the living room and joined in the dining room and saw the rocking chair by the second terrace's doors and it was moving and an old man dressed in a tuxedo and smoking a cigar sitting on it and rocking back and forth while smoking. My sister recalls she had crawled to him and bark at him which caused him to laugh at her and motioned for her to sit next to him. My sister then asked him who he was and he says that he was great uncle Takis and he was just watching his siblings and his nieces and nephews and now grandnieces and grandnephews. She sat by him for a while and she played with some leaves that had been blown in by the open windows and terrace doors all around the house. When she asked him why none of our grandparents introduced him to us, he said that he didn't need to be introduced. He knew all of us and had been watching us. Then my sister stood up and said goodbye to him because she wanted to go outside to play with me. She then says she looked for him around the house but couldn't find him. She asked around about Grand Uncle Takis and everyone ignored her and said there was no one with that name. Flash forward to last year when my sister and our mum were going through some old documents and photos. When my sister found a photo taken in 1957 and it showed he was the eldest son of our maternal great grandma and he had died from cancer in that very same chair in 1958. And his real name was Christophoros Thomas Bosinikis and he was great uncle Temios, actually named Temios, the male equivalent of the name Eva, oldest twin brother. All my life, I felt very uncomfortable sitting in that chair because I felt as if I was intruding. This happened about two years ago. My elder sister was staying with me and sleeping in the room across the hall. The room across my sister was staying in wasn't huge by any means. When you walked in, the light switch was by the door and it was about three steps to the queen size bed, which took up most of the room. It was about four or five feet from the end of the bed to the wall, but there was a vanity and some shelving so there wasn't a lot of floor space. We go to bed and my sister looks very disturbed and shaken the next day. She said she awoke in the middle of the night and got up to go to the bathroom. She stood up and reached out for the wall and light switch, and there was nothing there. She kept walking and walking and reaching out, but it was dark and there was just nothing. She found the bed again and walked from the end, but the same thing. She said she had walked 20 or 30 steps in each direction, and there was just nothing. I've slept in that room many times, and there's a window that lets in street lights, but there was none of that from her description. She had been in pitch darkness. She sat on the bed for a bit since it seemed to be the only thing, freaked out in the dark, 
And when she tried again, she found the wall and light switch right away. She slept with the light on for the rest of the night. In another story in the book that was right after this story, in the book, it was seen as the same phenomena, being pixie led. A teenager was walking across a field not far from her house and it just seemed to go on forever and ever. Even though she had been through the area hundreds of times, it was like it was much bigger than it had ever been. To get out of the situation, a person is supposed to put a piece of clothing on inside out, a lot of times socks, pull their pockets out or look through their legs to see past the illusion. The girl eventually did one of these things and was freed. Supposedly, this is a sign that one has been pixie led or glamoured by fairies. Just an interesting alternative theory for a strange situation that many people have experienced. It reminded me of a lot of stories I have read on Missing 411 as well. When I read about this, I told my whole family about it and about how to get out of it, just in case one of them ends up in the situation again. Another thing, I was talking to my sister again and she shared a detail I had forgotten from the day this happened. When she was wandering around the room for a long time, she eventually ended up touching some kind of fabric that seemed to be hanging. There was one window in the room without a curtain, hence the weirdness of not seeing the streetlight through it, and nothing else hanging on the walls that could have even remotely been mistaken for fabric. She said it was soft and velvety, and it was all she could feel. Nothing hard behind it, no walls as she followed it. It freaked her out enough that she went back to searching the space. When the space went back to normal, there was nothing like that in the room that she could have mistaken. I often wonder what would have happened to her if she had tried to go through the fabric. So this happened in 2019 in the Midwest. Around 9am, a beautiful sunny day. I'm inside my room, cheery and excited to start the day. The sun is shining through a clean window and today is the chore day. I was on a mission to organize some trivial things, nothing wild. Well rested, no stress, finally time to myself and organization. I had an offer for an important project that would be held at the end of June, the biggest gathering of green energy. And I was invited to showcase my trashing, wearable art made from poorly discarded trash, mostly plastic bags. Because I was scouted for a previous project, smaller one, that I worked on. I'm in a good mood, I have a goal, I'm well rested and the only drugs I could have done would be strong black tea and perhaps mouldy bread. None of which were even present. I'd lived in the place for about seven years and there was absolutely nothing special about it. That's important as to what will come next. As I bend down, I hear something calling for my attention. I'm alone in my apartment. I froze with fear but still looked over. Still in fear, I look from one corner of my eye and I see a face, about three feet from the ground. Oh shit. He looked very humanoid, with slightly larger features, the head and the eyes. A color of smooth leather-like skin was lilac gray on a dim level. Small nose, long but thin-lipped mouth, smaller ears and large eyes. Still human eyes, None of that big black side ovals. No, this had human eyes, but they were different, very different. The whites of the eyes were a dark gray. The iris was well segmented and had a typical root-like formation, except it was gray black and the pupil had no reflection. It became even stranger. When somehow I got sucked into the pupil, he showed me the abyss, the true nothingness. It was both dark and light simultaneously. There was all and nothing in it. I wasn't looking at anything in particular, but any emotion, space, time, mass, it was gone. All was gone and all was obsolete. Then the being talked to me. 
without moving a muscle. He said in my vibration of voice, one day I'll take everything away from you. I had no annotations or any sign of emotion. It was a statement like a fact, not really threatening nor a warning, just is. I remember feeling powerless as he, the being was way superior to mankind. Being so close to it made me feel incompetent. I then realized that the being held no experience with desire or fear or any emotional feeling. Then it left. Still, I'm in my sunny room, as if nothing happened. I looked around at my hands and they were wet, covered in an electric like field. I have no idea what it was, so I'm trying my best to explain it and what it looked like. This field around only my skin was colorful, bright and moved like a current. It was so close to my skin as if this was my second skin and it moved until it too vanished. I still live there, but I slept over at a friend's house that following night. I stopped working on the project early 2019 without any real reason to. In June 2020, it was canceled. So this happened back in the early 2000s when I had gone to visit my grandmother. It was a pretty big and old fashioned house. A typical Portuguese house actually. It had a long hallway and many huge rooms since it was just my grandma and her maid who lived there. Most of the rooms were unoccupied and locked. My dad grew up in that house and so did my uncle and aunt. They had practically spent their whole lives there and never found the house eerie or scary. I, however, was never comfortable. From the very first day, I always got an unfriendly and unwanted feeling from the house. I was always extremely uncomfortable there. Now it could be because I was raised in the main city and was accustomed to the constant sounds of vehicles and people and just random things all the time. While my grandmother's house was deep seated in a village away from the buzz and noise of the city. One night, after everyone had gone to sleep, I got up to drink water. I did that almost every night. That night, I realized that I had forgotten to carry my water bottle with me. So I had to walk to the kitchen, which was down the hallway to the left, opposite to one of the locked rooms. Naturally, I was a bit hesitant because old houses have a way to look creepy in the dark. But I ignored that feeling and headed down the hallway. I reached the kitchen, switched on the light, filled myself a glass of water and began drinking. As I drank, I looked at the locked door of the opposite room, which to my surprise, wasn't locked. I didn't find it completely fishy because I assumed that the maid must have opened the, the cleaned the room and forgotten to lock it later. So I decided to check it out. I kept back my glass, switched off the kitchen light and headed towards the room. When I entered, it felt like I was in a completely different environment. It was eerily cold and I got goosebumps. A very unsettling feeling washed over me. Something about this room was just so off. It was pitch dark. I could just see the outline of the furniture in the room. A bed in the middle, wardrobe to the right, and a dressing table on the left. Pretty basic stuff. But the bed looked so bulky. If the maid had cleaned it in the morning, it should have been perfectly made. But from whatever little I could see in the dark, the bed looked like it was used, slept on. My stomach twisted. I couldn't stand there any longer. I turned and ran towards my room. I locked my door and tried to distract myself. I thought about unicorns and some random stuff just to stay distracted until I fell asleep. The next day, I asked the maid if she had forgotten to lock the door of that room and she seemed surprised because apparently she had never opened it. Apparently, she never opened any of the unused rooms and she didn't have the keys. My grandmother told me she kept the keys in her drawer and no one was allowed to take them. So I asked her about it. She seemed equally confused, but she assured me that I was probably really sleepy and imagined the whole thing. I mean, 
I'm sure it actually happened. Anyway, I have always avoided that place since. At the most, I stay till evening, but I never sleep there now. When I was about eight, I got a rubber super bouncy ball. You know the ones. Mine was the usual clear rubber with gold glitter inside. One day, I was sitting on the kitchen counter in my grandma's apartment. I could stretch my arm out, carefully let go of the ball, it would hit the linoleum with an audible bat and jump right back into my hand. If I was quick, I could catch it. I kind of got in the zone with this. Drop, bat, catch. Drop, bat, catch. After several drops, I dropped it and there was no noise. We never found the ball. Next occurred when I was in my early teens. I'd bought a poster and at one point I had another stuff on my wall, so I rolled it up. In our living room, we had a chair that stood off the floor about 10 inches on four very thick legs. I put it under the chair. It was gone the next day. We never found that either. Skip to me as a very young adult in the late 1990s. I was moving out. One day, my parents were both at work. Nobody else was home and I had a van pulled up to the back. I would go to my bedroom in front of the house and bring something through the living room and kitchen, then out the back door to the vehicle. Occasionally, I put something on the dining table, which I'd cleared of stuff. It was normally really messy. I brought in a lava lamp. This thing was loud, as they say. It was about 17 inches tall, had yellow liquid inside, and had a sort of bowl or tray around the base filled with yellow, orange, and red plastic flowers. You couldn't miss it. It stuck out like a sore thumb. I put it on the table, came back, and it wasn't there. Puzzled, I looked on the chairs, under the table, on the nearby counters. I checked everywhere from bedroom to truck. I wondered if someone walked in and absconded with it. I hit panic mode and went truck, table, room, table, truck, table, room, table. Finally gave up and sat at the table, putting my arms out right where it had been and sat for a while. I eventually gave up, went back to my bedroom and grabbed the next item. When I walked back in, there was my lava lamp on the dining table, exactly where I'd put it. This house, like the one I live in now, may have been haunted. We had two things that went on there, but neither had anything to do with things disappearing. The last happened where I live now, about five years ago. I'd walked home from the store with, among other things, a bag of oranges. I took two into my bedroom. My bed was made with a brown comforter. It wasn't smooth, but rather a bit lumpy. I tossed one of the oranges onto the middle of my bed. Looking directly at it, I saw it land and vanish right before my very eyes. It didn't leave or leave a dent or divot or affect the comforter in any way. I looked under the bed, which was its side up against the wall. I never found an orange, even though I've since moved the bed around. Now this happened when I was around 11 or 12. It was after my mom's wedding. Me and my younger siblings were taken to my friend's house to stay the night. Because you know, a wedding with children after hours did not mix. And I remember being in the basement because it was big enough for all of us there with a TV and couches and a bed near an old bar they didn't use anymore. So there was me, my friend, my two younger siblings and my older brother. We played on the PS3 until like 1am after we all went to bed. Now that's out of the way, let's get to the weird parts. So I slept on the biggest couch. Another bed was taken down from upstairs, so it was in the middle between the two couches and another bed. 
My siblings were on the beds and my friend was on the other couch, so she was right beside my head. I woke up to a creaking of a door slowly opening. There was a toy room behind the couch I was sleeping on and the light was coming through from outside because it was early morning. I sat up and looked to the back of the room behind the bar. There was a door there that led to the boiler room, if that's what it's called. There was a fridge there, but it was pitch dark, even though there was a window with no curtains anyway. I couldn't see anything, so I grabbed my glasses off the floor. I put them on so I could see better, and there I saw it. I swear my blood ran cold coming out of that room. I could see a grey hand reaching out and then another. And the face came out after it all. I could see were blank black eyes staring ahead. The thing, the thing crawled on all fours. I could hear it scraping against the floor. It was skinny and long. I was frozen on that couch. It hid behind the bar and I could see it peeking from the side looking at me. There was also a fish tank in the middle of the bar so I can see the outline of the thing behind it. I was too afraid to yell as it stalked around and got closer to the couch I was on. It walked between the bed and the couch looking at me, still not blinking. It made no noise but it's scraping against the floor. Just then, my friend moved in her sleep and this thing's head moved so quickly to look at her, it started going towards her instead. It took two steps away and was reaching for her head. Its weirdly pointed fingers got closer to her face. At this point, I was finally able to get the courage to move. I screamed so loud. It moved to look at me. And then found myself bolting up on the couch, slight sight blurry and confused. I rushed to get my glasses. I found them under the couch. I put them on and I frantically looked at the door to see wide open. My friend awoke to me yelling and looked at me weird and asked what was wrong. I told her this thing was after her. It was about to touch her, but it's not there anymore. But the door is open. I started to cry. I got my things leaving, my siblings behind, I left. I never really told anyone this but her. Just recently, like a year ago, I went to her house again. I still went there and her mom recently told me that she told her about what happened. So she got a medium to come in and look at the house. And the medium told her that something bad was in the back room. So she was going to get rid of it. Now, I was shocked because at first I thought some kind of weird dream. But I don't know, take it as you will. I have no idea what went on. I still hate going down in that basement. I always get such a weird feeling. I grew up in Africa, where this story took place. At that time, I was 16 years old, and I was what is called a rebellious teenager. I'm 35 today. I would often go out late at night, stay with my friends until very late at night, and come home in the middle of the night. I lived in a house in a neighborhood where there were no streetlights, because the, between the asphalt road and the house where I lived. To describe the neighborhood a little bit, there was a road a little over a kilometer long that I had to walk to reach my house. And so there was no street lighting. It was almost very dark, especially on nights where there was no moonlight. I used to keep a small flashlight so that I could walk in the dark and get home. For the record, I know it may sound a little wild, but there were a lot of hyenas in my neighborhood. But I have been told since I was a child that hyenas never attacked human beings. As scavengers, they would look for trash from houses to feed on. That night, as I came home once again in the middle of the night, I walked in the dark with my little flashlight to light the way. In the middle of the path, I felt that someone was following me. No footsteps or anything else suspicious, just a feeling without any real foundation. After a while, I started to get scared for no reason. The feeling of being followed in the middle of the night without seeing anything was really too strong. So I turned off my flashlight and continued walking in the dark, thinking that whoever was following me would not be able to follow me anymore. On the way, there was a very small bridge where there was a light, the only one on the way to my house. 
Before reaching the bridge, I hid on the lower side between two houses to see if the person following me would go over the bridge. I was a little paranoid, but I really thought that someone was behind me. What I saw still gives me the shivers when I think back. After two minutes, maybe, I saw two shadows on that bridge, walking like human beings, but there was no one there. Just the two shadows. I still remember the shadows that were walking and that I saw clearly that night. The shadows were on the ground, but there were no bodies. Just the silhouettes on the ground walking as if someone were there, but no one was there. The two shadows were walking side by side and crossed to the bridge as normal people, except there was no one except the shadows. I had a fear that I still feel today after almost 20 years. I knocked like crazy at the door of the house next to where I was hiding. And after a few minutes, a man came out without understanding what was going on. He woke up in the night and I begged him to let me in. I think he knew who I was because I was a foreigner in the country and in my neighborhood, there weren't many foreigners. So he walked me home about 500 meters away from the place in question. I was shivering and woke up my mother who started to pray. The next morning, I asked my mother about what I saw and she told me not to worry that these shadows were the shadows of sorcerers and that apparently at night, that's how they move, invisibly. This is the only time I've experienced something that I can't explain to myself. During 1975 to 1977, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi had a state of emergency declared across India, which allowed civil liberties to be suspended and the press censored. Hence, authentic news was hard to come by. My grandfather, who lived in Patna, Bihar during that time, rebelled and started an underground newspaper along with like-minded people. This helped him keep up with the news that the government would usually censor. Thankfully, he and his colleagues were never caught. One of the worst human rights violations that happened during this phase was a mass forced sterilization campaign spearheaded by Sanjay Gandhi, the prime minister's son. Hospitals had been allotted quotas on the number of compulsory sterilizations they had to perform every day. And leaders to say, found a shortage of consenting men after a while. To avoid the wrath of the government, they started picking up homeless people from the streets and performed forced sterilizations on them. My grandfather interviewed such people, a majority of whom claimed they were sleeping on the streets and woke up the next day with neutered genitals and a hospital receipt in their pocket. Now, in their indiscriminate abduction spree, the hospital staff once picked up a sadhu, a Hindu saint, who was sleeping under a banyan tree and forcibly sterilized him. To give context, sadhus are renunciate saints who are celibate. They are said to be close to God and have mystic powers, at least the genuine ones. Also, their customs include never cutting their hair, where the spiritual powers are said to reside. Hence, what happened to the sadhu can be considered extremely disrespectful. He was extremely agitated when he met my grandfather and in his anger broke a hair from his head threw it on the ground and thundered, I swear upon my worship of Lord Ram, a Hindu deity, if I have even an iota of his blessings upon me, no one from the Gandhi family will die a natural death. As a proof of my powers, anyone who opens the book Ramacharitamanas, a holy book dealing with the Lord Ram's journey, today will find the hair I just threw inside it. My grandfather was incredulous regarding the sadhu's claim, but went home to have a look inside an early edition of Gitta Press published Ramacharit Manas, kept at his home. To his astonishment, he found a single curled up hair strand on the first page of the book. But still, the sadhu's claim of putting a generational curse on the Gandhi family seemed far-fetched to him. As the years passed by, the sadhu's prediction came true. 
On 23rd of June 1980, Sanjay Gandhi was flying a new aircraft of the Delhi Flying Club and, while performing an aerobatic maneuver over his office, lost control and died instantly from the crash. On 31st of October 1984, two of Indira Gandhi's bodyguards shot her with their service weapons in the garden of their Prime Minister's residence and assassinated her. On 21st of May 1991, Rajiv Gandhi, Indira's younger son, was assassinated by LTTE, a militant organization through a suicide bombing attack. This was a strange night. It happened about seven years ago when I was still a teenager. My extended family really loves biking and they had the great idea to go on a moonlit bike ride. They had heard of others doing it and were pretty sure the moon would be bright enough that we wouldn't need flashlights. The bike path was up a mountain, so it would be downhill the whole way if we drove up and started from the top. 9 p.m. rolls around and all eight of us head out to the mountain, a 10 mile drive uphill from the base. When we got to the top, clouds have completely covered the moon and it's totally dark, great. I'm feeling a little spooked already because of the tall trees and slight wind that is whispering through the trees. We all get situated and plan to stick together, but as we start rolling down the mountain, it becomes harder to stay together. All of our bikes were really old and all of them went varying speeds. So within 15 minutes, we had all separated to the point where I couldn't see anyone in front of or behind me. The mountain road was covered on both sides by thick pine trees and the moonlight was not very bright because of the clouds. It was terrifying to be suddenly so alone in such a dark forest. So I just kept pedaling as fast as I could. I'm not a superstitious person at all, but I keep getting very bad vibes from the depths of the forest. I almost began to panic and I wanted to stop and wait for some of my family to catch up, but I was too scared to slow down. It took about an hour to get down the winding road and when I made it to the bottom, everyone was there waiting for me. I wasn't sure how this was possible because I hadn't seen any of them pass me and I knew I was in front of at least three of them. They had all just arrived too, and I asked them how they were in front of me. They shrugged and didn't really care because of the story my father had just told all of them. This is the story. About 10 minutes into the bike ride, his tire had gone flat. He decided to give up on the ride and walk back up to the mountain to the car. The path was downhill the entire way or uphill if you were walking up, there were no changes in that. He recounted that he left his bike to the side of the road and began to walk up the mountain, back to the car. But after about 10 minutes of walking, he came across his bike again. It was as if he had somehow walked in a circle, but that wasn't possible because he knew he had been walking uphill the entire way. My father isn't one to believe in the supernatural, and he seemed genuinely confused. We were all horrified by this story because what the hell? How did that happen? And how did all of my family arrive before me even though none of them had passed me? The rest of my family also shared that they had gotten a very bad feeling during the long bike ride. To this day, my father claims his story is true and there's no explanation. My personal paranormal theories are skinwalkers. The mountain is on a Native American reservation, the Navajo reservation, or aliens. And then my other theory is that my father is just pulling an elaborate prank and I somehow took a different road or turn down the mountain so that my family passed me. Ever since I can remember, I felt something with me. Ghost or not, it doesn't scare me, but it likes to play jokes. One of the instances that stands out was about 10 years ago. I was still living with my parents at the time and I decided to cook dinner. I love to cook, so it was never a chore, but I hate peeling potatoes. 
My dad has never minded peeling them for me, so we went to the kitchen together to prepare the dinner. Our kitchen bar was L-shaped, and the little part of the L was always clear except when we were preparing food. My dad and I started getting everything out of the cabinets that we would need. He then asked me if I had seen any of the potato peelers. I told him no, but I'd help him look. My mother is just like me in the fact that everything has a place, so I thought this task would be simple. Both my father and I looked in the drawer where they usually are, then the dishwasher, then the dish strainer. We were beginning to get frustrated. We started looking in cabinets and other places that we knew they weren't supposed to be, but it was worth a shot. While my dad was at the other end of the kitchen, I bent down to look in the cabinets under the small part of the L, and my dad called my name. I stood up and looked at him with my back toward the bar. He had a blank stare on his face and was just pointing. I turned to see what he was pointing at, and on the edge of the bar, two of the potato peelers were neatly placed side by side. A more recent event happened a couple of weeks ago. A little bit of a side note, my husband absolutely hates to misplace or lose things. One morning we had gotten up, made our bed, and went to the kitchen for breakfast. On top of our freshly made bed, my husband placed his wallet to come back for later. After breakfast, he said he needed to go to the store and proceeded to our bedroom while I stayed in the kitchen cleaning up. All of a sudden I heard, you've got to be kidding me. I smiled because I knew what had happened. He came back to the kitchen and asked if any of our children had been in the bedroom. I replied that they had gotten out of bed and been in the kitchen the entire time. After 10 years of being with me, the last thing he thinks of is my friend, as he calls it, hiding things. I told him I'd go help him look, so we headed back to the room to look. We looked under the bed, on our dressers, in the bathroom, and then slowly took off every layer of the bed. At the end of the search, still no wallet, and the cover and sheets lay in a big pile at the end of the bed. Being the OCD man he is and hating that something of his had disappeared, he tried to convince me and himself that maybe he sat it in the living room or kitchen. To humor him, I followed him through the house, searching room by room. Even the rooms we both knew he didn't go in. By this time he was angry. I told him it would turn up and that I was going to make the bed again. As soon as I stepped in the door, I called for him to come. Lying on top of the mound of covers lay his wallet. He doesn't like my friend. I've had several, and I mean more than one, but less than 50 experiences. As a child, I was going to Catholic church, if that means anything. But with that in mind, I was raised thinking there were spirits, but not having seen or heard anything. Shortly after my grandpa died, I was staying at my grandma's house. I was in maybe the fifth grade when this happened. This was my first experience, and I never told anyone about it because I was a kid and nobody would believe me. That night, I stayed at my grandma's house. I slept on the couch. I was too scared to sleep in her room. That's where my grandpa died. He died in his sleep. As a child, that would freak anyone else. But my grandma had this clock that would chime every hour. I remember being woken up to the chime. It felt like it wouldn't stop. I remember opening my eyes because I thought I heard my grandma walking down the hall to get water or something. Expecting to see my grandma, I was going to ask her when the chiming would end. But when I looked down the hall, I didn't see her. What I saw was, I can't describe it any better, a blue floating orb and a massive one at that. It had to be the size of a head. It absolutely freaked me out. So. I did what any child would do, put my head under the blanket and closed my eyes so tight. I never brought it up to anyone, 
And that was definitely the last night at my grandma's house. Not long after that, maybe a month or so, at my old house. We've moved from that house about seven years ago and I have several experiences from there as well. I was in our basement with my younger sister. We were dancing to music with our childhood friend. I remember the song that I was dancing to when I saw this. It was Funhouse by Pink. It was the middle of the day during the summer, if that accounts for anything. But I remember I spun around and saw this extremely tall white figure that was standing in front of what was my room. I stopped dead in my tracks and just looked at it. It looked like lightning, electricity even. My sister and our friend noticed I wasn't dancing anymore and asked if I was okay. I said, don't you see it? They of course said no. I didn't know what else to do. So I just sat on the floor and prayed for it to go away. And it did. I never saw that apparition again. I also remember one night I was reading on my Nintendo DS, lol, under the covers because it got cold in my room. And as I was finishing a chapter of some book I was reading on the internet, I felt a dip at my feet. Not thinking of anything since we've always had cats and dogs. Thinking it was one of our pets, I stuck my head out to pet them. And nothing was there, but the pressure of the dip was still at my feet. I once again pulled the blanket back over my head and prayed. The pressure didn't leave until after I finished my prayer. Thinking back, I believe it could have been my grandpa or one of my cousins who passed. But those are just a f my first few experiences. My experiences got creepier and creepier as I got older. I live 20 plus miles outside of town in western parts of Wyoming, in known old Indian territory. We find a lot of old pottery and a lot of other things. We only touched one when we first moved to the house, but nothing else. And if we do dig a small clay shard up, we put it back after we're done or relocate it. Two nights ago, during a howling 40 plus windstorm, normal for this time of year, we heard a super loud woman right by our room outside, also where our one-year-old sleeps. It scared us, because this has never happened before. I don't think Wens would actually try to call and lure someone with this many other houses around in a subdivision. I knew they lived around here, because this area was taken from them for a typical American thing, oil. And when it dried up, land came for sale, and about 100 years later, here we are. Anyways, we did what you're not supposed to do. My hubby grabbed his gun, turned to the panic on all three of our vehicles and walked outside the perimeter of the house. Nothing, no wind, not even a breeze, no crickets. It was chilly, smoke was gone. We checked on Lily every five minutes, almost to make us sure she was okay. My mother-in-law gave us some of her mother's old native stones to put under the bed and in her windows and along the doorway with sage if we needed it. Yesterday night, we then heard baby cries. Like, you know, parents, when your child gets sleep fussy because they're not finding a comfy spot. We heard it all night, sometimes nonstop. And I was right by my daughter's side in her crib, losing it. I was tired of the sounds and just praying they would stop. Then 5 a.m. this morning, my husband left for work. I knew he was gone because I heard the door side by the garage lock and him struggled to get his work truck to start. And I heard his hydrogen tanks and shovels clang together. I got up, used the restroom and did my pregnant stretches before climbing back in. That's when I heard another lure of a voice like my hubby's again by our room outside, super windy, hello? Sleepy part of me almost talked back, but my consciousness held it back. I know to never talk, never give permission to enter the home, to never say anyone's names or mine to them, never go outside, and if I am seen by one, I contact no words back away slowly into the house and haul ass to those stones and put that Indian blanket on my girl that my mother-in-law got from her best friend an old reservation medicine man. 
what the written note said was it's to protect the innocence from evil spirits and call the good. I know I can't get rid of the when, because this is its land, not mine. But is there anything I can do to keep her from getting close or even ballsy this winter and attack my husband when he's going to work? I can't really get him to wear anything that isn't his compass necklace and wedding ring. He doesn't believe in that stuff, or maybe he does, and he just doesn't like to think of it. I'm pretty sure if it's a necklace, I'll just say I got this for you. I want you to wear it, to always have me with you and to keep you safe. He does a lot of stuff like that. Even if he hangs it on his rear view mirror, I'd still be happy. Here's one from my youth. My childhood best friend's dad had a workshop in the garage. And he'd put one of those old GE clock radios up on his beer slash soda fridge out there. The kind everyone had back in the 80s. My friend's dad was a bit older. He was on a second marriage when he and his wife had my friend. And he was about 42 when my friend was born. So his music tastes were in the 50s slash 60s range. He always had the thing tuned to the AM oldie station when he worked. One night while my friend and I are having a sleepover, we're sleeping in sleeping bags in the den next to the garage. At about 3am, we both get awakened by this loud, blaring, staticky and distorted rendition of Sleepwalk by Santo and Johnny. Now, this is kind of a haunting song anyway, but at 3am out of nowhere, when it rouses you from a dead sleep, before we realise too much, my friend's dad comes out and asks if we turned it on. We didn't. He goes out and turns it off. The next memory I have is going out when we were watching movies, and I only left the door open for light from the house. I didn't turn the garage lights on. I grab a couple sodas, and once again, Sleepwalk comes on. Once again, it's garbled, staticky, and distorted. I reach up to turn it off, but the thing is, the radio is already off. I had to flick the power switch on and off. A few weeks later, my friend and I were playing driveway basketball late into a summer night, and we came in to sit down and cool off on lawn chairs, and wouldn't you know it, sleepwalk again. This happened several more times. It was always sleepwalk by Santo and Johnny. It's always garbled, always distorted. We'd turn it off and go on with our lives. The last straw came when I was sneaking off with one of the neighborhood girls I had a crush on, trying to put some adolescent moves on her. I was doing all right until fucking sleepwalk. Not wanting to miss my opportunity, I unplugged it and it didn't stop. In fact, it got louder. The girl and I both bolted from the garage. We came back in with my friend and his then girlfriend and showed them the damn unplugged cord. My friend was like, okay, I'm telling my dad. And as soon as he said that, it stopped. We went and told us dad anyway, who didn't believe us. One day, a few weeks later, I came over and found the clock radio smashed and sitting in the trash can. I asked my friend what happened. He told me how he and his dad were working on his mom's car one night and that damn song came on again. His dad tried to change the station and nothing happened. He tried to turn it off and that didn't help. Then he tried to unplug it and it got louder again. So my friend's dad grabbed a hammer and smashed it to quit working. I'd love to have a really great ending, like the radio turned back on on top of the fridge the next day, but no. We went to the dump and we never heard from it again. But to this day, I can't hear that song, not even a few seconds of it. And it doesn't scare the living hell out of me. I was about 12 years old, doing my school homework on my family's dining room table. This was my usual homework spot. A big wooden dining table set up, a couple windows, chandelier above, and a few pieces of art on the walls. One of which was a framed painting, hung on the wall by your usual mail and hanger. 
It was a painting of a young girl in a field of flowers. Didn't we all have one? Directly below this wall art, placed against the wall, we had a wooden side table where my mom displayed her nice glassware on the top of. At this time, both my parents were downstairs, but in separate rooms. Just myself sitting at the dining room table, doing my homework. Scene set. As I always have, I decided to daydream rather than focus on my schoolwork. I don't recall what was running through my mind at the time, but I do know I became transfixed on the aforementioned painting. I don't remember feeling called to focus on it. I wish I remembered that part. So I'm starting off directing my focus solely on this painting. I don't think it was long after that the top of the framing began to tilt off the wall and forward. The bottom of the frame stayed against the wall. It was only the top tilting. To be clear, the bottom of the frame wasn't supported by anything. There were inches of wall space between the bottom of the painting and the glassware of the table. After a second of what I now know to call what the fuck, I quickly stood up off my chair as my initial reaction was to stop the painting from falling, probably thinking I'd somehow get in trouble. Now this is one of those five seconds feels like five minutes moments. Once I stood up off the chair, I can still remember my left hand grasping the back chair post and not letting go. I was frozen in place. My initial intent of rushing toward the painting immediately ceased from what was probably shock of what I was seeing. I was so stunned that this picture I was staring at started to tilt forward and off the wall before my eyes. All I could do was watch. The painting fell face down and again it fell in a tilting fashion. The top of the frame tilted forward close to 90 degrees as the bottom of the frame remained against the wall without any support to keep it in place and from falling straight down. The painting hit the glassware and the frame shattered. I can't remember if any of the glassware broke, but there was a loud crash and a mess. My mom came to the entry of the dining room and locked eyes with me as I still stood there, left hand grasping the chair. I explained to both of them what had happened, and I do remember they didn't get mad or punish me, but I didn't get the feeling they believed me. I will still mention it in conversation with them on a rare occasion, and I still get the feeling they think I'm exaggerating or not recalling correctly. But I will never forget that moment, as it was the first real unexplained and what I considered paranormal experience. Has anyone had a similar experience? Does anyone have an explanation to make sense of the physics of how the painting fell? So this is just some weird experience my husband and I've had over the past two years, on top of a few others. We've noticed it come and go, and we've never been harmed, but we can't sleep due to the amount of strange activity. About two years ago, in May I believe, I exited my shower. It was about midday and sunny out. My big bay window, fuzzy for privacy, let all the sun in so the master bathroom is always well lit. I dried off, toweled down my hair, and slipped on a t-shirt with biking shorts. As I was scrunching my hair with some leave and conditioner, I felt a distinct tug on the back of my shirt, about the level a three to five year old would be able to reach. Nothing was there when I turned around, but the room was freezing suddenly, to the point I saw little puffs of breath. The same thing happened to my husband a few weeks later, and there were tiny puddles of child-sized footprints on the tiles. It shook us both badly. After that, it got worse. Any time we showered or went to lie down to sleep, there was always this vibe in the room. The air was thick and humid, enough that I had a horrible time breathing due to my asthma. My husband's had began having horrible nightmares so vivid and real that I had to once slap him to get him to truly wake up. He becomes so disoriented and confused that he's thrashed around and fallen out of bed. 
I've never seen him like this. He doesn't have mental health issues. We even went to a doctor, then therapist slash psychiatrist to be sure. They called them night terrors and left it at that. But he keeps seeing a huge black figure with whites for eyes and horrifically large teeth. He said he's never seen anything like it before and has to take a pretty good sized dose of melatonin to help him sleep at night. It's really wearing on him. I've noticed a darker spot in the corner of our room, about seven feet tall and it's so black that normal black can't properly describe it. It's like that Vanta black or whatever they call it. I recently saw something while in the shower, through the shower door, fuzzy for privacy. I thought I saw a little gray figure about the size of a child standing in the middle of our master bathroom. I didn't have my glasses on, so this figure was very, very fuzzy, but distinct due to the white door it was standing in front of. It must have heard me gasp because the door swung open violently, and I could hear the sound of bare feet smacking against the wooden floors. I dashed out of the shower and threw my robe on trying to catch up to the kids. I had my glasses on by then and could make out little wet footprints about the size of my four-year-old nephew's feet. The entire house was checked, doors were locked, windows locked, no way could a get, kid get in otherwise. Our two cats refused to sleep with us anymore and hiss at the threshold of the master bedroom. That's not like them at all, they're snug bugs and big babies. What the hell is going on in our house? When I was six years old, my mother, twin brother and I lived in a haunted house. We would always experience weird shit. Long story short, late one night while in bed, twin brother and I slept in the same bed. I'm not sure what time it was other than all the lights were off. It was pitch black. My mother was asleep in the room down the hall and my twin brother was asleep beside me. My closet door opened up and a presence came from the opened door. I couldn't see it, but I felt it. I felt it the same way I felt my brother laying next to me. It was very real. I couldn't see it, but I remember feeling the thing. It was extremely gentle. I felt myself being guided out of bed and led into the closet. I didn't question, just simply followed and obeyed. This entire experience was completely absent of fear, so I had no desire to run or scream or anything like that. Anyway, I entered the dark closet and the door gently closed behind me. Still, no fear. I stood there alone, in the dark. Then suddenly, all of these cartoon-like figures began to appear in front of me. Some of them had small, tiny eyes, others had great big eyes. Some had funny faces, others no face at all, only floating eyes. They were trying to interact with me by making funny faces, and I felt really comfortable and at ease. Again, I was only six years old at the time, so I was really amused with what I was experiencing. While I was still in the closet with the funny faces, things turned dark. The funny faces disappeared, almost as though they were frightened away or perhaps making a clearing for something much darker to make itself known. I remember not being able to move. I remember my shoulders being tightly grabbed and this thing appeared directly in front of me and opened its mouth. When it did, this super long tongue came creeping out. It shoved its way into my own mouth and down my throat. At that moment, I blacked out. I woke up the next day in my bed. I have no idea or have no memory as to how I got there. I've been fascinated with sex ever since. I never uttered a word to my brother or my mother about the experience. Anyway, things had gotten so bad in the house, we were forced to move out in a hurry. My mom didn't want to take one single thing with us. She just wanted to get out and fast. We moved in with my grandmother, whom we had lived with for the next several years. At the age of 40, I'm 43 now, 
I finally told my mom what I had experienced in that house. She broke down and cried. I feel that the entity left something in me, a dark seed. I have a very unhealthy appetite for sex and I feel things. I also feel people. Needless to say, I'm very cautious about where I go and very selective of the friends I keep. Sometimes the weight of it all gets very, very heavy. My dad has an older sister named Eva, named after my dad's dad's younger sister, who died very young and under very strange circumstances that no one discusses, nor my dad knows. My grandpa had two sisters, Eva and another named Helen. Grand aunt Helen used to believe very much in dreams. And from what dad told me, she used to predict things via dreams like me. When Eva died, Helen saw in her dreams telling her to tell my grandma, my dad's mom and her sister-in-law, that she will come back in the form of the new baby my grandma was caring for and that they will give her her name. My grandma at the time had no idea she was pregnant. Helen told my grandma who then told my grandpa and together went to the doctor who told them that they were indeed expecting. Eva was born and named as that. Many years later, Helen was close to dying when my dad introduced her to my mom after they got engaged and my great aunt Helen smiled and said to my mom that she will make two strong fighter girls she will suffer heartbreak and loss as mother until those girls. My mom was a little creeped out by her, but smiled and thanked her. Nine months later, my mom miscarried a baby boy. Then a year after that, I came along and I was a high risk pregnancy and my mom was worried about me. So she went to church where the head nun, who was a family friend of hers, sat next to her and said that I would be fine and that I'm a fighter. Mom looked shocked at her as I was told because those words reminded her of the words by the now dead great aunt Helen. I was born dead. I choked by the umbilical cord and all the doctors and nurses were ready to pronounce me dead. When my mom's very good friend who was a nurse on the team started shaking me while holding me upside down and softly hitting my chest to restart my heart. I was dead for 20 minutes before I came back. I was also premature, so I was stuck in hospital for two months. My sister was born with no complications, thank God, but she suffered a lot as a toddler with pneumonia to the point she was close to death, but she pulled through. Recently, while I was told the first story from my dad, about his aunt Helen. Mum remembered what she had been told by her and they told me how they are being surprised and shocked by how true her predictions are about me and my sister. Because both of us, as most of us I believe, face challenges. But the biggest ones are those that has to do with health and I'm currently fighting to pull through. Every time I'm ready to give up, I remind myself of the words of my great aunt Helen told my dad. In the late fall of 2019, my mom decided to leave our narcissistic and emotionally abusive stepfather. She, my younger brother and I, packed our stuff up into a U-Haul and took it all to the new apartment we'd be living in. It was like a breath of fresh air getting out of that house and into a place away from that man. For the first couple months, everything was going normally. My mom would go to work, my brother would go to school, and I went to an alternative school that only required me to go two days a week. This meant that I got a lot of time home alone, something I'd eventually come to hate. It started off small. 
One day, I heard the front door open. It was about the time my mom and or brother got home. So I went downstairs to see who it was. The door was wide open and nobody was home. I checked the parking lot and my mom's car wasn't there. My brother was nowhere to be found either. I closed the door and went back upstairs after making sure nothing was missing. The most common occurrence when I was home alone were the footsteps. If I was upstairs, I'd hear someone walking around downstairs. If I was downstairs, I'd hear someone walking around upstairs in my room. It was almost a daily thing, so eventually I just stopped trying to investigate. Only once did the footsteps come into the same room as me. My bed was against a wall and I was laying down facing that wall, just scrolling on my phone. It was around 10 to 4 in the afternoon and I heard footsteps on the stairs. It was about the time my brother got home every day from school, so I thought nothing of it. The steps came into our room, we had to share one, and stopped right next to my bed. I rolled over to see what he wanted, but there was no one there. A few minutes after that, I heard my brother open and close the front door and start up the stairs. It couldn't have been him the first time. The worst it got was on this one night. Everyone in the house was sleeping, except for me. As I was laying in bed, my eyes were drawn to the far corner of my room, right next to my bedroom door. I don't really know a good way to describe it, other than saying it was too dark in that corner. Like there was just a black hole in the room. Every time I looked into that corner, I nearly had a panic attack. But I managed to pull my eyes away several times, only for them to be drawn back to the same spot. There were voices too. They were all whispering indistinctly, but they sounded angry and hateful. It was the most terrifying night of my life. I think the worst part is that nobody believed me. I got the classic response that it was just the house setting or that it was just the pipes. I guess it doesn't matter anyways. Shortly after, my mom, brother and I left and moved into another house. Not for ghost related reasons, lol. I haven't had another experience since. Our house was a row home built in the early 1970s. My wife and I moved in in 2007. The first real incidents that raised some concern happened before our children were born. We'd left the house to return to find a stack of papers that had been sitting on my office desk, now laid out on the floor in a row in sequential order. No one was home while we were out. This continued and escalated from seeing things out of the corner of our eyes to hearing voices. One night I woke to a whisper of, don't wake daddy, in the voice of a little girl. It sounded like she was standing next to our bed. I looked around the room to find nothing. Our son at the time was in his room asleep. Years have passed with every now and then activity that seemed to be a reminder of, hey, I'm still here. This changed Monday night. Our son tearfully told us that he hears things in his room and they speak to him. He's old enough to be sure enough of this that it caused a large outpouring of emotion. My wife and I decided to pray for him. She went upstairs for a minute and when she was up there, he looked at me and said, something is going to fall. I didn't think anything of it. We prayed for him and after we finished, things were quiet. About a minute passed and from next door, two loud bangs sounded in a manner like something had fallen, loud enough that we both jumped. Our eyes met and we didn't say anything. Tonight, we were riding in the car. I asked him how he knew something was going to sound that way last night. He said he'd had an impression. I asked if he gets impressions often. He said he does. My wife was working at the time and I asked him how her work was going and if he felt anything about it. He said 
she'd cut herself on her left hand. My wife just arrived home from work and told me that she had indeed cut herself on her left index finger while at work. Before putting my son to bed, tonight I was standing in our bedroom in thought about the events of yesterday when I saw a shadow pass through the hallway, large enough that it blocks the light that hangs in the middle of the hallway outside the door. Later, praying for my son again, I felt a cold air mass centered around my left arm. I checked its windows and all was shut and locked. It's a cold night where we are, but I could not find the source of the air mass centered around my arm. We're at a loss. I've experienced more things the last two days that I can't explain than I've ever experienced in my life. My wife's grandmother was sensitive to the spirit world, so maybe something passed down to our son? Shouldn't we get our house blessed? We haven't attended our church since lockdowns, and I'm hesitant to reach out to the pastor considering the holiday week here in the US. The tension here is palpable, as we've decided to try our best to protect our family. Hopefully, it works. So I work in a building all by myself. As a security guard, taking care of computers from midnight to 8 a.m. And well, I don't know what it is, but it's weird. At work, everyone is dead silent, but sometimes you get the occasional building creaking. There's honestly nothing to do. So usually I'll take a seat between my patrols. Though it seemed like every time I get comfortable, I would hear noises, which means I gotta get up and check. Only to turn up being nothing. I began to ignore these and began noticing the lights would appear to slowly get brighter or darker. Not by much, but a noticeable degree. I would notice because suddenly the walls around me just glow brighter. Eventually, I began ignoring this too. Then I began seeing shadows cast on the wall ahead of me, indicating that someone was walking behind me. These would trip me out, but every time I turned around, nothing. They weren't exactly solid shadows, but weak blurry ones, as if they were far away from the light source. Recently, I said fuck it, and decided to see what would happen if I did nothing. No reaction. Turns out whatever to this is, is just intensifies. The shadows would even wave their arms trying to get my attention, but I ignored it. Then I started hearing heavy breathing, like if someone was breathing right behind me and would slowly hear the breathing noise go left or right sometimes. So it felt like they were breathing behind me pacing. Anyways, as freaky as it was, I ignored that too and even began hearing two distinct breathing noises. At this point, I was already pretty used to it though and no longer saw them as a threat. Finally, I began getting the sensation as if something was very lightly touching my neck. Like if they were running a finger down the side of my neck towards my chest and it felt like the collar of my shirt was moving to the side too, as if making space for this invisible hand perhaps. I didn't however try to look because every time I would try to look at these events in the past, they would stop. So I wanted to see just how far this game would go. However, that's the extent of which it went. Well, aside from eventually being able to feel like I knew their location when they're behind me, because I'd feel something like a line of tingling nerves running vertically down my back, pointing at the direction they were in. The ghosts didn't seem to try to push any further than that. Actually, I kind of feel as if the ghosts have slightly given up, as I have not had the touch sensation or the tingle sensation anymore. I did try talking to them, but no response. So I don't know. I don't mind these ghosts or whatever. I don't think they're dangerous. But does anyone know anything about ghosts and stuff? Like, to be honest, I kind of feel bad for them. They seem bored and it would be nice to befriend a ghost. Or I'm going batshit insane. I don't know.
In high school, a group of friends and I purchased a Ouija board to play with. We decided my house was the best, so the five of us sat around the board in my bedroom one Friday night and began to play. The board we got was also glow in the dark, adding to the spookiness. The first time was uneventful. The only entity we contacted saying its name was no one. The second time playing was much more memorable and terrifying. It was only my close friend and I in my room playing in the dark, music playing softly on my stereo. We asked the basic questions and soon noticed our breath was visible. We were freezing. Now my house was in woods and my room was notoriously cold during the winter, so I turned my space heater on and we continued. No one appeared again and still our breath hung in the air despite the heater going full blast. The radio began to jump stations and the volume raised and lowered. Loud static filled the room, so I shut it off. The stereo jumped back on, lights flashing, country music blaring, even though we hadn't been listening to country. Unnerved but also excited, my friend and I laughed, asking no one more questions. Feverishly, the plaque flew across the board sometimes, right out of our hands. Besides predicting some minor events, we laughed off the encounter and the Ouija board was put in my closet for safekeeping. The nuance had worn off. At least no one wanted to play the board anymore. Some had bad dreams or just bad feelings. Meanwhile, I felt a dark presence following me, almost like an eerie shadow I could feel but not see. One night while in bed, the doors of my closet burst open, the radio blared on and my lights flickered. This happened a few more times on various nights before my paranoia got the better of me and I began to look up how to dispose of a Ouija board. Obviously, we had realized something sinister. I learned burning it was a bad idea, so my next best option was burial deep in my parents' woods. So one rainy afternoon when nobody was home, I took the board and a shovel and hiked deep into the forest behind my house. I dug a hole the best I could and buried the board deep in the mud. I had terrible nightmares for weeks that I would come home from school to find the muddy board on my bed, but no such thing happened. My closet would bur still burst open and the radio turn on randomly, and my room stayed freezing cold most of the year. For years I felt haunted and followed by something dark. It subsided over the years, but I still have encounters. TVs turn on or things go missing then suddenly appear. The encounters feel much less sinister than before, so I think whatever or whoever no one was, it wasn't good. I think the board opened me up to encounters, but only the first felt dark or dare I say, evil. I have found as long as I tell them I know they're there, the events stop. I'm not sure what I encountered or if it still follows me now. First time I'm telling this in public, but I have an interesting one since I got hypnotized by my stepdad. I was around my teenage years and he told me he had been learning hypnotization for two years by a professional. So he kind of knew a lot about it. Since he was dedicated to learn for a couple of years. After knowing that, of course we had to try it once. And with we, I mean the rest of my siblings too. We were still young back then. And so all three of us were laying in bed, breathing in and out for a few seconds, then concentrate on his voice. I felt like I had to be real with this and just really focus on what he says. The idea was he would bring us back to our past lives, trying to remember it. And so for 10 minutes, I was so concentrated on picturing the things he said in my mind to actually go further than my imagination would go. Everything went smoothly, except for my siblings. It didn't really work on them. But me, I was still closing my eyes. I pictured walking through a long hall with a door at the end. When I reached the door, I came out at a beach. When I stood there, some Pegasus horse came at me and took me on his back and we flew off to the sky. From there on, 
is when it happened. At first, it was those small images, seeing a street. I think it was around the late 1800s. I'm not very good with history, I'm afraid. But I saw people wearing them black long hats and suits, and women wearing them dresses, what you mostly see in some movies. I know, oh, yeah, it was in America. Note, that's why I always wanted to go to USA, since I was very young. Always felt like I belonged there. After that, I woke up in a bed, still in my past life. It was weird, because I had a bad feeling when I woke up there. I was just laying there, when I suddenly felt something behind me. I turned around, and I saw a woman next to me. But she was freakishly scary, because she looked at me in a creepy way and then smiled and opened her whole mouth. But her teeth were sharp. All were sharp and long. And me, I was crying on the other side. I literally cried to get me out of there. And my dad said as fast as he could to wake up in three, two, one. And I woke up, tears falling down my cheeks. I never felt so scared before. That was one hell of an experience. Also, I'm a painter. One day I just thought of what happened after I woke up from the hypnotization. I slightly remembered that I ran off from that scary lady before I woke up. Years later, when I was in my early 20s, I painted what you can say, an image of what happened after I ran off. I literally just painted it out of nowhere. A white man standing in an alley, scared as hell. And it was even snowing at the time. In May earlier this year, I woke up on a Monday morning no different to any other. I sleep with my phone charging on the bedside table next to me and when I wake up, the first thing I do, rather unhealthily, is check my messages before getting up. I took my phone off charge and upon unlocking it, I found that I must have locked it the previous night with the camera wrap open. I hadn't been using the camera, so I figured I knocked the camera app when locking it before sleep. I didn't think anything of it, but did notice that the flash had also been changed in the settings to be permanently on, which I never have, and it's not easy to knock on by accident. As I turned this setting off, I saw the camera roll icon had a new photo in it. This is the point that I realized something really weird had happened. The picture on my phone, I still have it there, was taken at 2.21 a.m. with my bed on the side that I usually lay on. I sleep alone in a double bed. It was clearly taken in the pitch black, but with the flash on, and it was taken with the back camera. At first, I wondered if I had somehow woken up in the night and checked my phone, accidentally taken a selfie and then gone back to sleep, and then forgotten the whole thing as I was so tired. But it was a back camera photo of my pillow, and I'm not there. The angle of the picture is really creepy, as it is as if it was taken whilst kneeling on my bed in the dark, looking down on where would be myself. Now, logically, the only thing that makes sense, I think, but please give me more suggestions, is that I sleepwalked, taking my phone off charge, turning the flash on, and deciding to stand slash kneel on my bed and take a photo of where I was sleeping, then locking my phone and putting it back on charge before getting back into bed. Bear in mind, I have never slept walk, slept talk, etc. in my life let alone acted as some sort of sleepy creep. I gave my brother a bit of a hard time that morning, making sure he hadn't pranked me or something. And he was equally as scared as me. We noticed that my clock had stopped working that night too. And he wondered if psychologically, when the clock stopped ticking, it interfered with my sleep. But it had stopped in the later hours of the morning after the photo was taken. I guess... I just want to discuss this as a non-sleepwalker, as I'm sure these things are fairly usual for some people. Something just doesn't feel right about it. Even if I did just do something strange in my sleep, 
I hate the thought that I was wandering around in the middle of the night in the dark and have no recollection of it. That really creeps me out. What was my sleepy mind trying to take a photo of? I thought about installing a motion sensor camera to see if I have started sleepwalking or something. But I don't want to see something that will unsettle me forever. During the summer, I lost my great aunt Helena. She was my maternal grandmother's sister. My grandma came from Algio, in the region of Peloponnesus in Greece. So, we visited the family tombstone and paid our respects to the last departing grandparents. And God, that cemetery was so beautiful and well taken care of, and it had that peacefulness all around. It was publicly owned, which surprised me, because in Greece, cemeteries aren't that well taken care of or at least those that I've visited. It was a shock. It was so big, it stretched over a small hill, and it was at least three miles long if you walked around it. The earliest grave is from 1816, which shocked me. I felt so calm, like when I enter libraries. It was super hot the entire day, and in the cemetery, there was a perfect cool breeze and yet I felt so warm and perfect. I felt at peace. When I visited my paternal grandma's grave, I feel this unrest and coldness in the place. That cemetery was cold and angry. The cemetery my maternal grandpa and grandma are buried in, the one I visited as a kid, had this restless calm. But the cemetery in IGO was a completely different experience. I'm in disbelief at what I experienced. I felt like I was being hugged by all my ancestors that I was welcomed there. I felt the warm glow. Did I mention that? I didn't want to leave, but as I looked at the family grave and I said a soft hi and a nice to meet you in a low voice, so my parents would think I'm crazy. The moment I said hi and nice to meet you, I felt this warm hand on my shoulder and I felt like crying. I'm blinking tears away while typing this, and I did blink tears away then too. I've never met my grandfathers, I never met my grand uncles or great aunts, old enough to be able to have conversation with. I was five to six years old when I last saw any of them. I was 10 when the last great uncle died, and I wasn't able to go to the funeral. My paternal grandmother died before I could say goodbye, and so did my maternal grandma. My grandfathers died before I could meet them. It used to make me sad and wonder why and how things would be like. I had years of seeing dreams of them, of being with them in my great grandpa's shop, or my aunt's house, or an old Athenian coffee shop from the 1950s, etc. I felt lighter and happier leaving, although I didn't want to. It's like I've made peace with how things are, and I knew they knew I existed and that I loved them, even though I never met them and things were complicated with other family members, that they didn't hate me because I was related to them or was the offspring of them. And that was my most peaceful experience in a cemetery, and I wanted to share it. I've been sleeping in the game room since then, in hindsight, not the best option, since, it, since it's right next to the basement, but it's the only option I've got. This is one of those weird houses that when you enter, you can either go upstairs or downstairs. But the game room isn't fully underground, more like halfway, while the basement is fully underground. This is the room where me and my brothers play video games together. I thought I'd be safe, since this is also the room our pups three huskies, four years old, sleep in. Today, I got up off the futon at 6.30 a.m., this time to turn on the lights. This is a much more normal time for me to get up, and I guess this is why she was excited that I was finally awake last time. The game room is L-shaped, with the futon, Xbox, and Nintendo Switch in the short segments of the L, 
The light switch is next to the sliding glass door in the corner of the L, and the PC is down the long arm of the L, with my room at the end of the L, and the PC between my room and the stairs. As I reach the corner of the L, I see something in the corner of my eye. I turn, hoping whatever it is will be gone when I turn my full attention to it. Nope. I see a woman sitting in the chair of the PC. Long, brown, wavy hair, reaching just past her shoulders. Caucasian, blue eyes. She's wearing jeans with a plain sky blue t-shirt. She's at least 5'10", so she's taller than me. I'm 5'7". She looked like she starved to death. Or maybe her face looks skeletony because she's dead. And that's how her real body is now. I don't know. She then reaches and turns on the fucking monitor. And it isn't one of those touchscreen ones. It uses an actual button to turn on. Both the PC and the monitor do this. I ran back to the fucking futon and hid under my blanket since that's all I could do. I wasn't running towards her to get to the stairs. She didn't see me. At least I don't think she did. She was fixated on the monitor. I'm curious about who she is, why she's here, what she wants, etc. But I can't talk to her. It's terrifying. I don't want to. Hell, I don't think I even could, since I'd probably need a spirit box or something, which I don't have. No, I don't want to play video games with her either, like one of my friends suggested I do. How do I get rid of her? She's not a threat, but she's terrifying. Is there any way I can get rid of her? without asking her to leave? Like, just throw a holy cross onto the ground and she'll be forced out of the house or something? I'm not religious, but explaining a purchase of a holy cross is easier to explain than the purchase of a spirit box or other known ghost stuff, since my family doesn't believe in this stuff. Should I try to get rid of her or just man the fuck up and talk to her? And how would I go about doing either of those things? I was three or four years old at the time this happened to me, but I have very vivid memories of my childhood. The one I remember the most, it was a normal night of my brothers and dad's bedtime routine. Bath, teeth, tucked into bed. We shared a room, but I needed a nightlight and he couldn't sleep when there was light. So there was a large makeshift wall that separated our beds. The wall kind of leaned over so his bed was cloaked in darkness. I also always wanted my Barbie tape playing on the stereo to help me close my mind and sleep. I remember waking up having to pee, did my business and realized I needed my Barbie on again. So I decided to ask my brother for help. I peeked around his wall into the darkness and called for him. Four or five times I called out to him louder each time. I couldn't see him, so I crawled in his bed. He wasn't there. I was confused, so I went to my mom and her boyfriend's room, which was directly across the hall from us. I got really square scared when I saw their bed was made and no one was in it. I started crying, calling out for them. No one was home. They left me. Where are they? Turned on the lights, I could reach in the house, which was only a two bedroom, sobbing still. I opened the front door to the house looked down our neighborhood streets both ways. It was dark, but everyone's porch lights were on. I'd liken it to the foggy world from the movie Insidious. There was just no fog, and no one. I decided to go across the streets to my friend's house I played with often, and was over there quite a bit to find someone, anyone. I knocked and wailed and again no answer. I opened their door, no lights on, no one home. I felt the dread. I knew there was no one anywhere. Somehow I just knew. I made my way back home in my little mermaid nightgown. Went back in my house, left the door open, hoping someone would come and cried myself back to sleep in my mom's bed. Next morning I woke up. Everyone was back. I was still in my mom's bed. I remember being angry and sad, crying, exclaiming, where were you? Why did you leave me? 
and they so nonchalantly said they were always there, never left. My brother too. They probably chalked it up to me having a nightmare, but I promise you, I was in another realm or astral project, but everything was real. I was able to do things. I don't know how that stuff works really. I'm just wondering, does anyone have an idea what's happened? I'm also left wondering if I woke in a new dimension or reality, different from the one I was in when I first fell asleep. This has always bothered me and probably always will. I've tried to actually astral project, never worked. Back when I was a kid, I used to stay at my grandparents' house a lot as it was both closer to school and my parents were working long hours. There was also a homeless guy in that area who was also drunk and would scare the children on the street. He was called Steve and people started using him as a bogeyman for children that would misbehave even long after he either left the area or passed away. I don't know what happened to him. I remember it was around the same time of the year in 1996 because I had just gotten the N Nintendo 64 for my birthday immediately after it was released in North America. I was so enamored with the console that I absolutely refused to go to bed and kept on playing the game. My exasperated grandparents tried to get me to bed by first switching off the lights and then telling me that Steve will come and get me. When that didn't work, they started saying, look, Steve is already in the backyard. I decided to take a peek at the window and lo and behold, there was a humanoid figure darker than the night at the window. I was extremely scared and started crying. At first, my grandparents played along, but when they realized that I was genuinely scared, they started saying that there's nothing outside. Yet, I could see this humanoid figure at the window. They tried to comfort me and turned on the lights and the figure vanished, but when they turned the lights back off, the figure reappeared. After insisting a lot that the figure was there, my grandpa took me outside to show me that no one was there and indeed, no one was there. I went to bed and rarely since thought of it again, usually chalking up to my overly active childish imagination. Now, as my grandma thinks she doesn't have much time left, she decided to renovate the house so she can leave a beautiful house to be sold by us when she's gone. My uncle and I have been doing most of the work. The incident that triggered my memory happened this weekend when my uncle brought his family over, including his five-year-old daughter. We decided to spend the night there to both keep my grandma company and to do the last finishing touches. At night, as we were preparing to head off to bed, my five-year-old cousin just asked my uncle, who's that man outside? I looked as well at the window, but couldn't see anything, nor could any of the other adults. However, she kept insisting that there's a man watching through the window, and she started crying and acting all terrified, just like I did 25 years ago. So now I wonder, if two children roughly the same age see the same thing and act pretty similarly, is it just a coincidence? Or could there be something more sinister to it? I wonder what your thoughts are. I was born in the USA, but I used to visit Mexico often pre-COVID probably twice a year as a kid and once a year when I started living on my own. This was my first experience when I went. I was around nine. If you're not aware, some places in Mexico are enchanted or plain out haunted. I was staying with my uncle at the time in the country. Country meaning a lot of houses do not have electricity and the nights can get pitch black. Even though my life was padded in the US, it was still neat to see how my uncle lived. My mom and siblings came, but I chose to stay with my uncles that time because I was close to them. 
They owned a farm that was in the middle of nowhere. They had electricity but would try not to use it. They had a barn with a huge cornfield. I remember this day like it was yesterday. I helped my uncle to do chores around the farm, feed the animals mainly while he did the heavier work. We went inside before sundown, ate and went to bed. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and checking my wristwatch. It was almost 3 a.m. I don't know what woke me up, but I looked around and saw a shadow figure by the window looking out. Now I'm shitting bricks and I quietly call out to my uncle. We were sleeping in the same room. He quickly shushed. I stopped talking and it went eerily quiet. Not a bug or bird making a noise. That's when I heard it. It sounded like a baby crying, but it sounded very far away. It gave me the chills. He went to get his brother, my other uncle. He told me to come on and grabbed his shotgun and his dog. Told me to hold a flashlight and to hold his dog's leash. And we went outside to see where the crying was coming from. We waited and we heard the crying coming from the cornfield. I looked at my uncles and they both looked scared. They decided to go investigate and brought me along. I was terrified the farther we went into that cornfield. They originally thought it was a fox or coyote, but they said that they know that they sound like, and they said this sounded like a human child. Now we were hearing the crying constantly. Every time we went farther in, the crying would sound farther and farther in. This field was huge, so we were maybe a quarter mile in, and my older uncle said he felt something in his gut, that something was wrong, and we needed to get out of here immediately. He said to run with the dog, and the dog will lead you home, but to shine the flashlights behind you. Then they could follow. As soon as I took off the run, the crying got super loud and sounded so close. I ran and ran, and I reached the farm pretty fast. My uncles did too, and we got inside and boarded up the house. They stayed up till sunrise. I asked them, what was that? My older uncle stammered and said he didn't know, but something was trying to lure us in there. One night about five years ago, some friends and I were celebrating a birthday party. It was late December and quite cold. The weather was very misty that night as well. I was having a good time and my buddy asked if I wanted to stay over for the night since we were all going to be getting drunk. I said sure. I wasn't drunk yet and some friends who showed up later had asked to head to my house to pick up some of their stuff. So me and the three girls went to my place. I lived in a dark back corner of the neighborhood that bordered vast fields of property. Driving up to my house, we rounded a corner and passed a ditch. Remember this. I get out with one of my friends as we were literally walking to my room, grabbing clothes. She grabs some of her video games and we both leave. When we walk out of my house, dogs from all over the neighborhood are barking like crazy. It sounded like hell, still making me shudder to this day. My friend and I looked at each other and noticed the house across the street. Behind the house was the field, and behind it was a massive light illuminating the back of the house. Ignoring that, we walked to my friend's car where the other two girls were. I tapped her window and she rolled it down. I asked if she could turn her car off real quick. She did. Without saying anything, her face went blank. I asked if she could hear all the dogs. And she said yes. We listened for around five more seconds when the howling and barking ceased at once, in unison. Nothing, no sound at all. We got scared, hopped in the car and we drove off. We all felt like something odd that night, but didn't know. I asked them something that could possibly give me a rational explanation to calm me down. I wish I hadn't. I asked if they had seen another dog walking around making them mad, or maybe a flock of birds riling up the dogs. They both said no, and I believed them. It was only two minutes time they were sitting outside my house. My friend piped up later 
and said she saw something when we passed the ditch going to my house. I asked what she saw. She described a sort of diamond that was changing shape, floating down the ditch. It was retaining a geometrical form, but shifting to different shapes. It floated down the ditch. I knew that ditch led to a runoff that went to the fields behind the neighborhood. There was nothing we could do. We left and haven't spoken of it since. I had just graduated and would do yard work and clean up a lot inside of my house. I knew some of the neighborhood kids and they would tell me some odd stuff they witnessed around there. They would see lights in the sky, their dogs barking up at trees, people standing on roofs. No one was ever hurt, but some strange things happened there. So I'm writing here because I just can't let this go. It's not exactly frightening, just so bizarre that I almost have myself convinced that my subconscious has irreversibly altered my memory of the event. I really just want to know if something similar has happened to anyone else. I, 44 male, once lived in an apartment complex on a relatively busy street. I was 10 and very introverted. Mom would make me play outside from time to time, just so I would have some exercise. Generally, I'd enjoy riding my bike, but I was never so motivated to do it. One reason I avoided going outside was the neighborhood bully. He was bigger than I, with red hair. I was an easy target since I always played alone. No idea what his name or age was at the time. So on the day of the event, I was riding carefully down the sidewalk since the street was fairly busy. Quite caught up in the thoughts of an introverted 10 year old boy, I didn't notice the bully approaching from the lawn of a building of apartment units to my right, the street to my left. I was going slowly, lost in my thoughts, and he entered my direct field of vision just as I was closing in on a narrowed bit of sidewalk. At this part of the sidewalk, some classical municipal shenanigans had occurred and there was a fire hydrant not three feet from a 10 foot diameter telephone pole with a steel guy wire. So of course, I panicked a bit when I saw how close Mr. Bully was and naturally turned my wheel away from him to the left. I'm sure this was the goal so that I would hit the fire hydrant or the pole and fall off my bike, ripe for a sound thrashing while prone. Then the unexpected happened. With my forward momentum, I had already reached the fire hydrants. My front wheel was definitely at least six feet beyond the leading edges of it. Yet when I turned away from the bully, I went into the streets. I was fully in the street when I suddenly stopped and turned my head back, ready to complain about his attempt. But when I saw his face, I quickly lost my voice. He was shocked. I looked back again at where I had left the sidewalk and put it together deliberately. I'm sure my brow was furrowed when I glanced back at him again. The question in my eyes, not verbalized. Had my bike just passed completely through that very solid fire hydrant? He turned and scurried away. Then I realized I was still on the streets. Again, bizarrely, no cars had passed or even been heard by me during this entire event. Fully weirded out, I got myself back on the sidewalk and went home. So my brain tells me this happened, but now it's so long in the past and I've ruminated on it for so long. Has my imagination embellished this? Or is it some sort of paranormal guardian angel event? Has anyone seen something similar? So the summer before I started sixth grade, I had just moved into this new house and I was just done taking a shower. When I had walked out, I saw someone standing in the doorway of my brother's room. I thought it was my brother since it looked like him. He said, hello there, in this creepy voice and I just responded with a confused hi and left. I turned around to see if he was still there and the bathroom door had shut. I went downstairs, talked to my mom a bit 
Then I threw my clothes in the laundry when I got down to the basement. Guess who was there? My brother and my stepdad. Both of them in the freezer looking for hot dogs. My brother had been downstairs the entire time and hadn't once gone upstairs. I just looked at them confused and shrugged it off because I couldn't explain it. A few nights afterwards, I was laying in bed around my bedtime and it was dark outside. I looked out my door wait, to see a man in a hat and suit staring at me before turning around and going to my parents' room. I froze and felt extremely afraid. I eventually fell asleep though. For a little while, my mother said I would scream shut up and get out in my sleep. And she felt it was strange. I had no memories of it or being distressed over a dream. Well, around that, I've never been afraid of the dark or felt uneasy about it. I've never been afraid of anything being under my bed or in my closet. I started to feel tense walking around the house when it was dark. Not always, but sometimes. Something in the body would tell me to run. I also felt cold breaths on me while I laid in bed or something grabbing me when I started to fall asleep. I would feel nervous laying up against my bed at night on the floor. And I would always constantly wake up every night at exactly 3.05 a.m. or 2.58 a.m. No other times. I started to close my closet door because I started to feel afraid or like I was being watched when it was open. Fast forward a few years and I just have the uneasiness and my mom has cleansed the house with sage weekly. Well, we lost the sage. Every time we got sage, it would come up missing immediately. We could have just lost it, but still, we have no idea where most of it was. I started to have really bad sleep paralysis of the same skinny ghostly women entering my room through my closet or from the bathroom. My mom cleansed my room again, and the most I've had recently was an uneasiness and nightmares of being killed by an entity. I'm not sure what it is. I'm not really afraid anymore, but it's still a strange occurrence. When Brad Culp was a student at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio, there was a rumor that the town was one of the most haunted places in America. When Culp started an on-campus magazine, he couldn't wait to write about several of the area's most famous phantoms. Not long after his story was published though, he kept finding himself thinking about one ghost in particular, the ghost of Oxford Milford Road. As the story goes, many decades ago, probably sometime in the 1940s, there was a young man courting a young woman in a rural part of town. Because the woman's parents didn't approve of the match, each night he visited under the cover of darkness. After her parents went to bed, the young woman would sneak out of her farmhouse and flash the lights of her parents' car three times. Then her young suitor would ride his motorcycle down the road. One night, he took the turn right before her house a little too sharp, says Culp. The motorcycle went one way, he went the other. His injuries were so severe that he didn't survive. Rumor has it, however, that his love-struck ghost still haunts this stretch of Milford Road. Curious, Culp, his girlfriend, now his wife, and a friend decided to head out there one night to see if they could verify the tale. His girlfriend was worried she'd be completely freaked out. She believes more in that stuff than I do, Culp says. But he was mostly concerned that his suspicions, that none of this was actually true, would be confirmed. On this particular night, as Culp passed the abandoned farm, an idea came to him and he pitched it to his girlfriend. How could she not say yes? Though reluctant, she relented and Culp turned a short way into the farmhouse driveway. He killed the engine and flashed his lights three times. 
No joke, there was a single headlight that appeared three quarters of a mile down the road, Culp says. You saw it start to come, going pretty slow. It kept coming and coming. My wife was freaking out. It was coming closer and closer. As a collision seemed imminent, Culp turned on his car's lights. He expected to see a kid on a bike, bailing out from his prank now that he'd been caught. But there's nothing there. The light is just gone, he says. They got out of the car. They walked around trying to figure out what it was they could have seen. To this day, we still talk about it. I saw something I cannot explain, he says. If you get him and his wife around a campfire, they'll swear up and down that the story is true. And if you're ever in Oxford, Ohio, consider parking for just a few minutes on Oxford Milford Road at night to test your own nerve. My grandma's house has always been a scary place, for as long as I can remember. My dad and aunt and uncle all grew up in the house and had paranormal experiences occur throughout their lives. One example was when my dad and uncle were teenagers. My uncle was walking down the steps and was swinging a towel as he had just washed his hair. Out of nowhere, my dad, who was standing in the living room at the bottom of the stairs, saw the towel straighten out in front of my uncle, as if someone pulled it, and my uncle fell forcibly down the stairs. Now, my grandma hates all things paranormal, especially Ouija boards, and she would often visit gypsies. So it's a big no-no in our family to discuss the paranormal events that occur in her house. 20 years or so ago, my cousins and brothers were playing in the upstairs bedrooms of my grandparents' house. The toys were set up in the room across the hall from them, and they were all in the same bedroom playing a board game. Out of nowhere, a Hot Wheels car, no batteries, no wind-up, just an average car, slowly exited the room that the toys were in went across the hall and into the room where they were all sitting. Needless to say, they were all terrified. Around eight years ago, my oldest brother moved into the basement of their house. One night when he was home alone, he woke up out of a deep sleep, having felt like he was shaken by someone. He stood up and instantly smelt gas. He went upstairs and outside of the house. Later, he found out there was a carbon monoxide leak, and if he had not woken up, there's a big chance he could have died in his sleep. Months after they went, my grandparents were away for the weekend. The family decided to try the ghost radar app in their house. We all sat around the phone, and my uncle asked the normal questions. Is anyone here? Blah, blah. Then he asked, who used to live in the basement? At this point, my brother had moved out. The ghost radar replied with my brother's full first name, which no one ever calls him. We were shocked. So my uncle asked, how did you save my brother? It replied with, wake. Um, what the fuck? He then asked, what did you save him from? And it said, gas. Bruh. Needless to say, we were shocked. The last thing that I'm going to talk about that happened in the house is my grandparents' friend's obituary, who passed away probably 15 years ago, will show up in their kitchen every month or so. They usually say hello to their friend and put the obituary back in the basement where it's supposed to stay. A little while later, it will show back up in the kitchen. This was early December 2020. My husband and I live in a duplex, and my sister and brother-in-law have the other side. I woke up early in the morning, maybe around 1am, because my dog was moving around a lot. He seemed scared. He really doesn't like loud noises, especially after the big earthquake we had a couple years ago. We're in Alaska. And he was acting like he did when the earthquake happened. So then, I started hearing weird noises. 
The closest thing I can describe it was an avalanche from far away, like a deep whoomph sound. We definitely don't live close enough to a mountain to hear an avalanche though. It went on for about 40 minutes, off and on. I tried to wake my husband up, but he's a heavy sleeper and didn't really fully wake up, and he said he didn't hear anything. It was creeping me out, so I went to the Facebook group for our area, which encompasses the whole road and all the neighborhoods branching off it, probably a 15 mile radius and someone actually posted asking about the noises. About 45 people had liked and commented on it, all saying it had woke them up too. Some people said it was actually shaking their house, like a vibration almost. Others just said it was loud and rumbling. No one had a specific answer, but it seemed like the people living off of one road in particular heard it the loudest and actually felt it but that it wasn't an earthquake. There's no airports nearby, and this definitely didn't seem like an airplane. Some people asked if it could have been the military base in the city across the inlets from us, but that still seemed too far off. Plus, the base usually posts when they're running training, or someone who works there will usually bring it up. Anyway, no one had a specific answer to what it was. The road we live off is pretty, is pretty long, and we live nearly 10 miles down it. My sister lives a mile away, and my parents are about five miles away. When I told my family about it the next morning, none of them had heard it. My brother-in-law, who lives next to us, even said he was awake during the time I heard it, and he said he didn't hear anything. I know it happened, because other people did hear it, even if it was a small group compared to the amount of people living in the area. I just don't know how so many other people didn't hear it. It was just very odd. And people who have lived in the area for over a decade said they never heard anything like it. Still, honestly keeps me out when I think about it, but it hasn't happened since. My brother-in-law joked about aliens and the like, but really... Who knows? So I live in a small seaside town called Blackpool in the UK that had a few important airfields during the war. It was home to 303 Squadron, who were the mostly Polish pilots trained by the RAF and were provided with supermarine Spitfires, Hawker Hurricanes, and one other fighter aircraft, I believe. Anyway, the airfield became a fully fledged airport after the war, with a terminal building and many more hangars for commercial and private aircraft. Previously, it was just a grass runway and a few military hangars. During construction, they were knocked down, all except one. To this day, that one remaining hangar is maintained and it's become a small museum. It contains the aircraft, along with equipment and even the uniform of R.G. Kellett, a commander of the squadron. I went for a visit once, as I'm super interested in the history of the aircraft, due to my granddad being a Spitfire pilot himself. I walked through the entrance and into the hangar, which had rope barriers around the aircraft that makes a one-way path around all the planes in there. After looking at the first plane and reading about it on a podium, I look up to see a man who looked about in his 40s, dressed in the RAF flying gear, with the leather cap, goggles around his neck, leather flying coat, a bright red scarf and the smart uniform underneath. It's a dark blue uniform called Best Blues. I didn't really think anything of it at the time and assumed he's one of the staff dressed up in the traditional uniform to put on a show. I thought this because I'd seen a similar thing a few months prior in another museum where staff dressed up as World War I soldiers, Roman soldiers, pilots and stuff, who were acting constantly and patrolling the museum. So I nodded and said hi, but he just stared forward, walked past me, getting about as close as three or so meters away, towards the door in which I entered, opens it and walks through it and shuts it behind him. I didn't think anything of it, 
Maybe he didn't see me or something. I forget and carry on through the museum and come across a staff member who's there to share information about the Spitfire that was parked there. We start talking and I mention the guy in uniform about where he went. To this he responds, we don't have anyone here that does that sort of thing. Are you sure you saw correctly? I started doubting myself at that point and yet again just forgot about it. A while later, I'm told by a friend that the hangar is supposedly haunted. I mention the uniformed guy I saw and she just freezes and says no way. She still doesn't believe me and thinks I'm making it up. Thinking back, it kind of creeps me the fuck out. I haven't previously experienced anything like that before. What do you think? My little brother's best friend committed suicide almost exactly a year ago. I sat with his crying mother, feeling her pain like it were my own. But what was also so angry at him? He abandoned my baby brother, his kids, a woman that was truly in love with him. But the sadness outweighed the anger. After the autopsy and his cremation, I suddenly awoke and sat straight up. I could feel someone. My dogs weren't freaking out, so I knew no one had entered the house from downstairs. I was looking around in the darkness, trying to get focus. My eyes made their way to the bedroom door, which I kept open for the cat. There was a spot that was darker than the rest of the darkness in the room. I was trying to figure out if my Jim Morrison poster was messing with me, but then it started to move closer to the bed. It was like if smoke could take the shape of a sphere. It slowly rolled toward me with its smoke-like extensions rolling off of the air as it moved. It came to within inches of my face. I was terrified, but somehow knew it wouldn't hurt me. Then it retreated and went away. The next night the same thing happened except the room got cold and I felt an overwhelming turmoil. I could see myself wanting to die. I reached up to touch it. The pain was so intense that I burst into tears. There were times in my life that I felt this low and I wanted to die. So to feel that again after what happened, knowing that agony wasn't mine, made me physically ill. My cat fled the room. I knew it was him. It was my brother's best friend. I had seen that pain in his eyes many times. I had to run to the bathroom. I was very nauseous and crying so hard, I don't know how my significant other didn't wake up. Then it dawned on me. He just needed someone to understand. That person was me because I've been my entire life sensitive and I understand his pain. I've personally been there. Sometimes they come as lights, sometimes darkness. Sometimes it's what their physical being look like. Sometimes I can hear them. Sometimes it's just a feeling. I was also always so scared when I was younger that I did my best to block it out. I looked at it like a curse and because of this, over the years, I feel it less and less. Somehow, I miss it. It was so much a part of my being that I feel like I'm losing a piece of my identity, but I have no idea how to get it back or what I'd do with it if I did. I just feel like what I thought was a curse was actually a gift and maybe I could have done something good with it. Summer 2016. It was around midnight on a Saturday night. My best friend and I were at the beach observing a meteor shower as we did every summer. After catching a couple of shooting stars, we witnessed a couple of flashes that lit almost the entire sky. Though we were surprised, we didn't give it much thought, as it could be related to whatever natural phenomenon, maybe even related to the meteor shower. On the way back home though, these flashes kept happening. As strange as it sounds, it felt as if they chased our car from afar. My friend and I joked about it, but we didn't feel entirely in a joking way. 
Now it's when things get real. Halfway to my friend's place, we drove through the woods to get to one of our favorite spots since childhood. Just a short tunnel in the back roads where we always used as a place to smoke a cig and listen to some 80s rock. The acoustics of the tunnel made it the perfect place for that. The tunnel is barely 15 meters long. We parked the car at its end, looking towards the crossroads. The road ahead climbs uphill through a dense eucalyptus forest. We lit a cigarette and put on some Frank Zappa tunes. It was all normal and we were talking about uni and life in general, when all of a sudden I saw a flash. I looked ahead and saw a beam of light. The light was projected diagonally from the top of the trees towards the road. The beam was mirrored on the other side of the road so it looked like a V. This V of light kept getting brighter and brighter until it vanished. But the moment it vanished, the V was still there. Only this time, it was as if somebody had cropped it out of the picture in Photoshop. I could see all the way through the hill and the trees through this V. So far, I could see an old abandoned military radio station that's a kilometer away from the spot we were at. It was at this moment that I turned to my friend and I saw his face was as shocked as mine probably was. We realized we both saw this and somehow, even though Frank Zappa was playing loudly just seconds before, there was a moment of total silence, which I then noticed had started when the V light appeared. My friends and I looked at each other and, as if we communicated telepathically, we put on the belts, turned on the car, and got the hell out of there as fast as we could. My friend was so shocked, he asked me to please drop him on his doorstep, instead of the usual spot about 100 meters away from his house. Honestly, I was scared. I slept with my window closed that night. To this day, we have no idea what it was that happened that night, or how in the world that was even possible. All we know is that we both saw it, and we feel lucky to have witnessed such a strange phenomenon. In Thailand, many people believe in the supernatural, including my grandma, and to show for it, she had a shrine dedicated to the Kuman Pong, a luck-bringing deity in the general living space of the house. She lives in a multi-story townhouse, so the general living space consisted of both the living room and dining room. There were no walls separating them. Now, the Kuman Thong are said to bring prosperity and protection to the homeowner, meaning they are not a malignant force to residents. However, the things I saw and heard that night still stick with me. I must reiterate, it may have just been a nightmare. I'm staying at my grandma's with my sister on Saturday night, as we used to do when we were very young. I was sleeping on the third floor of the townhouse and woke up because I needed the toilet. The toilet was down on the second floor where my sister and grandma were sleeping. And so I felt relatively safe to make the journey in the dark, plus my flashlight. I had one of those kinetic flashlights specifically for a visit to the toilet in the night. I reach the second floor and the first thing I notice is a dim light coming from the ground floor. First reaction, someone had left the lights on downstairs and so I dismissed it rather quickly until I heard laughing, children's laughter. It was the faintest noise though and only in silence could you make it out. My next move was trying to catch a glimpse of anything or anyone down there. You could see part of the living room from the top of the stairs that led to the second floor. Didn't see anything other than the lights which had been dimmed. Only other thing that happened that night was me hearing the noise of one of those pull back tar toy cars, which would then propel itself going forward. I had one of them, which was a Hot Wheels speed racer. And I have heard that spring sound so many times that I know it was the same noise I heard from downstairs. That set me slowly walking back to my bed as to not disturb what I believe were the spirits of the Kuman Thong downstairs. And my need to pee was no longer there. 
This is the only time I've encountered a spirit. And I like to think that they aren't real, but my friend described his own experience, which was almost identical to this. Downstairs later on during the dead of night, noises of children laughing and the noises of children's toys being played with. What's even scarier is that his mom has told us that when he was a kid, he used to talk and play with things no one else could see. And his mom believes that those things were the spirits of the Kuman Thong. I was in bed at around midnight yesterday. I usually go to bed around 10 p.m., but procrastinated some work and stayed up late to finish it. So when I went to bed, I set an alarm for seven in the morning, tucked myself in and waited for sleep to come to me. However, it didn't. I checked my phone time and time again, watching the hours pass by. Then at around 3.30, my dog, who usually stays beside my bed, suddenly starts whimpering at the bedroom door to be let out. So I get out of bed to let him out, but that's when I notice that he isn't sitting at the bedroom door to be let out, but staring at the bed unflinchingly, even when I call his name multiple times. I decided to sit beside him with my pillow and hopefully doze off. I slept and didn't dream. I woke up at 7 due to my alarm and started running errands. I forgot about the incident at night until my friend came to my house. He was noticeably worried and asked me if everything went well last night. After I told him what happened, he starts sweating and asks me to get out and come to his house. He believes in the paranormal and I didn't. I do now. He tells me to have a seat and starts narrating a dream which he had. Apparently in his dream, he saw everything I did that night, but from the perspective which was on the bed. He told me in his dream that at around 3.30, my dog just started staring at him for an hour, which he did in reality too. Strangely, my friend had an extremely vivid description of everything and some things I hadn't told him about such as my water bottle being empty that night and my laptop charger still plugged in and not put away. He also said something which gave me the chills. He said that he wanted to hurt me in his dream. His goal was to apparently take my nails off and stab me with them. It seemed extremely unnatural and unsettling, so we both went back into my house. However, what I saw next made me a believer in the paranormal too. A human nail on my bed, intact. Not a small piece, the full nail. It scared me because that means it was planted there by something. Currently, I'm at my friend's house and we're both terrified. I'm thinking of sleeping at my parents' house for the next few days. My dog is fine and not acting any difference. But could someone please explain what the hell I experienced? And whose nail could it have been? My family decided to take a vacation in a zone near the coast in a big cottage. We came there with some friends to spend the weekend and we were without any houses around and four or five kilometers away from the nearest town. When we first arrived and entered the house, I immediately felt a strange sensation from it. I thought it could be suggestion of being in a place that I didn't know, so I just ignored it. But then the night came, everything started to get strange. I slept in the same room as my sister, but she f quickly fell asleep, so she didn't realize what was happening. When I was finally getting to sleep, I suddenly heard three hard knocks on the door. So I instantly get up from the bed and came near the door to see what was happening. I opened the door and there was nothing behind. I thought it could be our friends, so I sent them a text message saying that they should stop joking because we were trying to sleep. Anyways, I felt like they wouldn't stop there, so I waited close to the door until I heard another knock and tried to catch them in the act. And then I received a text message from one of my friends 
saying that they were in the upper room trying to sleep too, so they don't know what I was talking about. Anyways, I decided to stay near the door just in case they were lying, and suddenly another violent knock sounds again, so I immediately open the door just to see that there was nothing there, neither my friends nor anything else. In that moment, I knew something was happening in that house. I tried to sleep, but my head was trying to understand what was happening. The next day, I talked about this to my parents, and they said we could move to another room in the upper floor, but didn't really believe me. I was 14 at the time, so they just thought it was my imagination. Then the night came again, and I was ready. I thought that if something happened again, I'll wake up my sister so she can confirm that later. The hours passed and I was in the bed with a little light turned on. Then suddenly I started to hear strong hits, but this time they didn't come from the door. They came from the wardrobe next to us. So I immediately woke up my sister and she was terrified. The hits didn't stop and the violence of them was so hard that the door from the wardrobe was moving, like something was trying to get out of there. I said that I would try to open it to see what was trapped inside and my sister was begging me not to because she was absolutely in shock. But anyways, I open it and in the same moment, the sound stopped, making the room come back to complete silence. She decided to wake up our parents because she was afraid that this thing that was there would harm us somehow. It's an awful situation and we never came back to that house again. I was backpacking in Southeast Asia with four of my friends in 2018. We were all pretty young and inexperienced backpackers. In the middle of our planned journey, we made it down to the southern coast of Cambodia. The hostel we were staying at was outside of the main city and took about 30 extra minutes of driving to get to. We finally arrived late at night and all we could see were dilapidated houses and the still standing hostel. The next day, we wake up and adventure to the beach. We're in a small offshoot of the city with not much around except the beach and a local restaurant. The main city is about a 20 minute taxi ride. We make our way to the city, have food and spend most of the afternoon there. When we arrive back at the hostel, we see another group of travelers had checked in and will be sharing our room. From what I could tell, they were German and didn't speak much English. We briefly said hello, but they were older than us and seemed to want to stick to themselves. There were five or six of them, both men and women, probably mid to late twenties. At this point, it's getting late, it's dark out and the wind is picking up. I hear the German group say they want to look around a bit and they leave around 8 or 9 pm, despite the heavy wind. As the night goes on, the storm gets stronger and stronger. Around 10 pm, it starts pouring rain intensely. The wind is so strong that the walls of the hostel are shaking and I become afraid that the roof will blow off. There is loud thunder and I see lightning outside. I cannot understate how bad this storm was. The winds were so strong that I really thought we might have to take shelter elsewhere. The rain poured all night and I could hear the ocean waves crashing. The storm continued all night and kept me up, and the German group never came back. I laid awake all night, terrified at the storm, and wondering where they had all gone. In the morning, the storm had calmed down and it was just drizzling. The German group had never returned. All of their belongings were in the shared room still. My friends and I were slightly concerned, and we asked others at the hostel if they had seen the group. No one had seen them since they had left last night. We hung out the hostel all day until around 2 p.m. when it was time for us to continue on our journey. We checked out with still no sign of the German group. I really hope they ended up staying at a bar or restaurant that night, but there weren't any really any other places to go nearby. I have no idea what happened to them and it haunts me to this day. I always get a bad feeling when thinking about it.
So I've seen ghosts and shadow figures my whole life, and I might at some point write about those. This happened when I was living in North Hamilton as a six or seven year old. I just saw a TikTok about the hat man and had a rush of memories that I had totally forgotten about. Living in that house, I was always uncomfortable and would get this recurring dream of a tall man with a big gray beard and white eyes who would introduce himself as God and told me to stare into his eyes. He would then pull me into a hug and it would feel like his embrace was fire burning me. Then I would wake up to find my room on fire until a few seconds later, I would actually wake up and everything would be fine. But I generally wouldn't be able to fall back asleep for the rest of the night. From what I remember, it was one of those nights where I woke up when I heard something outside my window. My window faced the backyard, but had a view of the driveway. And when I looked out to see what was out there, I saw a guy standing in the driveway in a top hat and coat. That was really all the details I could see since it was dark out. I was used to seeing shadows, but they wouldn't stay after I looked at them like this one. I felt this really deep dread. And just when I was about to get my parents, I blinked and he disappeared. Then a few nights later, I was getting into bed. I would sleep with my door open and the bathroom lights down the hall on. I rolled into my right side I saw the same figure standing in my doorway, but this time it had a face similar to the ghost face killer from Scream. I of course didn't know anything about the hat man or Scream at the time because I was young. I stared at it for a few seconds before pulling the covers over my head, but I could see the silhouettes through the blanket for a few seconds before it disappeared. I haven't been able to sleep with my door open since then. One night, I was playing in my room before bed. It was a stormy night, so all the windows were closed. My playroom was opposite my room down the hall. I heard a loud buzzing from the room, and when I looked at the dark room, it started glowing green before the desk chair in the playroom rolled across the room fast and slammed into the shelving unit, knocking things down. My mum came up the stairs and ran in there, expecting me to find breaking stuff. But I was in my room, cowering, and I told her what happened, but of course, she didn't believe me. From that point on, I was convinced that that's where the monsters slept at night. Those were the big events, but there was little stuff like hearing voices and footsteps. Let me know what you guys think. In the 90s, my parents were renting a Victorian house in the countryside. It was fairly isolated and that there were no shops or towns within a 25 minute walk. But not too far from a motorway, there was a little over an hour's drive to London. One weekend, my mum was gone to see her friends and my dad was home alone. He recalls that nothing strange happened on the first Friday or Saturday other than he got some time to himself and spent a lot of time cycling and messing around with his bike. On the Sunday, throughout the day, he said he felt a bit weird when he was on the property, as if something were watching him. He went about his day fairly normally though. In the evening, however, it felt extremely off to him. When he was making dinner, the gas stove kept turning off automatically, and at one point, he heard a crashing outside to find his bike knocked over in the shed. Nothing was too out of the ordinary, but it felt weird. When he was eating dinner, spaghetti bolognese if I'm not mistaken, the electricity in the house failed and my dad reported that there was a sudden coldness in the room, which is strange because it was the middle of summer. The fuse box just blew and he quickly fixed it. After dinner, he went straight to bed, hiding under the covers reportedly, while in bed, the electricity went again, but he decided against leaving bed to fix it. It was at this point he heard the sound of a flute coming from the fireplace in the bedroom. He recalls to me whenever he tells me this story that he's 100% certain someone was playing a flute in the bedroom from the fireplace. He recalls the flute suddenly halting and hearing footsteps approach the bed. 
At this point, he had had enough, so went to fix the fuse. He notes not seeing anything strange, but that the house was very cold. When he flipped the fuse, the lights didn't turn on, and remembers looking towards the neighbor's house and seeing their lights still on. At this point, he went straight to the bedroom and slept like a log. This is the weird part. Apparently after experiencing this, he reported it to the landlord and the landlord told my dad one of the old tenants was an Irish music student who killed herself in that very bedroom about 20 years previous. When my dad mentioned the date, it matched up to the date she killed herself on. I'm not a superstitious or religious person and neither is my dad. But that story is the only thing that sways my opinion slightly. I'm going to try and find the address to the house for my dad and see if I can find the ghost someday. For starters, I'm a night owl. I'll stay up all night, then get seven to eight hours of sleep during the day. During the past couple of nights, I've been hearing voices, noises, etc. My brother, who's trans, female to male, and my rooms connect with the bathroom, and we both have sliding doors to the bathroom. During the night, I'll hear the door being pressed against, making it shake and bang. We do have cats, but I always make sure they aren't in there before I close the door. Plus, during the night, only my cat is in my room, and he usually stays in there. The other thing I've been hearing is my mother's voice. This has happened multiple times and sometimes it changes where it's coming from. Sometimes it sounds as if it's coming from the dining room or it's coming right from the living room, which I have a good view of from my room when the doors open. But when I hear the voice, she's always sleeping since she works during the day and doesn't stay up late. There were a few times where I heard her voice talking to my siblings and their voices talking too. And it's even said my name a few times. I don't know what it is or even is a thing, spirit, etc. I have also seen figures go through the living room towards the dining room. What I did see that scared the life out of me happened a while ago in our old house. I don't know if it could be something that followed us to our new home and or could be related to me hearing my mother's voice. I was in my bedroom and had gotten up to use the bathroom. The hallway was pretty small and the bathroom was right in the center. My room was off to the right and my mother's to the left. Then across from the bathroom was the living room. It was a small house before I went into the bathroom. I had seen my mother standing in her room with her back towards me. Before I could close the bathroom door, I looked up to see my mother on the couch, just playing on her phone. Knowing exactly what would happen if I shut that door after seeing my mother in her room and after many horror movies, I dashed into the living room. And of course, I told my mother what I just saw. I don't know if there's a possibility of hearing my mother's voice along with seeing her in her bedroom when she was really in the living room might be connected or not. Or if something might have followed us from the old house to our newer home. This happened around 2007. I was 16 at the time and some girlfriends and I decided to make our own Ouija board. It was the weekend and we decided to take it to the grounds at the local high school instead of doing it in my friend's house. Thank God we at least had that sense. We set up and had the glass upside down with all of our pinky fingers on top. It moved, but I can't remember if or what it spelled. I've also felt skeptical about this before because you never really know if someone is just moving the glass, but all three of us agreed that we weren't manipulating it. While we were performing our little seance, there's a kid, 16 male, 
playing basketball within our sights. One of my friends recognized him and said his little brother, aged 10, died within the last year or so. The strange thing was this boy was alone and just shooting hoops. But over near one of the buildings was a kid about 10 years old just watching him. The boy played basketball by himself for a while and then left, never interacting with the younger boy. But the 10 year old followed him when he left, but from a distance and still never actually interacting. My friends and I finished up and I went home later that afternoon. I was sleeping alone in my room that night when I woke up with my eyes still closed and I could hear what I could describe as children's music. It was like the music that's one of those old music boxes and plays a melody when it's opened. I opened my eyes and what I saw scared the absolute hell out of me. Right next to my bed standing over me was a completely black silhouette about the size of a 10 year old boy. I was so afraid all I could manage to do was shut my eyes and just lay there eventually rolling over to face the wall and cover myself in blankets while I silently cried. I managed to fall asleep again at some points and woke up in the safety of daylight. It never visited me again, and I'm not sure if it was the boy or if it was something else in that shape. I've never done another Ouija board, fuck that. And I think it scared me so much I don't know if I'll be able to see a spirit again. My mum told me when I was young, three or four, that I would tell her my late grandfather would sit on the end of my bed and make me feel good in a loving family way. So I know I have the capability to speak to people from the spirit world. I just think about what happened that night and I was so terrified. I think I may have a blockage now to protect me from ever feeling so afraid again. The house across the street from me is interesting to say the least. There's been at least two suicides, might be three, but I can't quite remember. In it, plus at least two deaths from long-term illness. The house is completely wheelchair accessible. Think all ramps and low countertops. The deaths from the long-term illnesses from two separate families make sense, considering the house's designs. And the suicides were all from the same family, so that could also be attributed to a history of mental illness and compounding depression. Despite my belief, the house is haunted. The most recent suicide was on Thanksgiving. It's a Black Friday morning a couple years back. The eldest daughter shot herself in the mouth with a shotgun at about 3 a.m. My bedroom window faces the house and me being in high school and on Thanksgiving break, I was awake and heard the gunshot. That time, I thought nothing of it. There's an apartment building nearby that has quite a few people that light off fireworks consistently. But I did think it was weird I only heard one. The next morning, I got picked up by a friend at about 7.30 to go Black Friday shopping. I got back around two and there was crime scene tape around their house. I asked my parents about it and they said a cop had come by asking if they heard or saw anything suspicious the night before, but that's all they knew. We just assumed there was a break-in. That night, again at about 3am, I heard the same noise as the night before, again assuming it was a firework. Same thing the next night. The next night, around dinner time, a pizza gets dropped off at our house. Weird. We didn't order a pizza. My dad checks the receipt and realizes it's for their house and goes to drop it off. He asks the homeowner about the police tape and he very nonchalantly says his daughter had killed himself with a shotgun at about 3 a.m. Again, at about 3 a.m., I hear the noise. The next night, I sat in my room staring out the window to see if I saw a firework but I didn't, despite hearing the noise. I've always been a bit of an insomniac, and for months I'd hear the gunshots at around 3 a.m. I'd sleep at other people's houses and be awake at 3 and not hear it. 
At any time, I was awake at three in my own bedroom, I'd hear it. It stopped a couple months later. I just hope she found peace. This happened yesterday, 1st of December, during a video call with a colleague. I'm based in London. My colleague is based in Toronto. The call began at 6 p.m. London, 1 p.m. Toronto time. I help raise finance for technology companies, and we talked about how to finance a series of startups within the areas of AI, 3D printing, IoT, Internet of Things, and space tech. All went well until 32 minutes into the conversation when I suddenly felt a drop in temperature. Knowing that my heating has been on the blink for a few days, I choked it up to that, excused myself and put on a jumper. Back to the conversation. Five minutes in, my colleague stops and leans into her camera. Everything all right? I asked. Who is that behind you? She asked her face showing signs of worry. I swing around, no one there. I thought she was joking. She knows I live alone and on the third floor of a pretty new complex. I told her that her tactics to scare me aren't going to work. I don't mess with the paranormal due to issues in my past and I don't play around with Ouija boards, etc. And the apartment is new and not built on a burial ground, etc. She looks at me worried and explains that she is deadly serious. Five minutes after I returned with the extra layer of clothing, I was holding forth on the cash flow forecast of a company. She noticed movement behind me. It came into focus and saw a woman, young in her twenties, average build, Caucasian, stood directly behind me, staring intently at me. I asked for more details. My colleague said, M, I've never seen anyone stare with so much hatred as anyone before. Not in real life, but in the movies. I initially laughed it off, but my colleague was disturbed enough to cut the call short and send me the company details by email. I wandered around my apartment checking, even talked to my landlord who brought the apartment when complex when was brand new. He said that as far as he can tell, no one of that description has ever lived in my apartment or in the complex. I'm going to do a bit more investigation into the building, the surrounding area, and even into people I have known, but at this point, I'm at a loss to explain why this could have happened. Should I be worried? To this day, I remember the day as a baby I became conscious. And before I could even talk, I remember thinking, where am I? I remember dreams from my childhood, like they were yesterday. Dreams I've had many years ago will continue to this day like a story. My brother passed in 2010, and the night it happened, I was visited by a spirit that told me. And I thought it was just all in my head. The next time when his passing was confirmed, military, being completely awake, laying in bed, he came and sat right on my legs, like he used to do to wake me up for work. I was a little freaked out, but was very calm in an emotional time. Within the first couple years, he would visit me in dreams and show me, like the ghost of Christmas past, why things happened the way they did. To this day, we go on dream adventures. He comes to tell me he's still around. I have so many weird stories of my life that I truly believe is the movie. Two years after my brother's passing, I slept over at my buddy's house and astral projected. Seeing my body laying there floating up out of this house as soon as I got to height of the tops of trees, it was like a vortex took me away at the speed of light and went through this vortex wormhole thingy very fast. Had all my senses slowed down, 
right when I was in orbit of this blue slash red planet and slowly floated to the surface. When it was all cloudy ground and dark and thousands of people, which seemed like they were waiting for an event. There was a ball of light on the horizon and I started walking toward it. People saying, hello, I haven't seen you in so long. Or just hi. I didn't really recognize anyone. As I'm walking towards this, for some reason I thought it was a party, someone walking the other direction of everyone else bumps me so hard in the shoulder, it spins me around. And the person throws their arm over me and out of the corner of my eye, I see it's my brother. And he says, you can't go there, go home, go home, go home. And on the third time he stopped, walked, and I took two more steps and back into the vortex, back to earth, back through the roof, back into my body. As soon as I hit my body, I flung up wide awake. The world isn't what it seems. Everything is a theory based off another person's theory. This was about two years ago, while I was on vacation in North Carolina. Me and my family were on vacation visiting my sister who moved there. We were staying in an Airbnb, and my mom's boyfriend at the time and my brother went to go get ice cream to bring back for us. Me and my mom stayed at the house because we were tired. Our dog was on vacation with us, and she began to growl at the open door to the downstairs bedroom while my mom and I were on the couch watching TV about 15 or 20 feet away. We both looked at the door at the same time and saw a glowing aura. The room was dark, but the presence was bright. It didn't light up the room, but we could see it. it. Didn't have very much of a figure, more of a cast of light. I instantly felt a chill run down my spine and got a strange feeling in my whole body. The presence didn't feel evil, and it was almost warm and comforting. I asked my mom if she saw it or felt it too. She said she saw something, but blamed it on a passing car or something. This is where it gets weird. I came home from vacation and didn't think much of it. I thought it was attached to the house or something. Two or so days after I got home, I got a call from my close friend that I hadn't heard from in a few days. Not super strange behavior from her, she kept to herself. She informed me that she had just gotten out of the hospital after overdosing on ketamine. While she was in the ambulance, she was pronounced dead and had to be revived. Of course, the last thing on my mind was the light I saw on vacation. I asked when it happened and she said last Thursday night, and my heart dropped into my stomach. That was the night when I saw the light aura. I still wasn't 100% convinced that it was her though. I casually asked around what time it was and she said pronounced dead at 8.17 p.m. to be exact. I wasn't sure what time I saw the light, but I knew for a fact that my brother and mom's boyfriend had left around 8 p.m. I asked her if she remembered anything from it. I know, Probably not the best question to ask someone who experienced being dead, but I was in shock. And she said not really, but she saw a bunch of loved ones flash before her eyes right before everything went black. I'm convinced that she visited me that night. I have a mutual friend who said they felt something strange that night of her brief passing as well. She's a very spiritually connected person, so this would make a lot of sense. A night or so ago, I was in my room at my Zars house when I started hearing slightly sus noises outside my side window. For reference, my room has two windows, both of which are by my bed. One is on the side and just faces the neighboring house, and one is on the back wall and faces the backyard. It was slightly concerning since they were pretty close to my window, but the sounds weren't too concerning and I didn't see anything, so I just brushed it off 
It's like a wasp or a stray cat or something. A while passes and I'm just doing whatever on my phone. All of a sudden, I heard a dog barking from the yard behind ours. Now, this isn't an uncommon occurrence. That dog barks a lot. However, this was late at night and he only barks if someone is in the yard. So, this being the middle of the night and my whole family being asleep made him barking a little bit concerning. I turned off the lights in my room so I could get a clear view outside and I didn't see anyone. I saw a strange shape near the tree, but it was dark so my eyes could have just been playing tricks on me. Plus, there's a lot of stray cats in the area. I lay back down and continued to hear strange noises from outside both windows, but ignore them. After a few minutes, I decided to check out the back window again, because I heard the barking start up again, and the shape by the big tree was gone. But there was a figure standing behind the thin tree that was closer to my window. I don't know who or what it was, but I freaked out a bit. My blinds were already down, so I took the opportunity to circle the house to lock doors, just in case it was a person who wanted to break in. A few minutes passed and the barking died down again. All of a sudden, from the side window, there's suddenly a lot of light and then it goes dark again. The way the light was led me to believe it was just a car, but A, I would have heard it if it was a car and B, the angle of where the light was coming from wouldn't make sense if it was a car. Also C, there was no car parked when I peeked outside. There was also at no point a person at that window, so it rules out a stalker with a camera. No one broke in and nothing else came of it, so I genuinely don't know what the hell happened, but it was definitely freaky. This happened in West Texas about a year ago. Last year, there was a comet that was visible. I'm sure most of those in the US know what I'm talking about. I was a sophomore in high school when this happened, so I'm still probably the same maturity. But anyways, I wanted to go see the comet. My family, being my mom, stepdad, and two brothers at the time, and I live work on a farm. It's all cotton, corn, and milo. So with this being a rural farming community, we were almost out in the sticks, certainly a good drive from town. With the lack of city lights, we had the perfect view to see the comet. We would have all gone, but I stayed back with my brothers because they were three and one, and it was about 10.30, so if they woke up by chance, someone had to be home. To make a long story short, we go to the field, take out the binoculars, and have a good time. When we got home, I trade with my mom and I go to view. We were gone for about 20 minutes, so nothing unnatural. But as we were driving to a field we call the canal, we saw this huge fireball in the sky. It hovered in a constant state, but it would sometimes move closer than back away. I'm not sure how to explain it, but that it stayed the same size? Like, I could visibly tell it came closer than backed off, but it was the same size. Also described it similar to the sun that it stayed for about five minutes, then just disappeared, like blink, gone. With this being a rural farming community, there were no oil fields here, strictly cotton, as it was the season. While we can see the city lights from where we live, it was the opposite direction. The road goes north and south, and the fireball was due east, the city being west. We all together spent about half an hour researching, I googled fireball in sky. My stepdad looked up anything local in the news, like an explosion or something. And my mom checked Facebook, but no one else had seen it. Or at least, there were no other posts about it. We still bring it up now and then, but as far as we know, nothing ever came of it. If anyone wants to do some digging, I'll PM the area this happened in. But yeah, as far as I know, we have no answer to what this could be. My history teacher swears to God he saw a UFO around that time, within the week. 
But I'm not saying it was or wasn't a UFO because I don't know myself. The only thing I've ever found similar was when I was watching some paranormal TV show about UFOs and they mentioned a bright fireball in the sky. But yeah, that's it. COVID-19 has killed too many people this year, but my friend's father was not one of them. He died from a heart attack. The funeral rites of Hinduism are long. To make sure the soul's attachments to this material plane are completely removed. Part of this is to make sure that any chance of the soul being left in limbo to haunt the living is minimized. My friend, distraught and in grief, collapsed at the funeral. Her relationship with her father was one of those loving father-daughter relationships, immortalized in Hallmark cards, memes, etc. Fast forward four months to a few weeks ago. I was on a video call with her, explaining a paranormal incident that happened to me during a Zoom call. And out of the blue, she said she wanted to do a Ouija board session to contact her father. I said that this was a very, very bad idea. I sent her links to the many stories about how Ouija boards are a portal to trickster entities and all the bad stuff that will result. She, in an emotional state, began to berate me for not supporting her in her time of need. After a few harsh words on both sides, she shut the call down. I heard nothing until the 27th of December. Her brother called. I asked how she is. He explained that she did a Ouija board session over four days with two of her girlfriends. The two others didn't report any activity or harm, but his sister was in a bad way. First, it was nightmares of their father appearing and turning into something else. Then she started waking up in the middle of the night to find a figure standing at the foot of a bed. Finally, during the daytime, the figure began to appear in odd reflective surfaces. The family reached out to a priest who was knowledgeable in these matters, and it seems that things are slowly getting under control. I told the brother that I'm happy that this is the case. His final comment was, would you take the board and get rid of it for us? I said no. Best to give it to the priest. He would be able to handle it. I clicked the video call off without saying goodbye. Reason? He said that last sentence with a smile, which put me on edge. I think that all is not right in my friend's household, but I'm too scared to pry further. I live in a one bedroom apartment with my sister in a city in Southern California for about five years now. I have the one bedroom that includes the bathroom while the living room area is basically her room. My mother and brother live in their own apartments in the same building. So my family and I are all pretty close to each other and I feel they wouldn't lie to me about all this, but I have my doubts. My sister, an ex-boyfriend and three friends have all told me the same thing. They get an uneasy feeling when they enter my room and have seen a shadow person, all in varying instances. My mother, however, has told me while she never has seen any shadow person, she does try to avoid going into my room if she can, because the feeling is too unbearable. Since the day I moved in, I have never felt or seen anything paranormal. Recently this year, I started an ofrenda. For those of you unfamiliar or not Mexican, it's an altar to honor those family members that are no longer with us. You put pictures of them and offerings on the altar and blah, blah, blah. I find it as a spiritual refuge and has personally benefited me. My sister disapproves of it, however. She has told me ever since I started my ofrenda, the bad energy she gets from my room is more intense now and that it has given her major anxiety. She's more or less moved in with her boyfriend recently 
due to her new job, but also confessed to me it's partially because of my room. I find it pretty funny, but she told me she thinks it could be the reason why the kitchen almost went up in flames. Three weeks ago on Friday night, I went to sleep and woke up at 7 a.m. to the smell of gas. I went in the kitchen and two burners were on. Something had burned on the stove top, but I couldn't tell what it was as it was just ash. I unplugged the stove quickly and saw the black soot all over the walls, the floor, everywhere. Since I had left the front door open, my mother checked the security cameras and saw smoke leave the screen door around 2 a.m. and was burning throughout the night. I personally think it was a stove malfunction and I've never been a sleepwalker. My sister and mother think it has something to do with whatever evil energy is in my room and is now even more emboldened ever since I started my altar. I really don't know what to tell them anymore. And now my family is considering getting the apartment cleansed. When I was 15, paranormal activity came out. My friend and I decided to try the Ouija board. We spoke to this guy named Frank, and I remember he used to say fucked up things like, my mum is standing behind you and she doesn't like you. I'll overdose on pills. Just weird and crazy dark shit. But my friend and I both thought we were fucking with each other, trying to freak each other out. A few weeks later, I was sleeping in bed. I had a shelf above my bed that had my grad teddy from primary school sitting on top. The teddy was sat there for years without being moved. And there was a dresser with a mirror at the end of my bed. I woke up to the teddy falling on top of my head and when I would wake, I would wake up looking directly into the mirror. There, I saw a girl brushing her hair in front of my dresser. I rubbed my eyes numerously and instead of her disappearing, she became clearer. But the more I stared, it was like I was looking at myself when I was younger, maybe six or seven years old. And she had thick auburn hair but was wearing a very old style type of nightgown. Soon, I realized it wasn't. I hid under the covers and after checking numerous times to see if she was gone, she finally disappeared. Fully freaked me the fuck out. Anyway, we stopped doing the board and did other things normal teenagers do. I never told anyone about what I saw or a few friends, but put it down that I was seeing things and was still dreaming. Fast forward 11 years, I'm now 26. I picked up my sister and was driving her home and she randomly starts talking about when my friend and I played with the board. And she's like, Jose, my other sister, and I swear you brought something into the house. I shrug and I'm like, why do you think that? And she's like, we used to wake up seeing a girl brushing her hair in front of us. I slammed the brakes and was like, what the fuck? And she's like, yeah, she didn't say or do anything, but just brush her hair. And then I fessed up that I saw her too, but I thought I was dreaming. Anyway, we both haven't seen her for many years, which I consider lucky because I don't want anything in the house. But I must admit, it does still freak me out and I really don't want to see her again. Moral, don't fuck with the board, it's legit. It's fucked, and if my sisters and I all saw the same ghost, you may invite something in that you'd never want in your house. It started a few months after me, my mum, and sister moved here. I decided to stay late and play on my PS3 in the living room. Something about this house. Every downstairs room, except for my mom's room and the bathrooms, are connected to each other with doors that are always open. So there's a hall, kitchen, my mom's office, living room, and the same hall again. So you can basically run in circles. I saw someone entering my mom's office through the kitchen. I thought it was my sister, but I found it a little weird that she didn't turn the lights on. After like an hour, it hadn't come out of the room. 
I thought that was weird, so I entered the room myself and no one was there. Nothing like that happened again until a few weeks ago. I was lying in my bed and I saw my doors closing themselves without any help. They were always opening by themselves, but they never closed like that before. The noise woke up my parrots and they started screeching a little. The weirdest part about this were the keys. They were moving for a few minutes after that. I know it's normal for keys to do that after doors were closed, but I think a few minutes is a little too long. Then a few days ago, I was talking with my friend in the kitchen. I was cooking eggs, so the brick of butter was on the table. I'm sure it was stable because it was standing like that for 10 minutes. So we were talking and that brick of butter just rotated. Imagine yourself in bed just changing your position from sleeping on the back to sleeping on your left side. I have no idea how to explain it in a different way since English is not my first language. And here it comes today. We have bath cortines in our bathroom. When I was taking a bath, something hit it and fell on the floor. I tried blaming it on my cat, but he's outside. I got out of the bathroom and saw what it was. It was a block of styrofoam. I tried to explain it somehow, but there's no way I did it since I was taking a bath and of course, I was alone during that. So something just threw a block of styrofoam at me. I don't know why, but every time something like that happens, I have a feeling a woman did it. Maybe it's because the previous owner remarried and I have no idea where his first wife died. Our house is 50 years old, by the way. So this weekend, my husband and I made our first trip to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. We stayed at an inn that was once inhabited by a girl named Tilly Pierce and her family. And during the Civil War, the house was a makeshift hospital. I've never had any experiences with the paranormal, so I wasn't expecting to, even though it said this house was haunted. The first night we stayed there, Sunday, we decided to take a walk around town around 9.30 to 10 o'clock at night. While we were getting ready, the light on the nightstand was flickering like crazy. Creepy, but could be unexplained, so we just unplugged it. We headed out for a walk and no one was out. It had just rained and the bars and restaurants were closed, so not much to do, but we were new in town and wanted to scope things out for the daylight. We got back in at almost midnight, climbed up the creaking stairs and to our room. To briefly describe our room, it was a street view room that sat above the dining room area of the house. The other guests in the inn were fast asleep by the time we got back. We sat on the bed for about 10 to 15 minutes and out of nowhere, we heard a young girl start singing. I'd say mid song, no music. The song sounded like some type of hymn or maybe a popular song among the young people of that time. After about 30 seconds of singing, a muffled woman's voice, almost scolding, said something like, you're 15, and that's all we could make out. Again, no one was on the sidewalk, and we saw the other guests and no young girls were in attendance. The sounds came from directly below us in the dining room area, and we had just walked in about 20 minutes prior to a darkened house. We both looked at each other in shock, but still didn't register that it could be a spirit that we just overheard. One day came and went, and Tuesday morning we gathered for breakfast in the dining room table at the inn with the other guests. The innkeeper was talking about the history of the house, and had mentioned that he brought a psychic into the house, and she had felt the presence of a young girl, possibly Tilly. Another guest says, wasn't she 15? My husband and I practically broke our necks looking at each other when we recalled what we heard Sunday night. Now, Tilly didn't pass away in the house or even Gettysburg, but could it be a residual haunting? We both heard it so clear and loud, it was like we were hearing a snippet of a memory, but it wasn't bad or scary. It was actually very beautiful.
My parents and I were driving very early on a rural road on our way to a winery. As it was still early, the sun had not risen yet and we were driving with the high beams on and would occasionally switch to the low beams when a random truck would drive by. To explain the situation, I have to mention that my father was the driver. I was shotgun and my mom was in the back seat but was still looking at the road as we were having a conversation and admiring the scenery. The conversation stilled when, without blinking, I, and apparently my parents too, saw a man walking right in the middle of the road. I didn't just blink, and he didn't just come into the lights from obscurity. The man materialised himself in the middle of the road and was looking at us. This couldn't have lasted more than a few seconds, but in my mind, it took hours. I thought he would see us driving and swerve or at least stop coming closer to where we were about to drive through. But he didn't and we didn't stop driving. We drove right through him and he disappeared a millimetre away from the car, just as weird as he had appeared. It wasn't an illusion. I saw him very clearly and he looked just like a regular man. Not see-through and not scary at all. Nobody in the car said anything, and I was too on edge to start talking as I thought I was insane. My dad stopped at the nearest gas station, got out of the car, and started checking it. But the car presented no sign of crashing into anything. We hit a very big rabbit once, and I'm sure a man would do a much bigger damage than that. My mom and I also got out, and at this point, it was obvious to me that he was checking to see if we ran over anything, so I asked, did you see him too? I think he was relieved that he was not imagining things, but also scared that we all saw what we thought to be a person. He said he did, and that we shouldn't talk about it. My mom just gave me the look that meant she would tell me later. As soon as I was just the two of us, I couldn't help but ask her what happened. Why did dad not want to talk about it? And why did he continue driving when there was something that we thought was a man in the middle of the road. She told me it happened to them before, and they almost crashed. But when they turned to look what made them always crash, there was nobody. My dad's very superstitious, he is Russian, and he said that those are evil spirits and that you shouldn't talk about them because they feed off of that. I was working second shift in cell block C. Each cell block has two officers assigned to it. One to man the desk and one to patrol the block. My partner and I were getting set for lights out, just about to initiate lockdown with the last count of the day in which the inmates can be out of their cells. We called for the counts and started the head counts. Each cell block was arranged in a three-tier setup. They were shaped like a U with a staircase on each side near the front desk. As one officer walks the counts, the other waits by the desk. When the first officer completed the count, the officer that stayed at the desk recounts to make sure the numbers match. This process can take a while, especially if the inmates decide to play games. After count, we initiate lockdown. The inmates get about two hours in their cell before lights out. When it came time to shut off the lights, we both walked the tiers one more time to make sure all the beds had a body. Two hours after lights out, we decided to do an impromptu unofficial count to stave off the boredom. We both walked the first tier and each took one of the upper tiers. I took tier three. As I was walking along the tier, an inmate towards the middle started yelling to us, asking for help with something. It wasn't medical related, so we just yelled back for him to shut it. Then the inmates got a bit more belligerent, spitting curse words, calling us lazy. I started towards the area where the yelling was coming from. By now, the inmates was beating in the door, so it was quite easy to identify. And as I reached the door to get the inmate's name and number, for the write-up, the sounds ceased. No beating, no swearing, no yelling. I looked into the door windows 
and no one was in the cell. I looked into the cell on the left and the right and saw four inmates, two to a cell, pale as a ghost with fear and cowering in the darkness as far from the door as they could get. I returned to the front desk to check the cell box list and discovered that no one was assigned to that cell. Later that night, about an hour before shift change, my partner was patrolling tier three. He told me that while walking by that cell, he thought he saw someone step off the toilets and hang themselves. But of course, the cell was empty. There are times when I'm in one place that is familiar and I've been at many, many times before, but for that split second or few minutes, I don't recognize it or feel as if it's wrong. But just a few months before I hit my head and got diagnosed with a TBI, I was in my college city and I was in a street I used every day, twice or three times a day, so it wasn't normal to be this confused. The event goes as such. I was in Thessaloniki, Greece, aka my college city in the Aristotelius Square and heading to Tsimiski Street to make my bus home with an old friend when suddenly my friend is telling me that we were on the opposite side of Tsimiski Street and heading to Agia Sophia Street. But I was explicitly telling my old friend that she's wrong and the moment we reached Agia Sophia's and realized that I was wrong, I felt terrified, sad and angry. I even cried a bit and had my old friend calm me down. That event struck me as very, very odd. I was so disturbed that I locked myself in my apartment for a few days, licking my wounds. I had a similarly emotional experience when I was in Gallipoli in Italy, when I was 18 years old, and I've never been there. Yes, I knew what to expect after a few corners and some buildings looked familiar and homey and didn't want to leave. While in Lecce in Italy, it felt unwelcoming all around, yet familiar, and I just felt this feeling of danger and that I had to flee. Ironically, during the pandemic, I found out that my maternal grandpa's family is hailing from a small village formerly known as Exmil in the peninsula of Gallipoli in eastern Thrace, modern day European Turkey, during the 1910s before they settled in the central Macedonia region in Greece. This raised a few questions in my mind about my feelings in Gallipoli. Since the Italian city is a settlement for the people that came from eastern Thrace, or at least for some people, but I thought it was a coincidence. So, my question is what are these things that used to happen to me where one moment I would recognize some, my surroundings and the next not? And being so sure that it must be a different way, but I have no way to describe how different it must be with words I just know. Or do unfamiliar places feel familiar when they shouldn't? Any thoughts? Twelve years ago, I met my wife. She was a very close family, and I was welcomed in by most of them pretty quickly. We would spend a lot of time at one of her sister's houses when we wanted to hang out. On one visit, the whole family was over having dinner. The sister that lived in the house said something about the guy in the garage keeping her up all night with his tools banging around. Everyone empathized and just kept eating. I asked, what they were talking about. They said the previous owner of the house was an older guy that spent most of his time in the garage, working on his vehicles. One time, there was some kind of explosion and he died in an ambulance on his way to the hospital. Now, they can hear him in the garage most nights, working on things. I figured they were pulling my leg since I was new to the family. My wife's brother-in-law, whose house it was, said the guy had a problem with men. He always messed with the men of the family, but not the women. Her brother then told a story about a night he was watching TV pretty late. It was past midnight and no one else was awake. Out of nowhere, the TV volume went all the way up 
then back down. Then the TV turned off, then back on again. The remote, he said, was across the room. At that point, he decided to walk home. I still just figured they were messing with me. Fast forward a few months. I was having some issues at home, so I asked if I could crash on their couch for a few days. One of those nights, I was up watching TV. It was probably two or three in the morning. I kept hearing sounds from the area of the garage, but that's where the heater and water heater are located, so I chalked it up to that. I was laying on my side on the couch watching who knows what. As anyone who's ever watched TV like that knows, when the commercials come on, you flip to face the back of the couch to give your neck a rest. On one of those couch facing flips, I heard a voice that sounded like it was right next to me, whisper into my ear, say, go to sleep, quite sternly. I'm not one to screw around with things like that. So without turning around, I grabbed the remote, turned off the DV, closed my eyes and tried my best to fall asleep. The next morning I was telling them about it. They just had the I told you so face on. I've slept there since many times, but never again on the couch. And if I ever start to hear him working in the garage, I know it's bedtime. Two days ago, my friend Catherine came over for dinner. My house has a hallway that leads to the bathroom, two bedrooms and the storage room. The moment we got inside my house and I went to the bathroom to get ready to go to the supermarket to buy what we needed to make dinner, she yelled and said, hey, the hallway's kind of creepy. The hallway doesn't look creepy, especially at 8 p.m. After we returned, we cooked and ate. Then the landline phone rang and I went to take it. It was my dad. And as I was talking, Catherine came to see if I was okay. And she avoided looking at the dark hallway, saying that it made her uncomfortable. Then, later at night, around midnight, I had to take something from my room and she came with me. And I made sure I lit any light I could on the way there to help her when she turned to me and said, that her brain suddenly got tingly, like she watched ASMR or something and she got cold. It's summer where I'm living and it's 29 Celsius degrees outside, so it wasn't cold. But after we left my room and went back to the kitchen slash dining room, she told me my room and hallway gave her the chills and freaked her out and wanted me to keep the lights on. And in all honesty, I feel cold spots in the hallway ever since I started living on my own in the house. Or at least I notice it when I'm alone. But whenever I have family or friends over, I don't. But that day with Catherine, I could feel it too. But I thought I was getting freaked out too. And in general, during the entire night, we would talk and her eyes would drift either to the dark corner where there is lights made out, shutters, my aunt made, and to the hallway. That's when she left and went home. She told me that she felt that something was in the hallway and in the corner of my diner. She felt it, but couldn't see it. Catherine has admitted that in the past, she had paranormal experiences. And so do I, so I believed her. When she left, I made sure to say a little prayer before going to bed, because I felt kind of crept out. But I can't see it either, and yet I can't help but every night since then look at the corner and the hallway and get this chill down my spine. I don't know what it is, but I hope it isn't something evil and it's just a spirit. This happened about 13 years ago when I was around 10 years old. Me and my little friends were always looking for some trouble to get ourselves into. Our favourites was making homemade boards for communicating with ghosts. We wanted to experience something scary, or so we thought. I'm not proud of this moment, as I now realise it was extremely disrespectful for us to do so. 
but bear in mind I was only 10. A very small baby passed away and a couple of days after, the grandma also passed away. Two deaths in one house must mean that we can finally communicate with a ghost. So we took our homemade board and went a little bit further from the house so we wouldn't get in trouble but still close to where we could see the porch. We set up everything and grabbed each other's hands. We closed our eyes and started focusing on ghostly stuff or whatever. I felt a sudden urge to open my eyes and I took a look at the porch of the house. There was a tall woman wearing a long black dress. She was looking down so I couldn't see anything besides that. At first I thought it might be the mother of the baby. People in my country wear black after a close member's death so it's not uncommon. She lifted her head up and that's when I felt my heart drop and the hair of my body just stood up. She had no face but I could tell that she was looking right at me. You know those moments when you're terrified but for whatever reason you just can't move, can't scream, you just watch in horror? After the initial shock, I managed to let out the most intense scream I've ever done. My friends took one look at me and then looked at the direction I was looking at and they started screaming too. We ran so fast we couldn't catch our breath when we got to my house. I've never been so scared in my life. After we managed to catch our breath, I decided to ask what everyone saw. A faceless lady staring right at us. Without me telling them what I saw, that was everyone's answer. I'm not claiming that we saw a ghost. We were very young and maybe there are some explanations as to what's happened. Maybe we wanted to see something so bad that we created a scare out of nothing. What confuses me though? is how did we all see the exact same thing? When I was a child, I was pretty sure my home was haunted, especially my bedroom, but I didn't want to scare anyone, so I didn't say anything. I moved out years ago, but recently my brother told me out of the blue that my childhood bedroom is definitely haunted. I asked him how he knew and he said it just was. When I was six or seven, I saw a disembodied dead hand coming out of my closet. It freaked me out, but I brushed it off by telling myself that kids see things that aren't there sometimes and decided to ignore it and not say anything. There would also be days when an abnormal amount of flies would suddenly appear in my room overnight. They'd stay in my room and disappear fairly quickly the same day. I also had a period in elementary school where I had terrible insomnia in that room. I wasn't scared, I just couldn't sleep. My parents finally decided to have me sleep in the guest bedroom and I was fine. Eventually I moved back into my bedroom and didn't have that problem anymore. I always avoided being alone in the house, especially at night and thought I was just scared of being alone, but found out after I moved out that that wasn't the case. It's just the house that scares me. Anytime I was alone, I felt watched or like someone was directly behind me. On one of the few nights I agreed to house sit and didn't have anyone stay with me, I heard loud footsteps in the attic. My dad was constantly in the crawl space and attic doing home repairs, so I've ruled out some stranger secretly living in our home. There was also another time a few years ago that my brother and I were visiting and my dog started growling at the corner again. All of our animals interacted strangely and often with this corner. I jokingly said something about it being haunted but immediately followed it up with, just kidding, it's not real. And the exact moment I said that, a heavy painting in the corner was picked up and thrown hard against the ground. The nail in the wall was fine. The wire it hung from was fine. The wall was fine and hadn't moved in any way. I quickly apologized and prompted to never taunt it again. I've lived in several haunted and non-haunted homes now and all of the haunted ones have a very heavy, 
not in a bad way, just neutral energy. Just like my childhood home. Anybody else experience anything like that? Thoughts? When I was three, my dad and late granddad dug up a dried old up tree in our back garden. It wasn't a very big tree, but it was starting to break down the wall between our garden and the next door neighbors. I remember the dirt was really dusty as the roots were pulled up and my dad picked up a ball from in the dirt right where the tree had been and gave it to me. For the record, I have lots of vivid memories from that house, which we only lived in until I was five. This ball I kept with other marbles growing up. It was precious to me, but I never played with it, just stored it. Every few years I'd get it out and inspect it because it was like no other marble I had ever seen. It was bigger than normal marbles, dark brown with a couple of scuff marks in it. I recall as a nine-year-old trying to shine a light through it and nothing would pass through. And doing my inspection only to get deep skin, tingling lizard brain, alerting feeling of anxiety while doing this and promptly put it away for years. I always knew where it was though. Fast forward to my late twenties, I'm early thirties now, and I realized the ball is not actually brown. It's black and no matter when I take it out of its box, it would give me the chills for no reason. The past two years I've taken it upon myself to figure out A, what it is, and B, why it feels so bad. I now keep it in a wooden box beside my bed, nestled in my D&D dice some of which are gemstones. And each session, I will handle the ball to try to feed into it positive energy. It once gave me a shock to my elbow, which I can't work out. I told it off. I didn't know what else to do. The black ball has started to reveal thin silvery lines below the surface. I've cleaned this thing with soap several times in my life and nothing ever comes off. But the more I handle it, the more it changes. A Wiccan friend refuses to touch it. A crystal shop owner suggested it could be silver swirl obsidian. And a Facebook group suggested it was buried because someone used it for something big and bad. The house we dug it up from was haunted. Three-year-old me has been frightened by things I'd seen. Anyway, I feel deeply responsible for this ball and don't feel I can let anyone have it to study it away from me. But it weirds me out. I really wanted to get it all off my chest. Twenty ninth of May, twenty twenty one, Italy. It started as a usual weekend. I was at a friend's home with other friends, drinking something, chatting, and playing games. When it's summer, sometimes we decide to go outside for a walk. It was night, around 11.30. Cloudy, we could still easily see where you were going. We live in a countryside place, but not too far away from the nearest city. It's the typical Tuscany landscape. Anyway, we take the usual dirt road that is in front of the house. As we walk down this road, a friend, let's call them M, goes a bit further than us, and another friend that was with him comes back to us saying that he lost him in a matter of seconds. How? From this point, things got creepy. We started searching with torches. Maybe he fell down the side. We call it, but nothing. We arrived at the end of the road and still nothing. He'd vanished. The road is around 200 meters. Plain and with a dead end. How can someone disappear? Fine, maybe he came back home, we thought. So half the group backtracked to home, to check, while me and two other friends remained at the dead end. Later, we get messages that he's not at home. So we too started coming back. When we've nearly arrived, M reappears from the road, running towards us. At first, he thought that we made up some kind of bad joke on him, but no. He then explained what happened from his point of view. 
As we all saw, M was just walking by himself a bit further than us. When he reached the dead end, he realized that we weren't there behind him anymore. No torchlights, no voices, nothing. From his point of view, we were the ones that vanished. So he too backtracked to home, but there was no one there. So then he came back to the dead end, doing the same road from start to finish. Three fucking times. And nothing. We live in this place. We would know where we are with eyes closed. There are no roads similar to that nearby, and it's literally impossible to miss each other on a straight, plain road. So how did all this happen? We thought about it all night, searching for some kind of explanation of what we just witnessed. But how can you explain this? When I would work the night shift, all sorts of fun stuff would happen. I'd bring wheelchairs out for cleaning after everyone was in bed, and I'd walk down the hall 20 minutes later when it was time to clean them, and they would be on the opposite side of the hall than when I pulled them out. Pens would disappear, lights would flicker, the usual creepy stuff. There once was a man in the last room on the first floor. The room always had to be dark. The curtains closed, he refused care and was all around a very unpleasant individual. Well, fast forward to last year, he passed away and we transferred a lady for the purpose of the story, we'll call her E, from the third floor. So E moved to the first floor from the third floor and then we noticed a change in her behavior. She went from being the sweet but spunky lady to just a total shut in. She was grumpy violent and anxious all the time. She then somehow fell and broke her hip, so I was assigned to a one-on-one -on -one with her to make sure she got the care she needed. She demanded that I sit beside her and hold her hand the entire time I was there. If I got up to do anything, she'd scream. I got up to ask the nurse for some pain meds and she grabbed my arm and said, please don't leave me, don't leave me. There's something in this room and it's trying to kill me. This happened every time I would go in. So a couple of weeks later, I was taken off the one and one and the day after I was taken off. She passed away. So after E, we had a new lady move in. We'll call her M. M was a sweet lady. She always took her meds, never refused care and was all round lovely. Except for when it was nighttime and she had to go to bed. She'd resist care and cause a fit. One night after she got settled, I came in for her brief change and the nurse came in with me to give M her meds. And as I was cleaning up in the washroom, I heard M ask the nurse the most chilling question. Am I going to die soon? The nurse of course said, oh God, no. Why do you ask M? And she responded with, because at night, the man and the lady in my room tell me I am. I left the room with the nurse after that and she was pale as a ghost. I asked the nurse if she was okay and she said, I had a dream last night that E was sitting at the end of my bed, laughing about teasing the new lady in her room. I remember when I was younger, I used to see my family members, but they were transparent and in my room in the middle of the night. Let me explain. So the first time this happened was a while ago. I had just woken up from a nightmare and I saw my mom smiling sweetly and stroking my head. I fell asleep as if nothing had happened. And when I woke up, it occurred to me that she was transparent. I couldn't feel the contact between her hand and my head either. I had initially thought that this was just my brain hallucinating until an experience that freaks me the fuck out, even to this day. It was a calm night, but an extremely fun day. I had a wonderful day spending time with my dad. These experiences where I was seeing my family members in the middle of the night, but transparent, freaked me out. They had already happened multiple times before. Like I said up top, 
I initially thought that it was in my head. Anyway, back to the story. I was in my bed reflecting on my day and thinking how much I missed my dad. This was right after my dad tucked me in wearing a blue shirt. This is important to the story. I woke up in the middle of the night and turned towards my door. My dad was standing in the doorway, but the door was wide open. I always close the door before I sleep. There was something off about my dad. He was completely transparent. He was also wearing a different shirt than he was before. He was wearing his yellow lantern shirt, a completely different shirt than what he was wearing when he tucked me in. At this point, I knew what was going on, but I was way too tired to deal with some sort of ghost thing at that time of night. So I turned around and went back to sleep. This is where it gets worse. I went downstairs in the morning to ask my dad if he had visited me that night. He said no, and why I asked. I told him what I saw, and told him the shirt that he was wearing when I saw him. He told me that was the exact shirt that he slept in. He was really freaked out. Truly a weird experience, and I'm still curious on what I saw, and how I saw it. The same shirt that he was sleeping in, on a transparent version of him. As a kid, if I woke up in the middle of the night, I would run to my parents' bed or hide under the covers. These are all the events I remember that happened to me, that I am 100% sure weren't dreams between the ages of four and eight. I can't remember any dreams from my childhood, and I'm very sure I was awake for all of these events as a kid. Number one. I wake up and look around my room in the middle of the night and immediately run to my parents' bed, just having an awful feeling. I get under the covers and peek out, and what appears to be a black silhouette of a man walks through the shower curtain into the bathroom in direct view of me. It was pure black, but like the blackness moved inside of it and throughout it, kind of like flowing really slowing like energy. He stopped and just looked at me for 10 seconds. No face, just distorted slow blackness and proceeded to walk through the wall into my bedroom. I hid under the covers and stayed awake the rest of the night. Another time I was already asleep in my parents' bed when in my sleep I started to feel heavy and couldn't breathe. So naturally, I woke up and regained consciousness and see what looks like a homeless man with an old camera sitting on top of me and smiling and taking my picture. I'm instantly flashed like it's Call of Duty and he takes off. My dog downstairs stands up suddenly. I could hear his nails on the wooden floor. He popped up quickly by the sound of it. And I start to wail my arms and call for my parents. Number three, when I woke up one night and was walking into the hallway to go to my parents' room, I saw a figure peeking into my sibling's room. She was pale, had curly hair, lipstick, and I honestly can't remember if I saw her legs or not. There was something there, but kind of covered like a blur or sensor. She smiled kindly and looked towards me, and I just ran into my parents' room. When I told my mom, she showed me a picture of her grandmother, and I swear it's had to be her. So my mom has told me this story many times. When I was around one year old, I almost died, but this lady saved me. Whatever happened to me began around one week before I was worse in health. One day, I began crying and my mom told me she fed me, changed my diaper, tried to put me to sleep and did everything she could think of to stop me from crying, but nothing worked. 
So the night goes on and I'm still crying. So my mom and dad decided to drive around with me in the van to see if that would help. It did. As soon as the van left our home at that time, I quit crying and fell asleep. My parents thought, okay, we can drive back home. But as soon as we reached the house, I began crying again. The next day, my mom takes me to a doctor because she thought something may be wrong. The doctor examined me, did some tests, and everything came back normal. So my mom goes home with no answer as to why I won't stop crying. So my mom ends up going to the same doctor two more times because I won't stop crying. On the third time, the doctor tells my mom to look elsewhere because all the tests were normal. I was crying so much, I was rarely eating and my mom said that I had low body temperature and she freaked out because she thought I was gonna die. She wraps me in a blanket and dips my feet in warm water. And she said my body regained its color and my temperature went back to normal. This happened on around the fourth day after I began crying nonstop. The neighbor tells my mom he knows this lady who can heal me. My mom takes me to that healer lady and she performs a cleanse over my body. My mom said the egg kept slipping out of the lady's hand as she was performing the cleanse, but eventually she completed the cleanse and told my mom that somebody had tried to curse her. Years go by and my mom finds out her cousin did witchcraft on her because she was jealous of my mom's success in her business. Her and my dad started. After this incident, my mom said I never cried again when we reached home. As an adult, I've thought of reasonable explanations to why this happened to me. Obviously, I wasn't there. But if what the healer lady said was true, then the witchcraft may be the only answer. When I was a kid, our first house sat on the last public land before Penhurst State School and Hospital here in southeastern Pennsylvania. As I grew up, the past of Penhurst always interested me and that started my love of everything paranormal. My wife and I met when we were teens and have been together for more than 20 years now. One night, just after we'd met, we were driving around looking for a place to park and make out as kids did. It was a late night in winter and it just snowed. We were driving through a small section of woods near our hometown. I made a slight right turn to go up a hill, hit a patch of snow and ice and slid onto the shoulder of the road. The car wouldn't move. I spun the tires a few times and dug out my mom's cell phone to call my dad after an internal debate as to who would be less pissed off. He answered and I explained the situation. He said it'd be on the way. I tried everything I knew how to do, turning tires, having my wife press the gas while I pushed, nothing worked. I remember sitting in the car with the windows down in the silence of the night. A dog started barking and it sounded way too big and way too close. There was a house in the distance and we started freaking out with all kinds of imagined threats. I remember being truly scared. Suddenly, an engine sounded in the distance. I looked in the rear view mirror and five or six snowmobiles pulled up behind us. I got out of the car and one of the riders walked up to me. He didn't take off his helmet or raise his visor. He asked if we needed help. I said yes. He and a few others pushed the car as I worked the gas and they were able to get it back on the road. I thanked them. They hopped back on the snowmobiles and continued on their way. I spun the car in a tight circle and we made our way down the hill. As we turned to go home, I stopped the car under a streetlight. The snow was fresh and untouched. I got out and walked around for a moment. I had just watched a crew of snowmobiles shoot down that road, listen to their engines and fade away in the night. There were no tracks, no sign of anything besides us out there. It is one event that I still remember to this day. It's not as dark or freaky as things can be, but it was a cool experience and one I'll tell my kids about when they get old enough to understand.
I rescued a black cat, a Maine Coon Bombay mix, about two years ago. I named him Gomez, after Gomez Adams, of course, because he's super affectionate and very needy, as he was abused prior to me adopting him. Recently, he's been acting a bit odd, more than usual, I should say. Prior to this experience, he was occasionally seemed like he was chasing or playing with something else, but obviously, I saw nothing. He is a cat though, so they do do weird things like having the zoomies at random times. But I have also occasionally felt a cat rubbing against my leg, and when I look down, Gomez is nowhere in sight. But I hadn't thought much of it due to mental health issues along with psychiatric medications. Moving forward, all these experiences seem to lead to another possible option. Gomez came with a paranormal buddy. So, a few nights ago, around 5 or 6 a.m., Gomez kept desperately trying to wake me up and would not leave me alone. I thought nothing of it, as he occasionally does this if he doesn't sleep well and requires extra cuddles at night. Then he finally left me alone after like 30 to 45 minutes. So whatever, no big deal. I went back to sleep. His food dispensed from his little robot feeder and he jumped down to eat. Not too long after, I felt paws crawl on my hip and lie down. This is where he normally sleeps. So again, no big deal. Well, I then heard Gomez crunching on his food, so I got confused and slightly woke up. I swear I saw another cat laying on me. It looked white with spots, so definitely not Gomez. Then Gomez jumped up, the weight lifted off my hip, and then he lay down on me. So long story short, I'm not sure if I was hallucinating. Night terrors, sleep paralysis, and bipolar. Still dreaming while half awake? Or I have a ghost cat in my house? Gomez has been running around a lot more than normal and staring off in my room, occasionally seeming like he's following something with his gaze. With all of that being said, if I adopted Gomez and he came with a little ghost companion, I got two cats for the price of one. And one only eats and requires vet insurance. So I'm gonna mark it as a win. So when I was around two, me, my mom, my dad, my older sister and older brother lived in an apartment a couple streets down from where I live now. Me and my brother were around the same age since I was only nine months younger than him. And we both shared a room. My mom told me recently about some experiences she had in that apartment. I'll list off a few she told me. The cabinets, all of them in the kitchen, would fling open at night when everyone was asleep. The only reason she ever knew about this was because my sister told her we would hear walking going up and down the stairs. And by the rooms at night for some reason, the entity seemed to love going around making a mess. I'm calling it an entity because spirits is more like a living thing before. And this thing was demonic. This thing was bad. And I truly believe it somehow managed to follow us to where we live now. My mom told me she got a Bible. We still have that Bible to this day. We're not a religious family, so you know, it was bad when my mom was gifted a Bible. And she got it from a friend because she was telling them about this thing in the apartment. And she was reading it one night when my dad was asleep because she was afraid. Then she heard the stomping of feet coming closer and closer. Like if this thing knew she was reading, it was going to stop her from doing it. She closed the book and put it down, scared out of her mind. She would tell me that I would run into her room afraid, same as my brother. I'm pretty sure my younger brother also lived there for a few months and he would scream and cry at night from seeing or hearing something that my mom or dad couldn't see. The last thing I know of that apartment is one that scared my dad so bad that he completely erased it from his mind. So this happened on the day we were moving out our stuff. And, move, and in a moving van, getting ready to leave my mom, my sister, and my siblings. We're outside waiting for my dad to come out with the last thing. And my mom swear she saw a big shadowing figure behind my dad as he was walking out. But my dad looked puzzled behind him 
When my mom said there's something behind him, he turned and froze in place. So scared he couldn't move, giving off such a demonic energy. He was scared, he was afraid. And my dad usually doesn't get afraid, so that freaked him out bad. I feel like it managed to attach itself to one of us, because I do see big shadowy figures every once in a while. I'm one of those people who are very skeptical and wouldn't spend my time entertaining the thought of ghosts if it wasn't for my own experiences and the testimony of my family members who grew up in this paranormal location. Before I begin the story, I want to make an observation on behalf of the separation of these instances. Not only was there a plethora of really strange activity in this one location, that continues to this day, but these incidents seem to follow or correlate with my grandmother. Now, when I was younger, my dad mentioned to me that when he was a boy, he lived in this house opposite a graveyard, in which he grew up in a short while. But in the late 90s, it was in this house that many bizarre, unexplainable things happened, such as phantom music, or church choir music being heard within the house, but all attempts to locate the origin of the sound failed. Loud crashing noises like dishes falling that would shake my grandmother, only for her to come into the kitchen and find everything in its place. There were also violent banging on the doors that would have her ready to yell at the kids to knock it off, only to find my dad and uncle in their room with the same confusion. She also recalled eerie dreamlike states, with a woman in a wedding dress hovering over her bed at night. Now, as wild as that sounds, all three people living in the house had shared experiences. I had no reason not to trust them. They moved from there and kept these memories. It wasn't until later in my childhood that I witnessed it for myself, all while being with my grandma at the time in an entirely different house, mind you. One day, during a conversation in the kitchen, an aerosol can was knocked off the counter in between us. It fell from the island counter in the middle of the room and hit the tile floor. We both just kind of stared at each other with a shocked look and laughed it off. Then probably a year or so later at a new house, in the middle of another conversation, a loud door slammed. Keep in mind, these were gated houses in isolated counties, with little to no possibility of someone coming knocking. Once we investigated, nothing. I live in a newly constructed house in a wooded area. However, I believe there are at least two spirits haunting it. One is the spirit of a little girl who is neutral, but this other spirit is intimidating and annoying. I had an elderly relative visit my house last year and she kept asking me who the little girl was. This relative doesn't have dementia. I told her there were no kids here and shrugged it off. But I would later hear the pitter-patter of little feet running around and even my pantry opening and closing. But when I ran out of my room, there was no one there. Also, sometimes in the kitchen late at night, I feel a small soft tug on my shirt or feel someone next to me. I'm not alarmed by the presence, however. It's odd, but I even feel calm and just understand someone is in the room with me until she decides to leave. I don't talk with her. I just do my thing while she does hers. The only creepy encounter I had with her was hearing a little girl's laughter when I was alone once. But there's another spirit here too. Periodically, I'll hear what I can only describe as a malicious munchkin type laugh very early in the morning in my room. It only seems to happen between three to 6 a.m. and only when I have all other lights out and my room is pitch black. Due to this, I always leave some light on and even play white noise when I sleep. 
But last night, my light and white noise machine got turned off by a storm. I woke up hearing that evil helium voiced laughter by my pillow. I jumped upright and the laughter intensified. Whatever it was then poked my leg like it was trying to annoy me. I turned a nearby flashlight on and it all stopped. The power then came back on and I went back to sleep with the light on. This entity seems to only be able to manifest in total darkness. When my room or my office has the lights out and I pass by late at night, I feel something in there, something malicious, something watching me in the shadows. Sometimes I'll even see movement when I feel bold enough to look into the dark room. So I had a best friend around the time of my early 20s. My friend and her mother moved into an apartment in a nearby town. Around one or two months after their moving, I was walking in the kitchen heading for the door. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw a figure of sorts, small and low to the ground, quickly pass by me. My first reaction was of it being their pet dog, a small dog, so out loud I called its name. I turned around to the direction I thought it head in and the dog was nowhere to be heard or seen. I believe I turned around way too quickly for the dog to have run out of sight. I'm not sure if that relates to what comes next, but it's of note. About a month later, month three post moving, my friend started telling me she would hear or see shadows in her apartment. I thought maybe my ghost dog story got her imagination going, but I did believe her as she was never one to talk about paranormal stuff. She was a bit freaked out. Shortly after, my friend started telling me her experiences. I was over their apartment and sitting at the kitchen table, waiting for my friend to be done with her shower. Her mother was home and sat down across the table from me. Her and I got along and all, but never really sat down to chat kind of relationship. So it caught me a little off guard that she sat to talk with me. She starts by saying she wants to tell me something in confidence as her daughter's good friend. Okay. She begins by telling me how my friend was also telling her mom about these experiences she'd have. Her mom admitted she pretty much brushed it off as being nothing, but noticed it was bothering her daughter. Then she went to the post office and went inside for service. Just like the movies, the small town clerk say something like, oh, you just moved here? Did you hear what happened where you lived? That kind of movie line, really? Apparently, a middle-aged male was arrested for child molestation charges. On the court date for his arraignment, he shot and killed himself at the house. The mom was now beside herself and afraid to tell her daughter. Not even a month later, they had packed up and moved out. I'll never forget it. So I got back home from school to find the front door was, un was locked. It was a mesh screen door so I could see inside it and saw that a key is still attached from the other side. So the way our door works is that the keys can only be attached on one side at a time. So if a key is still attached to one side of the door, you can't insert another key from the other side. So anyone who locked the door must have locked it from the inside and left the key there. Usually, our family always puts away the key after locking the door for the above reason. My family went out of town earlier in the morning. So I figured the only one home at the time was my grandpa. He's old and quite frail, so he rarely ever goes out. I thought he probably locked the door and went on to sleep or something. So I knocked, harder and harder while screaming to wake him up. He's hard of hearing. I kept trying that for about 15 to 20 minutes, but nothing. I'm starting to worry that something might have happened to my grandpa until he came up to our driveway. Turns out, He'd been out to the mosque for afternoon prayer. I was stumped. Turns out there'd been nobody home. The kicker was, 
He did bring a spare key, but we can't use it since there's a key still attached on the other side. My grandpa was as stumped as I am since he left the house only for 30 minutes and brought a spare key with him. There's absolutely no way to lock the door from outside and somehow leave the key on the inside. And there's absolutely no way my gramps could have locked it from the outside if there's still a key inside. The only way to lock it must have been from the inside. I ended up having to punch a hole through the door big enough for my arm to get in so I could turn the key from inside. So you might be wondering, isn't there any other way my grandpa could have gotten out of the house other than the front door? Yes, the garage door. But to go through there, you have to go through two locked doors, both of which my grandma didn't have keys to. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had to break the door to begin with. The window is also out of the way since why would an old man go through the window of his own house? Not that it's possible. Anyway, since all of our windows are barred to prevent burglars from entering. The only plausible explanation is that my grandpa didn't lock the door, but the door lock accidentally triggered when he closed it. But this had never happened before, nor since, so I doubt it. Husband, nine month old and I, sleeping in our bedroom and have experienced odd happenings over the last three weeks. I was asleep the first night, so was our baby in his crib. And husband was awake watching TV on his phone with headphones in. He heard a noise and took out the headphones. While this is happening, I'm having a nightmare that an evil presence is trying to get into our room. Husband hears loud tapping on the window and I wake up. I'm groggy as fuck and he asks, did you hear that? I nod my head because a noise woke me but I don't really know what the noise was. Remember, my dream was absolutely terrifying. So I wake up thinking it's not a dream and that something really is trying to get inside our room. My heart is pounding and I'm full of this depressing dread. Hubby gets up and looks out back the door window. Keep lights turned off. He grabs a knife from the kitchen and opens the door. There is nobody. Our husky is staring at the side of our house, fixated on something. But when husband goes outside, there's nothing there. He goes back inside and our baby is screaming and crying because he heard the noise as well. Our son sleeps through the night every night. We also sleep with a fan on full speed to create a sound barrier to help him stay asleep. Second time, several days later, I wake up to hubby opening our door and shining his flashlight on the phone into the living room. He kept hearing a thumping on the walls. Again, our son wakes screaming. Third time, I wake to the dog barking in our backyard and I hear a noise, but again, can't be sure what it was since I was asleep and I'm groggy as fuck. Husband was awake again watching TV and swears he heard a door open and shut in the living room, but the door was locked. Again, son wakes up crying. On Saturday, we put a 30 year old crucifix that was blessed in a church in Mexico in our room against the window where the knocking occurred and haven't had any disturbances since. I feel like there's still a muted, disturbing presence, but since pitting up the crucifix, I feel safe. I was in France with my family in the southern countryside in 2019, on holiday in the summer. I won't drag on with boring details, but we were staying in a two-story villa with a swimming pool that was enclosed by hedges on three sides, with a gap in one of the hedges to go back to the house and a fire pit just outside the house. Every night, we had to put a pool cover over the pool to stop leaves and whatnot from getting in. My dad told me it was my turn to put the pool cover on as he had done it the two nights previously. And I just finished unspooling the cover and dragging it across the pool very slowly. After I had finished, I was admiring the view from the poolside across the well-lit French terrain. It was around six, 
when my eyes dashed to the quick movement. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. I could see it running out of our neighbor's garden. Imagine a hairless dog with no head or defined paws, no mouth, eyes, or visible orifices. It had a skin tone like a white person, and it moved in bounding leaps, as a dog does at full sprints, but without the grace. It looked like a lot of skin toned fleshy cartilage, very smooth and without contour. It was about waist height of an average man from what I could see. I could see its stump, where a head should be on a dog, pointing diagonally up straight ahead of it, which didn't move while it was running. I had a clear side slash above view for about three or four long seconds, before logic kicked in and I realised that if it sensed I was there, I could be in possible danger. I was 15 at the time, I've always had perfect vision, and there was absolutely nothing obscuring it. I'm a sceptic, and even I couldn't justify what I had seen. My whole family didn't believe me, and basically called me crazy or tired, but I was wide awake and I know what I saw. Plus, our other neighbour's dogs, who were kept about a mile in the direction it was running, started barking later at about eight. Then we heard dogs barking further off in the distance at around nine. I talked to my neighbour directly opposite our villa, and she said she had no dogs. I talked to the neighbour with dogs about a mile up the road, and he said he hadn't seen anything. I've always been so fascinated with the paranormal, but never had any experiences. I'm from the Midwest, and one of the only things to do in the Midwest is just drive around the countryside. My friends and I did this aimlessly, and we had an obsession with cemeteries. We went to every cemetery we came across and found some absolute gems. One on a hill in a grassy field where the stones are not even visible, aside from brushing the grass apart beneath your feet. Another back in the woods with no markers across an old bridge. Just all kinds of spooky and quirky cemeteries. We had looked up local area haunted locations before, but no major sites that we could stomp around at and never experienced anything. We later go to college and still see each other on the weekends every other week or so. We always wanted to find one specific cemetery that is known to be haunted, but the location is kept secret. My buddy's friends at college actually found it and went. Turns out they have to list the cemetery in county directories. Anyway, he tells us he could take us there, so we go. We went to sunset and tried asking questions and recording and so on. This goes on for some time into the night. We don't take it very seriously, but still want to encounter something. One of my friends puts his cigarette out on a tombstone to elicit a response. Yes, it was stupid and we were childish. We ask another question and wait. It was dead silent. And then we heard the leaves crunching step by step from the darkness towards us. It sounds like someone is right in front of us, but we see nothing. We wait there, silently, frozen. Next came the most blood-curdling scream I have ever heard. We're in a bit of shock and the whole event still seems like I made it up in my mind when I reflect back on it. We slowly began walking and then eventually running as fast as we could towards the car without a word between us. I still think, what if it was a big cat or something? But where I live, they're pretty much unheard of. I've still never heard a scream like that to this day. It gives me chills just thinking about it. So I moved into my new house right as the pandemic started. It was pretty all right. Nothing was really off to me besides the initial offness of living in a new house. So now it's September and it's about 11 p.m. I don't usually fall asleep early and my parents knock out around nine. At the time I was calling some friends on Discord. All of a sudden, 
I hear this really loud crash in the room next to mine, my dad's office. I flinch and tell my friends about it, but before I could investigate, I hear my dad come out of the room. I assume he knocked something down while taking his meds. He's diabetic and needs insulin, so I brushed it off. It was still odd though, because he doesn't ever stay up late. At 1am, I hop off the call because I'm tired. I walk out of my room to use the restroom, just for me to see a random basket laying on the floor in the middle of his office. I was familiar with the basket, because he usually kept cotton pads in it, but it was weird that my dad, who loves to keep stuff organised, left it on the floor. I go back to my room, and as I try to fall asleep, I suddenly see the light around me darken and the overwhelming feeling of somebody standing behind me. Because my back was to the rest of my room, I immediately turn around in panic. I don't see anything though, and eventually fall asleep. The next day, I ask my dad about him knocking down anything, and he looks at me really confused. Apparently, he had heard the crash by my parents' room, which is on the opposite side of the hallway, and went out to investigate it, hence why I heard him moving around. I asked him about the basket, and he said that he found it on the floor too, and was confused as well. Considering how small it was, it sounded like somebody grabbed it and flung it into the ground aggressively. There was no real explanation as to how it could have landed where it did, because it was usually on my dad's desk across the room. We blessed the house, but I still have small odd things go on in my house sometimes. All three of these things happened simultaneously. I was just daydreaming when out of nowhere, I start to feel abnormally tired. Then the Alice in Wonderland syndrome kicked in and I felt like everything around me, both in real life and my daydream, was really small. It became so overwhelming that I had to close my eyes, which was when the hallucination kicked in. As soon as I closed my eyes, I had a hallucination that felt like a vision and it did a hallucination. I saw a man with white hair and a white beard riding a horse. Normally, I would see an image and that would be the end of it. But like I said, this felt like more of a vision. And for some reason, I instantly, I guess subconsciously, knew that the man on the horse was supposed to be me. I was then joined by a few other white haired men on horses. But here is where it gets weird. As I was having this hallucination, I had another hallucination over top of it at the same time. But this one was weird. It only lasted for an instant, like less than a second, maybe less than half a second. But I comprehended the entire thing in that short time. But since it happened so quick, I forgot some of the details. What I do remember is that it was me and some girl. No idea who she was is having the same hallucination at the same time and unlocking some kind of memory that connected the two of us. But what makes this hallucination so bizarre, besides overlapping another hallucination at the same time, was that I know I've had that conversation with that girl before, except I obviously never have. It felt like deja vu, but deja vu, as far as I know, occurs at the same time as an event causing it to feel like it's happened before. But I've never actually had that conversation. But I definitely remember having it, if that makes sense. I don't really believe in the paranormal, though I would like to believe it. So I guess that's why I'm really sharing this, hoping there's more to it than just my brain doing weird stuff. Despite the fact that I'm pretty certain that it was just wild and normal experience. So if anyone has some compelling thoughts, I would love to hear them. Paranormal or just normal? I had lived in an apartment that had recently become vacant. Anyway, I'm in my early 20s 
We're getting off work and of course we want a drink for the weekend. So my boyfriend is out picking up liquor and picking up a mutual friend of ours and I'm getting off of work. I worked at a pizza shop at the time, so I usually came home just stinking and wanted to shower. This time coming home, something was off. The place was ghetto, so the front door was a sliding glass door. To explain the layout, it was basically the first front of the apartment was the kitchen, and the living room and the second back part was the bedroom and the bathroom. The bedroom just being separated from the living room by a slatted sliding door. This time coming home from work, that door was open. Let me explain, I have seen ghosts all my life, but this was different. Adrenaline shot up my spine and my hair stood on end because there was someone in that doorway. Someone very tall, blonde with overalls. I'm now laughing at this Ace Ventura moment, screaming into the sliding glass door as I run away. I let a loud scream and get the fuck out to call the police. Tears forming. So pissed and scared someone was in my home. I was thinking, what am I going to say to the cops? Like I came home to find someone robbing my apartment. I had a shitty old flip phone, so even 911 can take a few moments to correct. I realized the person looked familiar, but how is that possible? I know this makes me slightly crazy, but I look inside and there's no one there. If it were a real human being, they would have had to have jumped out the two-story bathroom window. I saw Jerry. I took the apartment knowing he had died there of natural causes. I knew him while he was alive and he was seemed a decent guy. I originally gave him no thoughts because he was living there for months and without any experiences, none. I went in there and I said to him, hey, I know this is your first place bef before it was mine, but don't ever scare me like that again. Who knows, I probably startled him given the fact that I saw him in full form. Ever since then, I would feel acknowledgement that this from time to time, but I never saw him in the flesh again. I lived there for at least a year or so after that. I work at this camp in rural Alabama. My friend and I had just finished our shift, which ended at eight, and I needed to use the bathroom, so we went to the dorms. The building always seemed creepy to me. The best way I can describe it is it gives off really bad vibes, especially the right side. The first thing I see when I walk in is a creepy red light to the left, so I went right instead. I went into a room and shut the door. I tried locking it, but it wouldn't turn all the way. I didn't want to keep messing with it, so I just left it alone and went into the bathroom. Everything was fine for a few minutes until the lights started flickering. Immediately, I was trying to finish up as fast as I could and get out of there. Then they shut off completely. I'm freaking out at this point and I text my friend to tell him what's going on. He texts me back and says that someone is standing at the door to the main room staring at him. This makes me think that he's messing with me and I tell him to knock it off as it's not funny. But he's sending me pictures and videos of the building to show me he's not messing around. I get out of the bathroom and go up the door to try and lock it again. I turned it as hard as I could before it finally went all the way. After this, I start hearing loud banging coming from the main room. It wouldn't have been other staff because everyone had gone home at this point and there were no campus in the dorms at the time. I tell my friend to send more pictures to prove he's still in my car and he does. Now I'm crying because I'm too scared to leave the room and I just want to go home. I beg him to come inside and get me so I won't be in there alone. Eventually, we make it out to my car and I drive out there as quickly as I can. I tell him about the banging and he tells me the person he saw in the window had walked into the kitchen and that's probably where the noise was coming from. He said that the person he saw might have been the Navu girl. He says that everyone here knows about her, but doesn't remember what's happened to her. I try googling it, but the only thing that comes up is a parody Twitter account. After tonight, I'm never going in that building again.
So a few nights ago, I was going up to bed and my partner was asleep in the lounge. I tried to wake him up, but he wouldn't. So I just let him as he looked comfortable anyway. When I went upstairs, I laid in bed on Facebook for around 20 minutes. When I heard footsteps coming up the stairs and into our room that stopped at the door next to our bed. Me just thinking it was my partner, I looked to the side and saw someone standing there. More like a black figure. It was dark, I couldn't make out any features. And looked back at my phone, thinking nothing. Now, this is when it freaked me out. I was still thinking it was my partner, and I saw him walk down the hallway. I thought he was just going to the bathroom. But then the bathroom door never opened, and I never heard the toilet. When I sat up in bed, I could see straight down the hallway, and it was dark and quiet. At that point, I knew it wasn't my partner, because there's no way he would be in the bathroom without the lights on. I went back downstairs once I calmed down, and he was still asleep. Safe to say, I made sure I woke him up, and he checked all the rooms and closets upstairs, in case of an intruder, which wasn't the case. It was so weird, I can't stop thinking about it. And what brings me to tonight? It was less than an hour ago I was downstairs watching Netflix. Everyone is asleep upstairs and I'm the only one down here. When I hear something in the kitchen, right next to where I'm sitting. My kitchen, dining room and lounge are in the same room as it's an open plan living space. So I walked over to where the sound was coming from and it was a ball from one of my son's toys lightly bouncing. It was the sound a ball makes when you play table tennis, for example. It was one of those small plastic balls. I just picked it up and put it away. Didn't give it much attention. I checked to see if there was wind, but all the doors and windows are locked. Our house is only one year old, so I don't think a draft would have been the case. I'm not too sure though. I can't have the feeling that this is the start of something. I'm a member of an up-and-coming paranormal investigation team. We spend every other weekend investigating supposedly haunted locations for our YouTube channel. Our last investigation got a little bit dicey. We had selected an old tuberculosis hospital to spend the night in so we could run tests. Spirits box, Ouija board, ovulus, the works. Walking into the hospital, you could feel the weight in the air. It was like walking into a vat of syrup. Despite this, things were fairly normal for the first little while. We didn't get much of anything, and we were almost ready to pack it up and go home. Then, one of our investigators, who we had known would be there a little later, arrived. We'll call him Brian. The moment he stepped in the door, things got crazy. The first thing that we noticed was the sound of footsteps running in the hallway above us. It was a three-story building. No big deal, it could have been an animal. Then, a piece of glass fell from an exit sign above Brian's head. It came a few inches from cutting his head off. We finally decided to conduct one last dowsing rod session and get out of there. During this session, however, Brian's look began to turn. We didn't stop the session, but rather sent one of our other investigators over to check on him and see what was happening. Upon pulling up his shirt, we found a massive scratch running the length of his back. At that same moment, one of our dowsing rods bent. I'm not talking a small bend that bounced back either. It was a permanent bend in the metal that had definitely not been there before. We were all standing there as well, and the investigators holding the rods could not have bent them without us noticing. In fact, the investigator holding the rods and the one with the scratch both refused to ever investigate with our team again. They stopped investigating permanently. However, I've never seen a ghost do something that malicious. Could this even be a demon? For those who would like to see the video evidence, I'll link the video 
in the comments. So when I was a child, I'd always have recurring nightmares of a dark, misty form with red eyes that would slink out of my wardrobe if I left it open at night. As I got older and learned about sleep paralysis, I wrote these experiences off as that. But they would only happen if I left my wardrobe open and I was able to move during them. One night in particular, I remember the form coming out of my wardrobe and over the edge of my bed before seeming to grow and stretch over me on the ceiling, boring into me with those fiery, unblinking eyes. I remember grabbing my duvet around me and huddling against the wall beside my bed, trying to make myself as small as I could. I hadn't dreamed about the shadow in years, until a few months ago. I had a recurring nightmare of the shadow standing by my bed, looking down at me. It didn't come out of the wardrobe this time, but just materialized beside my bed and stood silent and unmoving for a few minutes before disappearing, leaving me unable to sleep. This happened for three nights in a row, and I told my sister about them because it had been so long since I had them. I woke up after the fourth night relieved to have gotten an uninterrupted night's sleep. When I woke up, my mom knocked on my door and came into my room to sit on my bed. She told me that my great aunt had passed the night before. My great aunt was an amazing lady who had led a wonderfully long and full life, but she lived on a different continent to us. And I had been the last person in my immediate family to see her before she died. I can't help but think that the shadow I saw was an omen of her death, or else it's just a massive coincidence. Has anyone else had any experiences like this? Do you think that the shadows I saw as a child were the same entity as the one I saw recently? I can't find a whole lot of info on shadow people, and when I do, a lot of it seems contradictory. I have a close, trusted friend whose family is of Native American slash Canadian descent. I think he said he was Che. I can't really remember, and it's too late at night to ask. His grandparents are full-blooded Native American and have passed down stories of skinwalkers and not deer. Not deer, a deer that are just not quite right. Like you'll notice the pupil is square or well, they'll be a little too tall or a little too humanoid. My friend is not scared of anything other than these legends. He shares frequent experiences of skinwalkers and not deer throughout his life. But here is the most recent one he's told me. He calls me and our group of friends from out at his grandma's house in the middle of nowhere, Midwestern USA. He sounds extremely panicked, saying he tried to call us all multiple times, but it wouldn't go through till now. I was driving through the dirt road by grandma's and I saw a deer in the road, right? I thought it was dead, but it wasn't. It looked back at me. Not in the deer in headlights way either. It was just like looking at me, like it didn't care. Did you check on it? Maybe it was hurt. No, I don't want to fuck with stuff like that. I just went around it, but here's the fucked up part. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry, I'm so scared, bro. It's okay, dude, what happened? We'll stay on the phone with you. <sighs> there were more of them, probably 30 deer, all laying down like they were dead, farther down the road, but they were all alive. I didn't see any gunshot marks or any reason they'd be doing that. They didn't move or react to my car, even honking. Some popped their heads up and just looked at me but didn't move. I don't know guys, I don't like this. And I couldn't get signal and it was so dark. At this point, none of us really had any explanation. We were just like, that's really weird. 
and stayed on the phone with him till he got back to the city we all lived in. He didn't end up continuing down the path, pulling around and going another direction. I dreamt of my grandma for a full year after she passed away. Sounds far-fetched, right? Yeah, I'd find that hard to believe, but I dreamt of her every single night for a full year. In those dreams, we would always have conversations and I could never remember what we talked about. It was always vague and I always woke up extremely sad. My very last dream was the most vivid dream. It was a sunny day and I remember walking towards the back of my grandparents' house where the clothesline and fruit trees were. Before reaching the back, I passed by our cabin on the property and walked through a narrow walkway that opens up in the backyard. I remember seeing my auntie as I walked up to her. She nodded and he her head like, look ahead. Right there in the middle of the backyard was my grandma, sitting with her legs folded, sewing. Just how I would always find her coming home from school. Anyways, I also noticed how incredibly bright and sunny it was. I could actually feel the warmth all around me and it was so bright, blindingly bright. And another thing, she was surrounded by the most beautiful garden I had ever seen. I remember the colors being so vivid, the greenery just surrounded her. She looked at peace and I truly believe she was in heaven. I remember feeling so much sorrow. I had a million things I wanted to say to her because I knew that this was not real. But all I could manage with tears running down my face was, she misses you, you know? She replied, I know, I miss her too. Then she said, you have to let me go. For context, we were talking about my baby, her favorite and closest great grandchild. I woke up after that and realized I had been crying in my sleep. The sorrow was so overwhelming, I didn't stop crying for a while. Deep down in my heart, I know that that was a goodbye from her. I never dreamt of her again for a long time. That was the only conversation in all my dreams I remember word for word. I know 100% without a doubt she was telling me to let her go and goodbye. I kept meaning to ask my auntie if we shared the same dream. Whenever I think to bring it up, it slips my mind. Well, here it goes. This was in winter 2017 in Alexandra Park, London, England. When coming back from a friend's house, I got dropped off in my mate's car by the bus stop between Grove Park and Alexandra Palace at around 1 a.m. And I heard some people shouting and celebrating pretty loudly. I was taken aback because you'd expect to see a large group of people around from how loud it was, but I couldn't see anyone around me or at the palace. Anyhow, I continued on my way home down the alleyway that cuts through the Duke's Avenue when I happened to bump into a good friend of mine on a bench. He's a bit of a stone loner that smokes in random places at night. And he asked me if I'd heard those weird noises of those people, and so we listened to them carefully. It was immediately clear that these noises of these people weren't in any language that I've ever heard before. It didn't sound like foreign voices either. They sounded very English, but in some very strange old language. What was spooky is their voices were so clear in what they were saying, like it was a theater, and each voice would come in and say different things. Like one was the voice of a young lady, then a boy, and then they would let each other take turns in speaking in their own critique. There must have been about five different voices we heard. And another strange thing was a moment it surrounded like they were running down a hill towards us. Walling and it would echo under the bridge really close. Then it would be far away in an instant. My friend said that he had heard this same noise for the last couple of nights or so. He was thinking that maybe something happened there a long time ago. It was very strange, but not really too scary. And it sounded like these people were celebrating and having fun. To this day, I don't know what it was. It could have been people in the park that we couldn't see, but I'm not sure. Just noises, 
We're coming from, there's a small bit of woodlands. And then Alexandra Palace, which is locked up at 1 a.m. So is the gym and spa that it backs up onto. Anyway, that's my experience. Let me know what you think. A bit of background regarding myself. I'm a progressive Muslim living in Malaysia, a country stuck between being progressive and conservative when it comes to religious beliefs. And as a child, I didn't always care. So anyway, I was 10 during the time, and usually in my country's education system, we would receive textbooks that were loaned by the schools. These textbooks are often held by previous students of the same school, and when they're done with the book, another student will receive it. I received mine from a student who, by the time, had passed away. I didn't think much about it and used the textbooks as usual. By usual, I meant that as a 10-year-old kid, I would doodle on it and draw moustaches on random portraits of people. I did this to a religious education book and drew satanic horns on a famous Islamic figure's portrait. What happened next scared and scarred me for life. It was just me alone in the classroom after school hour as I drew those horns and fangs on him. A gust of wind blew over and the pages of the book were turned. I went back to the page where I was doodling and I was shocked to see the page ripped and missing. I closed the book and reopened it and to my surprise, it was there and it was intact. It looked like it hadn't been touched, like brand new. I was creeped out and closed the book and reopened it again and this time, as I turned to the same page again, the portrait of that person was altered to the point it looks like someone drew a demonic entity over it. It had the typical look of a demon, that's what I could say. I grabbed the book and threw it into my locker, locked my locker and never went back to my locker ever again. I went to an Islamic education teacher, an Ustaz, and he told me that I should never do that again. He did some work, I guess in exorcism, and that was the end of it. Lessons I learned, not to vandalize random stuff. You could be fined and sent to detention, or worse, ending up getting the biggest scare of your life. This has been going on for months and it's freaking me out. Over the months, strange shit has happened while I'm trying to sleep. Every night, my bed will randomly shift and my foot will feel like it's being crushed, as if something decided to take a seat on my bed and just watch me. I've heard whispers and sniffing as if the entity has a pet dog. I always feel like I'm being watched. My room is in the basement and in the house. In the basement, the only thing that ever makes sound in the middle of the night are the pipes and the vents. There should be no reason for the washer changing setting, which can only be done by dials, or something smacking the water heater loud enough for me to hear a clear ding, or even a random shit falling over or off shelves. I've lived in this room for two years now, and this only started nine months or so ago. But the worst part happened yesterday. I suffer from paranoia, so these past months I just chalked it up to me being paranoid. Until yesterday, at 10am I got out of bed, got dressed, and after I got up the stairs to get breakfast, I heard a clear adult female voice from a few feet away say yeah he's awake. It couldn't have been my mom because she was at her business and she's the only woman in our house. Fuck that. No, I wasn't hallucinating. I never have before. And I was wide awake by the time I left my room, just like always. My family thinks I'm crazy and haven't heard or seen anything. Clearly she likes me. Why else would she be excited about me being awake? So she's not really a threat, at the moment at least. But it's still fucking creepy. How do I get it to stop? It's freaking me out. I'm fine if she stays, so long as I get her to stop being so creepy. My friend told me I should talk to her, but fuck that shit. This is terrifying. 
What if I say something that makes her mad? I share room with power tools and saws and shit. She's most active at night. That one time at 10 a.m. was the only time she's done anything with it when it was bright out. Twenty odd years ago, I lay in bed at an old mansion converted into a hotel. I was the caretaker and the only person in the building. I stayed in the old servants annex, which was down a long dimly lit corridor. As I lay half asleep, I heard deliberate evenly paced footsteps walking towards my room at the bottom of the corridor. It was strange because instead of feeling frightened or alarmed, I just lay there and calmly listened to the footsteps grow louder with each step. My heart didn't skip a beat when I heard the handle turn on my door, even when it opened after I felt sure I had locked it. The door slowly creaked open and still I lay there, not feeling any sense of curiosity as who just entered my room. I just blankly stared at the ceiling as if in a lucid dream. The man made his way to my bedside with the same evenly paced, steady gait. It's really strange as I had a conversation with this entity, but I only remember it feeling like lying on a psychiatric's chair, as if under some hypnosis. I have no recollection of the subject matter at all. Our talk reached its natural conclusion. All the while, I didn't notice look in its direction. Not out of fear, but rather I didn't have a notion to move an inch. At this point, I felt a foreboding dread as if somehow I had snapped out of a trance, but still I didn't move. I felt his presence rise and move toward my face. It felt like he wanted to kiss me goodbye. It closed my eyes as I felt a weight push upon my lips. It wasn't sexual. In fact, it felt slightly aggressive as the pressure started to push my head back into the pillow. I was now starting to feel a bit panicked as my neck started to stiffen in an attempt to resist the increasing weight pushing down on my face. Just to the point I thought my neck would surely snap, it stopped and I was released. I lay there for I don't know how long, but when I finally moved to look around my room, there was no one there. Throughout my life, I have always moved homes, schools and suburbs, which has never been a problem. However, one particular house my mother and I moved into, I would regularly encounter a girl covered in blood. To elaborate, I'm now 18 and would have been five or six at the time we moved into the property. One afternoon, my mother and I were sitting in the lounge room watching kids cartoons and eating popcorn I had been seated for a while and really needed to go to the bathroom. As I walked from the lounge room to the bathroom, I noticed the linen cupboard had been left open, but only slightly. On approach to the cupboard, I remember feeling quite nervous, but confident to find out what was inside of the cupboard. To my surprise, there was nothing in the cupboard, but there was a space big enough from the floor to the next shelf allowing me to fit quite comfortably in the cupboard. Being five and having the worst attention span, I decided to play with my truck in the linen cupboard. I'd been sitting in there and playing for what felt like forever with my truck until a very petite, miserable looking girl appeared across from me in the cupboard. I was ultimately quite confused and didn't know who the girl was, but had a sense of comfort and security when she was with me. After sitting and just staring at this girl, I quickly came to realize she was covered in blood from head to toe. We both looked up and she began to cry and slowly tell me details about her father did some horrible things to her, which I prefer not to share, and ultimately ended up murdering her in the house. I would regularly try and clean her blood with tissues, towels and other absorbent materials, but never had any luck. The interaction didn't last too long as my mother called me back to the lounge room, 
that after meeting her once, we spent numerous occasions in that cupboard comforting one another and we became quite close friends. However, I am now wondering whether the spirit genuinely did want my help and was trying to take advantage of me due to my age at the time. This was in 2014 or 15. My girlfriend and I were staying in a hotel called Stay On Main. I only learned later about the hotel's history. I only stayed there because it was cheap. That place was freaky as fuck. But anyway, I digress. My girlfriend and I were walking to a parking structure where our car was because we planned on going to Disneyland. As we were walking there, my girlfriend noticed a shortcut to the car down an alley. My instincts told me no, let's just walk around since it's a nice day outside anyway. She insisted. Fuck it, let's go. Soon as we turned into the alley, I noticed right away that a man in a hoodie quickly turned and followed us down the alley as soon as we went. I told my girlfriend under my breath, don't freak out, but we're being followed. I told her to run and get help while I fight him off. As we started to pick up our pace to create distance from him, I noticed that this alley is a dead end. There's no way out but to go back from where we came. The man was closing distance on us, had his hands in his pocket, hoodie pockets by the telly. I make a fist with my keys as I turn around to face him ready to fight. We pass a dumpster. I swear to fucking God, guys, two men in perfect business suits with briefcases say good morning and pass us walking very fast. They popped us out of nowhere. They had black sunglasses, were white, and at least six feet tall. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't give him the greeting of the day back. I was in shock. This man that was following us had turned around and sprinted out of the alley. My girlfriend and I followed the two suits out of the alley back to the public streets. Hoodie guy was nowhere to be seen. But then we somehow lost the two men in suits. I swear to God, they saved my life and my girlfriend's now wife. I'm convinced they were angels who protected us from a potential tragedy. I still give my wife shit till this day about taking that shortcut through the alley. In the summer of 1985, I was at Azalea Trails Girl Scout Camp in the San Gorgonio Mountain Pass. My group's leader had moved us from our original campsite one night into a clearing in the forest. We slept in camping bags and had a campfire that night. My girlfriend and I woke first the next morning, so we were the only ones awake when this happened. Note, she asked me about my recollection later while we were reunited in junior college. I guessed to see if mine matched hers. It did. Within minutes, there was a light pink craft hovering directly above us, silently circling the clearing. It was dome-shaped and flared out at the bottom. It was so close, so close that I could see its silver shiny windows and lights below it. I had the distinct feeling that whatever was inside was cognizant of us watching. We didn't think to grab a camera or wake the others. I think we were stupefied, transfixed. We watched for about 20 minutes. Then something even stranger happened next. The pink craft left as silently as it appeared. And from the space it flew into, we saw, way above, another craft shooting out of the morning sky. We thought it was going to crash as we watched it just fly or fall into the forested area to our right. So we hunkered down, put our hands over our heads and got ready for impact. But nothing happened. Nothing. It was shaped completely different than the first time, like a puffy jet plane. It was silvery, sparking, like it was made out of lights. It was then that the rest of the kids woke up. When I got home from camp, I learned that my maternal grandfather had died. And try as I might to get my parents to listen to me about this incident, they were pretty distracted. 
I must have been talking about it a lot though, as I remember my mom having a private talk with me about keeping the story to myself that other people wouldn't understand. Since then, I've started my own family and every member has a UFO story. They seem to follow us. Me and my two friends were coming home from a movie and they were about to drop me off at my house. It was around midnight and we were just down the road from my house and at the entrance of my neighborhood, we saw a person. It looked like someone was out walking. Who would be doing that at midnight? Anyway, one of my friends said, watch them not be there when we get up there or something along those lines. The person turned and started walking back up the road towards where the houses would be. There's a line of trees blocking the road. So as soon as the person turned and walked back up the road, we could no longer see them. Also, on the other side of the entrance, across from the trees, there's a graveyard. Once we got to the entrance, which was only like a five second drive, we no longer saw the person. We were all tripping out because not only did one of my friends call that he wouldn't be there, there was also nowhere that they could go except up the road. The only other way they could have disappeared that fast is if they darted into the trees. We pulled into my driveway and we all started talking about what we saw. One of my friends said they saw someone dressed in blue. The other said it looked like a construction worker vest. I saw a hooded figure dressed in black, not like the Reaper, more like a jogger with a hoodie on. Once we all said what we saw and confirmed no one was lying, we got even more confused because there's no way we all seen something different. Later that night, I was wondering what it could have been. Eventually, I fell asleep and for the first and only time ever, I'm not kidding, I had sleep paralysis. I woke up to see a figure dart across the side of my bed, then the front of my bed, then it went on the ceiling, then jumped down at my face and after that, I snapped out of it. The figure didn't look like anything but a black blob. But what freaked me out even more is that I'm the only one who saw the person at the entrance of the neighborhood as a black figure. I still have no idea what it was to this day. Nothing has ever happened after that. Right, so how do I start this? Well, I'm a non-believer in paranormal activity, but what's happened to me over the past three months has changed that. I live in a sleepy village in the UK, which had a dark past with murders and such. About a year ago, my next door neighbor died and his dead body was left to rot in a chair since his family never visited. I was quite close to him and when I found out, it hurt. After a few months, the house got cleaned out by the family and the chair that he died in got put into the back garden. I can clearly see from my bedroom window. I was talking to one of the people who live the other side of the street to me and they said they had seen a white figure sat in the chair. I thought nothing of it since I didn't think ghosts or spirits existed. And this kept happening until the chair got taken away by the council. And yet still, even though the house was empty and no one had access, I still heard banging and what sounded like voices from inside the house as it connected to my room. And I thought it was just my mind playing tricks on me. Skip a few weeks and some new people moved in and I started to get along with them. And earlier tonight, I was sat in my garden with their cat called Oliver. The two from the house came out and said they were going for a meal and no one else was in the house so asked if I could keep an eye on the cat. I said yes and they left. About 20 minutes later, I went to check on the cat and it was fine. I sat with it for about 10 minutes and I kept hearing banging from inside the house from the front room. I started to think about it and how similar it was to what I was hearing when the house was empty. 
This then was backed up when I heard an extremely loud bang from outside the house, which my parents also heard. This has well and truly got to me at this point, since this has happened over a few months. So I just thought I would share my story. So, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, after re-watching The Woman in Black 2. I know, horrible thing to start with. Ever since I was really little, I was really fascinated, intrigued, obsessed, however you'd classify it, with stories about British kids who were sent away during World War I. Can't explain it. Narnia, Peter Pan 2, random stories I'd find in the library, etc. I just was always drawn to these stories. I also remember playing with my friends and sister, and my imaginary play always went to, we're kids, but we were sent away from our parents, so we have to take care of each other. And maybe that could have been just from what I was watching, I really don't know. I have also always had dreams plenty often, less often now that I'm older, but recently have started up again, of being bombed. Like, I'll see planes flying and hear the bombs drop from the sky. It's always dusty and I'm running and I feel little. I always feel lost and helpless. Like when I'd lose my mom in the store when I was six years old. It's that same kind of bottomless pit feeling. And when I was younger, if I heard or saw a plane flying low, we lived by a private airport so it wasn't uncommon. I'd always be anxious until they were out of sight just in case they dropped a bomb. I'm from Texas and was born in 1998. In no way have I ever seen a bomb or been near one or anything like it. It's just this deep rooted fear that I have no idea where it came from. Not from any past trauma, in this life anyway. And it was never a fear that they'd crash or anything like that. It was always, they're the bad guys and any second a bomb will fall. Super specific. I don't know. I've just been thinking of this a lot recently. I don't even know if I believe in past lives, but let's just say they are real. Could I find out more about it? Is that even what this is? Or am I just looking for something that isn't there? Around here on a calm day, you might hear the guns from Fort Bragg going off. So most of us are used to hearing and feeling a bang every now and then. Sometimes though, we get an explosion that hits and when it does, the windows will rattle and you're confronted with the thought that the end of the world just started. But when you run outside, there's nothing. No smoke, no fire, just calm. That's when you know you've been introduced to what we call the Seneca guns. It gets its name from the same sound heard around, but they've been heard all around the world and has many different names. Some say it's just the military testing missiles in high atmosphere explosions, or a sonic boom from a fighter jet. Some even say it's a meteor exploding in the atmosphere. Whatever it is, it's been heard long before settlers came here. In fact, the Native Americans said it was the sound of the Thunderbird flapping its wings to take flight. Sometimes, if you're at the beach and one hits you, you might see an orange ball of light sitting just above the water soon after. Many have said to have seen it. Around here, you might see a green glowing mist coming from the woods. If you look real hard, you might see a figure in that mist just walking around trying to find its way through the brush. This story really isn't too scary. In fact, it's more of an offer of wonder yet to be explained. But if you ever hear it, you might understand just how scary it is to live with it every day. There's no warning, no known trigger that causes it. It just happens. A boom so loud your very soul can feel it. A boom that some say comes from the depths of hell. Maybe it's just a weather anomaly. Maybe it's just an atmospheric disturbance. Maybe it's the devil slamming the door to hell 
after taking another soul. We may never know what it is. Them woods hide a many a dark secret. Some we may never understand. I grew up in rural North Carolina. I lived up in the woods where there used to be a water mill. A family lived there back in the 40s. The parents had two daughters and one son. Unfortunately, one of the daughters got caught under the water wheel and drowned. Ever since I've been a kid, I always heard humming and low singing in the woods when I was out tromping them. But the one thing that really scared me one night it was when I was older. I worked for the sheriff's office and I had left work early one night due to being over a lot of hours. So I got home around 2.30ish. And when I pulled up, I saw the figure of a little girl standing right beside my garage. And when I got out of my car, she was gone. The next experience I had was when I was out hunting in the same woods. It was super quiet. A beautiful fall evening. I had just got down into my stand when all of a sudden I started hearing the same humming and singing I heard multiple times over the years. But I heard what sounded like someone walking towards me. I looked everywhere and couldn't see anything. And I heard a laugh, but not the same laugh as before. So as I was climbing down my tree stand, a rock hit my boot. And once again, I heard the laughing. Now mind you, the area I was hunting was about three miles deep in the woods where there was no one around. So I brought my brother and cousin and a few friends down there one night and we were just gonna sit and listen and see if we could hear anything or whatever. We were down there playing cards, joking about it. When all of us heard what sounded like someone that was in the distress we all went quiet and listened, and we could hear what sounded like someone breathing heavily. And the thing that confused me about that night was that if it was a little girl or something more dark, sometimes I think things are better left alone. A few months ago, my mom went to a spa. We're neighbors, so most nights we'll have a little hangout together, have a catch up, etc. under the night sky. Me and my mom have always had a fascination with aliens, UFOs, etc. Her having a first hand experience when she was younger, something a little wilder than this, but that's another story. But the first time we saw these lights was still insane to experience first hand. Now, it's a nightly thing. I think there's only been a handful of times we haven't seen anything. So let's get into it, because I'd love to know if anyone else has had the same sightings. When we first noticed these distant, bright moving lights, I said, it's probably a satellite. That's until they started doing maneuvers. We were shocked at how fast they were moving often slowing down only to quickly zip forward or backward, sometimes in a zigzag motion across the sky, often small but exaggerated, occasionally very wide movements up and down. On one occasion, we saw two light sources almost chasing one another, occasionally speeding up and doing complex maneuvers, darting across the sky, disappearing then reappearing. I would have continued to shrug these off as satellites if it weren't for their speed, movements, patterns, etc. On one occasion, I spotted one that seemed to have multiple light sources. This will be hard to explain, but almost as if I had multiple lights all around it that would turn on and off in different spots. These lights were still far enough away that they could be shrugged off as stars but the movement of the lights on and around it was still noticeable, even without, without my glasses on. I know this isn't anything wildly out there, 
So I'd love to hear if anyone else has had similar experiences. My ex, his brother and I, decided to have a day trip in a small area called Legion Campground in Tuella Canyon, Utah. We'd camped there for a couple nights before and nothing weird happened. Well, aside from waking up to a cow trying to charge at my dog, there was only one entrance to the trail. This day, there were no parked cars aside from our own, so I know for a fact we were the only ones there. As soon as we get out of the car onto the trail, I feel like we're being watched. So right off the bat, I warned them something is off. Don't disturb anything. There are a few Native American tribes that consider areas of Utah sacred land. Anyway, here's where it gets freaky. It's scary silent. We can see wind going through trees, but no sound, not even birds. X was up front, his brother right behind, and I was in the back. We were coming to the spots where there was normally a creek, but it was all dried out. We were all expecting to have, a, have to maneuver east and cross where the embankment wasn't so deep. My ex didn't believe in the paranormal, so I was thinking, okay, what's got him stopping in his tracks? He just froze. About 50 feet away, we see a crouched black figure. We first, of course, tried to pin down what animal it could be. It wasn't identifiable and moving away from us. The black figure quickly changed shape to have long limbs, almost like Slenderman that's allowed it to stretch, step across the embankment. Without a sound of an animal hitting the ground after a leap, not a rock out of place. By this time, we're stepping backwards, but still bewildered. This moment was about 10 seconds long, but it felt like time had slowed. As we watched, it got on all fours, and we could see a long skinny tail and feline-like ears. It walked a few steps on all fours, then changed its form to look like a bear and ran until no longer in sight. All I could think about to explain what we saw was matching the description to a skinwalker. Creepy as hell. Haven't been there since. To preface, my dad was a staunch believer in UFOs, aliens, anything paranormal. He figured we, my two younger brothers and I, needed to know about this stuff, so he told us all kinds of stories growing up. It scared the shit out of all of us and still affects us to this day. We're all in our 30s now. When I was in my late teens or early 20s, I lived with my dad. He lived in a trailer that was three bedrooms. I smoked cigarettes at the time, and the rule was that I was allowed to smoke in the living room at night, but not in my room because the smoke would make it to his room and wake him up. That's important for later. He had built a three-way bunk bed for us that was still in the house. The middle bunk faced out from the other two, and there was about three to four feet space under it. That was my bunk. It was situated in such a way that if I was laying on my back, the door was directly behind my head with just enough room for the door to close. I hope I'm painting the picture right. Anyway, one night I'm watching TV in my room. It's late, so I turn everything off and lay down to sleep. I don't recall how long until I heard the noises. I begin to he hear what sounds like footsteps go up the hallway behind me, back and forth, back and forth. Then, light tapping on the walls along with the footsteps. Then they stop directly behind me in the doorway to my bedroom. Then I hear something run into my room and under my bed. To say I was terrified is an understatement. I wanted my dad awake, but was too scared to yell or anything like that. So I grabbed my pack of cigarettes from the TV stand that was close enough to the bed I didn't have to move much. I lit up and started blowing the smoke into the hallway. Luckily, my dad woke up yelling at me for smoking in my room. The next day, I explained why I smoked in my room, and he was fine with it, but didn't understand why I was scared. That was my dad, though. <laughs> to this day, I can still remember that night like it was yesterday.
So I was a freshman in college and I was going camping with some people I had just met. We were going to a mountain where I'd been camping many times before. We got there at 1 p.m. and set up camp. It slowly gets dark and I get more and more drunk, well, not too drunk. At this point, we're all gathered around the fire playing charades. It's around 10 p.m. Our campsite is among the trees and there's a large hill about 20 feet behind us. I have to pee, so I get up and start walking up the hill so that I can pee on the other side of it. The moon is nearly full and I can see perfectly fine. I get to the top of the hill and begin to walk down the other side, which is a grassy clearing that meets up with the tree line again. The juice. Right as I'm pulling my pants down, I look at the tree line and freeze because there was a figure standing there about 20 feet away from me. At this point, I'm so drunk that things are spinning, but I realize that what I'm seeing is not normal and I get a grip. I try and look at it and this is what I remember. It was standing on two legs and its entire body was white. It was definitely facing me and looking at me, but I couldn't see its face exactly. It had a larger head. It was so white that it was almost glowing in the moonlight. I honestly don't know how long I stood there and stared at it, but it was a while because I was so in shock. Then it turned around and returned into the forest, still walking on two legs. I ran back to the fire and told everyone what had happened, but I didn't want to sound crazy, so I tried to be calm and nonchalant. Everyone was so drunk that we all brushed it off and forgot about it 10 minutes later. I even forgot about it until a month later when those memories hit me. And it's been on my mind ever since. It's really made me question my beliefs about the unexplained. What could it have been? Has anyone had similar experiences? This happened in Southern Arizona. I need some help figuring out what is going on in my house. About a year and a half ago, I moved into an older home out in the country with a friend from college. We have bedrooms that share a wall. Ever since we've moved in there, there have been strange instances. During the day, we'll get weird feelings that something is watching us. We'll hear footsteps upstairs and things will be moved around or knocked over in the kitchen. About six months in of us living together, her boyfriend moved in and I started staying over at my boyfriend's more often. At this point, I would notice when I got home my TV was on. It's always off when I leave in the morning for work. I don't sleep with it on. And a decorative box I have under the TV unit is always shoved to the back end of the shelf. My friend said she started noticing in the mornings that I was gone that she would hear movement in my room with the closet and dresser doors opening, clothes shifting, as if I was there. It seems as though something was mimicking the sounds I would make in the mornings as I was getting ready for work. A few weeks ago, her and her boyfriend were gone for the weekend and I had the house to myself. The house cat was also gone for the weekend. I was woken up in the middle of the night. I'm not sure what time it was, but I felt the cat jump onto bed with me by my feet and started kneading the bed as she usually would. It wasn't until I reached down to pet him and found that nothing was there to realize he wasn't even in the house. We've also seen a man in random areas of the house, usually upstairs in one of the guest rooms or walking into a bathroom. I only caught glimpses of him and he's always walking into a room when we catch him and he's gone when we go to investigate. Do you guys think this stuff is related to each other? Any ideas what this could be? We live in a rural area out in the country in Illinois. We've been told there were Native Americans that used to inhabit the property. I'm not sure if that gives any clues. Any comments would be helpful. So I just woke up out of a dead sleep. It's exactly 2 a.m. I was dreaming of a woman sitting outside of my window. She got in. 
She toyed with me like a sick game of hide and seek until she pinned me against my exit door. I woke up terrified and waited for shadows out of my window. I walked down the hall to pee and couldn't shake this feeling of being watched. I rationalized my fear as I checked the house. Everything was fine. Ello is safe, cats were normal. Still, I couldn't shake this creepy feeling and it was intensifying. I woke up my partner who saw that I was visibly panicked, shaking and tears running down my cheeks. He got up and bravely walked with me down the house. Nothing was visibly wrong, but one step into the front bedroom felt like a wrecking ball to the gut. I felt like I had the wind knocked out of me and my whole body turned into goose pimples, or chicken skin, if you will. I felt like I had passed a threshold where I wasn't welcome. We had a little bit of sage, so my partner started smudging the house while I meditated. He started in the bedroom and I stood in the hallway, directing the energy to an open window and blocking access to the back of the house. I felt every second of this spirit passing through my body to cross the hallway. My skin visibly stood on end, raising and settling at the same time like a slow motion shiver. I've never had such an intense feeling. I'm not even sure how to describe it. Heavy? Large? Weighty? Those seem like words. My partner followed behind the energy and we coaxed it out of the window. I closed it and he continued to sage the rest of the house. He felt something too, but whatever it was, it's gone now. I don't have that intense feeling anymore, but I do think I'm going to watch a little Bob's Burgers before I try to sleep again. I didn't know that's what it was called until much later. I was living in a house in Laguna Beach that had been there since the 1920s. Its history had been a speakeasy, a brothel, and a house for smuggling illegal immigrants. One day, my new wife and I were arguing. I can't even recall what it was about. She walked down the block to get a cup of coffee and cool off, and I was alone in the house. The way the place was built was incredibly haphazard. There was a bedroom and living room on one side, then a bathroom with two entrances. On the other side of the bathroom was a hallway that had windows on one side and two bedrooms on the other. I could look across the hall into the bathroom from my bedroom, then through the bathroom and down the other hall. I was standing at my dresser and I just noticed movement out of the corner of my eye and looked down there. There was, and honest to God, this gives me goosebumps just typing it 17 years later, a black figure. It was maybe three feet tall and it was only vaguely humanoid. It looked like black scribbles, like someone had scribbled a human shape, but the scribbles moved, like electricity arcing. That's the best way to describe it. There was no sound that I could remember. I distinctly remember when I saw it, I wasn't afraid, just like, what the fuck? Then it noticed me looking at it. I can't say it turned around, it just focused on me, I guess. Then I was scared. I didn't move, didn't scream, nothing. I was just frozen because it just fucking came at me. It rushed down the hall towards me. I have no idea what it intended, but as soon as it entered the bathroom, the door closest to me just slammed shut on it. I screamed. I yelled for my wife. She wasn't home. I went the fuck outside, into the daylight, and didn't go back in until she got home about 10 minutes later. This was like 12 years ago. I was in eighth grade and for my biology class, our teacher told us that we were going to build an aquarium. So she assigned each student what we would bring to the next class. They told me to bring a turtle and I did. One day before aquarium day, my mom, against her will, went to the pet store and brought me a cute little turtle and a fish tank for it. 
I didn't pay much attention to it at the moment. I only fed it at night and that was it. So the next day, we were all at school with things from the aquarium and other animals. Only for our teacher to tell us that the coordination didn't approve the aquarium project. That meant I had a new turtle friend. So I looked at it for a few seconds and said, Hi, now I think I have to give you a name. I looked at it a little more and thought, You look like a Patricia. I don't know, that was the first name that crossed my mind. And I didn't even know if the turtle was female. After that, I didn't think about it for the rest of the morning. At noon, I was sitting there with the turtle on the fish tank, both waiting for my dad to pick us up when these two girls passed in front of me and one of them got really excited for the turtle. So she came up to me and the other girl just followed her. She asked me if she could touch it and I said yes. And then she asked what name it was and I thought of Patricia, but I still wasn't convinced. So I told her that I hadn't chosen any. She then looked at her friend, who was very quiet and expressionless, and asked her what name she'd put to the little turtle. And this serious girl looked at it for a few seconds and only said, Patricia. I thought, what the fuck? And told her that was funny because I was also thinking of the same name. Then she looked at me, still expressionless and said, this turtle looks like a Patricia. And again, I thought, what the fuck? And I said, well, it looks like Patricia will be. The other girl smiled at me and then they left. I felt so weird for a few seconds. It was crazy that that girl had the same thought of me. I don't know. When I was in my early 20s, my brother and his then girlfriend, now wife, and I used to go ghost hunting in the Pittsburgh area on our nights off. One night, we decided to go to our local battlefield, Bushy Run. It's maybe one in the morning. We park our car in the lot and run across the street through the field to a spot that has some benches and a memorial. The area is maybe 75 yards to the tree line of the woods. My sister-in-law brought a tape recorder so that we could do some EVPs. So we sat down and started asking your typical questions. Is anyone with us? Did you fight in the war, etc.? When we heard a noise that I can best describe as a bird mixed with a horse neighing, kind of high-pitched and sing-songy, coming from inside the woods. We all stopped and turned to the tree line and tried to see if there was an animal or something, but couldn't see anything. It then happened again, but louder and closer. We were starting to get freaked out because we all grew up in the southwestern Pennsylvania our whole lives, and we never had heard an animal, or anything that matter, that sounded like this. After another moment, we hear the noise again, but it's right at the tree line this time. After that third time, we heard what sounded like hundreds of horses running full speed from the tree line directly at us. We all shot up and hauled arse to the car as quickly as we could. Once we got in, we were all looking at each other like, what the fuck just happened? When we remembered the tape recorder, my sister-in-law rewinds it to press play we hear ourselves talking and right before that first bird or horse noise, the tape cuts out and then picks back up again as we were running to the car. Not sure if we accidentally turned it off and back on again, or if something interfered with the recording, but the whole interaction was missing. I asked her if she still has the tape, but that was 10 plus years ago, so probably not. That was definitely the most frightening and unexplainable thing that we encountered on our ghost hunting days. I had two crazy encounters when I was about four years old. I'm 24 now, and I still think about them all the time. The first encounter was when I was in bed trying to sleep. Suddenly, a human-like figure rose from the floor and stood there just looking at me from the end of my bed. It was short, like, like a child. I got the feeling that he was a boy. I got scared and sort of was screaming for my mom. She came into my room to get me and she took me to her room to sleep in between her and my dad so that I would feel better. The same exact figure rose from the floor 
at the end of their bed too. I started screaming again, so my mom picked me up and started taking me back to my room. As she carried me down the hallway in her arms, I began seeing the figure following behind her. It was scaring me so much that I kept screaming and started thrashing around in her arms. She placed me back in my bed and left the hallway light on as a nightlight to calm me down. I didn't see the figure ever again after that. The second encounter that I had was not too far apart from the night of the first one. I got up in the middle of the night looking for a pack of cheese crackers. Four year old me's favorite snack, lol. I was in the kitchen climbing up on a chair to get to the crackers in the cabinet. And as I was turning to get back down, there was a short alien-like creature standing in the corner watching me. It had huge eyes and a cape draped around him with a tall collar. I was frozen with fear for a few seconds. I didn't know what to do next because I was standing where the kitchen was. I jumped down and just darted past it. I actually moved aside for me, like it was just giving me room to run past. I continued running back to my room and stayed there. I haven't seen her since. This happened several months ago. My wife and I have an 18 month old daughter. She's our first baby besides a miscarriage. Our daughter was somewhere around a year old. She was or is at an age with lots of toys around the house. We know them all and the sounds they make multiple times a day. I say this because of a very strange occurrence. One day, my wife and I were sitting on the couch with our little girl nursing. The TV wasn't on, but my wife had a video playing quietly on her phone. I got up to go to another room and as I'm crossing the room, I hear a child clearly giggling in between me and my wife. I instantly turned around and saw my wife staring at me with big eyes. I asked her if maybe I misheard where it came from and it was our daughter or my wife's phone. She said no, she heard it in front of her as well. She said it couldn't have been our daughter because she had been 100% latched on and nursing the whole time. We double checked the video to make sure it wasn't on there, but there were zero children or laughter in the video. I checked if there was some weird toy on the ground that maybe I had nudged. Nope. And the sound didn't sound like it came from any of those sources. It was clearly a voice in the room. We didn't feel bad though and thought maybe it was either our miscarriage, a child that has yet to join our family, or some spirit of a child that is enjoying all the toys in the house. So we were cool with it. But make no mistake, something was in there with us. Another night, about a month later, we were in bed quietly talking and we distinctly heard a chair from our dining room table moving. It makes a distinct sound. We don't live in a place that creaks, so it's normally very quiet. We both looked at each other and knew the other heard it too. Again, we didn't get a bad vibe. We decided a friendly spirit of a child is just having fun in our place. I'm an avid gardener. Earlier in the season, I got a tray of six romaine lettuce starts from the hardware store. I planted them in two columns of three in my green section of my garden. Probably took me five minutes. The next morning, I came out for morning watering and two of the romaine starts are gone. Oh well, I guess a squirrel or a raccoon totally dug them out. I couldn't see any remnants of the plant at all, so I just assumed I planted them shallow. The dirt was loose. Something was able to yank the entire plant out. Not that crazy. The morning after that, two more are gone. So I have two left. Figured raccoons for sure. Really annoying bastard with thumbs fleecing me for all the letters I've got. Again, I didn't even see a root, munched up plant, just gone. So about two weeks later, 
I'm working on a totally separate patch of my garden. This patch is next to my large garden and green section, but separated by fencing, dogs and pests. In the very corner of this patch, my pepper patch, are two romaine starts. Overgrown a bit, wilted down, planted in a haphazard way that I knew I wouldn't have consciously done because I'm kind of anal about the aesthetics of the garden. I was really gobsmacked and asked my mom if she'd done it. She said, absolutely not, that's your thing. I wouldn't do that. It's totally possible that I just didn't notice the remain starts and they'd been there since they'd gone missing. But how did they get there? No idea. I honestly think I had to have done it while sleepwalking. I'm not known to do this though, so it would be a first. I don't know, they're still in the same spot. I look at them and wonder. This is the first time I've taken the time to try and explain this to anyone. I genuinely questioned if my neighbor was fucking with me for some reason. Been thinking about some interesting experiences I had as a child with what I can only describe as shadow people. I have vivid memories of these tall, thin creatures with their vague features making their way into my bedroom late at night, just before I fell asleep. Looming over my bed, I'd keep my eyes sealed, still able to sense them, could feel their eyes staring at me their breath on my face as they got closer. Every time one of these shadow people made their way into my room, I had what I described as a far away dream. Even though I wasn't asleep, my seven-year-old self couldn't think of a better description. Anyway, during these dreams, I would watch as the room seemed to stretch, making things seem as if they were far away. I'd hear what seemed like hundreds of voices, first as whispers, but growing in volume and apparent agony until I couldn't hear anything else. As the otherworldly cacophony reached its peak, one of the shadow people would come into my room, walking in through the open door sometimes, but more often through either the closed attic trapdoor or straight through the second floor window. My eyes would stay sealed shut until I could no longer feel the being's presence or I fell asleep. I would tell my foster parents, later adoptive, what happened, but was just assured that it was just a simple nightmare. I just kept experiencing them for about another three years, with less and less frequency. I only ever saw the shadow people at this house, and my first encounter was within a few days of being moved here. But I'd had faraway dreams for about a year before this. I visited the house while I was in my first foster house because two of my siblings were being fostered here separately from me and we'd ride with my parents to pick them up during visitation days. After my second cat died, me and my sister couldn't believe that the body shown to us belonged to her. So we started searching in the woods near her grave. We started yelling her name and after a few minutes, I heard her meowing. No cat sounds the same. If you have a cat for a long time, you learn to differentiate their voice from the others. I asked my sister if she could hear it and she said yes. We couldn't tell where the voice came from. It seemed like it was coming from every direction, like the forest itself was meowing. We were searching for a few more minutes until the meow stopped. A few months later, while I was taking a bath, I suddenly became ashamed of being naked. I ignored it until I saw one of the bras hanging on the wall swinging. I found it weird. The doors and windows were closed. They shouldn't have been moving at all. I tried not to think about it until I saw a gray mass jumping into the sink. I freaked out and ran away. At first, I thought it was my dog who passed two weeks prior to that. But after some thinking, I realized that it was actually my cat. 
My dog hated the bathroom, while my cat loved lying in the sink and playing with things that hung on the wall. I was also always irrationally ashamed when I was naked in front of her. Years have passed. I got a lovely female cat named Felicia who passed away a year ago. Whenever I sit outside in the dark near the place of her death, I usually smoke there when I don't want to risk waking up my mom. I can hear her snuggling to the walls, purring and making that weird female cat sound. She's always with that man who jumps and runs around our garden, but that's a different story. Though he's the reason why I avoid visiting her. But I can't see any of them, even when I look in the direction of the sounds. So let me start off and say, my husband and I are total stoners. So maybe that's the explanation for this. But I really think it was something supernatural. So I used to bartend and get home after midnight and my husband, husband now, boyfriend then, would stay up late, get high and chill out and watch TV. So one night after work, we're doing our thing when it sounds like right outside our window, a car crash happens preceded by screaming and general carrying on. We look outside and don't see anything at all, but figure maybe it's just out of view. Then off and on, we kept hearing female and male screams to the point where I'm like, do we need to call the cops? Like it sounded terrifying and sounded like it was happening right outside our window, but still we couldn't see anything. I'm pretty shaken up. And I keep hearing it, but seriously, nothing. Eventually, it all calms down, and then we start getting a knock at the front door in the window. But no one there. At this point, I'm like, what the fuck? But I'm really thinking something not normal and natural is going on, but I don't want to indulge it. I get up to make some tea to calm us down, when I hear a female's voice clear as day as if it's in the same room, say, hello? I look out the kitchen to my husband and I'm like, did you hear that? He says, yes. And all that I could do was walk around the room saying, what the fuck is going on? Like I was seriously tripping out. The next day I asked my husband what was going on and he's like, I think it was some cats on the porch, lol. My husband is a total skeptic, but every now and then I'll bring it up and one time he did admit that it was something strange and he did hear it, but most times he just wants to act like it was nothing. My sister lives in my parents' house where they both died due to COVID-19. Over the past few months, my sister has mentioned bizarre things happening in the house. I don't live there right now. It started three months ago, about five months after our parents had passed away due to COVID-19. She said she was sleeping and heard something in the room across from the bedroom and looked and saw what looked to be a silhouette of a woman peering around the corner and she called me immediately. She turned on the lights, nothing was there. And I went and stayed with her and nothing was there. A few weeks later, when I was there helping move our parents' stuff out to a storage unit, about eight o'clock at night, we heard what vividly sounds like running in the attic. There's absolutely no way to get in the attic besides from my parents' old bedroom. Naturally, we think someone is up there, so we call the police and they do a thorough search and there's nothing and we got lectured about false police reports. One month ago, I'm staying there, the dog sitting while my sister is vacationing, and she had been complaining that she kept seeing the same silhouette in the most ominous places. I told her that her mind was playing tricks on her. I'm laying on the couch and behold, I heard running in the attic yet again. I'm kind of freaking out at this point because I don't want to call the police due to the last time. Instead, I call our neighbor over and once again, nothing is up there. Last night, 
I get a call at 3 a.m. and my sister's out of breath in her car, driving over, screaming at me that she heard dad's voice in the attic. I mean, she is frantic. She gets to my house and unironically looks like she saw a ghost. My wife struggled really bad with major depression. We got married in November of 2018. We both drank way too much and were dependent on benzos and opiates, as well as whatever else might be around. My wife got weight loss surgery a few months before our wedding and she just seemed to be slipping into an even darker headspace after that. In October of last year, she took her own life. I discovered her body in our tiny house we have parked on my parents' property. So horrible. I made it a few months before I overdosed on fentanyl and ended up in the hospital with a very small chance of living. I pulled through and moved away for seven months and got clean from everything. It was the only way I would have ever gotten clean. I like to think she had a hand in helping me pull through to be able to live a better life. Now that I've been back home, I've never gone over to that tiny house. Only a handful of times. It doesn't scare me when I'm in there. It's just an odd feeling in a way. Last week, I noticed the bathroom light was on, so I went in to turn it off. Both switches were off, yet the light was on. Weird. I toggled them back and forth and they went off. That brings me to today. I noticed the curtains in the loft where she had shot herself in were pulled open. Nobody had gone up there in a long time. I went up and closed them. I'm not a huge believer in the paranormal, but I've never been one to dismiss it either. What do you think is going on over there? I've since gotten my life together, got counseling and have been drug free since January. Life has been really hard since I lost her. Should I leave the blinds open for her to enjoy the view? This happened almost 10 years ago. We had just moved into a new house after my parents' divorce that I really didn't like as it was situated right next to a very busy road. I was 15 and in a lot of turmoil from the divorce. A year prior, I adopted a cat, Mitch, who was the only good thing in my life at the time. He was a great cat with the personality of a dog. He helped immensely every time I was depressed and I really depended on his companionship. When I got Mitch, my best friend adopted his sister. She ended up having kittens and my brother took one of those, who was named River. Mitch took her under his wing immediately and they were inseparable, always going on adventures outside, hunting critters, napping together. Well, one late afternoon slash evening, I was napping on the couch. This dream was so vivid, I still remember clear as day. It was a dark room with a grey background and one source of light shining from above. Under that light was River. She was speaking to me and all I remember is her just constantly reassuring me, saying things like, don't worry, I'm going to be okay. He has taught me a lot now and I can take care of myself, etc. I snapped awake and thought it was the oddest dream ever. It was also dark outside at this point. For some reason that I will never understand, I just gravitated outside. It felt like something was pulling me out there and I just blindly followed. I walked through my yard, across my streets, and over to the busy road. That's where I found Mitch, killed by a car running him over. I was devastated, and don't think I've ever broken down so hard. Went to my old house and buried him in the yard there, as that was his favourite spot. I still can't understand that dream to this day. I was leaving my girlfriend's house last night a little after 3am and I saw something that has baffled me to the point 
that I feel like this is the only place I could potentially find an answer. My girlfriend lives right next to a church and cemetery. The church is at the top of the hill, and the cemetery starts at the bottom of the hill at the road. As I was approaching the cemetery to turn onto the main road, a streak of light, about three feet off the ground, came bounding from the top of the hill and crossed in front of me, headed towards the main road. The best way I can think to describe its movement is to picture a rock skipping across water, but instead of a rock, it was a streak of light. Actually, it's pretty comparable to Tracer from Overwatch when she uses her blink ability. My first thought was that it was some kind of reflection. I still think that's the only logical explanation. But then I thought it kind of looked like the reflection of a cat's eyes, but that would require it to be looking at me. And there's no way an animal could look at me while running in the direction it was moving. About the time it was directly in front of me, I tried to see if I could make out any kind of figure. This part honestly sounds extremely ridiculous, but it almost looks like there was an outline of a small cloaked person right behind the light, almost like they were chasing it. With it being really dark and me only barely making out that shape to begin with, I'm going to assume that was just in my head, but the light was definitely real. I sped up while trying to also keep my eyes on it in order to get a closer look, even rolled my window down as I got closer. But when I got to where it crossed my path, it was gone. There's nowhere it could have gone except in some really tall glass, but I tried to look there too and saw nothing. My maternal grandparents lived in Nebo, Missouri, a little community in the Mark Twain National Forest. We lived in Springfield, making for a couple hours trip when we'd visit for holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Mother's Day, Father's Day, sometimes 4th of July. And sometimes they'd have one of us kids visit for a few days. In 2006, my grandmother had a stroke and had to be put in a facility to monitor her state. The mental state never recovered, and the last photos of her I saw were nearly unrecognisable. All of us were preparing ourselves for the inevitable, that we'd have to say goodbye for the last time. Then, one Sunday morning, my father answered a phone call and shortly, the younger of my sisters started crying. When we asked what the problem was, she said, Grandpa died. His health had suddenly broken down and despite the attempt to get him medical attention, he'd gone quickly. That Wednesday, we had the funeral and burial. Given her physical and mental state, Grandma couldn't be there. In a couple days, we got the news that Grandma had died peacefully and we had a second funeral and burial about a week after her husband. Now for the ghostly part. At the family meetings and such after the second funeral, a little story got out. Grandma had been informed that her husband had died, but on hearing this news, she protested that couldn't be, as he was still visiting her. Now, as I said, after the stroke, Grandma's mental state wasn't quite all there. But what if she was right? What if my grandfather was still visiting her? Did he not want to go without her? During my first 20 years, I never questioned that they loved each other. Maybe that love was enough to keep them together, even after one of them had already died. I've worked at the same doctor's office for over two years. For a year and a half, I would be the first person coming into the office at 7.15 a.m. I would always feel like I was being watched. The other ladies in the office had told me about Billy, whom they believe is a young boy who stays closer to the front of our office in our first two rooms. They told me about coming in and all of the sinks turning on, the music randomly blaring rap music, and when we all keep it on is country music, and hearing a little kid run back and forth through the halls. My first experience with Billy was around November 2019. 
I saw someone at the end of our hall, moving around in the dark. When I got up to where I saw the person moving, there was absolutely nothing. Since then, I've seen him several times in the same place, doing the same thing. Another one of Billy's quirks is that he really likes to grab my coworker and I. He brushes up against our arms and rib cages. I got an undercut about six months ago and I felt the hair on the back of my neck stand up several times out of the blue. Billy also likes to stay directly in my peripheral vision to where I can see someone moving. But when I turn to greet them, there's no one. I've never been uncomfortable with the touching until a few weeks ago. I was talking to my coworker but facing my computer so I couldn't really see her. I felt the waistband of my pants stretch and slap into my lower back. I instantly turned around and asked my coworker why she did that. She was turned around facing her own computer so I knew it wasn't her. That's the most aggressive he has been towards me and the most uncomfortable he's made me feel. I have a bit of experience with lucid dreaming. Not much, but a little. This time I seemed to go lucid, but something was very off. I thought I was awake. Wow, not realizing until writing this, but I don't know if I was awake or asleep. When I heard a rhythmic tapping of somebody's fingernails on the opposite side of the far wall of my room. Before being able to think much of it, I heard a baby's laughter and my body began to lift out of itself and I was floating above my bed. I didn't think much of it at first because I thought I was just going lucid and trying to stay calm. But then I realized this wasn't like a lucid dream I've had before because this time I wasn't the one in control. It brought me to the foot of my bed. My body still floating began to spin. It got faster and faster and I had a weird way of knowing it was something controlling me and that it was about to drop me. And when it did, I dropped to the floor and when got put back in my body in my bed. I began trying to scream, but couldn't. The experience was similar to a dream I had when I was younger, where this black entity, in some weird way female, followed me around until coming face to face with it as I tried to scream at the top of my lungs. It took my breath away and I couldn't make the slightest noise. But this more recent dream was different because I couldn't move my body and I was in the real world in my bed, as opposed to being in the dream world I was in, my dream when I was younger. Also, this time, the entity wouldn't reveal itself. Does anyone have an idea what this thing could have been? Or should I not go looking? This dream, or whatever it was, took place in roughly a year ago. Side notes, Baker 4 and Frank Ocean's cover of Moon River are both very inspiring. So currently, someone is moving out of the house I live in. So when I heard a bunch of commotion around the house, I thought it was just them getting more stuff out. Upstairs in my house, there is a hallway, and if you step in the middle just right, it makes a very distinct creak. This was the first of what I heard. A few minutes later, I heard a lot of movement downstairs. Again, I thought it was just them moving their stuff. I soon realized it wasn't, but I looked out of the front door and their car wasn't out front. It was silent. I stood there not knowing what to do. Yes, I probably should have just left, but for some reason, I felt stuck. Like leaving the house wasn't an option. I could feel my heart in my chest beating. That was the only thing I could hear, my heart. Then came a cough from the kitchen. No other noise. It was not who I thought it was. I sped walked upstairs and went to the bedroom and stood there next to the gun. I didn't know if it was a person that broke in or what. I eventually got the courage to walk around the house, armed of course, but no one was there, just me. 
I went back upstairs to put the gun away, and just as I do in the corner of my eye, I see a bleached white head in the doorway. It was low to the ground, like it was lying down, probably about shin height. I looked over quick, and when I tell you the fear I felt when I was able to get a clear look of it before it disappeared, I would. It had medium to big sized ears, and overgrown buzz cuts, sunken eyes, to the point it was just two black voids, and the mouth was a grin, but blackened. If anyone can tell me anything, please do. I don't know what I expect to get from this, but I do want to share my experience this past week. Last week, I failed to gain any restful sleep. On Monday, I arrived home late in the evening and ate a large meal within an hour or two of falling asleep. That night, I had nightmares revolving around demonic slash spiritual activity and eventually was startled awake around the witching hour. Tuesday night, the same thing happens, but not the same dream. I think nothing of it as nightmares for me occur very seldom, but when they do, they typically revolve around demonic or spiritual activity or my teeth falling out. So nothing out of the norm for me. Wednesday night, I'm able to eat dinner a few hours earlier before bed, but I still experience another nightmare. This time when I wake up, I continue laying in bed and calm myself back down. Just as I'm about to fall back asleep, I feel the pressure changing my bed. I remember the moments vividly because it scared the piss out of me to say the least. I was sleeping on my side and as I was about to fall back asleep, I felt the mattress move up and cup my back. As a mattress normally would if you were laying on your side, the movement of the mattress was as if someone or something was laying next to me and got off the mattress. I sleep alone on a queen mattress with a weighted blanket. I also don't have any pets. The only pressure significant enough to change the shape of the mattress would be me. Unaware of whether the dreams or the presence in my bed were influenced by my good or bad energy, I saged my place the following morning. It's now Saturday and the dreams have ceased for the time being and I haven't encountered that presence again. So I have a friend from my city I used to live in, in Kentucky. Me and my two sisters and parents moved to Reno, Nevada, where we now live. My friend was visiting her dad in Reno, so she stopped by our house for a sleepover because she wanted to have a sleepover, I guess. I don't know, she kind of just showed up. Anyway, she loves paranormal stuff and she wanted to summon a ghost for some reason. I'm a dumb kid, so I played along and we made a house-made Ouija board. We started asking it the usual questions, blah, blah, blah. And what we got was a little seven-year-old girl who was murdered by her dad with an ax because her dad drank a lot of beer, she said. And she gave the date in which she thinks she was born and when she thinks she died. She also gave us her name. So I went up to the computer and looked up the police records for murders. And there was someone who was axe murdered by her father and was nine, not seven. All the other dates, names, birth dates, etc. were exactly the same. So either the ghost said the death date's wrong or it's not the same person. Anyway, now we summoned this ghost and she didn't leave, by the way. I hear small footsteps in the hallway beside my bedroom for a time every day. And whenever we eat a meal, I'll hear a very faint, I'm so hungry, from the hallway. She's not a creepy ghost though. She doesn't say much, but whenever she wants to go in one of our rooms, she will knock. Like I'll hear a tapping on the door, and all I do in there is play video games, so I'll just say, come in. And I'll hear faint footsteps on my carpet, and then hear faint footsteps out of the room. Other than that, she doesn't do anything. She just likes, like, likes to hang out in the hallway, I guess. The 
This has been a somewhat regular occurrence for over 20 years that used to terrify me. But now, I want to know who or what it is. I live alone, so there's nobody else with me. A few times each month, and quite randomly, I wake up either during the night or in the early morning to the sound of heavy breathing. It's usually about two people, but sometimes just the one. It sounds like they're breathing through heavy breathing apparatus, and it's loud and deep, like they're standing over me. This used to absolutely terrify me, and I was convinced there was somebody else in the room, but there never was, and over time I learned to relax and tried to go back to sleep. More recently, I've become super curious about who or what this is. The breathing isn't mine, and I've become aware of my lighter and quicker breathing in the lucid moments before waking up fully. Many times I hear two beings with different breathing rates, and I somehow wake with the awareness that one is closer than the other. I never see anyone or anything, and I don't remember anything else. As I wake from the lucid state, the breathing is completely silenced, and I'm left with the memory of a few breaths only, and no other clues. Sometimes I can recall an unrelated dream I was just having, and this breathing interjects to wake me up. The breathing is not familiar to me in any other way, and it's not any memory that I may be unintentionally recalling. I've also moved house a few times, and now live in a fairly new premises, so I don't believe it's connected to anywhere I've lived. Does anyone else experience this? I was having a sleepover with, with cousins and for some reason, we were sleeping in the living room. It's open to the rest of the first floor and you can basically see the integrity of the floor from there. I'm dreaming and I see a scary beast with claws and horns making its way up the staircase. I see it from where I'm sleeping as if my eye were floating over my body. As soon as the demon slash beast reached the top floor, my sister screamed to death. I mean the loudest, scariest scream. I'm like, all right, what the fuck? What a strange coincidence. I keep it to myself and it ends there. And so I thought. Several years later, I overhear my sister and my mom talking about that story and it sent chills down my spine. Turns out they both had the dream of the same thing as I did. Well, my mom saw the exact same thing as me but from the top of the stairs. She went to take a look, just to be sure everything was fine, because the dream was very surreal and so was mine. At the exact time she got out of her room, she screams, is to be heard. From my sister's point of view, a dark shadowy figure slid under the door and made his way up the wall to the ceiling, getting closer and closer to the top of her face. It transforms into a big black spider and it drops on her face. Obviously, that's what scared the shit out of her and made her scream, waking up with a major panic attack. The only explanation they found was the fact that my sister had borrowed a satanic book from the library and this thing demon was attached to it. The book was in her room and it was returned the next day. It never happened to either of us since but this one will stick with us for a long time. I used to work at this old plant building door frames and doors when I was 18. It was probably built in the early 1900s and was falling apart in some places. I worked from 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. My job was to build the frames and scrap whatever wood I didn't need. I would usually keep the scrap in a bag until the end of the night and then go throw it in a huge dumpster. My first few days, I felt unsettled because the dumpster was literally in the pitch black outside. This plant was in the middle of nowhere with no lights outside. Eventually, I got used to it. The bathroom was also a good five minutes away by walking from my workstation. One night, I needed to use the restroom and made my way over there 
And while I almost reached the bathroom, I heard a very high-pitched yell from behind me. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I looked behind me to see something white turning the corner where my work area is. And I ignored it, thinking it was the security guard. I used the bathroom and come out and go back to work. I asked my lead man if he heard a scream and if anyone came down here. He gives me a strange stare and says no. When it's time for break, he calls me over and tells me to sit down at the table with him. It was around midnight at this point. He tells me not to get scared, but that this place has a strange vibe to it. That people claim to see and hear things all the time. Apparently, a little girl in the 1930s died in an accident there and that people claim to see her and a black dog. Nobody knows what the black dog is there for. There is only one guy that says he saw the dog, but the dog disappeared when it turned into a corner. When I quit, I was so happy because that place gave me the creeps. I was 14 at the time. I had just moved downstairs because I wanted more privacy as my parents were always checking in on me. I've always been a rebellious kid and wanted to be alone and do my own thing without anyone telling me not to. I had always noticed strange things happening around my house and I kept asking my parents if they were going through my stuff in my room. They would always say no, so I just brushed it off. These things still happen to me to this day, like things being moved and waking up in a cold sweat with no explanation. One night, as I was on my phone, I felt this feeling of dread and anxiety come upon me. I then heard a voice say, it's okay. And I looked up and a black silhouette of a woman was standing at the foot of my bed. She had no face, but I could clearly see the outline of a petite woman just standing there. I remember feeling very scared, but also very calm at the same time. I was looking at her for 15 seconds before she vanished. I told my parents what happened and they were also scared because my dad would always say he felt a presence in the house. I instantly moved back up to the main floor. I remember telling people about it and I would always remind them that my parents built the house so there were no previous owners. People have given the idea that it was my grandma who passed away a year before this happened. I still question if this is true. I haven't had anything that intense happen to me again. 15 now. I still have nightmares and also question what she meant. Why was it okay? I remember telling that to myself over and over. I'm thinking of moving back down soon. But for now, I'm good right back upstairs. I've been going to my local barber shop for a year or so. There's only one guy who's the owner. He hasn't changed or had anything weird around him. I see him often in the area. Over the last four or five times I've been there, there's been a lady who is Cypriot and an older man in his 70s who I'm assumed is related to the other two due to him also mentioning Cyprus in his barber chats. I've had many conversations with them both the lady and the older man, and they both know how I like my hair done. So imagine my surprise today when I go in and there's the owner guy, a lady and an older gentleman. Now, the owner guy was the same one. The lady and the older guy, however, were different. The lady referred to the older guy as uncle at one point, which threw me. The original older guy used to take forever, but did a great cut. Same as this guy. However, the lady and older guy were different. Looked completely different. You had the same style of hair, clothes, etc. as originals. The older guy then asked me, number one on the side as usual. Honestly, I've never been so confused. They aren't the same people. I know that for a fact. Yet they both behaved as if they had met me before. I've always been good with faces and even bumped into someone four weeks after in a London club after seeing them on a stage in Gran Canaria. 
So I know I'm not being silly. It's just strange, so strange. I can understand family run businesses, but to have one uncle and niece as a pair of barbers from Cyprus, then have another pair from Cyprus come into the same shop? I don't know. There was a period in my life where I would always wake up in the middle of the night. The TV was on eco mode, so it always shut off after inactivity. So the room would be pitch black when I woke up. Then, every time I woke up, I kept seeing this gray shadow standing in the middle of my room, facing me. It had no face, and was maybe one meter, 40 centimeters tall. Not very tall, it had the shape of a human. I remember every time this happened. I tried closing my eyes while I kept my cool, trying to turn the TV on. And as soon as the TV came on, it would disappear because of the light. This happened very frequently. So I got used to it and thought it was just something weird with my vision. But one night I woke up with the same shit happening and I got fed up and decided to aggressively stand up and lean towards it while saying, what the fuck are you? To see what the fuck it was. Maybe scare it and make it disappear. What shocked me was it didn't disappear at all. It was still standing there, clear as day, facing me. I just ran the fuck up to turn the lights on, and it would disappear. And I would just sit in my room with the lights on for a bit, trying to make sense of what just happened. Strangest experience I've ever had with something paranormal. The shadow never appeared like this after this incident. In the corner of my room, I've got my TV and a sofa chair with my computer. And I've experienced three times when sitting and chilling on my computer with my TV off. I've seen in my TV a shadow walking past me, behind me. This happened to me about three years ago. I found out I was pregnant with my second child. We were so happy and excited to add to our family. During my first pregnancy, I had the best, most intense dreams I've ever had. This pregnancy was different. My first dream that really stuck with me right after finding out was of my dad dying. I woke up in tears, but knew it was just a dream. Two to three nights later, I had a dream about my mum dying. Again, I woke up in tears. I told my husband and he said they're just dreams, nothing to worry about, even though he knows I believe dreams to be so much more. Two days before my 35th birthday, I had a nightmare. I was at a restaurant carrying a baby in a carrier attached to my body. I was sitting at a long table with about 15 other people. Everyone was laughing and having a wonderful time. Then out of nowhere, someone walks in and just starts shooting. As soon as I'm hit, I wake up. It was at that moment that my miscarriage began. I lost the baby two days later on my birthday. That night, I lay in bed thinking of what could have been, crying until I fell asleep. I had a dream. It was of my husband's Nana who had recently passed and I had been close with. She was sitting right at my feet. She gave them a squeeze and said, don't worry, hon, I got him. And then I woke up. I know the three dreams before the miscarriage were sort of preparing for me for the loss to come, but Nana visiting me, that was something that healed me. What do you all think? I was walking down the streets with my friend at night, not so late, about 9 p.m. As I was walking, I saw a very normal woman with her medical mask on, in her 30s or 40s, from afar walking towards the opposite direction, which is my direction. As she came closer, she started looking at me and staring. It seemed weird, but I brushed it off. As we were passing by, I just glimpsed at her and walked by. 
And as I turned my head to my friend to continue our conversation, she grabs me by my arms and looks at me dead in the eye with a very scary look on her face that I can't get out of my head. Her eyes were wide open as if she was looking through me. But the way she was looking at me was as if she was very scared about something. She told me with a shivering voice, run. I was weirded out and was like, what? She repeated herself as she was holding my arms. With the shiver in her voice, I could hear the fear in her voice and see the fear in her eyes. She looked very worried about me and kept repeating, run, you're in danger. Run, be careful out there. But then my friend pulled me away from her and told me not to look at her and continue walking. My friend thought that she knew me or something because of the way she was talking to me. I was traumatized. My friend told me to brush it off and that she may be cuckoo or something because there are a lot of weird people that walk the streets here, but she wasn't one of those. First, it wasn't that late at night. And second, she seemed like a very normal person that was dressed very decently and looked decent. I still can't get it out of my head. Anyone have an idea what this might mean? Do even the most docile of animals sense when a presence is evil or malicious? I've got a close friend who lives with me. He left for a few days and my boyfriend wasn't home. I was alone, so I figured I would get some cuddles in with my dog in bed since my boyfriend doesn't like the dog in the bed. Too warm for all three of us. So we laid together for about 10 or so minutes. When clear as day, I heard in my friend's voice saying, hey G, but no one was home. The voice was loud and so clear. It sounded like he was sitting next to me. I was a tad freaked out, but when my big baby of a dog, who's growled maybe six times in his whole life, started growling at it, it really freaked me out. All the hair on my dog's back and neck stood up. He stared at the entrance of my room and just continued to growl. His eyes were following something and anytime he'd shift around the room, he would position himself so he was in front of or over the top of me. I didn't hear anyone's voices after that, nor was it the first time I've heard voices but it's never been my own friend's voice who's still very much alive. My friend's got a voice you could recognize anywhere too, so it wasn't a similar voice. No, I know for a fact it was his. I know animals can sense things, but my question is, do you think the voice was malicious or evil? My dog doesn't even growl if I'm play fighting with a person. He's never seemed to care if I was in danger. Could he have felt like he was in danger? And that's why he growled? When I was young, probably 10 years old, I was home alone for the first time. My parents had a board meeting and my brother had practice, so they let me stay home for two hours. It was starting to get dark out when they left. I was laying on the couch watching TV. My trusty cat's cat's bones was laying at my feet on the armrest of the couch. As I lay there watching TV, I saw the cat stand up. I looked down to him and saw he was arching his back and puffing up, staring up at the stairs. The staircase was one of those kinds that go up and flight, turn and go up to the second floor. There was a wall that separates the two flights of stairs. I looked up and I saw a person standing there half visible, the other half of them obscured by the wall. I looked back at the cat and he was back to laying there on the armrest. Young me, thinking someone had broken in, grabbed a baseball bat and searched the house. Having found no one and all the windows secured, I went to my room and sat in my bed. As I sat there processing what happened, a voice softly whispered my name from behind me. I leapt up and ran out of the house to sit on the porch till my parents got home. I never spoke a word of what I saw to anyone 
until four years ago. I casually told this story to my brother and sister. Little sis gasped and said she once saw the same thing when she was a teen. I have no idea of the house history, but we did live across the streets from a cemetery. I'll start by saying this encounter was not mine, but my mom's. When she was 39, now 68, she lost her best friend to cancer. She was broken and so sad. I was nine, I remember her being so lost. We were playing in the living room when she excused herself to go to the bathroom. When she came back, she seemed happier, more at peace with the loss. I never thought anything of it, being nine years old. Now, I'm a writer and artist and do quite a bit of research into the paranormal for my stories. One day, I was talking with my mum about how I need to research ghost encounters for a Halloween short I'm writing. She looks at me in a way she never has. She says to me she had one after her friend passed. The day she excused herself to go to the bathroom, she told me she didn't have to go. She just felt the urge to go into her bathroom. So she did. Waiting for her was her best friend and her bubby, grandma and Jewish. Her bubby smiled and grabbed her friend's hand. Her friend smiled, gave a little wave and they left. My mom explained to me that it was in that moment that she knew death was not the end. You would be with the ones you love. They would hold your hand and let you know that everyone else is okay. She then went on to tell me she has had many different experiences since she became a mother. But I didn't know that they were until that day. Now, on a side note, I've always been interested in the strange supernatural and paranormal. It's like it was in my DNA. Now I wonder if it is. Back in 2017, I frequently saw what I now know as shadow people for a couple of months. I already have some visual snow and palinopsia and all that good stuff, so originally I just thought it was my vision doing its little acid trip. I would usually see them out of the corner of my eye. They would be hazy black figures with no distinct body, but at the same time I could make out how they were. Imagine if somebody edited a blur effect on Black Mannequin. They were tall or short, lanky figures. One time I saw one that was so tall that I had to bend its head down because of the ceiling. I then started to see them in my dreams, except this time their body was clear. I would go after them and chase them, but they'd always get away. In real life, they never spooked me which is odd because I get paranoid easily. But in my dreams, moderators, I always felt really anxious and wanted to catch them. Eventually one day, I saw one curled up in a ball on the floor of my restroom. And that was the last memorable time I saw one in that house. I realized one day that a few months earlier, I had been in that same position on my bathroom floor due to a mental breakdown. And that's when I decided to research them. I read that they appeared during bad times in your life, but I'm not really sure what to think of them. I've only seen them two or three times in my current house. Has anybody else had experiences with these things? I bought a painting at a thrift store of a beautiful young angel a few months ago. I was immediately drawn to it, which isn't typical for me. I'm not into art or angels. I hung it up in my bedroom the same day I bought it. The next morning when I woke up, the living room lights were on. I thought that was strange that I wouldn't have noticed I left them on when I went to bed since I can see my living room from my bedroom and would notice if the lights were on. The next night, I made sure they were off when I went to bed. Sure enough, the next morning, 
they were on again. Same thing happened the next night. This time, I woke up around 3 a.m. and could see from my bed the living room lights were on again. After that third night, I never had an issue again. So I chalked it up to some type of electrical thing and it being a coincidence with the painting. Although the lights never turned on automatically during the day, just while I was asleep. Then just the other day, I was in my bedroom putting laundry away and the painting started swinging. Like it was very, very noticeable. I just sort of stared at it, watching it, and then it just stopped. That's never happened before. Nothing could have hit it. There were no breezes or drafts. It was really, really swinging. Not sure what to think. I don't get a bad feeling from it. I should mention I live by myself. So no one could have turned on the lights on after I went to bed or moved the painting. I'm in the US Army and I live in the barracks. The building I live in is old, so there's the possibility that this is something else, but I'm not 100% sure. Two details that might matter or might not. One, I live on the fifth floor on a corner of the building. Two, I don't have a roommate. About a year ago, I first got the feeling that I wasn't alone in my room. It was uncomfortable at first, but I did my best to ignore it. This feeling was amplified when I have my closest door open for any amount of time and comes with the feeling that I'm being watched. Then came the tapping. The tapping happens sporadically, but almost always at night, never during the day. It usually sounds like it comes from my closet or maybe the wall next to my closet door while my mirror sits on the wall. The tapping has no rhythm to it. Sometimes it will be three or four taps. Sometimes it's eight or nine. Sometimes it's a gentle tap, like someone tapping their finger on the door. Other times, it's as if someone is knocking on the door. It sounds almost muffled. It's loud enough that I can hear it clear as day, but it doesn't vibrate the whole door or wall like it would if I was to knock on the door or tap on the wall. Either way, this tapping and banging sounds like something is very clearly trying to get my attention. I've tried to record the banging, but audio and video recordings don't seem to capture what I hear. I was in this big, white, seemingly never-ending room, floating, I think. There was a big transparent screen, although it wasn't a traditional screen, as it was all over the place, more like a curtain, perhaps. You could turn around in any direction and would still face the screen. I'm pretty sure in this room, I decided which life I wanted. The screen contained a variety of smaller ones, each one showing small glimpses of different lives, I think. They were showing various details, glimpses of memories, family members, places, stuff like that. I remember one of the screens specifically showed this big, enormous, alien-looking metropolis, by which I was really impressed. There was this voice that guided me, a spirit guide perhaps? It was deep, warm and friendly and I think it helped me pick this current life. I don't remember much after that, but I'm pretty sure I got to meet with the souls of my future family. We discussed our roles in this life, etc. I had this memory for as long as I can remember. It's definitely not something I consciously came up with. I tried various methods to find out more. AP, past life readings, but the success was limited to say the least. I'm pretty sure this is real. But then again, maybe I had just extremely vivid imagination when I was a child, and over time convinced myself it was real. Any of you guys have similar memories? I 
I'm 21, Chinese, wearing a Buddhist necklace from grandma. My sleeping position is facing on top and mouth closed, and I sleep very well, like a pig. I'm just scared it come disturb me again, but after my mom left the room, I did try to sleep again till 11 a.m. I can remember two of my dreams before I went back to sleep. First, my previous house got creepy guy looking at a girl inside, near the fridge. Second, dream on game quiz within a circle I was acting in. After this dream, this is what I can think and move when I hear the voice. It happened before my mom's alarm rang. She wanted to dry clothes in the early morning, Saturday 8 to 9 a.m. And I know after a while, she have woken up and closed the door, as the experience caused me to be awake. Woken up by a deep demon sound this time, it is a shorter talk, but sounds angry, loud on top of me. I can't tell what it was saying, like it's gibberish. Lasted a few seconds, happens to me occasionally and more frequently these two months, July and August. Previously, did not experience this. I can move my ten fingers well. I can even think of what to Google and do after hearing this. I can open my eyes and look around and flip to my right side to try to sleep again. I always sleep with my mom. I'm a stress-free person with no anxiety right now, as it's school holidays. I eat healthily as well. It's happened a few times to me. Am I experiencing ghosts or am I hallucinating? I hope it's hallucinating. When I was like 13, I was watching the show Supernatural with my sister. The episode was about Bloody Mary and the next day I was telling my friend about it and I accidentally said, in a candlelit room, you have to say Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary in front of a mirror and she will appear. I didn't pass any heed that I had said it three times as this was during the daytime and we weren't hanging out outside, not in front of a candlelit mirror at night. Being 13, I had pretty bad acne and I was using this cream for it and laying in bed, I realized I had forgotten to put it on that night. My room was pretty big, with my bed and wardrobe being the opposite side of the room. So instead of going across to hit the light switch, I used the torch from my phone as light while applying the cream on my chin in front of the mirror. I'll never forget what I saw when I took a step back to check if it was all rubbed in. There she was, standing behind me, a girl no taller than five foot, standing right behind me with her head tilted down to the floor, with long black soaked hair covering her face exactly like the girl from the ring. Without taking a second look, I sprinted into my parents' room, traumatized, and they just brushed it off as me having a nightmare or whatever. I had to sleep with the light on that night. Now, I'm a 25 year old guy, and I still avoid looking in mirrors at night if the lights are off. My mom died in June, and after the funeral, I took in her six-year-old cat. When he was with my mom, he stayed hidden most of the time, either under the bed or sofa. You'd rarely spot him anywhere else. After I took him in, I had no clue that this cat is actually really active, friendly and loving. A week after moving in with me, I could see that he chose me as his owner. I have a husband and kid as well. With them, he's accepting, but doesn't show any affection. About a month after my mom had died, I noticed that the cat started and meowed in one certain spot in my kitchen, and it felt eerie. This lasted a couple of weeks. Then, it all of a sudden stopped. But now I've noticed that he won't let me look at myself in the mirror. Like when I get ready for work, etc. I have three mirrors in total. One in the bathroom, one in the bedroom, and one in the living room. And at this point, it doesn't matter which one I choose. He insists I pay attention to him and follow him away from the mirror. At one point I joked about it that, yeah, yeah, I know, there's nothing to look at. 
when he started to behave like this, but now it feels off already. He could be in another room and he somehow feels when I approach the mirrors and bolts towards me to make a distraction. At least it feels like that. From time to time, I feel like maybe I'm imagining it, but it happens all the time and I feel uneasy already. What's in those mirrors then? Has anyone witnessed something like that? This happened to me when I was seven years old. One night, I slept like normal around 10 p.m. And suddenly, around 2 a.m., I woke up for no reason and sat up on my bed. When I sat up, I was groggy and I rubbed both my eyes and looked towards the doorway. The door was wide open and I saw this weird shadow peeking into my room. Only its neck and head were visible because it was peeking into my room. I was able to see this shadow because I had a nightlight across the doorway on the wall. I rubbed my eyes again, thinking it was just my imagination. As I stopped rubbing my eyes, I opened them again and I looked towards the doorway. I saw the shadow face still there, but this time I stared longer at it and made out horns that curled toward outward on its head. I couldn't make out any facial features, just all black like a shadow. As I kept staring at it, I couldn't even make out its eyes. Everything was black. I freaked out as I continued staring and yelled for my mom as I covered my face with the blankets. As my mom got to my room, I cried, telling her I just saw the devil in the doorway. She obviously said it was nothing but I know what I saw. I never saw it after that. And even now, typing this up gives me chills to remember what I saw that night. It was a very busy day at the store yesterday. We had way more deliveries than we could handle and the waiting times were just terrible. Some people had to wait for their order for two hours. Because of the hectic evening, I was still at the store very late. The people I closed with went home and I was all by myself. I locked the front door out of safety and because one of the customers was threatening me before closing, I went back into the office. The thing about this office is that it's pretty closed off. The door is pretty much in the center of the store, but it's a very small room. You can only really see the rest of the store via the cameras. At around 2 a.m., I was still working on some paperwork. The store was dead quiet and I had the office door open. All of a sudden, I heard a music box like tune. It sounded like something that would come out of a music box, but without the mechanical stuff you always hear. The tune was pretty slow and clear, like a tune for a baby. I went to the main part of the store to check, but I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. It scared the crap out of me. The store's pretty new and there are lots of computers around, but I've worked there for seven years and I've never heard anything like that before. I can't really pinpoint where the sound could have come from. It was probably some random noise made by a shake machine, but I don't get why it would randomly make a quiet tune like that, which I then wouldn't have noticed for years. My town doesn't get fogs in the town, only in the surrounding areas. It's surrounded by farms, mountains, factories, and two army bases. We do have humidity, but not so much to cause a fog while surrounded by buildings. My aunt was cleaning her room because she spilled something when she opened the balcony door to dust off her duvet and saw the fog. She called me to see it and I instantly took my phone out and started recording. The fog was moving, she said, and I saw it too. Due to lockdown, our town at night is with curfew, so no one was out 
and no stores were open besides the emergency pharmacy and a private birthing clinic I live near to. The weirdest parts are how fast the fog was moving and the first time seeing the fog move. How I had a headache the past three hours and the moment I went outside, the headache stopped, only to start again when I went inside my house. It feels wrong to look at and it doesn't show up on my camera. I've encountered fog before in other places, but I never cared. I never felt this dry. It used to feel wet and cold, but it felt dry and cold. I've heard scary stories about fogs, which I didn't believe and chalked it up to superstition. But this feels different. I hope more doesn't come. And there was no weather report saying anything about fog. About two weeks ago, I was going to Hardy's with the hubbin when I abruptly interjected that the word Igridizil was being screamed into my ears repeatedly. Along with hearing that as if it were roared at me, I began to see this pitch black gnarly tree in the middle of a large black field. It looked as if the tree was scorched and it didn't have any branches. At the base of the tree, was white ash in a neat circle. I then witnessed about five or six horses galloping around the tree as if they were mad or crazed. They all had white eyes and they were also pitch black. I looked up to see intense storm clouds like those you'd see before a tornado and vibrant lightning within them. I noticed that tendrils of lightning were raining down on specific parts of the field and destroying it. It didn't feel random. Throughout the whole thing, I felt this sense of dread approaching. And in the physical world, I felt the need to be on the lookout. I was anxious, and I felt like I was being watched. I've never encountered Odin. I believe that I've had some kind of seer or conduit ability since my first experience at the age of six. I don't know a lot and have to reach out for sources or those who can interpret what I believe I witness. I'm still a bit freaked out by it. This took place when I was a child, so definitely over a decade ago. I want to say about 12 or 13 years ago. My old front door had a window, like most do. Unlike the translucent glass most have, this window was completely see-through. There were stairs in front of the door leading up to my parents' room. One night, I was walking down the stairs with my mother, and we both saw a hand holding up and frantically waving a peace sign at the window. My mother opened the door, and of course, nobody was there. Looking back at it, I'd have passed it off as my child mind today, if my mother hadn't seen it too. I can't remember if it was my mother who said this, or if it was my mind trying to think of something reasonable, but I recall a motion that it was a moth. I don't think this is the case. Because not only did no moth fly in the house when my mother opened the door, but I know what I saw, and my mother looking around for a person confirmed it. There was no way a person could have gotten away that fast either, since we were almost at the last stair when we saw it. My mother has never mentioned this since, and I'm not even sure if she remembers at this point. I do remember, however and I just want any potential answers at what this could have been. Thank you. I was six when this happened, and it's still clear as day in my mind. I was sleeping with my mom, dad, and sister. We had this long body mirror in front of the bed. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I stared at the mirror, and I can't stress enough how real this was, but a lady came out of the damn mirror, slowly. 
I'm guessing Goosebumps writing about this. I couldn't see her face because it was covered with long hair and she was wearing a white dress. Really similar to the ring, but I haven't watched it at the time. And she was glowing. The reason why I still remember it was because she was literally so bright. She didn't emit any light to her surroundings, but it was on her, like an aura. She slowly looked, walked from one end of the room and to the other, just going through the wall. I didn't scream, but I just hid in my blankets. I don't know why I didn't try to wake anyone up, but when morning came, I told my family and they believed me. Paranormal shit isn't an uncommon thing in our house, but that's the most memorable of my encounters. Today, I'll say that I don't believe in ghosts because I haven't seen one like that since. I only see movement from the corners of my eyes or black figures I'd think was a member of my family, but it just wasn't. But I don't really take that much into much deeper thought. When I was 22 years old, I was pregnant with my oldest child. My child's father, we'll call him Rob, had used illicit drugs in the past before we got together. Our bedroom was set up with our dresser placed against the wall opposite from our bed. One night, I awoke to the sound of scratching. I looked to the foot of the bed and saw the outline of Rob's body sitting there facing the dresser. He was leaning forward a bit, as if he were hovering over something on top of the dresser. I thought he was cutting up drugs, even though he had never done so during the four years we'd been together. Extremely confused, I whispered, Rob, what are you doing? He didn't acknowledge that he had heard me, so with a little more volume in my voice, I repeated his name. Again, no response. He just continued scratching at the dresser. Irritated, I threw the blanket off of myself, huffed loudly, and began to scoot down to the edge of the bed. But I stopped abruptly and froze. Before I had the chance to make any significant movement, I heard a sudden snort. You know the sound that people make when they snore and you interrupt their sleep, but they don't fully wake up. I slowly looked to my left and realized that Rob had been sleeping soundly next to me the entire time. I moved into my house around three years ago. When we first moved in, something didn't feel right. I just thought that it was a normal feeling when you move into a new house, so I wasn't scared. My mum was heavily pregnant at the time. I always hated my bedroom and I thought it was scary. I would often stay up all night or sleep downstairs so I don't have to go up there. A few weeks later, my mum gave birth to my brother. Everything was fine for a while, but I still didn't like my bedroom. Suddenly, during the night when I'm watching TV, my brother's toys would often turn on by themselves and I'd get a weird feeling. Two years later, things got worse. Me and my mum would often hear knocking on our bedroom doors during the night. When we'd open them, nobody was there. My brother often wakes up in the middle of the night and when he's starting to fall asleep, he would jump up, get scared and talk about the man with scary eyes that he saw walking past him. Now he always talks about the man that stands in the corner of the room. Now me and my mum always get scared walking up the stairs because we always feel like something is watching us. One night, my mum was carrying my brother up the stairs to go to bed. He started crying and talked about the little boy that ran past them and went through the door. Is my house haunted or am I overthinking? So to provide a quick background, our house has always had weird vibes to it. My boys have both claimed to have experienced things and my wife has seen things as well. Last night, I'm putting down our youngest. A little rocking chair, mine from when I was a toddler, 
was seated against his wall. I was sitting on the floor in front of it. The room was dark, except for a nightlight. After he was sleeping, I left the room, shut the door and walked downstairs to the kitchen. About a minute or two later, definitely less than five minutes, I heard a bang from above me where his room was located. My wife, who was upstairs at the time, texted me asking what that was. I said I had no idea. Our son ran out of the room and found my wife terrified. The small rocking chair was in the middle of the floor upside down. It had moved somehow about five feet and flipped forward. I know he was sleeping as I checked before I left the room and the movement sound happened within a five minute span. My wife was on the same floor of the house and would have told me if she was involved somehow or his brother had somehow entered the room. His brother was sleeping at the time as well. We eventually calmed him down and got him back to sleep. It was crazy to say the least. I had a friend, Bailey, who was raped and murdered. At the time, I was a single parent with a three-year-old boy. Every year, there's a balloon release at her grave. I had to take my son with me this year. He had never been to a cemetery and had never met Bailey or her family. He asked Bailey's mom if he could have one of Bailey's balloons. I never told him Bailey's name. She happily obliged. We all share good memories and laughs. We release the balloons. Tears are running down my cheeks as they silently drift away, further and further into the clear blue sky. After saying goodbyes, my son and I get into the car. I'm getting him strapped in and he says, Thanks for taking me there, Mom. Odd, but I said you're welcome. Then he says, We were here for the blonde girl, Bailey, right? There were no pictures. And she was here and is taking the balloons to heaven. And it doesn't hurt anymore, Mama. So thank you for taking me there. I wonder what she looked like to him. I wonder if she talked to him. The only person he was focused on the entire time was Bailey's mom, who needed the sweet, innocent smile of that sweet, blonde-haired boy more than any of us that day. He got to take one balloon home and had the best time of his life. We do not give our children enough credit. This happened when I was about 12 or 13, back when I had an incredible attachment to MSN. My mother had left me alone for a few hours to go grocery shopping, which meant that I had the family computer to myself, and I was excited to chat with my friends online without interruption. A few hours go by, and I still haven't moved from the computer in the living room. My mom suddenly bursts through the door with grocery bags upon grocery bags, and immediately starts yelling at me, why didn't you help me with the groceries? I was confused and startled. I didn't know she was home. I would have come out to the car to help her. As I tell her this, she becomes angrier and explains that she saw me watching her struggle from the upstairs bathroom window. And instead of helping her, I just watched her. I froze. I knew that I hadn't left the computer on the main floor, not once. But before I could protest, she went back outside to grab the rest of the groceries. I tried to explain myself after the fact, but she didn't want to hear it. I let it go, because I knew that something was very wrong with that house. The thought of someone or something pretending to be you is the most terrifying thought to ever almost cross the boundaries into my reality. I hated that house. One night, not too long after we moved in, I was home alone and sitting on the couch in the living room. I was expecting my mother to come home any minute. While texting, I heard a knocking on the window which was behind me, across the room to the right. It was definitely coming from the window, clear as day. But as I turned around and squinted towards the window, all I saw was black nothingness into the night. But the knocking continued. I honestly thought it was my mom, 
Maybe she forgot her keys, I thought. But why would she be in the backyard? Why wouldn't she knock on the front door? It was a knock that demanded attention. I got up and walked towards the window. The knocking stopped as I looked into the window and saw nothing. I hesitantly pressed my hands against the cold window and cupped my face to look outside. And nothing. I turned to face the kitchen and I immediately noticed that all the cabinets were open, even the hard to reach ones above the fridge. I could have sworn they weren't open a second before when I approached the window. I thought that the haunting had followed my family when that happened. But luckily, nothing else happened in that house. I moved out shortly later to live on my own. And things have settled down in the paranormal realm. This house was haunted and I know it. It was said that the owner before died in the house. Some of the neighbors said by suicide, not confirmed. I would always feel uneasy when I was alone. You would hear footsteps like someone wearing high heels or a figure in the corner of your eye. I do remember sleeping in the living room and waking up at 2 a.m. like the feeling of being watched. Then, while I was under the covers, I would hear light footsteps coming towards and stopping above me. Then I would ever so slightly hear my name right next to my ear. I would get a lot of night terrors and sleep paralysis. I remember once I opened my eyes and I couldn't move or talk. I remember looking over and seeing my brother watching TV. I was trying to get his attention, but I couldn't. I guess he heard me murmuring and saw that my eyes were open. He started calling my name and I started praying and a few seconds later, I could start talking and moving. I asked him if he saw what happened. He said, yeah, a dead person was on top of you. A chill went down my spine. That house was bulldozed and doesn't exist anymore. If you want to know about other things that happened in that house, let me know. My brother had three of his friends over at our old place and they were watching a ghost movie, don't know what, and they went to go and get some snacks from within the pantry, which was of course in the kitchen. Although connected to the kitchen was the stairwell to the lower level of our place, where a store is located, and below the store is our basement with our laundry machine. I had mentioned in my other story that the people that had owned the store were doing illegal things which conjured a ton of negative energy which led to spirits inhabiting our house. Back to the story. My brother had mentioned that there were spirits in the house, which caused one of the friends, we'll call him Germ, to act all tough like he supposedly always does. It resulted in him opening the door and openly taunting the demons downstairs to go and fight him, to which he was surprised when he heard something large sprinting up the stairwell. Jim slammed the door and dead bolted it shut as the demon started to pound on the door, causing the door frame itself to rattle in place. My brother called him an idiot afterwards and then proved that he too is an idiot by playing with a homemade version of a Ouija board. And him and his three stooges began to talk with one of the friendly spirits within the upper part of the building. Before my family moved, we lived in a small town called Waterford, outside Albany, New York. It was along the Mohawk River and is very close to where the Mohawk and Hudson connect in the Erie Canal system. We lived in a small house at the time, around 15 years ago. My parents both had instances in the house where they would hear me as a three-year-old having conversations by myself in my room. They would be freaked out by this, obviously, when they asked me who it was, I would always give them the same response. The runaround man. This also coincided with an experience they had where the lights in the kitchen would shut on and off at will. When they had someone look at it, they would say it was perfectly fine, but it never stopped. It even happened when someone was there looking at it and they immediately left. Years later, 
My parents found out from some people who had lived in the town for many years that the house used to be occupied by a handyman in the 20s and 30s. He was referred to around town as the runaround man. His family lived there until a fire killed everyone in the house. My family moved from that house in the mid 2000s and the house was torn down after massive flooding from Hurricane Sandy in 2012. I saw a ghost of a young boy today while visiting my mum's plaque at the cemetery that's near where I live in Adelaide. I'm from Australia if you can't tell. Has anyone ever had an experience like that before? I'm still shaken up because I don't mind if I ever see a ghost, but the cemetery was nearly closing and my car was the only one around and nobody else was about. I tried to go after the boy to see he, if he was really what I was seeing. He looked about nine or 10, browny blonde hair, and he looked like he was zooming fast, although he was walking, if that makes sense, but like just for fun, and not even to the gates to get out of the cemetery. And I didn't even see where he came from. I asked him, are you okay? Where are your parents? Thinking it's probably someone's kid needing to be let out of the cemetery. But in reality, now that I think about it, because I looked to see where he was, and literally gone, like out of thin air. He was basically a ghost. He basically popped up and then disappeared out of thin air. Anyone ever had any experience like that? I told my older sister and she said they might pop into my dreams tonight and it might mean something. I just saw something and I don't really know how to explain it. I'm a farmer in the Midwest of the US. I'm still currently driving a tractor as I'm typing this. I'm driving an Auger wagon, unloading a combine, and I looked out my right window facing east. Over in the distance, about 200 yards along the edge of a field that borders a wooded area, I saw this thing. It looked humanish. It was extremely tall. If I were to guess, it looked around seven feet tall, walking on its legs like a person. But whatever this was, it was not human. Its arms hung down to its knees, but the weirdest part was its head. I don't know if this was its actual head or if it was wearing it, but it looked like an elk skull with large antlers. Elks are not native to where I am, but the antlers were way too big to be a white-tailed deer. I couldn't tell if it was wearing clothes or not. I have no clue what this thing was. I called the combine operator and he saw it too and has no clue either. Does anyone know what this thing is? Just today, I was trying to fall asleep and my phone turned on. It was on TikTok, but it wasn't the last video I had seen. I ignored it and tried going back to sleep. One of my papers fell off my desk. I get that my fan is on, but my fan is always on. It's never fallen before. It's never moved before either. The lights recently went out in my kitchen and they came back on when my mom accidentally burned herself. They've been going on and off at random times, but it's mostly when I'm downstairs by myself. That usually signals to me that it's time to go upstairs. The thing is, is that my dad recently passed away. I have dreams with him every now and then, but he's never dead in the dream. I'm way older too. The last dream I had with him, he was telling me something important. He was worried, but I forgot what he told me. A few months back, I had a weird ass dream where someone was in my room and behind me. I pretended that I was asleep. He was talking to me and pretending to be my dad. He told me, bless you, but I didn't sneeze. I didn't see a word. I don't know what the fuck is going on.
I was at a youth event the other day at my church. My church is one building split into two sides. Don't ask me why, but that's how it is for some reason. It was night time and I had to use the restroom and the only ones available were the one on the other side. Cool, whatever, no big deal. Until I stepped in and I got an overwhelming feeling that something wasn't right. I tried shrugging it off, thinking I was just being paranoid, but it started getting more and more overwhelming the more I was there. I started getting concerned when I was in the restroom and I started shaking a bit. As I was about to open the door to leave, I felt like there was a being on the other side. I opened the door and nada, but I ran, out, I ran out. Then I went outside, tried forgetting about it. Then the youth pastor and the pastor's kid ran out of the church. Apparently, as they were closing up the church, the light started flickering and something in the back of the church was knocked over. Considering my history with being able to sense things, I don't think it's a coincidence. So this is a story from a couple of years ago. I've heard this from mouth to mouth because this kind of news spreads like wildfire. At first, I thought it was just a rumor, but one of my friends actually went to the couple's house to confirm this. Turns out the rumors are true. There's a married couple near where I live. The wife had been pregnant for seven or eight months. One day, the wife woke up with her baby gone. Like literally her bulging belly was now deflated. Could it be that she had a premature birth while she slept? No, there's no trace of the baby. They went to the hospital to check with ultrasound. No baby. Doctors are baffled and didn't believe her. They thought the cable lied about her pregnancy. The couple still have their pink slips. The slips they gave you every time you check your pregnancy test to track the baby's growth is proof. They didn't lie about her pregnancy. This is the first time I've heard about this happening. I checked on Google and apparently this was not an isolated incident. Apparently there's an urban legend about a ghost, spirit, demon or whatever that feasts on unborn babies straight from the womb creeped me the fuck out. Has anyone heard about this happening in their country? The previous homeowner left us a heavy slate billiard table in the basement. I had led the billiards scattered all over the table as I didn't clean up after a previous game days prior. Well, after arriving home from work last week, I was sitting on the couch with my cat and all of a sudden, the cat's ears perked up. About five seconds later, I hear what sounds like someone hit the billiards together with some decent force. I can't tell which ball was hit as they were all scattered to begin with, but boy, that was odd. I mentioned it is a heavy slate style because it is as flat as can be. We're hearing what sounds like constant thumps coming from the upstairs empty bedroom has a rhythm to it like a drum. My fiance works from home five days a week and she's scared to be by here by herself now. She claims to hear whistling, footsteps, coughing, you name it. I get that there may be residual energy from the previous homeowner since they lived here for the past 20 plus years and died in the house. But activity has been picking up more and more as we renovate the place and change it. My friend Dave and his brother Dan were driving home to Arizona from visiting friends in Illinois on October 24th this year. They entered the state of Kansas early a.m. before sunrise. Both confirm this story. They first started to notice a town that they appeared to pass by repeatedly. A small farming town to the left and identical cement, not metal, grain silo to the right. Same town to the left, same silo to the right. This exact town passed by at least three times, possibly four or five. A thick fog rolled in and ice started building on the car. 
a sheen of ice eventually covered the entire surface and made icicles on the antennae. When they stopped for gas after this experience, no other car had this shell of ice. The oddest part, however, was when they noticed around 10 a.m. that it was still pitch black. The sun didn't rise until a couple hours after that, very gradually eliminating the fog and melting the ice on the car. My great grandpa was a World War II veteran that died of polio, I wanna say 12 or 13 years ago. I went with my grandma years later to his grave to place flowers. At this cemetery, they had metal flower vases that were tall and skinny and would flip upside down and recess into a hole. With a twist, it locked into place. It was also kept there by a chain. All of this sadly was to deter theft. When I tried to twist it, it came undone, but I couldn't lift it out. Me and my grandma took turns trying to lift it, but couldn't. I had heard stories about great grandpa before his polio, and he was always known to be a prankster and lighthearted. I told my grandma, it's almost like grandpa is messing with us. And out of nowhere, it lifted out of the hole. It's like he was there, and when I pointed it out, he knew the jig was up and let go. I still couldn't help but laugh through the tears. Even in death, he kept his sense of humor. I worked as a PSW on the night shift at a long-term care home. I had a resident bell ring at 2.59 a.m. I went in and asked her what she needed and she proceeded to yell, that there was a man in her bathroom and I needed to get him out. We had people who would wander into others' rooms, so I asked her what the man looked like and she said he was a black figure and he had no face. I calmed her down and then told whoever was in the bathroom that they had to leave her alone. I then went back to my charting. Around 10 past three, I had another call bell ring, but from the other side of the floor, from where the first bell went off. I went into this resident's room. This particular resident would ask for pain meds around this time and I asked if he needed meds. He told me and I quote, there's a creepy man in my room with no face. You need to get him out. My blood ran cold and I had a nurse stay with me on the floor for the rest of my shift. 